Outside the window, an endless fog swirled, so thick that it seemed as if the whole world had disappeared on the other side of the fog, except for the light that broke through the fog and illuminated the room. In a slightly cluttered bachelor apartment, an emaciated Zhou Ming sits with his chest hanging over a long, narrow table and feverishly writes in a notebook. On the seventh day, nothing has changed. A thick fog envelops everything outside the windows, and the windows themselves are blocked by an unknown force. The whole room seems to have been thrown into some kind of anomalous space. There is no connection with the outside world, no water or electricity, but the light is on and the computer turns on, although I unplugged it. As if a light breeze suddenly blew from the window, Joe Ming, buried in his diary, raised his head, and a faint light flashed in his exhausted eyes. But the next second he realized that it was only his own illusion. Outside the window there was still only a curled pale fog, a world of silence that enveloped his tiny home. Glancing over the windowsill, he saw a wrench and a hammer lying on it, signs of his attempts to leave the room over the past few days. But now these hard, crude tools lay quietly there, as if mocking his predicament. After a few seconds, Zhou Ming, with a calm face, lowered his head again and returned to the diary. I am trapped in complete uncertainty. But what is behind this door is even more abnormal. Zhou Ming paused again as he slowly studied his handwriting in the diary. He absentmindedly flipped through his diary several times, looking at what he had written over the past few days. Depressing words, meaningless ramblings, scribbles and snide jokes written in an attempt to relax. He didn't know why he was writing them down. He didn't know who they might need in the future. And in general, he never wrote in a diary. Being a high school teacher with rather limited free time, he couldn't waste it on such a meaningless thing. But now, whether he liked it or not, he had a lot of free time. He woke up and found himself locked in his room. Outside the window hung only a thick fog that did not want to dissipate. So thick that he could not see anything except it and it was as if the world had stopped alternating between day and night. Constant dim light filled the room 24 hours a day. The windows were locked. The electricity and water were turned off. There was no connection on the mobile phone. And no matter how much he screamed in the room, no one outside seemed to hear it. Everything resembled an absurd nightmare in which the known laws of nature were violated. But Zhou Ming, having exhausted all means, established one thing. This is not hallucinations or the realm of dreams. The world just stopped being normal, and so did he. He took a deep breath, and his gaze finally fell on the only door at the end of the room. It was a simple, cheap, white wooden door with a calendar that he had forgotten to replace last year and decided to leave behind, a shiny doorknob, and a slightly askew doormat. Zhou Ming could open this door. If this closed and aloof room was like a cage, then there was nothing more sinister than that there was a door in it that could be opened at any time, tempting the prisoner to push it open and go outside but the door did not lead to where he wanted. Behind the door, there were no old but close entrances, no sunny streets and energetic people, nothing that he knew. There was only a strange and foreign land, but Zhou Ming knew that he had little time to hesitate, and that the so-called choice did not exist at all. His food supplies were running low, and he only had the last quarter of several buckets of water left. Perhaps he will have a chance to find out what caused all this. Zhou Ming sighed softly, and lowered his head to write the last few paragraphs in the diary. But no matter what, the only option left now is to go to the other side of the door. Maybe there's food on that ship. The observations and preparations I had been making over the last few days should be enough to keep me alive on this ship, even though the preparations I could make there were very limited. And finally, to those who come after me, if I don't return, and in the future some rescuer opens this room and sees this diary, please do not take what I wrote as a dystopian story. It really happened, kind of. It was creepy, no matter what. A man named Zhou Ming, trapped inside a crazy and strange space-time anomaly, actually existed. I did my best to describe the anomalies I saw in this journal and record all the efforts I made to get out of this trap. So if anyone after me sees this, please at least remember my name and remember that I wrote this diary. Zhou Ming closed the diary, threw the pen into the pencil case lying next to him, and slowly stood up from the table. It was time to leave before he completely despaired. But after a brief thought, he did not go straight to the only door leading to the outside world but headed towards his bed. He must be ready to meet a foreign land outside the door, and his state of mind, especially his mental state, left much to be desired. Zhou Ming didn't know if he could sleep, but even if he just went to bed, it would be better than going to the next world in a state of mental exhaustion. Eight hours later, Zhou Ming opened his eyes. A chaotic fog still floated outside the window, making it impossible to understand whether it was day or night. Zhou Ming ignored the situation outside the window. He took food from his few supplies and ate until he was 80% full, and then walked to the mirror in the corner of the room. The man in the mirror still had disheveled hair. He looked rather pitiful, as if he had been living on the streets for a long time. Not many people would want to look at such a person, 
But Zhou Ming continued to look at himself in the mirror, as if wanting to imprint this image in his mind forever. He looked in the mirror for a few minutes and then said in a low voice, as if addressing the person on the other side, Your name is Zhou Ming. At least on this side, your name is Zhou Ming. Don't forget it. Only then did he turn around and leave. Approaching the door of the room that was too familiar to him, Zhou Ming took a deep breath and put his hand on the handle. Apart from clothes, he did not take anything extra with him, neither food nor protective equipment. This was the experience of his previous explorations. He could not bring anything through this door except himself. In fact, he felt that he had to put a question mark even over this himself because Zhou Ming turned the knob and pushed the door. An ashen-colored fog appeared before his eyes, rising and falling like some kind of curtain. In the midst of this fog, he heard the sound of sea waves pleasantly caressing his ears. After a moment of dizziness, Zhou Ming opened his eyes and saw a wide, empty wooden deck, a towering mast standing under dark clouds, and tiny waves on the sea, the edge of which he could not see. Zhou Ming bowed his head and saw a body that was much stronger than he remembered, a captain's uniform that looked exquisite and expensive, but was made in a style completely unfamiliar to him, a pair of large, bony hands, and a classically elegant black pistol in his hand. Yes, now he wasn't even sure if it was him. It wasn't the first time Zhou Ming walked through this door to the other side. Ever since he woke up a few days ago and found himself locked in his room with some strange phenomenon, with a strange fog obscuring the entire world. And then he discovered this strange place on the other side of the door. After all, this door served as the only exit from the room. He remembers the bewilderment and confusion he felt when he first pushed the door open and saw the deck outside. The shock and panic when he first looked down and saw how his body had changed. He had explored this side several times since then, and now, although he was still not sure what had happened to him, or what the strange ship was that had appeared outside his room, he had at least gained some experience and had a basic understanding of ship. As in previous cases, Zhou Ming waited until the severe dizziness caused by passing through the door passed, and then taking the first opportunity, he examined the short pistol in his hand, matching all the details from memory, and finally making sure that it had the same objects on it. Same as the last time he left the deck. It seems like I'm seamlessly switching to that body every time I walk through that door. If only I could place a camera on that side of the deck. Then I could check if this body changes when I open the door to the captain's cabin and return to my flat room. Unfortunately, objects from both worlds cannot pass through the door, and I cannot take a camera here. But the phone was able to record the view from there as through the door, and I walked through it myself, so my body actually changed into this shape when I walked through the door. Zhou Ming muttered. He knew he might look a little funny to outsiders standing on the deck talking to himself, but he had to make some noise. He needed some proof that he was still alive on this empty, creepy ghost ship. A sea breeze swept across the deck, rustling the black and blue captain's uniform made of an unknown material. Zhou Ming sighed softly, but instead of walking towards the deck, he turned and looked at the door behind him. Then he put his hand on the door handle. Turning the handle and then pushing the door inside, he would see a thick gray-black fog through which he would return to his bachelor apartment where he lived for many years. Gripping the handle tightly, he pulled the door towards him. The heavy oak door creaked, revealing a dimly lit cabin, on the walls of which hung beautiful tapestries, shelves with many decorative objects, a wide table in the center of the room, and a small door in the back of the room with a burgundy carpet in front of her. By opening this door from this side, he will return to his bachelor apartment. Opening it from the other side, he will find himself in the captain's cabin which is clearly a normal room on this ship. He entered the captain's cabin and glanced to the left. On the wall next to him hung a mirror one man's height, and it clearly reflected what Zhou Ming looked like now. He was a tall man with thick black hair, a majestic short beard and deep-set eyes, whose very appearance seemed to give him an aura of raw power. He looked to be over forty, but his heroic appearance and extremely depressing eyes made him look younger, and his well-tailored captain's uniform added a special charm to him. Zhou Ming moved his neck and made a face at the mirror. He considered himself an easygoing, friendly person, and the image in the mirror did not at all match his temperament, but he soon abandoned this attempt, because instead of looking friendly, he felt that he was making a majestic captain turned into a psychopathic serial killer. While Zhou Ming was performing these actions, a slight click was heard from the side of the table, and he, not at all surprised, looked in the direction where the sound came from, and saw that a wooden figurine in the form of a goat's head was installed on this table, turned slightly to face him the inanimate piece of wood seemed to come to life at that moment. A pair of obsidian eyes set into a wooden face silently looked in his direction. Panic memories of the first time he saw this strange scene flashed through his mind, but the corners of Zhou Ming's lips only twitched slightly as he stepped towards the sea table. The wooden figurine in the form of a goat's head on the table in response to his actions 
slightly turned its neck, and a hoarse, gloomy voice came from its wooden recess. Name? Duncan, Zhou Ming said calmly. Duncan Ebnamar. The wooden goat's head's voice instantly turned from hoarse and gloomy to warm and friendly. Good morning, Captain. Glad to see you remember your name. How are you feeling today? How is your health? Did you sleep well last night? I hope you have wonderful dreams. Besides, today is a great day for sailing. The sea is calm, the wind is fair, cool and comfortable, and there are no annoying fleet or noisy crew members. And you yourself know how the crew members make noise, Captain. You make quite a lot of noise yourself. Even though this was not the first time he had to deal with the creepy goat head, Zhou Ming still felt a shiver running down his spine. He gave the figurine an almost evil look and squeezed out through his teeth. Quiet. Oh, of course, Captain, you love silence. And your faithful first mate, second mate sailor sailor observer knows this very well. There are many benefits to silence. Once a person in the field of medicine, or perhaps in the field of philosophy, or in the field of architecture, Zhou Ming now felt a shiver run not only down his back, but throughout his entire body. I mean that you are ordered to remain silent. As soon as the word order was heard, the goat head completely fell silent. Zhou Ming sighed with relief, and stepping forward, sat down at the navigation table. Now he was the captain of this empty ghost ship. Duncan Ebnamar, an unfamiliar name, an unpronounceable last name. He knew it the moment he first stepped onto the ship through the black and gray fog. He knew in his head that his name here was Duncan, that he was the master of the ship, that the ship was going on a journey much longer than he could have imagined. He knew that, but only that. The memory that remained in his mind was so vague and mixed that it consisted only of the aforementioned key passages, as if he knew that the ship had planned an amazing journey, but had no idea where it was going, and that the original owner of the ship, the real Duncan Ebnamar, seemed to have died a long, long time ago. What remained in his memory was more like the captain's strongest and deepest impressions left in the world after his death. His instincts told him that there was a big problem behind the identity of this Captain Duncan, especially with the presence of a supernatural phenomenon on this ship, a talking wooden goat head, and that his secret might even mean some kind of danger that he never imagined. But he had to bear this name in order to remain safe on this ship. After all, like the wooden head of a goat, something on this ship is always trying to identify the captain. Even the ship itself. It was reminiscent of safety measures, as if the captain of the ship could really forget his name at any moment. And if he did, something extremely terrible and dangerous would happen, which is why there were checkers throughout the ship. Zhou Ming didn't know what would happen if Captain Duncan forgot his name, but he was sure that if he mispronounced it, it would not lead to anything good. After all, even the wooden goat head on the navigation table spoke in a gloomy voice at first. But if a person was named Duncan Ebnamar, then everyone on this ship became quite welcoming. Either way, at first glance, they did not have high intelligence. Zhou Ming, perhaps he should now be called Duncan, finished his brief period of reflection and reminiscing, and then looked at the map laid out on the table. However, on the map, he did not see any identifiable routes, marks, or land, not even islands. The only thing he found on its rough, thick parchment surface was a large, wavy, grayish-white mass that, like fog, obscured the original route. And the only thing that was not obscured by the fog was the silhouette of a ship in the middle of the map. Duncan. Zhou Ming did not have much experience in sailing ships, but even someone who did not know maps would say that normal maps do not look like this. Apparently, like the wooden goat's head on the table, this map was some kind of supernatural object. Duncan just hadn't figured out how to use it yet. As if noticing that the captain's attention was finally focused on the map, the goat's head, which had been standing quietly on the table for a long time, began to move again, making clicking sounds and turning its neck in a circle. Eventually, his entire head began to move around the base. Fearing that the creature would drill through his sea table, Duncan finally couldn't help himself and glanced at it. Speak. Yes, Captain. And I will say it again. Today is a great day to sail, and the Lost House awaits your orders, as always. Shall we hoist the sails? The hard black muzzle of the wooden goat's head stared at Duncan as he sat at the navigation table, his obsidian eyes seeming to glow with an eerie light. In fact, this thing did not know how to express its emotions at all but Duncan could clearly read a certain anticipation in its wooden face. In fact, this wasn't the first time the goathead had called for him to set sail. In fact, he had done this every time Duncan had come here. It even seemed to him that the ship was constantly trying to persuade him to sail quickly in order to return to the right path as soon as possible. However, Duncan remained silent. A shadow of doubt appeared on his stately face. Lost in deep thought, he clearly realized two problems. First, he was completely alone on this insanely large ship. The total length of the ship, known as the Lost House, was estimated by Duncan to be at least 150, 200 meters. To control such a behemoth requires at least tens, if not hundreds, of experienced sailors. 
how can he swim alone? Secondly, putting aside the above-mentioned professional factors, there was another key problem standing in the way of his journey. He did not know how to swim. Duncan was a little alarmed and tried to guess what would happen if he asked the strange and noisy goat-headed man for advice about driving a ship, but after this guess he became even more alarmed. Goathead, however, had no idea what his captain was thinking and simply asked, Captain, is something bothering you? If you are worried about the condition of the lost house, then you can be sure that it is always ready to sail with you to the ends of the earth. Or are you worried that it is better not to sail today? I know a little about fortune-telling. Which fortune-telling do you believe in most? Heavenly signs, incense, crystals, whatever. Speaking of crystals, do you remember Duncan trying to keep a stone face and overcome the desire to beat the goat head in front of him? Said in a low voice, I'll go out on deck to observe the situation. Stay here just quietly, as you wish. But I must remind you that the lost house has been drifting blindly for too long. You must take control as soon as possible to return the swim to the right path, Goathead said, after which a grinding sound was heard and he finally returned to his original position. Duncan instantly felt the whole world become calmer. When the pain in his head subsided, he sighed with relief, then took the flintlock from the table, stood up, and left the captain's cabin. He found a rather old-looking flintlock rifle while exploring the ship, along with a one-handed sword that hung from his belt. These two items ensured his safety while moving around the ship. During his explorations over the past few days, he had spent a lot of time learning roughly how to use both, although he had never seen any living creatures on the ship until now. Except yourself. Talking objects were not counted. Duncan climbed onto the deck near the captain's cabin and was again hit by a light sea breeze. Duncan tried to calm his irritated mind and looked up at the sky. The sky was still obscured by thick, dark clouds. Among them, Duncan saw neither the sun, nor the moon, nor the stars. Only the dim, heavenly light enveloped the endless sea. It had been like this for a long time, in fact. From the day Duncan got on the ship, he had only seen such a sky. It even made him wonder if normal weather even existed in this world. Or does such a sky exist here forever? Duncan turned and saw the door to the captain's cabin standing silently in front of him. On the beam above the door was a line written in some letters unfamiliar to him, but when he fixed his gaze on it, its meaning clearly appeared in his mind. The Gate of the Lost House. Gate of the Lost House. Lost House? Duncan muttered to himself and then grinned. A good name for a ship. He then walked around the captain's cabin and up the stairs at the edge to the upper deck at the rear of the ship. There was a wooden platform that provided the best view of the entire ship, with the exception of the observation deck. The massive black helm waited silently for the captain. Duncan frowned. For some reason he suddenly felt a sense of impatience and excitement that seemed to come out of nowhere as soon as he saw the helm. He had never experienced this in the few times he had been here before. As if in response to this concern, a wind suddenly rushed across the deck from nowhere. Sea waves beat against the side of the ship, but neither they nor the wind could damage the huge lost house. What's happening? Duncan thought alarmedly, and the next second he looked towards the bow of the ship. On the sea, right in front of the lost house, between the sky and the waves, an endless high wall of white fog appeared out of nowhere, which seemed to prop up the sky, causing Duncan's eyes to immediately widen. What alarmed Dong, Zhou Ming. Even more than its size was that this wall reminded him of the endless fog outside the window of his bachelor apartment. The lost house was heading straight towards this wall of fog. Duncan did not know what kind of fog it was or what was hidden in its depths, but he instinctively sensed great danger. His survival instinct told him that being swallowed up by this thick fog was not a pleasant experience. Subconsciously, he rushed to the platform where the helm was located, and at the same time, a huge feeling of powerlessness washed over him. Even being at the helm, how could he single-handedly lead this huge ship away from the wall of fog? But he still instinctively approached the helm, and almost immediately heard a hoarse, guttural voice coming from a copper pipe connected to the captain's cabin next to the helm. It was a goat-headed man, but this time there was panic in his voice. Captain, the border has collapsed. We are approaching the edge of reality. Please adjust the ship's course immediately. Hearing the panicked voice of the goat head, Duncan almost cursed. It's easy to say, adjust course. But then conjure me 180 good assistants who can control this thing. Immediately after that, he looked forward and saw several bare masts standing on the deck. He despaired even more. On this ship, even the masts were empty, let alone the sails. In his emotional shock, he did not even bother to seriously think about the strange words that had just escaped from the goat-headed mouth and only instincts forced him to subconsciously grab the steering wheel, which seemed to be shaking slightly in front of him for some reason. For the first time in many days he put his hands on the helm of the Lost House. The strange circumstances on the ship and the repeated persistent requests of the goathead made him doubtful, so he did not take the helm. But now there was no time to hesitate. He grabbed the helm tightly, not even thinking about how to control the huge and empty ghost ship alone.
Changes happened in the next moment. A sound similar to the roar of the sea rang out in Duncan's head. It was as if 10,000 people stood near the shore and saw off the ship, as if thousands of sailors stood on the deck and shouted the name of the captain, interspersed with a dark song and the noise of furious waves colliding with the ship. A flame appeared at the edge of his vision. Duncan subconsciously looked at his palm and saw emerald flames burst out from under the helm of the lost house and spread throughout his entire body in the blink of an eye. In the blazing flames, flesh and blood suddenly became transparent and illusory. The captain's uniform became torn and worn, as if it had been soaked in seawater for tens or hundreds of years. Beneath the suddenly ghostly flesh and blood, Duncan could even vaguely see his own bones, crystal-like bones pierced by emerald flames. However, he did not feel the slightest pain or burning heat. In the roaring flames he only felt his perception spreading in all directions. The fire rushed from the bridge, spread to the deck, to the side of the ship, to the mast. The flames intertwined like a web, rose from the deck like breath, spread along the only mast, and, finally, intertwined between the sea and the fog, forming a huge sail. The lost house set sail before the edge of reality, which was rapidly collapsing. Its flesh and bones became translucent under the influence of the flames. In the midst of the raging flames, Duncan stood at the helm of the lost house, and his feelings seemed to spread throughout the flames, eventually spreading throughout the ship. It turned out that he did not need a crew at all. The lost house could set sail, was ready for it at any moment, when only the captain was at the helm. Duncan panicked for a moment as the emerald flames rose into the air, but over the past few days of research, he had observed paranormal phenomena on this ship more than once, and this experience helped him calm down and not let go of the helm in those critical seconds. Now he was sure that the flame was some kind of force that was harmless to him, regardless of whether his body would recover after this or not. But at least now he could see that the flame was helping him control the ghost ship. The roar of joy in his head died down and Duncan's mind became clearer than ever before. The Lost House now felt like an extension of his limbs. He still did not have the knowledge and experience of a qualified captain, but at least he could control the ship. The illusory sail on the mast inflated, and at the same time numerous side sails began to adjust their angle. And although at the moment the sea was calm, the sails still inflated, as if they were filled with some invisible wind. As Duncan tried to turn the wheel, palpable responses of force arose in his head. He felt the huge ship beneath his feet finally turning, trying to escape from the endless fog ahead. However, the speed with which the ship was turning seemed insufficient. The endless fog was inexorably approaching it, and from the copper pipe at the helm came the piercing cry of Goathead. Attention! We are approaching the border of reality. We are about to fall into the spiritual world. Captain, we need... I'm doing just that, Duncan shouted, interrupting Goathead. Instead of making noise down there, think about how you can help. The Goathead fell silent for a moment, but as soon as Duncan thought that he had finally stopped, his hoarse, mournful, and even creepy cry suddenly came again from the copper pipe. Forward! 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 Duncan. At this moment, Duncan suddenly completely lost his sense of reality. He had come to terms with becoming the captain of the ship, with the supernatural power of the ship, and even with the appearance of the emerald fire. But he never could have imagined that Goathead, who had given him a creepy and dangerous feeling from the very beginning, would now do something so amazing. But the approaching fog did not give Duncan the opportunity to think. And although the lost house began to turn faster, given its size, the speed of this turn would more appropriately be called almost drift, the fog approached faster, as if deliberately chasing its prey. And soon he reached the edges of the ship. The fog spread so quickly that it almost instantly enveloped the entire space around the ship. As soon as the fog enveloped the ship, Duncan clearly sensed a strange change in his surroundings. The sky suddenly dimmed, and countless black threads suddenly appeared on the originally blue surface of the sea, turning the sea dark at a speed noticeable to the naked eye. And from the fog countless shadows appeared to Duncan. We have entered the spiritual world. The violent and creepy forward of the goat had finally stopped. His screams sounded as if from afar, mixing with a dull murmur, as if Duncan was surrounded by a mass of evil voices. But the lost house all is not lost yet. Captain, grab the helm. The lost house will be able to stay on course until it sinks into the deep, deep sea. We can still get out! If only I knew which way to steer! Duncan shouted, his voice mixed with the crackling of burning green flames, as if from hell. I've lost my sense of direction. Intuition, Captain, intuition, came the voice of Goathead from the copper pipe. Your intuition is more accurate than any marks on the maps, Duncan. A feeling of powerlessness washed over him, but Duncan no longer had the strength to argue with Goathead, and since he said that he should rely on his intuition, he will do so. Trying to follow that feeling which arose in him before the fog appeared, he firmly grabbed the steering wheel and twisted it with all his might in the direction in which he considered it necessary. 
Chilling sounds were heard from top to bottom of the lost house, and the huge ship set off across the sea, which became completely black. The wind howled, the fog swirled, and suddenly in the dim light, Duncan, out of the corner of his eye, caught something floating out of the fog. The next moment he realized that it was a ship, a white ship with a black pipe standing in the middle, which looked much smaller than the lost house. It so happened that this ship was sailing towards him. Only one thought remained in Duncan's head. Where in the spiritual world did the ship come from? He had been exploring this bizarre world for so long, but had not met a single living person. So why did a ship suddenly appear in front of him right now? And what was the likelihood of this event anyway? The wind howls, the waves rise to the skies, this endless sea releases its terrifying power to the fullest. White Oak squeezes the last energy from his steam turbine to fight death in the face of a natural force that can tear any man apart. The gray-haired captain, Lawrence Creed, stood in the wheelhouse, the solid walls and glass windows of which did not give him a sense of security. His hands gripped the wheel, and the hiss and sounds of White Oak's dying breath penetrated directly into his consciousness through the series of gears and rods behind the wheel. Through the wide window, he could clearly see the huge waves crashing against the side of the ship, but even more frightening than the waves was the strange fog over the sea in the distance, and the dark lightning bolts looming from it. The White Oak was considered the most modern steamship in the world, but even the most advanced machinery could only provide the ship with travel on normal seas. But now he and his captain are faced with the collapsing edge of reality, with a soul-piercing cold spreading from the fetid palaces of the evil gods at the bottom of the sea. Captain. The priest will not be able to hold out for long. The first mate's sorrowful cry was heard from the side, and Lawrence heard a muffled hoarse echo in this cry. He then looked forward to the bridge and saw purple-black flames rising from an incense burner set on the prayer platform, and the venerable priest in a dark blue robe, who trembled before her, scarlet blood dripping from his mouth and nose. Lawrence's heart sank. He knew that the venerable priest was still on the side of humanity, and with the last strength of his purest soul, was fighting the screams from the depths of the world. But this persistence was running out. The purple-black smoke coming from the incense burner was proof that pollution was greater than prayer. Once the priest fell, every waking mind on the ship could become a door to the deepest depths or even subspace. Captain! The first mate's voice was heard again from the side. Lawrence interrupted him with a gesture. His face at that moment was full of determination. Temporarily turn off the holy emblem we are plunging into the spiritual world. The first mate was dumbfounded. The man who spent half his life at sea could not believe his ears. Captain? Let's plunge into the spiritual world, so at least for ten minutes we will avoid the strongest wave of border destruction, and the priest will have a chance to regain his strength, Lawrence again ordered in an indisputable tone. Only this time he explained, follow my orders. The first mate opened his mouth as if he wanted to say something else, but then clenched his teeth. You are the captain. The crew began to follow the captain's orders as quickly as possible. Lawrence, who was standing at the helm himself, took a deep breath as the holy emblem in the depths of the hold began to fade. He felt that the invisible protective force field surrounding White Oak was rapidly weakening, and without this field, the ship gradually sank into the spiritual world, which was between reality and the deep, deep sea. Fog suddenly appeared around the ship out of nowhere, and the water in the sea darkened. It was dangerous, but ships returning to reality from the spirit world was not unheard of. As a member of the Society of Explorers, he had also looked through texts and various survival guides countless times, written by survivors. Could it get any worse? All he had to do was avoid the storm at the edge of the spirit world, and then use the power of modern steam turbines to make a spectacular spiritual drift. And if luck favors him, he will be able to return his crew to the human world. Then he will immediately hand over Anomaly 099 in the hold to the consul of the city-state of Prand, and for the rest of his life, he will no longer have to deal with these things. It couldn't be worse, thought Lawrence. And then he saw how a three-masted sailing ship, much larger in size than the White Oak, appeared out of nowhere in the middle of the sea, and rushed towards him with some inexorable speed along a frightening trajectory. Captain Lawrence stared forward with a wooden gaze. A huge shadow crashed into the side of the ship, and every person aboard the White Oak saw a moment they would remember for the rest of their lives. It was an ancient and impressive-looking three-masted ship. In an era when steamships were no longer considered a rarity, the sailing vessel that emerged from the thick fog was ancient, as if it had stepped out of a hundred-year-old oil painting. Its masts rose above the water like huge mountains. Its pitch-black wooden hull was engulfed in burning tongues of emerald flame. Its huge sails were filled with screaming ghostly images in the raging flames. Such scenes, perhaps, appear only in the most terrible legends about shipwrecks. We're about to collide, some of the crew shouted in alarm. Those who made their living at sea and were known for their bravery and rudeness could not help but lose their composure in the face of such a huge ship. 
Having shouted this, they rushed in all directions. Some tried to find shelter on the deck, some grabbed for anything to stay in place, and some even knelt down, and amid the impact of the mighty waves, began to pray to the goddess of storms, Gaiman, or the lord of death, Bartok. The blessings of all the gods were weakening in this endless sea. All but these two, they still looked at each of their children the same way. But not all crew members lost their composure. The ship's first mate turned his attention to his trusted captain. He knew that sailing the endless sea was a dangerous business, and that an experienced captain was always the key to the fate of the ship. And Lawrence has been sailing the sea for thirty years. The old captain, who is more than fifty years old, may not be as strong as when he was young, but maybe with his vast experience of surviving in this sea, they will be able to survive. The ship that emerged from the fog clearly did not look like an ordinary ship sailing in the real world, but rather something that appeared from the spiritual world, or a place much deeper. And if it was some kind of supernatural vision, then perhaps it could only be fought with the help of some kind of supernatural force. Seasoned captains who sailed the endless seas for many years had some experience in dealing with supernatural visions. However, the first mate saw in his captain's face only a mixture of fear and shock. The captain stood motionless and held the helm, as if not noticing that the entire ship was completely shrouded in shadow. Looking forward at the shadow of the ship approaching him, the muscles on his face tensed, and finally he muttered a few words through his teeth. But these words turned out to be colder than the bitterest frost. Is this the lost house? The ship captain? The first mate was amazed at the name that sounded in his ears. Like everyone who made a living at sea, he heard it from many older, more senior and more superstitious crew members than himself. What did you say? This is the lost house. Captain Lawrence, however, acted as if he had not heard the voice of his first mate at all. He clung to the helm of the white oak with all his might, and at the same time the overhanging hull of the lost house touched the bow of the white oak. Almost all the sailors screamed, but the expected collision did not happen. A huge ship, engulfed in emerald flames, rushed through the deck of the white oak, like a ghost of grandiose proportions, consisting of a thick hull, gloomy cabins, dimly lit corridors, flaming keels and sailors with wide-eyed sailors. They watched with horror eyes as they were about to collide with the ship, the green flames of which rushed towards them like a fiery web. Lawrence also watched as the flames rushed towards him, but much earlier he saw how it engulfed the first mate in front of him, and his entire body, flesh, blood and bones became illusory. And then he saw the priest on the prayer platform and saw how the flame, having reached him, then went out then flared up again with the same strength, as if the gods behind him with their blessings were still sheltering him from being swallowed up by the lost house. The emerald flame then reached Lawrence, and he experienced the same changes as the others. A strong feeling of weariness, resignation, and awe came over him. The sea amulet, which he had prepared in advance for protection, began to act. The sensation of alternating heat and coolness barely allowed him to maintain his sanity. In this state, he flew through the cabins and corridors of the lost house. Creepy, dull cabins with ancient wooden pillars, entangled in rotting ropes and overgrown with shells, appeared in front of him, and immediately disappeared. He saw a huge hold, where all sorts of strange things lay silently, which should have been buried at the bottom of the sea, and a luxuriously decorated cabin, in the center of which a wooden goat's head rested on a table. This head turned and looked into Lawrence's eyes indifferently. Finally, Lawrence, with the last of his strength, raised his head and saw a figure at the classic-style helm, dressed in a black and blue uniform, so majestic and terrifying, as if he was the owner of a nightmare. A figure that dominated the emerald flame, as if even the sea in the depths of the spiritual world succumbed to its greatness. Lawrence closed his eyes in submission. He knew that he was now part of the Lost House, and that the nightmare captain needed some kind of sacrifice to satisfy his endless emptiness and loneliness. But the next second, he, gathering all his courage and madness, opened his eyes again. He remembered what he had learned from books and legends, and looked with all the frankness and calm he could muster at the terrible captain standing aboard the lost house. You don't have to take everyone. Take only me, but spare my team. However, the tall man didn't answer. He just looked at him indifferently, and there seemed to be a slight curiosity in that look. He seemed to wonder why this tiny mortal captain dared to beg him for anything. Each of them has wives and children, Lawrence shouted furiously. The figure standing at the helm finally reacted. The man stared at Lawrence and seemed to want to say something, but suddenly a loud whistling sound was heard from the side. Lawrence only saw the man open his mouth and say something, but he could not make out a word. The man's answer simply disappeared amid the roar of the waves. What did you say? The wind is too strong here, I didn't hear you. The next moment, Lawrence heard a loud noise. A mixture of wind noise, sea waves, and the screams of his crew. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw how quickly the emerald flame was fading. 
and how the last part of the lost house was disappearing into the fog. Lawrence inhaled sharply, and then noticed that his hands, which had been engulfed in emerald flames moments ago, had returned to their original state, like everyone else on board. The devout priest, panting, leaned over the prayer platform and spoke the name of the storm goddess Jemona. The purple-black smoke rising from the incense burner disappeared. Now in its place was white smoke. Lawrence took a long time to catch his breath, and then he looked around in bewilderment, as if he could not believe that this nightmare was over, until the voice of the first mate was heard from the side. Captain, the ship, the lost house, has sailed. A disoriented Lawrence pondered his words for a few seconds before muttering, Did he really let us go? The first mate didn't hear him. Captain, what did you say? This Captain Duncan, Lawrence muttered subconsciously, but then suddenly hit himself in the face as if he had accidentally remembered some forbidden word, then jerked his head up and looked at the first mate. Roll call, everyone aboard. Everyone. Faster! Check who is missing from the ship! The first mate nodded and accepted the order, but as soon as he was about to leave, Lawrence called out to him, And check if anyone else has appeared on board! The first mate was confused for a moment, but then understood everything. Surprise and horror flashed in his eyes. He took a deep breath, whispered the name of the storm goddess, and then rushed to the deck. A deafening bell suddenly rang out on the white oak, still floating in the spirit world. The bell rang, followed by the hasty and panicky steps of the sailors. Lawrence remained in the wheelhouse with the second mate and the priest, who had not yet had time to catch his breath. The old captain looked out the window. The white oak was still sailing through the spiritual world. The sea beyond the ship's railings was shrouded in thick fog, and the water was still black as ink. But the storm had subsided, and the terrible ship called the Lost House had disappeared. This created an illusion that the storm, and even the collapsing boundary of reality that preceded it were caused by this ghost ship. And now, with his disappearance, all disasters were again far, far away from them. Lawrence remembered the terrible legends of the Lost House and Captain Duncan Ebnamar, of the ship that was swallowed up by the edge of reality more than a century ago, and of ships that sank in the deep, deep sea during a collision with this ship. Now they did not seem to him just stupid stories that were invented to scare children. But in any case, now that the Lost House had sailed away, and the surrounding waters had calmed down for a while, even if they were still floating in the dangerous depths of the spiritual world, but he had and his team at least had a chance to catch their breath. Next, Lawrence must determine what exactly the Lost House took from White Oak, or what it left behind. And this must be determined quickly. He did not dare to allow the ship to sail into the real world without making sure that there were no hidden dangers, since some things brought from the spiritual world could cause terrible pollution in the real one. But on the other hand, if they lingered in the real world for a long time, depths of the spiritual world, they will experience irreversible consequences. Listening to the noise coming from the deck, Lawrence suddenly raised his head and looked at the priest who was sitting in front of the incense burner. His face looked a little better compared to the past, so Lawrence asked in a very serious tone, Mr. Ron, what is our stability level now? The priest coughed twice and then took from his pocket a small compass, beautifully shaped, dotted with many nautical and sacred symbols. And after he opened the metal cover with a click, the needle on the compass immediately began to rotate rapidly, and finally stopped at a certain position. We are stuck on the surface of the spiritual world, a little closer to the real world, so the influence from the depths is very weak. The priest looked at the position of the compass needle and suddenly became slightly embarrassed. Strangely, our condition is completely stable. Even with the holy emblem disabled, we didn't dive even a meter. Hmm. Maybe that collision with the lost house knocked us onto a safe course. Lawrence shook his head with a bitter smile, trying to liven up the situation with a malicious joke. I heard that in the spiritual world, there are mysterious points of balance that can save things from the real world, from the attraction of the depths. Sir, this joke goes beyond all limits said the priest, and coughing twice more, tried to catch his breath, but it wasn't much. Helped. Hmm. In any case, what happened today needs to be reported to the church. The appearance of the Lost House is by no means a trivial matter. Over the past few decades, the church has, of course, received reports of encounters with the Lost House, but they all turned out to be just gibberish or group visions of a crew out of control. But today they actually witnessed its appearance. Goddess. You better prepare for that in the near future. After returning to Prand, you will no longer be able to sail. I understand that neither the church nor the authorities of the city-state of Prand will allow a ship that has just survived such a disaster to return to sea, for the safety of the entire crew. And I also have to report this not only to the church, the authorities of the city-state, the Explorers Guild, but also to my wife. Captain Lawrence wrinkled his forehead with displeasure and let out a long sigh, after which he waved his hand. But enough about that. You need to rest. And the ship needs the blessings of the goddess. The priest nodded carefully and soon the first mate, who had recently left, returned to the wheelhouse. 
There was quite a gathering on deck. There are very few sailors, the first mate began to report, without waiting for the captain's questions. I personally checked all the sailors gathered on deck and the mechanics remaining in the boiler room. Each of them was able to accurately pronounce the names of the gods in which they believed. Not a single person is missing. Lawrence, however, opened his eyes wide. Of course this was good news, but he couldn't believe it. What about the holy emblem? She's fine too. The first mate immediately nodded. The navigator prepares incense and essential oils and waits for your order to launch the holy emblem again. Lawrence, listening to him in disbelief, again could not resist quietly muttering. Did he really spare our ship? Luck favors us, Captain. The first mate spread his hands. We haven't lost anything. Perhaps the scary, ghostly captain was simply sailing by. Or maybe he encountered us completely by accident. Do you believe this yourself? Lawrence immediately glanced at his first mate. If luck had really favored us, we would never have encountered this. Before he could finish speaking, hurried footsteps were heard outside the door. Then someone pushed the door to the wheelhouse, and a sweaty boatswain appeared in front of Lawrence. A tall man with a frightened expression on his face. Captain! Anomaly 099 has disappeared! Silence instantly reigned in the control room. Everyone was staring at each other. But for some reason Lawrence, in this brief moment of shock, felt a sudden relief. Great. After meeting the Lost House, something really disappeared. So I was right. But then he pulled himself together and going to the door, ordered the first mate to take the helm, and the boatswain to lead him forward. Quick footsteps were heard in the corridors of the White Oak Hold, and soon the boatswain led Lawrence into the very depths of the ship. What appeared before Lawrence's eyes was perhaps the most special cabin on the entire ship. Occult symbols were engraved on the door of this cabin, and the heavy black door seemed to be made of a single piece of black iron. Mysterious symbols stretched from the edges of the door to the end of the corridor, as if forming a kind of cage to seal the contents of the cabin. Lawrence looked at the door to make sure there were no signs of damage on it or the symbols around it, and then looked up. The room with the holy emblem, where the sacred symbols were placed, was directly above the sealed cabin. These symbols ensured that the ship was protected from the effects of depth, and also served as a second insurance to maintain the airtightness of the room, which was supposed to ensure the integrity of the barrier, even when the holy emblem was turned off. But even with both barriers intact, the contents of the chamber, White Oak's most important cargo for the journey, Anomaly 099, a human coffin, disappeared. Taking a deep breath, Lawrence stepped forward and opened the door to the sealed cabin, pushing the heavy door open with force. Inside the sealed cabin, the light burned brightly, and the gas lamps hanging on four supports illuminated the center of the room almost to the smallest detail. But the cargo that should have been there had disappeared, leaving behind only a few chains and some grayish ash on the floor. The boatswain's voice came from behind Lawrence. In accordance with the requirements of sealing anomaly 099, the cabin was kept lit, and every two hours a crew member came to refasten the chains around the coffin and pour the ashes onto the floor of the room. But when the ghost ship appeared, the sailor assigned to this task failed to enter the cabin in time due to the chaotic situation. And being almost seven minutes late, he eventually discovered that Anomaly 099 had disappeared. Just seven minutes late would not have caused it to get out of control. In the best case, the seal would have weakened, and there would have been a commotion. In the worst case, the coffin would have been rushing around the cabin. The layers of seals and the sacred emblem are not here for show. Lawrence shook his head and frowned. The current situation is that she has disappeared from this ship and it has nothing to do with the crew of this ship. The boatswain asked in a nervous voice. Then you mean, this must be the lost house, Lawrence said in a hoarse voice. This captain took anomaly 099. Here he paused and sighed quietly again. Perhaps we should be grateful that the lost house always took only what it wanted, and that the captain came for anomaly 099, and not for our lives. The boatswain looked at his captain's face for a long time, and then at the empty pressurized cabin, before hesitantly asking, but how do we inform the authorities of the city-state that we have lost such an important cargo? Lawrence looked at the boatswain and patted him vigorously on the shoulder. The lost house is a natural disaster and we have marine insurance. But will the insurance company pay for it? Shut up. The blazing emerald flame gradually receded and the sea around them began to calm down. Having received confirmation from Goathead that the lost house had left dangerous waters and was now ready to sail on its own, Duncan removed his hands from the blackened helm and looked down at his flesh and blood body and at the deck which had regained its original appearance after the emerald light had gone out. Flame. But deep down, he felt that a lot had changed. He felt that something had changed the moment he took the helm of the Lost House in his hands, that the emerald flame connected him to the ship, even connected him to this sea. And although the flames had now died down, he still felt this invisible connection, felt every detail of the huge ship under his feet, 
Slowly closing his eyes, Duncan heard faint whispers coming from the deep dark corridors of the lost house. He felt an inexplicable closeness to this whisper. He saw a lit lantern in the captain's cabin, the glass lampshade of which pulsated with an eerie white light, heard the sound of waves beating against the hull of the ship, as if hidden beneath them was a deep gaze. But when he tried to find the source of this gaze, he disappeared as if deliberately. Duncan's eyes opened, he exhaled softly, and the foggy sails on the mast of the lost house inflated. He approached the stairs leading to the deck, next to which ropes swayed in different directions, disturbed by the blowing wind. Then it dawned on him. Having decided to take the helm in his own hands, he became a real captain of the ship. Captain, we are rising from the edge of the spiritual world and will soon return to the real one. Goathead's voice came from the side, but this time not through the copper pipe used for communication on the ship, but directly in Duncan's mind. And he seemed much more serious and less worried when it came to business. We were lucky. At the very depths of the spiritual world we only swayed a little, so we were almost unharmed. The real world, the seas of the spiritual world, the ethereal depths and the subspace that seemed even deeper. These strange words floated up in Duncan's head one after another, words that he knew pointed to the essence of this bizarre world, but he still did not know what they really mean. However, listening to Goathead's voice as he addressed him as captain, Duncan vaguely felt that some subtle change had occurred in his tone. He even thought that if right now he called himself not Duncan Ebnemar, but Zhou Ming, then Goathead would still obey his orders. And this change occurred after he took control of the ship and successfully recovered from the Emerald Flame. But after several seconds of hesitation, he did not dare to do this, did not ask Goathead about the spiritual world, the abyss and subspace. He would have made a different decision if it had been a few days ago, when he was in a constant state of anxiety and worry, and desperately trying to clarify what had happened to him. But now he seemed to be in no hurry. This world, the existence of other people, other ships, an orderly society, other civilizations, gave him a lot of hope for the future and a vague idea of U-200 Baj U-200B plans for the future. In the midst of his thoughts, Duncan recalled the details of the meeting with the ship that suddenly appeared from the thick fog. A smoke, black pipe, and amazing mechanical structures that appeared right in his mind when the ship crossed the path of the Lost House. It was a ship with a mechanical engine, while the Lost House looks like a sailing battleship from a bygone era, Duncan muttered to himself. But it was not exactly a ship with a mechanical engine. On this ship he saw cabins of an unknown purpose, which were furnished as if it were some kind of place of sacrifice, and on the keel of the ship there were many strange patterns and symbols, similar to decorative ones, but there were many of them more than would normally be required. Goathead, Duncan suddenly spoke. Not knowing Goathead's name, he subconsciously said the name. When we just crossed paths with that ship, a man who looked like the captain shouted something. What exactly? The Goathead didn't seem to pay any attention to what the captain called him. He readily accepted it and immediately answered. The wind and waves were too strong for me to hear him. You didn't hear either? Duncan frowned. It seemed to me that at that moment he looked so dejected as if he was ready to die with me, and what he shouted could be something very important. Wanting to die with you is a normal human reaction, especially among sailors at sea. And you shouldn't worry about it. And the screams of those ants trying to shake the tree is even less of a concern for you. Goathead's answer seemed reasonable, but Duncan, who was climbing the stairs to the deck, almost swayed on his feet and twitched his lips in shock. Wanting to die with me is a normal human reaction. As soon as he said this, he felt a little uneasy because it seemed to reveal a flaw in his personality as a captain, a lack of self-awareness. Perhaps because the emerald flame had overdone it, or perhaps the feeling of oneness with the lost house had lowered its guard. Either way, it made Duncan a little nervous for a moment, but Goathead didn't seem to notice. It's only natural that they should be afraid of you. Goathead sounded as if he was even a little proud of himself. Anyone who sails the endless sea must fear you as much as they fear the old gods and the shadows in subspace. And by the way, speaking of shadows, you knew how the brilliant engineer, or perhaps the scientist or gourmet Duncan once said wisely, did not raise this topic, because he was afraid that he would not be able to leave here if the conversation continued. More importantly, of course, that he really did not want to talk to Goathead for long, since the intensity of his chatter increased exponentially as soon as someone answered him. And the next moment he was distracted by something on the deck. What the hell is this? Duncan stood on the edge of the deck and looked in horror at something in the doorway of the captain's cabin. It was a wooden box, the length of an ordinary person, and it was made to last. The planks of unknown, dark-colored wood were tightly nailed together and reinforced with what appeared to be gold-like metal, and along the edges were intricate designs that looked like words or hieroglyphic symbols after deliberate distortion. This box was in no way an item from the Lost House. Duncan hadn't seen it before when he left the captain's cabin. The goat head fell silent for a moment, and then said thoughtfully, I don't recognize this object, but it looks like it's a trophy trophy. 
Duncan thought without answering a word. Then he walked around the box twice and said, This thing looks like a coffin, but it's much more beautiful than a regular coffin. Wait, a trophy? You mean this thing came from that ship? That is, he was taken from that ship. Good hunting, Captain, Goathead said in a rather serious tone, interspersing his words with compliments. You always return from every voyage with rich booty, the usual thing. Duncan opened his mouth, subconsciously thinking that he was not going to take anything from that ship. And what kind of hunt and rich prey was this? But if you think about it, he was afraid that these words would not correspond to his image of the captain. And most importantly, that ship had already disappeared into the fog. And remembering the look of the captain of that ship who was going to die with him, he realized that he would not be able to calmly return this box back. So he kept those words to himself. He stood in front of the magnificent coffin-like wooden box and noticed that the lid seemed to be loose enough to be opened with one hand. After a moment's hesitation, he put his hand on the lid. At least he wanted to figure out what he had received during his walk in the spiritual world. His body was stronger than he thought, and the lid was not as heavy as he expected, so almost without any effort, the dark-looking lid lifted. Stunned, Duncan looked inside the box. Human? In the wooden box lay a beautiful girl. Long silver-white hair scattered like mercury inside the box. Her refined and flawless features were at the same time noble and sublime. She was dressed in a magnificent purple and black court dress, her hands folded in front of her as if she were in a deep sleep. Perfect appearance, as if she were a doll. Upon closer, detailed examination, Duncan suddenly noticed the inhuman structure of the girl's joints. A doll. A doll so delicate and lifelike that Duncan could hardly understand it at first glance. She lay motionless in this magnificently decorated wooden box, like a noble lady sleeping in a coffin waiting for someone to wake her from a long sleep. And Duncan really thought that in the next second the girl would wake up, but it was only an illusion. The figure lay motionless in the box, not reacting in any way to the surrounding situation. Duncan watched this bizarre thing warily and warily. There was nothing strange about the doll in itself, but its almost lifelike appearance and the coffin-like wooden box made him instinctively feel a sense of danger. And then he thought about the box again. The fact that he somehow showed up on the Lost House convinced him that he had a reason to be so vigilant. After watching for a long time, Duncan felt relieved that the magnificent gothic figure in the box had not yet suddenly jumped up and taken him by surprise. Then he frowned and asked Goathead, What do you think it is? This must be an important cargo that accompanied that ship, Goathead answered immediately. Although he had previously stated that he did not recognize the strange wooden box that suddenly appeared on the deck, he clearly had more experience in maritime affairs than Duncan, the false captain. On the outside of the box there are symbols indicating gods, and around there are pins holding chains in place, which may indicate that the box was once in a sealed state. Transporting sealed items across a vast sea is risky business, meaning this ship seems to be something. Sealed? Duncan's eyelids subconsciously fluttered, after which he looked at the open lid of the box. When the box appeared on the Lost House, its lid was almost open, so he could easily push it open. And even though he didn't know anything about seals or anything like that, he knew that the seal on this thing didn't work. So this thing is a dangerous item? Dangerous for fragile, ordinary people. But I don't think it will pose much of a threat to you. Such anomalies, which can be sealed by someone using special equipment, cannot withstand the power of Captain Duncan. Duncan was silent, his expression hardened, and different thoughts were spinning in his head. Goathead's compliment sounded flattering. He could believe it if he really was Captain Duncan, but he was not. So he was seized with panic because from the words of the goathead it became clear that this doll in the coffin is dangerous. She posed no threat only to the real captain. Even though he now bore the name of Captain Duncan, and even seemed to have taken over his body and possessed some power, Zhou Ming was quite aware of his capabilities. He did not think that only the captain's body would make him the same as the real Captain Duncan. He knew too little about this world, about the ship and even about his own body. He also noticed a new and strange word in the words of the goathead, anomaly. The word anomaly sounded like an ordinary word, but the accent with which Goathead pronounced it made him vaguely aware that this word had a special meaning in this world. Perhaps the word anomaly in this world meant not only unusual, but also referred to a certain type of thing, for example, to the doll lying in the coffin. Unfortunately, he does not have sufficient grounds to ask about such things, which here are common sense. After complaining about the need for careful collection of information and accumulation of knowledge, Duncan frowned and took one last look at the doll as if he had made some kind of decision. I must throw it back into the sea. There was a note of doubt in his voice, especially when he looked at the figure again. Not because of its beauty, but because it so resembled a living person sleeping in a coffin, that the thought of throwing it back into the sea seemed to him wild, as if he were throwing a living person overboard. 
but these hesitations ultimately only strengthened his resolve. After all, he had long known that there were many strange and bizarre things in this world, although so far he had only encountered one ship, the Lost House, on which he saw a talking goat head, a mass that rose by themselves, lights that never went out, a strange and dangerous sea, a terrifying spiritual world, and an endless sea fog. But in this strange sea, he collided with a mechanical ship carrying a sealed item, and the item he transported strangely ended up on the deck of the Lost House. Being a reasonable and cautious person, he couldn't leave something with such a potentially strange and dangerous power around just because it looked nice. Duncan, determined to return the lid to the coffin, found nails and a hammer in one of the cabins and carefully hammered several nails into the coffin lid. Finally, he pushed the coffin with the doll to the edge of the deck. Then the voice of Goathead sounded in his ears. You can do whatever you want with your prey, but with all respect and humility I suggest you not be so careful. No new loot has appeared on the Lost House for a long time. Shut up. Duncan snapped briefly. The goat head fell silent, and Duncan kicked the coffin hard, sending it straight into the sea. The heavy box, having passed over the edge of the deck, plopped into the sea, which by this time had returned to its normal color, and then emerged back and began to drift from the stern of the lost house. Duncan watched the box float away for a moment, relieved to realize that it was completely hidden behind the waves, and then he looked up and saw that the fog had cleared, and a blue sea was splashing around the lost house. The ship left the spirit world and returned to reality. Nearby, he saw no sign of the mechanical ship that briefly crossed paths with the lost house in the spirit world. Duncan frowned slightly and calculated the time that had passed since their meeting and the speed of each ship. Based on his calculations and current sea conditions, that ship should not have disappeared from his sight so quickly. Is it also because of this strange sea? Or is it connected with the so-called swimming in the spiritual world? Duncan thought. But soon something else caught his attention. He saw a sudden glimmer of golden light from the depths of the overcast clouds that never cleared over the vast sea. When the bright golden sunlight spilled over the sea, the heavy curtain of clouds dissipated, as if swept away by an invisible hand, and the sea, cloudy for so long, was illuminated by sunlight. Duncan stood on the bow of the lost house, looking wide-eyed at the dispersing clouds, and for a moment felt a sudden, inexplicable excitement. Since he learned of the existence of this side many days ago, since he first explored the strange ship, the sky had almost never ceased to be obscured by clouds, because of which he had already begun to think that there was no sunlight in this world. He had been away from the sun for so long. Even in Zhou Ming's bachelor apartment, the thick fog outside the window had long blocked the sun. But now the sky over the endless sea has cleared. After a long absence of the sun, he had the feeling that he would finally see the sun on this side. Duncan subconsciously took a deep breath and opened his arms towards the sunlight. And as if in response, the heavy clouds quickly dissipated and disappeared, as if they had never existed at all. And then a huge sphere appeared before Duncan's eyes, shrouded in numerous distorted golden streams of light. The moment he opened his arms towards the sunlight, an expression of confusion appeared on his face. He looked intently at the sky. The sun was dazzling, but nowhere near as dazzling as he remembered it. He could clearly see the thing hanging in the sky, its spherical shell that seemed to have many dense patterns on it, streams of bright light pouring around it, and two circular structures slowly rotating in concentric circles around the central sphere against the backdrop of intertwining streams of light. Duncan's eyes narrowed as he dimly discerned that the two circles seemed to be connected by a myriad of intricate runes, as if some higher power had drawn an eternal shackle between the heavens, trapping the sun in the sky. Duncan couldn't accept the sunlight he craved so much. There was no sunlight in this world. What is this? He whispered in a quiet, cold voice. This is, of course, the sun, Captain. Goathead's voice was calmer than ever. Blinding sun. If this luminous object high in the sky was indeed the sun, then its sunlight was truly dazzling. Duncan did not know how long he looked at the sky, but very soon his eyes began to hurt unbearably and were swollen, and he finally looked away from the clouds, but the image of the sun was already imprinted in his eyes and the depths of his consciousness, and even with his eyes closed he could still clearly remember its appearance, a pale golden sphere and concentric rings rotating around it. The sun wasn't like that, or rather the sun shouldn't have been like that. In the world he knew, even under a foreign sky, a star high in the sky didn't look like that. But now he had to accept the truth. He was in an alien world, more distant than he could have imagined. Even the sun took on a shape he couldn't understand. Duncan subconsciously glanced back at the door in front of the captain's cabin. Pushing the door inside, he could return to the room he had lived in for many years, his bachelor pad. But outside this room, a thick fog had long shrouded the world, and all that was left of the house he knew was, in a sense, the last thirty square meters of his apartment. The house that seemed so easy to return to by opening the door was in fact just another ship on a lonely sea. 
After a long silence, the goathead's voice suddenly sounded in Duncan's ears. Captain, where are we sailing next? Do you have any plans? A sailing plan? Duncan thought. No matter how much he wanted to immediately develop a well-thought-out plan for exploring this world and begin the next journey, he did not even have a normal map at hand. Not to mention information about what cities there are in this world, what forces there are here and whether this vast the end of the sea. He only learned to control the ship a few hours ago. Nevertheless, he thought about it and after a few minutes mentally said, Where did the ship come from that collided with the Lost House? Do you want to go to city-states? Goathead was surprised and then added discouragedly, I would advise you to stay away from the sea routes controlled by these city-states, at least for now. Even if you are the great Captain Duncan, the Lost House is not in the same state as it was then, and the garrison fleet and church guards of these city-states will surely fight to the last to repel your attack. Duncan was speechless for a moment. He suddenly wanted to know what Captain Duncan, whom he replaced, had done to deserve such hatred. And thanks to the euphemism of Goathead's words, Duncan also realized that the Lost House and its captain were not in such good shape as usual. Maybe the reason. The reason why the ghost captain and his ship were in the middle of the ocean was that they were afraid to return to the ports of the civilized world. In other words, his journey to the ends of the world is an exile. Duncan was a little upset. He desperately needed to find a way to understand this world, to find a way to establish contact with the civilized society of this world. Whether it was long-term survival in this world, or solving the mystery and returning to the homeland that he knew so well, he could not continue to wander aimlessly across the endless sea. The only problem was that the civilized society of this world didn't seem to think so. The locals perceive Captain Duncan as a world boss who is roaming outside the main city, and as soon as he comes into view, they immediately assemble a group of 25 people to drive him out. The only source of information he has here is Goathead, but at this stage he did not dare to ask him about everything. But again, why wasn't there even a book on this huge ship? A long, lonely voyage is an extremely stressful situation for those who live at sea, and a person must surely have some means of relieving it. Captain Duncan couldn't be illiterate, could he? You know, being a captain is a technical job that requires a high level of knowledge. Even the roughest and wildest pirates at least have a captain who can read maps, calculate routes, and understand astrology. He was tormented by doubts, so Duncan asked, carefully, as casually as possible, and Goathead answered without hesitation. Books? Reading books at sea is dangerous. The depths in subspace lie in wait for the mortal mind every moment, and the only safe books are the classics published by the church, but they are quite boring. She just needs to wash the deck. But you've never been interested in the church, have you? Duncan's right eyebrow immediately shot up. Why can reading a book at sea be life-threatening? And can you calmly read only classics published by the church? What kind of disease existed in this endless sea? He felt as if he had gained a little more knowledge about this world, but with it came new doubts that Duncan had to push to the back of his mind. He walked to the end of the ship and looked at the vast expanse of water and sky in the distance. The golden sun shed thousands of rays, reflecting on the sea in waves of thin gold foil. A beautiful sight, if you do not pay attention to the eerie appearance of the sun. I would like to hear your advice, Duncan finally said cautiously, turning to Goathead. I was a little tired from this aimless journey, and perhaps before he had time to say this, a strange feeling suddenly washed over him, a feeling that came from his connection with the Lost House, as if something alien had appeared on the ship. The next moment, he heard a knock from the stern, as if something heavy had hit the deck. Frowning, Duncan took a loaded flintlock gun from his belt, and with his other hand took out a one-handed sword, and quickly ran in the direction of the sound. A few moments later he found himself at the stern, and what he saw stunned him. It was an ornate wooden box, shaped like a coffin, and an eerie figure. Duncan was overcome with an eerie feeling. He stared at the still wet surface of the chest, as if in the next second it would suddenly open, and then he noticed that the nails he had hammered into the lid had disappeared. He hammered them in before throwing the chest into the sea. After several minutes of vigilant contemplation of the box, Duncan finally made up his mind, and clutching the flintlock with one hand, and poking the long sword into the crack in the lid with the other, he opened it. The ornate lid creaked open. Inside, a lifeless gothic figure lay silent, surrounded by red velvet lining like a sleeping princess. Duncan stared at the figure for several seconds, and then in a quiet, stern voice, he believed that he was showing enough severity for the moment, said, if you are alive, then rise up and talk to me. He repeated his words, but the figure remained motionless. Duncan frowned and finally said indifferently, Very well, then I'll have to throw you back overboard. After that, without hesitation, he put the lid back in place. Then he brought his tools and drove some nails across the box. And after driving the nails, he found a chain, and using the pins on the box, secured the lid. After all this, Duncan stood up, clapped his hands with satisfaction and nodded slightly. 
This time you won't be able to lift it. With that, he, without thinking, pushed the coffin back into the sea, watching the box sink into the water, then rise and be carried away. Duncan breathed a sigh of relief, and then turned to leave the stern. But moving back a little, he sharply turned his head and looked again in the direction where the box had floated. The box was still floating on the surface of the sea. Duncan nodded, turned his head and continued walking away, and then suddenly turned around again. The box was still floating on the surface and had already floated far, far away. Maybe I should put a cannonball in him or something to make him drown, Duncan muttered before turning and slowly walking towards the captain's quarters. You were a little harsh on this lady. The goathead's voice sounded in his head. Shut up. Are you calling the damned doll a lady? Yes, she looks like a cursed doll. But what curse in the boundless sea can compare with the lost house and the great Captain Duncan? Captain, in fact, this lady is quite gentle and harmless, Duncan. Why is this goathead so proud when he talks about the curse and notoriety of the lost house and Captain Duncan? Perhaps sensing Duncan's bad mood in the ensuing silence, Goathead immediately changed the subject. Captain, you said earlier that you wanted to hear my advice. In particular, we'll talk about this later. Now I need to rest a little. Sailing through the lost land in the spirit world drained my energy prematurely. And from now on you must remain silent for the rest of the day. Yes, Captain. The Goathead fell silent, and Duncan returned to the captain's cabin, where he walked up to the table and casually ran his eyes over the cards. The next second... His gaze suddenly froze. It seemed that there were subtle changes on the map. The gray-white spots that covered the entire map, wriggling as if alive, became slightly smaller, and the sea around the lost house acquired more distinct outlines. This thing updates the surrounding waters in real time while the lost house floats? Duncan immediately walked over to the table and focused on the subtle changes on the map, but his concentration was soon interrupted. In the back of his mind, the lost house again signaled foreign object contact, and immediately after that, Duncan heard a knock on the deck behind the captain's cabin. The coffin returned. At the stern of the lost house, Duncan looked with an indifferent gaze at the richly decorated wooden box lying in front of him. Drops of water flowed from the edges of the box to his feet, confirming that his memory of throwing the box overboard was not a lie, and that the box had indeed floated in the sea not long ago. The situation was so terrible that it sent chills down my spine, but for some reason Duncan was much calmer than he could have imagined, perhaps because he was on board this already bizarre ghost ship perhaps because he had recently experienced an exciting walk in the spirit world in a collision with another ship, or perhaps because for several days he had to deal with someone equally whimsical goat head. Duncan seemed to have become somewhat immune to the bizarre paranormal phenomena of this world. In fact, the last time he threw this damn doll overboard, he had a vague suspicion that everything would not end so easily. He looked down and, unsurprisingly, discovered that the nails and chains with which he had secured the coffin lid were gone. Then he bent down, and with the help of his sword, tore her from the coffin again. The magnificent gothic figure still lay motionless in the center of the red velvet lining, her hands folded in calm grace. But this time Duncan clearly noticed that the corners of her skirt were wet, and a slight smell of the sea emanated from inside the lid. So far, the eerie figure had not seemed to do anything unusual or dangerous other than return again and again, but the fact that it had returned was a standard sign of a cursed object. Duncan looked at the figure indifferently for a minute, and then suddenly broke the silence with a smile. I suddenly wanted to satisfy my curiosity. With these words, he turned and walked to the exit of the cabin located nearby, leaving the doll on the deck. Personally, he was wary of her and didn't want to leave her with him, but knowing the lost house and goathead, he knew that leaving her on deck for a while wouldn't be much of a problem. And that, even if she starts to rage, the number of living creatures on the ship will be enough to cope with her. In the meantime, he had to prepare. Duncan crossed the stern, opened the wooden door to the lower deck, stepped onto the wooden staircase, which was already unknown how many years old, went to the cabin on the lower deck, and ended up in the cabin where the guns of outdated models were stored. The guns lay silent on either side of the cabin, moldy blackened planks covering the firing holes made next to them. Blackened powder kegs and massive iron balls of shells lay between the gun positions as if they had been accumulated over the course of a century. Duncan glanced at these obsolete objects, and one thought suddenly occurred to him. He did not see a single human figure on the ship except himself. So who controlled these guns? Could it be that the weapon, like the lost house itself, can charge and fire itself? What about the fresh water tanks on board? Do they also replenish their supplies themselves? What about damaged areas? Do they repair themselves too? Is there such a thing as damage on this ship? A variety of questions crossed his mind, but he could not find an explanation for them. Duncan was well aware that he knew very little about the ship, although he had explored it to some extent over the past few days. He was only able to get a general idea of the upper levels of the structure. 
the deeper areas being much more bizarre and frightening than the upper ones. This coupled with the fact that he was hoping to leave his bachelor pad and return to the normal world on Earth rather than focusing primarily on the Lost House, did not give him much incentive to move in that direction. But now he suddenly began to show more curiosity about the ship, or a greater sense of control. It was his ship now, and he deserved to know everything about the Lost House. Or maybe this change was due to the fact that he grabbed the helm that time. Duncan shook his head, and put his plans for further exploration to the back of his mind, and then headed towards the place where the shells lay. A few moments later, clutching his holding several cast-iron cannonballs, Duncan returned to the stern. As he expected, the damned figure was still lying in its wooden box. Did she make any movements while I was away? Not at all, the goathead's voice immediately rang out. The lady is as calm as she looks. You should trust my judgment that she is gentle and harmless to you. And since she returned to the ship three times, this possibly means that she and her coffin are somehow connected to the lost house. As the great gardener once used to say, shut up. Duncan looked indifferently at the doll lying in the coffin. It remained unknown whether she was truly unable to move or was still pretending to be asleep. Either way, Duncan didn't care. He must satisfy his curiosity. The massive cast iron ball was unusually heavy. When executing traitors on a ship, tying one of these balls would be enough to bury even the most experienced sailor. Duncan put four balls in the coffin, and then returned to the cabin, and brought four more. The eight balls filled almost all the remaining space in the wooden box, and the elegant gothic figure, surrounded by a circle of cannonballs, now looked less elegant. Duncan resealed the lid of the coffin, and then, with some difficulty, pushed it to the edge of the deck. Even with his current physical strength, this was not so easy. Finally, he pushed the coffin into the sea. There was a sound of falling into the water, and the magnificent wooden box sank to the bottom. Duncan stood silently on the edge of the deck and looked for a long time at the place where the wooden box fell into the water. Then the voice of the goathead was heard in his head. Captain, are you sorry? If you feel bad throwing away this trophy, the Lost House can try to use the anchor to get this box again. Although this is not a proper use of the anchor. But the anchor says he can try. Shut up. But I see that you have been standing on the edge of the deck for a long time. Shut up. Mmm, Duncan sighed quietly. He couldn't admit that his head was starting to pound from his conversations. So he stood on the edge of the deck, enduring pain, and at the same time trying to maintain the seriousness expected of an impressive captain. Soon the pain subsided, and he leisurely returned to the cabin with the guns. After calmly waiting a few more minutes and deciding that it was time, Duncan suddenly went to the observation window between the two guns and began to closely observe any movements at sea. The goathead couldn't resist. Captain, what are you, Duncan? Without taking his eyes off the sea, he answered. I'm curious how the hell this damn doll came back. And because she's cursed? I appreciate your non-serious attitude, but I think that even if it is a damn doll, it must somehow return to the ship. She tries to play dead, but keeps coming back to the ship, so I think there must be a reason for this and that she can communicate. But now she refuses to do this, which means I will have to find a way to catch her when she returns to the ship. After listening to Duncan's explanations, Goathead was silent for a couple of seconds, and then suddenly asked uncertainly, Captain, it seems you suddenly became interested in something. Ah, that's a good sign. You haven't been in the best of spirits since you last woke up from your sleep and have lost interest in many things, including your trusty first mate, second mate, and... Shut up. Mmm. After Goathead fell silent, Duncan continued to watch the sea. And as far as he could see, the sea was calm. It seemed that the coffin had literally sunk into the depths and would never emerge from there. But having experienced its return twice already, this time Duncan was unusually patient. He silently counted the minutes, allowing time to slowly flow forward as if he himself did not notice that he was actively waiting for the doll to return again. Then a small dark shadow appeared in his field of vision. A dark shadow in the middle of the wave caught Duncan's eyes. An elegant wooden box cutting through the surface of the sea, like a lonely boat in a storm. A beautiful gothic figure stood in the box, and clutching its magnificent lid, rode forward through the wind and waves. A gothic figure standing in a coffin swings the lid from side to side and rides the waves. Duncan was amazed. Duncan felt that he would probably never forget this image for the rest of his life. A magnificent coffin rising and falling with the waves on an eerie sea, and a gothic figure moved by mysterious forces, standing in the coffin and clutching the huge lid with his hands. And it looked like he was not pleased with this scene. It looked so sinister from any angle that for a moment Duncan didn't know whether to be surprised at first that the damn doll actually moved, or at the ease with which it rode the coffin lid. This scene was completely contrary to his original ideas. He had imagined the doll returning to the ship several times, but he had never imagined it would return like this. And in those few moments that Duncan was in a daze, the doll was already at the stern of the lost house.
As Duncan carefully poked his head out of the viewing hole, he saw the figure throw the lid into the coffin, then reach out, grab a piece of wood protruding from the stern of the ship, and begin to climb up so quickly and nimbly that it seemed as if it was being pulled up invisible rope, and the heavy-looking box soared above the sea as if it had lost its weight and floated through the air next to the figure. Duncan managed to move his head back before the figure noticed him. The figure apparently did not notice that the captain of the ghost ship was secretly watching her. She instantly climbed to the stern of the lost house, jumped onto the deck, and then waved her fingers in the air, causing the coffin floating nearby to land at her feet. Then she turned her head, as if scanning the deck, to make sure that no one was nearby, then quickly straightened her dress, which had already become wet, and began to crawl on her hands and knees towards the coffin. Halfway there, she was stopped by a pirate sword suddenly appearing from the side, followed by the click of a flintlock pistol. The doll froze in place and tried to turn her head, but saw the ghost captain, shrouded in emerald flames, standing nearby and looking at her coldly. In a cold and deep voice, as if emerging from the depths of the spiritual world, he said, Oh, I caught you, doll. As Duncan watched, the doll visibly shook, as if scared, and tried to instinctively dodge away, but due to her haste, her upper body swayed slightly, and Duncan heard a crunching click coming from her shoulders and neck, and then its head fell off. Before Duncan's eyes, the doll's head fell off, and its long silver-white hair, tousled by the sea breeze, entwined itself around the head, which rolled towards his feet. The doll's body was in the same position as at the coffin, ready to run away. One of its hands was reaching out to Duncan, but its head looked helplessly at Duncan, opening its mouth. Help, help, help. It would not be an exaggeration to say that Duncan's heart stopped beating at that moment, although he doubted that his heart still existed when it was enveloped in ghostly flames. But the sight of the doll's head falling caused him a real shock, and only a ghostly flame hid his expression at that moment. The doll regarded his momentary hesitation as a kind of indifference, and because of this, she did not even notice that the formidable Captain Duncan seemed to be more nervous than herself. She continued to repeat, Help, help. Head raise. Duncan finally reacted. He calmed his tiny heart, which at the moment existed only in his imagination, tried to control his movements and voice, and watched the figure for a while with maximum calm and composure, confirming what, despite all its strangeness, the damn doll looked like. It seemed that she was more afraid of him, the ghost captain, than of her own bizarre nature. Realizing this fact, Duncan knew that he had to remain calm. He knew nothing of this world yet, let alone this damn doll. And while he was not completely in control of the situation, his identity as Captain Duncan served as his best guarantee of safety. On the other hand, he could not leave the doll unattended. And although everything did not turn out as he initially expected, it turned out that the doll could still communicate with him. He put away the flintlock pistol and continued to hold the sword in his other hand. At close range, the flintlock pistol, which he could quickly fire only one shot, was clearly less reliable than the sword, not to mention the fact that the accuracy he practiced hastily did not make him a skilled marksman. Then, using his free hand, he lifted the head of the figure that had fallen off. It was a strange feeling. Although he knew it was just a cursed doll, the feeling of holding the head in his hands made Duncan think, and the faint warmth that came from the head almost made him want to throw it away. It's too abnormal and strange a thing, but he finally restrained these strange feelings coming from his heart and calmly looked at his head. Do you want me to put it in its place? Yes. Okay, do it yourself. Duncan nodded and casually handed the head into the doll's hands. Then he saw how these hands, with great skill and dexterity, caught his own head and also smoothly tidied up the messy silver hair, adjusted the angle and placed the head on the neck. One click, and the head was in its rightful place. The whole process went smoothly. Obviously, this was not the first time the doll had done this. Immediately after this, the frozen face of the figure moved quickly. She blinked and let out a long sigh. Phew. I'm alive. Duncan didn't know what to say. In any case, right now he wanted to make some kind of cutting joke. But after thinking about the identity of Captain Duncan and the unknown circumstances of the figure in front of him, he simply nodded with an indifferent expression on his face. Very fine. And now you will come with me. You have already boarded my ship three times. We need to talk. Having said this, he dispelled the ghostly flames that had enveloped his body and returned to his original form. He had mastered this power since he took the helm of the Lost House. But due to his recent exposure to the flame, he was still far from mastering it, let alone using it in any way. He didn't even know what else it could be used for other than to control the ship. He simply used it to create a strong image in front of the strange cursed doll and also to cheer himself up. And now that he had settled everything, the flames were only wasting his energy. The damned doll obediently rose from the coffin and was surprised to discover that Duncan had regained his human form. Are you not a ghost? Duncan gave her an indifferent look. I can be one when necessary. The doll raised one hand to support its head and awe appeared in its eyes. 
Duncan wasn't sure what it was that was causing the doll to tremble, but he was clear about one thing. Its head didn't look secure. It might even have nearly fallen off again due to the fear the doll felt. He turned in the direction of the captain's quarters and, through his real-time link to the lost house, felt the doll follow him after a brief hesitation of a second or two. As expected, the ornate and strange coffin floated next to the doll. He seemed to follow her wherever she went. A few moments later, Duncan brought the cursed doll into the captain's cabin. Under the eerie gaze of a carved wooden goat's head, the ghost captain and the cursed doll sat opposite each other at the table. Duncan in his dark chair, and the lady opposite him sat gracefully and gracefully on her box, using it as a chair. Sitting like this on a wooden box, the doll with silver hair and a long gothic dress really looked graceful and graceful, like a piece of art that should be kept in a palace, guarded by guards. Unfortunately, as soon as Duncan saw her, he remembered how this lady rode on the waves and how her head fell off. He sighed and, returning his cold, imperious gaze, looked into the doll's eyes. Name? Alice. Race? Human doll. Occupation? Doll. Why are you asking these questions? After a few seconds of thought, Duncan replied, to find out basic things. On either side of the wide table facing each other sit Duncan, the captain of the lost house, and Alice, the cursed doll. The atmosphere between them, even though neither of them may be human, is not at all warm. The doll lady, who calls herself Alice, still looks a little nervous. Although the ghost captain promised her temporary safety, even the damned doll clearly felt uncomfortable in front of Duncan's terrifying face. Now she gracefully sat on the lid of the coffin, but her fingers, quietly squeezing the hem of her skirt, betrayed her anxiety. Duncan in turn fell silent for a moment, thoughtfully watching the lady sitting in front of him. A supernatural being, powered by an unknown force, clearly not made of flesh and blood, but capable of speaking, walking, and even radiating heat. Such a creature in its homeland would probably have been shown in Approaching Science 1, and would have been shown in at least three and a half episodes. Duncan didn't know what type of creature in this world a doll like Alice belonged to, but over the past few days with Goathead, he had learned a few things in passing. For example, that although supernatural visions exist in this world, all kinds of supernatural things are not considered ordinary phenomena, and the doll lady in front of him. The doll lady in front of him, Duncan guessed, must be some kind of special creature even in this strange and unusual world. His guesses were not groundless. The powered ship that collided head-on with the Lost House was new and had a well-trained crew, and he saw firsthand how many of the sailors aboard that ship persevered despite the intense fear they felt. And inside the ship were a large number of strange compartments and objects, many of which were depicted with intricate runic symbols in a style very similar to the style of the symbols on the surface of Alice's coffin. In other words, it is very likely that the purpose of this ship was to escort or transport Alice, the cursed doll. Duncan made himself more comfortable in his seat and looked at Alice with a calm but serious look. He has an important guest on board, there is no doubt about it. But on the other hand, the doll lady didn't seem so scary. Rather, she seemed rather timid. After all, she didn't say a word when we first met, she just got scared. Sorry. Probably the long silence and Duncan's gaze put too much pressure on her. And Alice, unable to resist, spoke. Me. Where are you from? Duncan asked, finally averting his gaze. Alice thought for a moment, as if reacting to Duncan's question, and after a few seconds, she tapped her fingers on the ornate wooden box beneath her. From here, Duncan's face instantly took on a gloomy expression. I, of course, know that you were already in this box, he said, coughing twice. But I'm asking where you came from. The place, you know. Do you have a hometown, or something like what you might call a departure point? Alice thought again and openly shook her head. I don't remember. Don't remember? What is a hometown for a human doll? Alice asked, folding her hands in her lap. Most of my memories are associated with me lying in a box and being carried from place to place. Sometimes I vaguely felt that someone was walking nearby and watching me. Oh, I also remember the whispered conversations of those who were watching me. They were talking about something in a fearful and nervous voice. Duncan's eyebrows arched. What were they talking about? About boring little things. But I became curious. Duncan spoke seriously. He was sure that this was most likely just boring trifles, but now he really needed to find out everything he could about this world, even if it was the content of the wild gossip of ordinary people. Well, the word I've heard most often is Anomaly 099. I think they use it to refer to me and my wooden box, but I don't like that name. I have my own name, Alice said, remembering. Besides that, sometimes they talked about seals, curses and the like, but most of it is a blurry memory. I slept while in the box and therefore did not really listen to what was happening outside. The doll said indifferently, and then, as if suddenly remembering something, she added, But I remember something else. I must have heard this before God on your ship. The voices speaking outside the box often mentioned a place, 
the city-state of Prand, which seemed to be their target. And I suppose mine too. The city-state of Prand? Duncan thought and remembered this name. Finally, he learned another useful information, although he did not know when it would be useful to him. Then he raised his head and looked again at the doll standing in front of him. Besides this? Besides that? I spent most of my time sleeping, Captain, the lady said seriously. What else can you do when you are locked in a large box that looks like a coffin and sleepy muttering is heard around you? Squats? The corner of Duncan's lips twitched. At first glance, she was a well-groomed and elegant beauty with a dignified behavior. But in reality, she not only rode the waves, paddling with a coffin lid, but also suddenly said all sorts of nonsense. He quickly built a new image of this Lady Alice in his imagination. But outwardly maintaining the image of the calm and majestic Captain Duncan, he avoided answering and continued, So besides the fact that you slept in a wooden box, you know nothing about the outside world. And you cannot tell me how it has changed, or exactly where the ports or city-states are. I'm afraid so, Captain. The doll lady nodded with a serious face. Then her eyes widened, as if in response to a sudden thought, and she glanced rather nervously at Duncan. So you plan to throw me off the ship again? Because I'm no longer of any use? Before Duncan could say anything, Alice added, I understand. After all, it is your ship. But could you not put the colonels in the box this time? Ask. Eight cannonballs is too much. Obviously, right now, the doll was not in the best mood. But she did not dare throw a tantrum or something like that. Duncan was embarrassed, mainly because he never expected that he would have to calmly discuss this with her. As he put the cannonballs into the box, he thought of Alice only as an ordinary damned doll from a horror movie, and all the images that came to his mind were shown in these films. He could not even imagine that the damned doll would behave like damned dolls from comedies. So preparing to fight the terrible curse has now turned into an embarrassment. But Duncan is a thick-skinned man, and his majestic, grim expression seems to have been carved with a sword on his face. So he forced himself to ignore the embarrassment he felt at her words and shook his head slightly. I haven't thought about throwing you overboard yet. In the end, you can always come back. What I'm curious about is why you keep coming back. I see that in fact you are very afraid of me and this ship. If this is so, then why don't you stay away from us? Is this ship called the Lost House? Well, I'm a little afraid of you and your ship, but aren't the depths of the sea more dangerous? The doll lady silently looked at the ghost captain sitting in front of her. In her mind, behind this tall man, lay an endless void of obscurity which was superimposed on the reality of the cabin, as if two worlds were forcibly superimposed on each other. But much more than the suffocating nothingness, she was frightened by what was in the depths of the endless sea. Is there anything more frightening in this world than the depths of the sea? One Chinese documentary series about science. The deep sea is something to be feared. Alice is a human doll, but she is still able to express her feelings through soulful eyes and changes in facial expression that are difficult to explain by common sense. So Duncan could clearly see the fear and dislike of the deep sea or certain things in it in her expression. Fear and dislike of the depths of the sea or some things in them were understandable to Duncan. And when he thought about the spiritual world and the so-called edge of reality that he saw there, he could easily understand that the sea in which he was definitely hidden great and terrible secrets. However, the Lost House was sailing on a vast sea, and the mechanical ship it had encountered in the spirit world was also sailing on that sea. This could not but arouse in him curiosity about things more distant from the sea. For example, what is the earth of this world like? Or is there an ordinary earth in this world? However, the doll standing in front of him could not answer his question. Alice remembered little, and according to Duncan, this is the result of some kind of seal or suppression. He remembered what he had seen in the cabin of the other ship when he encountered it. Mysterious runes, religious symbolism, and symbols inscribed on the outside of Alice's coffin all pointed to one thing. In civilized society, she was deeply feared, like a damned doll. Duncan cast a thoughtful glance at the lady standing in front of him, who answered him with a sincere and serene look. I want to make sure once again that you definitely don't have memories of where you came from and your past. No, Alice answered seriously. I've been lying in this big box for as long as I can remember. And although I don't know why, it seems like I was always surrounded by people who, afraid that I might break out of it, sealed it in various ways. To be honest now, looking back, I suddenly thought that the circle of nails you sealed me with was quite harmless. Although later you put eight cores on me, but at least you didn't pour lead into the box, right? Duncan, however, this time did not pay attention to Alice's chatter, but continued to ask, Where did you get your name? Who gave it to you? Why do you need a name if you really never left the box and never communicated with anyone? Did you give it to yourself? Alice suddenly froze. She seemed genuinely embarrassed and froze for a good ten seconds, and Duncan was already wondering if she had a malfunction. But then the doll came to her senses again. I don't remember. 
I knew from the very beginning that my name was Alice, but I didn't give myself that name, I, she muttered in bewilderment, and her hand subconsciously reached to her head. Seeing this, Duncan hastily stopped her. Okay, forget it. If you don't remember, don't rip your head off. Alice. After that, Duncan asked the doll standing in front of him a few more questions, but, unfortunately, most of them remained unanswered. As the doll lady herself stated, she spent most of her adult life in a sleepy state in a coffin, alternately falling asleep and waking up, and knew very little about the outside world. The only thing she knew came from the conversations she heard outside the coffin while half asleep, and this little knowledge barely allowed Duncan to piece together the contours of this world. But even so, Duncan was able to establish a few things from his conversation with Alice. First, in this world there is a power structure known as the city-state, a word that was repeated several times in the doll lady's narrative and constituted almost her entire path, which was originally ended in the city-state known as Prand. The site appears to have flourished, with many sailors highlighting its important location for many shipping routes. Secondly, Alice goes by the name Anomaly 099, which apparently is some kind of official name in the civilized world. But as for her own name, Alice, it seems that no one except herself and Duncan knows it. Finally, Alice was being transported from one city-state to another, and she did not appear to be the only anomaly being moved in this manner, as she had heard those in charge of her escort mention the words, other sealed rooms in conversation during some of her travels. From this, Duncan hazarded the possibility that perhaps constantly moving the anomaly was a necessary means of sealing it away and preventing it from escaping. Apparently, the team responsible for transporting Anomaly 099 was out of luck, and due to the lost house appearing out of nowhere, they escaped. Duncan couldn't understand what was so scary about this strange damned doll and what harm it could cause if it got out of the box. After all, she seems quite harmless now. To be honest, Duncan was quite disappointed. He thought that he had finally found a source of information that would help him understand this world. But he did not expect that the girl lying in the coffin would be the same ignorant of this world. Just like him. But this disappointment faded slightly when he glanced again at Alice, who was still sitting calmly on the wooden box. At least now he had someone to talk to on the Lost House. Although she was a doll, although she looked very creepy when her head fell off, although she definitely harbored many secrets, although she sometimes talked all sorts of nonsense, Duncan still considered her more normal than Goathead. And speaking of the creepy and dangerous of this sprawling sea, the lost house, do the strange and incomprehensible things on the ship look safe? Even from the point of view of an outside observer, he, Captain Duncan, seems to be the most dangerous in this vast sea. Duncan exhaled, his expression unconsciously softening, and he asked casually, I wonder what you would do if I threw you overboard again. Alice blinked. Cannonballs this time? No. Will you nail the lid? Uh, no. Will you pour lead into the box? No, ahem, I mean, if I refuse to let you stay on board, then I'll row here again. Alice answered seriously, sitting modestly on the box. I don't want to be swallowed up by this sea, but at least I'll be safe on your ship. Duncan was so shocked by the doll's frankness that for a moment he didn't know whether to call it honest or sassy. After a few seconds of thought, he said, You could be more polite. You already know the answer anyway, right? Alice smiled. But if I return, then most likely I will find a way to hide from you in one of the cabins and will not thoughtlessly go out on deck. A little time has passed since my awakening, and last time I didn't think everything through. But now I have experience. Duncan interrupted her. My feelings cover the whole ship. I can even tell where the wave hits the ship. Duncan continued with a calm expression on his face. And I can also decide to destroy you directly, in a more thorough manner, so that you do not continue to plague me and my lost house. The doll lady didn't seem to think about this possibility. Her eyes subconsciously widened in fear before a click was heard near her neck. The headless doll caught the head and began to frantically press it to her neck. Duncan could no longer maintain the serious atmosphere. He wanted to laugh and cry at the same time, but he resisted it and only let out a long sigh. After waiting for Alice to put his head back in place, he continued. However, I suddenly felt that another crew member on this ship would not hurt. If, of course, you behave properly. Then you can stay on this ship. You could have said that before. I was scared to death. Duncan finally couldn't help himself and smiled from the corners of his eyes. So what's wrong with your neck? Alice answered innocently. I don't know. I usually don't go out that often. How do I know why my body behaves this way? Duncan looked at Alice silently for a few seconds, and then with a serious expression on his face said, It seems that lying in bed for a long time has damaged your cervical spine. Alice. Looking at the speechless doll lady, Duncan's mood suddenly improved a little. Hmm, to sum up the above, you are now a new crew member. Follow me. We'll choose a place for you to rest. The Lost House is very large. Surprisingly large for a sailing ship, and, in Duncan's opinion, it was several times larger than necessary. This large size meant larger cargo bays, more guns, stronger construction, and greater resistance to wind and waves. 
all of which meant the ship was capable of meeting the challenge of the toughest voyage. But at the moment Duncan has no plans for the so-called journey. This amazing big ghost ship brings him nothing but loneliness, so it wouldn't hurt to have a few crew members to talk to. In any case, there were many unused cabins on this huge ship. The silence in the corridor was broken by the sound of footsteps. It was Duncan who led the doll down the wooden stairs to the lower cabin, which was located directly under the captain's, and judging by its design, was considered the upper living area of the ship, in which was more or less light and neat, in contrast to the darker and more creepy places further on. Duncan stopped in front of one of the crew cabins and casually opened the wooden door. Behind the door was a room with modest decorations. There were several single cabins similar to this one on board the ship, but they had not been used for a long time, and there was nothing in them to indicate that they had ever been used. While exploring the upper deck of the lost house, Duncan, of course, noticed the existence of these empty rooms, but then did not attach much importance to them. But now that he himself controlled the ghost ship and knew the secret of its ability to sail alone, he became suspicious. Since the ship did not require a crew, who were these cabins intended for? Single rooms in the upper cabins are apparently intended for the first mate, second mate, boatswain, and other high seamen, while the lower ones have general purpose cabins for the rest of the crew, in addition to the dining room and chess room, which are obviously intended for more than one person. Unlike sails and ropes, which require no maintenance, their very existence is for the benefit of people. But this ship did not require a crew at all. Duncan frowned slightly as he realized that this ship was a ghost, which was now sailing alone on the sea. At some point in its history, there must have been a crew. At least when the ship was built, it was designed with various amenities for sailors. What happened to make the ship what it is today? Where did his crew go? Was the real Captain Duncan the ship's owner from the start? What did this creepy goathead know about the ship? Captain! Suddenly a puzzled voice came from behind him, which interrupted his thoughts and scared him at the same time. But then he realized that it was the voice of a doll. He completely forgot about Alice's presence for a moment. Over the past few days, Duncan had become so accustomed to being the only living person on the ship and so accustomed to Goathead's noisy voice, that he felt a little uneasy at Alice's sudden appearance. My name is Duncan. You can call me Captain Duncan. Of course, you are free to call me just Captain. Duncan quickly straightened up before turning and looking at the doll walking behind him. This empty room will be yours from now on. Come in and look around. Oh, yes. Alice nodded and first stuck her head over Duncan's shoulder to look around the room, and then turned and took the wooden box that always hovered behind her, lifted it over her shoulder and carefully carried it into the room. At the sight of the coffin, always present next to her, the corners of Duncan's lips twitched, and he began to watch as the doll lady carefully placed it next to the bed and examined the velvet upholstery of the coffin with special care. Then she began to look around the room, and Duncan, finally unable to restrain himself, said, You're going to carry this box with you all the time, aren't you? Yes, Alice answered casually. Where else should I keep it? Once upon a time this box served as your seal and I thought that it would bother you. Duncan frowned. But now, it seems you can't. Live without him. It's not the box's fault that it was people who sealed me, Alice answered, sitting on the box and patting its lid. Would you like to come in and sit with me? Duncan shook his head. No, how do you like the room? Oh, very good. Alice looked around the room with a satisfied look, as if she were not in a room with modest decoration, but in a luxurious courtyard. Is this a wardrobe? I don't have a change of clothes, so I won't be able to use it, but it's good that it's there. Oh, and there's also a table that I can put things on in the future, but I don't seem to have anything to put on it either. Maybe I could use it for my head. This will make it easier to comb your hair, as long as it suits you. It's a strange sight to watch a gothic doll sitting on a coffin and planning her life, especially since there was something very suspicious in this planning. But despite this, a small smile slowly appeared on Duncan's face. Then he took half a step back, and his face took on an indifferent expression again. You can rest here for a while and get used to your surroundings. You can move freely on this level, as well as on the deck level, with the exception of the stairs leading down. This is a simple structure, so you should quickly figure out all the rooms. I'll be in my cabin. You can find me there if you need anything. If I'm not there, there's a talking goat head on the navigation table. He's my first mate. Alice nodded as she listened to the first part, but when she heard the last two sentences, her eyes immediately widened. A goat's head? This pitch black wood carving? I think you noticed it. I noticed, but you said it could talk, and this is your first assistant. Alice was amazed. I thought it was just incredible. You are a talking and walking doll. Duncan looked at Alice with a stone face. And you think that a talking goat head is incredible? Alice froze, looked at her hands and muttered, as if she had just realized it. Ah, me too, I think. Duncan shook his head and turned and headed towards the door. That's all, rest. And if you need anything, call me. Alice's voice came from behind him. Yes, Captain. Having left, Duncan did not go anywhere else 
but immediately returned to the captain's cabin and sat down at the wide table, where the wooden head of the goat immediately began to move and turned its head in Duncan's direction. Ah, Captain, you're back. You seem to have persuaded that lady. You see, and as I already said, this gentle, harmless lady will not harm you during your journey and will keep you company. I see you have decided to keep her on board. Are you going to entrust her with anything? The lost house doesn't need anyone. The decks clean themselves. The cannons, too and the water tanks themselves maintain the required water level. Perhaps she could head the galley. Looks like you're not too happy with the food on board. Speaking of food, it looks like we need to replenish our supplies. The salty dried meats and hard cheeses in the warehouse may be a little stale, and although rude sailors are not picky about food, but the great Captain Duncan is definitely Duncan felt his brain boil, and was once again convinced that with this noisy goathead he really needed a normal interlocutor like Alice. Shut up, he said, giving goathead a stern look and only after he fell silent did Duncan continue. You were so quiet when Alice was around that I thought for a moment that you had finally learned to remain silent. It's a rule of the sea not to interrupt when the captain is interviewing a new crew member. Even if I'm your trusty first mate, second mate, Boatswain and Duncan didn't wait for Goathead to finish. In fact, if he hadn't interrupted him, the Goathead would never finish. During these few days, look after this doll. Uh-huh. Look after this lady. Are you still not sure about it? Oh, I understand, Captain. It's a necessary caution. She has many secrets, and she hasn't revealed them all. Perhaps because she doesn't know them herself, or perhaps she deliberately hides them for some reason. But in any case, she's still a damned doll. The people on that ship used the seal to keep Alice from leaving the box. But now that the sealed doll is walking around my ship, I'll need a little time to make sure that it really is harmless, even if it will only be harmless on the Lost House. While at the helm, Duncan had real control over the Lost House and could sense any movement on the ship. But even so, out of some caution, he ordered Goathead to keep an eye on the cursed doll. He knew full well that he was not an expert in the occult, and knew very little about the supernatural forces of this world, and a walking, talking doll was beyond the scope of his knowledge. Alice's words and actions could have been harmless, but suddenly, the doll lady has some kind of invisible influence that he will not be able to notice. Goathead understood such things much better than him. And even without this, Duncan understood that he could not constantly monitor the Lost House. And although he has decided to survive on this side of the door, if necessary, he may have to return to the world on the other side. And there, he might not be able to feel the movement on the Lost House. At the last thought, Duncan's gaze suddenly changed slightly, and he stared motionless at the goat's head on the edge of the navigation table, whose obsidian eyes looked at him indifferently. Did Goathead ever notice him returning to the opposite side of the door when he returned to his bachelor pad? and what was happening on the ship when he left it. This sudden appearance of doubt irritated Duncan a little, but under the indifferent gaze of the goathead, he did not show it at all, but instead mentally decided to check on Alice. Of course, he has no propensity for snooping, even if the target is a non-human being. So he only inquired in general terms about what was happening below deck, but even through transferring his perception to the lost house, he could at least determine the current location Alice and whether she was trying to destroy anything. After all, underneath this doll lady's harmless, elegant, and beautiful appearance was the essence of a cursed doll, a dangerous individual known to the ordinary people of this world as Anomaly 099. She was still in the room, probably studying its furnishings and arranging a place to rest. Duncan felt some relief when, at the same time, Goathead next to him suddenly said, What are your future plans, Captain? If you're bored, you're faithful, shut up. Duncan glanced at Goathead, then rested his hands on the edge of the navigation table and making an effort with his will, he again felt that he was holding the helm with both hands, and the emerald flame flowed through his body like water. As the flames grew, Duncan's body became illusory again, and streams of flame spread along the table, beyond the captain's cabin, onto the upper deck, up the mast, along the shrouds, causing the translucent spirit sails on the mast to billow in the wind, as the massive main side and horn sails adjusted their angles to the sea breeze the huge three-masted sailing ship began to slowly accelerate across the expanse of the sea. Duncan's gaze fell on the map in front of him, and as expected, he saw the gray-white fog that had shrouded the map instantly give way to the silhouette of the Lost House, slowly moving forward, and the fog around the silhouette dissipated. After a brief pause for thought, he began to focus on the map, the emerald flames surrounding the table becoming an extension of Duncan's limbs, conveying the captain's will to the map. And in this subtle state of connection, Duncan finally became dimly aware of the mystery of the card, which was apparently also a supernatural object. As soon as he thought, the silhouette of the lost house on the map immediately increased a little, and then decreased to its original size. Duncan once again tried to enlarge the image on the map, and this bizarre move was crowned with success, 
Even though no matter how much he zoomed in, only fog was visible at the edge of the map, Duncan was confident that the map was sufficient to capture and represent every inch of the ocean that the Lost House explored in precise detail in real time. Under Goathead's gaze, Duncan's face did not change in expression, as if he were a real captain. The expression on his face was cold, but his heart was filled with vague excitement. His gaze glanced at the flames rising from his body, and his mind felt the state of the Lost House and the changes taking place on the map. This strange emerald flame truly served as the key to controlling the Lost House, and the key to controlling many of the strange objects on this ship. Perhaps this is his strength as a captain. Duncan thought about the power of this flame and realized that if he wanted to truly control the ship and use it as a foundation for survival in this bizarre world, he must understand his powers. The first step is to completely master the flame. As for the next plans that Goat had just talked about, the first thing Duncan did was look at the map that was slowly changing in front of him, and at the gray-white fog that was slowly dissipating around the silhouette of the lost house, and the simplest and most obvious plan was born in his head. Since he didn't know enough about this world, and since the map was almost completely shrouded in fog, it would be right to clear the fog first. After all, the purpose of his going to sea is to explore new places. However, Captain Duncan, in the eyes of the locals of this world, was associated with the world boss wandering in the wilderness. So even if he and the Lost House remain at sea, this will not improve their reputation. As for the risk of drifting aimlessly at sea, Duncan believed that before he took the helm, the ship was already adrift. So what was the additional risk? At least sailing would clear up the fog on the map, unlike the aimless drift before. Duncan stood up from the navigation table and the emerald flames faded, but in his perception, the translucent spiritual sail on the mast of the lost house did not disappear with it. Part of the emerald flame that wrapped around the mast and shroud still burned, continuing to fulfill the will of the captain. Combined with what he observed at the helm, Duncan formed a vague idea. Although the spirit sails on the ship only rose after he stood at the helm, neither the size of the sails nor the many things that operated on the ship automatically were affected by the force the captain himself. The ghost ship has its own source of energy. Although he did not yet know what kind of energy it was that made the ship move, it was clear that all he, the captain, had to do was give orders to the ship. And the ship will loyally carry them out. Duncan stepped away from the navigation table and turned his head towards the small door in the back of the captain's cabin. Behind this door was the captain's private sleeping quarters, which he used as a place to rest during the first few days he explored the ship. Now he needed a quieter environment to explore what else he could do as captain of the Lost House. But until then... The ship that set sail needed to be looked after. He looked at the wooden goat's head on the edge of the table and ordered in a very serious tone, You will steer. Eh? Goathead was surprised. But Captain, you, I have things to do. Don't bother me for a while. Duncan cut him off. He didn't seem to care at all about what Goathead was about to say and just gave him the order very naturally. While with the help of his perception in the message emanating from the emerald flames spreading across the deck outside the cabin, he could clearly see the various connections hidden deep inside the ship. Masts, shrouds, sails, steering wheel, guns. Everything was connected by invisible threads, as if nerves or blood vessels ran through the ship, and all these connections ultimately converged in the captain's cabin. Duncan felt, Goathead is vaguely connected with all this. Perhaps this mysterious and bizarre Goathead is the lost house itself. Or is it some kind of control mechanism that can take over control of the ship in case of an emergency? Duncan had never built a ship, so he had no idea how it worked. But he thought the real Captain Duncan knew what Goathead could do. On the other hand, Goathead, who always called himself the first mate, naturally should be able to take the helm instead of the captain if the situation required it. Duncan needed to take a small risk, take measures that he had never taken before, but which a real captain should have known about and was obliged to take. After all, the captain should also have time to rest. A few seconds later, a joyful voice came from Goathead. Oh yes, Captain. Don't be shy. You're faithful. But Duncan casually waved his hand and, turning, walked into the bedroom located in depths of the captain's cabin and closed the door behind him. The door behind him closed, obscuring the empty gaze of the Goathead. But Duncan, as before, clearly sensed the lost house, felt every subtle movement on the ghost ship. With his senses, like extensions of his limbs, he could see the sails on the lost house, finally adjusting the angle of inclination with the influence of the sea breeze and the black wheel on the stern bridge, turning slightly to level the ship's course. As he expected, Goathead took control of the ship for a time and began to diligently perform his duties as first mate, but Duncan could still control the ship himself at any time. Under Goathead's control, the Lost House was less maneuverable and less fast than if he had been at the helm, but now that Duncan's main task was to further clear the fog on the map, and there was no clear goal or course, 
he did not care about the consequences. Making sure that Goathead had not moved and that the gothic doll remained in its room, Duncan sighed with relief and looked around the not very large room. This is his personal bedroom, and also the most comfortable and elegant room in the lost house. In addition to the soft bed, against the wall opposite the door, there was a large classic wardrobe and a shelf with many strange objects, and opposite the bed, there was a dark brown desk, but there were no books on it, only a few objects and writing and drawing utensils. Next to the table, there was a window that looked straight out to the sea, and on the wall next to the window hung several hooks on which Duncan's pirate sword, which he now carried, and a flintlock gun used to hang. Duncan walked to his desk and placed the long sword and flintlock within reach, then opened the desk drawer and examined the powder flask and lead bullets that lay in the wooden box. Next to them lay a small brass compass. Duncan took it in his hand and saw that the needle under the glass case was spinning erratically, as if pulled by an invisible force field, and that a small line of text was written at the bottom of the compass. We are all homeless. Duncan held the compass in his hand, watching the needle on it spin as if drunk. He had seen all these things many times before. He found this room during his first reconnaissance, and all the things here, including the line of text, must have been written by the real Captain Duncan at some point. Mentally analyzing the information he had received, Duncan exhaled and casually placed the compass on the table, raised his right hand and rubbed his fingertips. A small emerald flame flared up at the tips of his fingers, under the influence of which half of Duncan's palm immediately became transparent and illusory, as if spiritual. When the flame stabilized, Duncan approached it with his other hand and felt it, then took a feather from the side and touched the flame with its tip. He did not feel any heat, and the feather did not ignite. Only a small part of the emerald flame spread along the shaft, giving the feather an eerie glow. Duncan did not feel any response from the pen, unlike those moments when he touched the map and the steering wheel with the flame. Duncan mentally noted that spiritual fire does not heat or set things on fire, and that it was most likely only associated with anomalous things in the Lost House, not normal ones. So what if it was an anomaly from outside the Lost House? How would the flame react? Duncan thought for a moment, and for a moment the figure of Alice suddenly appeared in his memory. Will spiritual fire affect her? But he soon discarded this unimaginable thought. After all, even if Alice was a doll, Anomaly 099, she was at the same time a person who could talk and walk, who had a mind of her own, and who was now a member of the crew of the Lost at home. Therefore, Duncan subconsciously treated her as a person. He could not accept the idea of testing his flame on a living person. After all, he did not know how it would affect other anomalies. Duncan then tested the flame several more times, checking to see if there were other things with supernatural properties in the room. Finally, his gaze fell on a small brass compass with a message. The brass compass lay motionless on the table, the arrow still spinning under the glass case. However, perhaps it seemed to him, when Duncan maintaining the flame looked at the compass, the needle suddenly froze in place. And then they continued to spin around as if nothing had happened. Duncan, she definitely just reacted to my look. He was a little wary of the compass because it contained a message from the real Captain Duncan. On top of that, he was worried if the ghost captain had left some kind of power or trap on the item to prevent it from being stolen. Therefore, he did not test the compass with the flame. But after seeing the reaction it caused, he suddenly made a decision. Reaching out, Duncan took the compass into his hand again, the cool touch reaching his fingertips. Glancing at the spinning arrow, he placed it in his right hand, which was used to maintain the spiritual fire, and slowly squeezed it. The emerald flame, which seemed to contain countless spirits, flowed through his fingers like oil and quickly reached the compass. In the next moment, the arrow, which had previously been spinning wildly, stopped and pointed in a certain direction across the vast ocean. Duncan's heart sank. At that moment, he clearly felt the feedback from the compass, and was convinced that it was indeed an anomalous object that could be influenced by spiritual fire. But before he could grasp the details of the feedback, a force of gravity suddenly fell upon him. Duncan felt his body shudder for a moment, and the next moment it was as if he was swallowed up by a fog. All the furniture and objects suddenly disappeared from his room, and the walls and roof around him dissolved like snowflakes, after which his vision went dark. Duncan stood in the center of this dark space, anxiously wondering what had happened. The first thing he wanted to do was reach for his sword and gun, but the next moment he realized that all he had left was a brass compass. Duncan blinked, and while he was trying to see something through the darkness, the brass compass was suddenly surrounded by countless thin streams of light. These streams spread and intertwined in the darkness, as if weaving an endless web, and stars formed in the places where they intertwined. Some of these streams diverged in different directions, while others converged like rivers, and after a while the intertwined streams of light and stars began to resemble a galaxy. Duncan looked at the vision before him with some bewilderment, 
He was wary and a little alarmed, but for some reason he did not feel that anything was threatening him. But on the contrary, looking at this network of streams of light, he felt a long-forgotten feeling of peace of mind. The next moment, a strange feeling suddenly came over him. Duncan's gaze was involuntarily drawn to one of the stars in the intertwined network of streams of light. It seemed to him that this star was about to plunge into complete darkness. He subconsciously reached out to it. At that same moment, the force of gravity fell upon Duncan again, and it seemed to him that his soul took off, and he involuntarily rushed towards that star, which was about to plunge into darkness, and with such speed that he soon left behind a web of streams of light woven by a compass. In the midst of his rapid flight, he subconsciously looked at his right hand, which was clutching the compass, but saw that the compass had disappeared at some point. At the same time, just before he touched the star, he saw a shadow suddenly darkening from the side. This shadow appeared suddenly, as if it had always been there, and flew with him towards the star. Duncan could only vaguely discern that the shadow resembled a bird, and before he could get a better look at it, his vision darkened. Soon the sense of the real world returned to his limbs. In addition to the disgusting smell of some decaying limbs, and the harsh sound of heavy chains dragging along the ground, cold, damp, the stench of rotting flesh and the sound of chains dragging on the ground, many strange sensations flooded Duncan's mind, and for some time he was unable to open his eyes. At that moment, it seemed to him that his soul was divided into two parts, one of which remained on the lost house, and the other ended up in a completely alien body, which was as difficult to control as an old broken car. He tried to open his eyes and move his fingers, but he could not feel the corresponding parts of his body at all. The unpleasant sensation lasted for several seconds before the indescribable numbness and lethargy finally disappeared, and Duncan felt as if his body had awakened from a long hibernation and regained the ability to move slightly. Finally, he opened his eyes and saw what surrounded him at that moment. A gloomy cave-like space appeared in front of him with burning torches stuck into the stone wall, the faint light from which reflected an eerie picture of the surroundings. Duncan saw a lot of people, or rather, a lot of dead bodies scattered on the damp water-filled ground and stones. Most of them were in rags, but some had their clothes intact. Drops of condensation were dripping from the top of the cave, and in the distance a sound was faintly heard, similar to the sound of sewage flowing in an underground river, and the sound of dragging chains seemed to come from the depths of one of the caves. Channels connecting the cave and gradually moved away. Duncan blinked, trying to comprehend what had happened. He looked down at his right hand and saw a completely unfamiliar thin palm and torn clothing, and the brass compass he had previously held in his hands had disappeared. He looked to his right, remembering that he had imagined a shadow following him as he flew towards the star, a shadow whose silhouette resembled some kind of bird, but of course now he found nothing. The shadow touching the bird probably could not get into real space with him. Duncan slowly clenched his palms, suppressing the nervousness in his mind, and then tried to rub his fingers together. A very faint emerald flame immediately appeared at his fingertips. Needless to say, these flames now looked much weaker than the ones Duncan was familiar with but he still felt some comfort. After a few seconds, he calmed down and felt some kind of spiritual gap and connection more clearly than before. He clearly felt that the other part of his spirit was not here. He felt the presence of the lost house and felt himself sitting at a table with a brass compass in his hand. These feelings were wonderful, but Duncan immediately became vaguely aware of what had happened. There was a projection, or in other words, an expansion of his spirit, and part of this projected spirit crossed an unknown distance and entered another body. And in this projected state, he could still clearly sense the existence of his own body. It must have something to do with the brass compass. This is the power of the anomalous object. Some guesses crept into Duncan's head, but he didn't let them take up too much of his time. Having made sure that his body was safe and sound, that his spirit was under control, and that he was only temporarily in someone else's body, he calmed down a little and decided to find out what his new body was like. The first thing he could be sure of was that he was not on a ship, but on land land that he could not find after all his days at sea. The second point was that this gloomy cave did not look like a good place at all, and the bodies scattered around did not correspond to the usual burial scene. So, for what unlucky reason was the body he occupied ended up locked in this hell? Duncan took a deep breath and, making an effort, rose to his feet. Before this, he was leaning on a boulder, which was very inconvenient. It was at this moment that he felt the air he had sucked into his chest disappear, and some strange sensation emanating from his chest which made him barely stand up. Duncan looked down in surprise and saw a large hole. On the left side of his chest, right next to his heart, there was a large hole, but the heart itself was not there. A cool breeze blew from the hole, mixing with the air Duncan breathed in and eventually dissipating into the damp air in the cave. From a certain angle, Duncan could even see what was behind him. 
Oh, crap. Even if his nerves had become stronger, even if he had already seen a lot on the Lost House, Duncan still felt that at that moment, he broke out in a cold sweat. Like goosebumps ran across my skin and every hair on my body stood on end. And after this burst of horror, he immediately realized that he was still standing on his feet as if nothing had happened. Even without a heart and with a hole in his chest, he did not feel pain at all. Am I a corpse? After a few moments, Duncan came to his senses and quickly calmed down. Yes, he took over someone else's body. Yes, he stood up and could move. But maybe he shouldn't worry so much. After all, he had a ghost ship that could sail on its own, and a wooden goat first mate that could annoy people with ease. And he had recently met a cursed doll that could move and even ride the waves. Isn't this more creepy than a reanimated corpse? At least now he only lost his heart. Unlike Alice, whose head is often out of place. With such chaotic thoughts running through his head, Duncan regained his composure so quickly that I was even surprised myself. He then took a few moments to adjust to the unusual movements caused by the anomaly in his chest and stepped towards the bodies that lay in the cave. In fact, Duncan looked at the first body and did not feel any surprise when he saw a terrifying hole in the chest of another person. He was a middle-aged man with a gaunt face and torn clothes. He resembled a beggar on the side of the road, but even though he was long dead, his eyes still conveyed the struggle and despair he felt at the moment of his death. Duncan walked on and saw one heartless corpse after another. He found only two exceptions. On the heads of two men there were terrible wounds, apparently caused by a collision with a stone, which led to instant death. Duncan couldn't help but think that perhaps the two men had committed suicide because they couldn't stand the pain of being disemboweled. Honestly, the things in this cave exceeded any threshold of cruelty for an ordinary person, and even Duncan felt a little shocked. So much so that after examining all the bodies he had to sit down on a relatively clear stone in the distance, sort himself out a little and speculate about the truth of it all while he calmed down. Obviously there have been terrible murders here, but judging by how coldly and uniformly they were carried out, it seems that these were not just murders, but something more. For example, some kind of vicious ritual. Duncan again summoned the spiritual flame, and felt the connection between himself and his essence, once again making sure that at any moment, he could interrupt this projected state, and return to the safety of the lost house. But he felt he had to find out what was going on here, even if it was just getting information about the land. Duncan exhaled, feeling the air leave his chest, rose to his feet from the boulder on which he was temporarily resting, and looked at the tunnel in the depths of the cave, remembering that the sound of dragging chains came from there. After all, in any case, now there was a huge hole gaping in his chest. Before leaving his temporary shelter, Duncan tore several pieces of clothing from the nearest corpse and wrapped them around himself. He did this not because he could not stand the cold in the cave, but in order to more or less cover his open heart. Although the hole in his chest did not affect his survival in any way, he, like a normal person, did not want to walk like that. In addition, these flaps calmed him down a little and reduced the eerie sensations caused by the wind. Moreover, Duncan considered the possibility that while walking through this underground space, he would suddenly encounter other people, and common sense told him that a large hole in his chest might not to encourage strangers to talk. Therefore, after a short treatment of his wound, Duncan carefully left the dank cave, and entering the tunnel connected to it, slowly headed deeper. The temporary body he occupied was uncomfortable, not only because of the hole in his chest, but also because Duncan clearly sensed his weakness. His arms and legs were too thin, unlike the ghost captain, who clearly had strength much higher than usual mortal. Duncan couldn't see to fully appreciate the state of his body, but from what he could feel, he guessed that he was in the body of a teenager, a teenager weakened by long-term malnutrition. And although he was currently controlled by the spirit of the powerful ghost captain, it seemed that even the strength of the spirit could not break through the physical limits of this weak body. Unfortunately, Duncan had no choice but to slowly move through the deep tunnel with his barely functioning body. He knew that in such a weakened state, he would be helpless in any dangerous situation. So he prayed that this body would last a little longer. The tunnel he entered was deep, damp, and dark, and seemed to have hidden ventilation holes, for Duncan could feel a light breeze, and at regular intervals there were torches or oil lamps hanging on the walls, indicating constant human activity. After another long journey through the tunnel, Duncan suddenly discovered a fork ahead, apparently made by people, which was surrounded by smooth walls with a high semicircular arch. Below there was a dark, damp brick floor, and on the walls on both sides of the road there were holes, similar to drains, from which sewage flowed into the watercourses located below, going into the dark distance. Sewer? Duncan quickly realized that in front of him there was clearly some kind of sewer of quite a large scale, and the place before where the corpses of people lay looked like a natural cave structure connected directly to it. A huge sewer, a natural cave connected to the sewer and corpses. 
While he was wondering what kind of place this was, he at the same time carefully examined the details of the sewer in front of him. It was huge and well made. The main support appears to have been a reinforced concrete structure, which could have been large enough to allow the sewers to be used as a sort of underground shelter if necessary. To build something of this size, the city above the sewer must have a certain level of technology. Technology cannot exist in isolation. Behind each product of engineering art, there must be a huge number of related industries and technologies. Even if it's just a sewer, it can show Duncan the level of construction, planning, materials, and maintenance behind it, as well as the concept of life for its inhabitants. This was enough for Duncan, who was currently experiencing an acute lack of knowledge, to receive valuable information from the civilized world. Duncan moved forward along the sewer, stopping abruptly after some distance and turning his gaze to a nearby wall. A cage-like lamp with a metal casing protruded from the wall. Compared to the torches and oil lamps in the tunnel, it shone much brighter, and the frosted glass body burned with a flame bright enough to illuminate the path ahead. Duncan walked up to him and examined him carefully. For him now, everything that he found outside the lost house, especially the creations of modern civilization, had a special appeal. After watching for a few seconds, Duncan finally realized what it was. Gas lamp. But this gas lamp seemed different from the ones he had seen before. Apart from the difference in style, the most obvious difference he noticed was a few subtle symbols on the glass cover of the lamp body. The curved hieroglyphic symbols appear to have been added early in the lamp's manufacture. Duncan didn't recognize them, but immediately remembered the mysterious runes he saw on the mechanical ship and on Alice's coffin. Although they were different, both of them had a similar aura. Sacred ritual. Duncan stepped back a little, looking deep into the sewer, and saw that gas lamps were shining brightly on the wall at regular intervals. For an underground structure that was almost never visited except for maintenance, the sewers were lit almost too brightly, and each of the gas lamps also had similar mysterious runes on the body. Duncan had the impression that these gas lamps were actually fighting against something in this dark, deserted dungeon. More precisely, the civilized world that they represent. Duncan walked further along the gaslit path, keeping his eyes on the walls, floors, and arches around him in search of any valuable clues, when suddenly, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed something else. He stopped between two gas lamps in a less lit part of the sewer, and looking up and diagonally above him, he saw something painted on the wall near the vaulted ceiling of the sewer painted in dark red. He saw a pair of hands reaching towards the sky as if they were worshipping something. And in the direction of the cluster of hands, hanging high in the air was an orb emitting thousands of rays of light. Under this drawing there was a text of symbols that seemed to dance, as if from great excitement and anticipation. These symbols were not earth symbols, but Duncan naturally understood them. The false sun will finally fall, and the true sun god will rise from blood and fire. The life of all things belongs to the sun, as does their order. Duncan stood silently in the sewer, staring at the dim patch of light, the dark red symbols, and the sun that seemed soaked in blood, shining and revered. It seemed as if he had been peering longingly into another world for a long time. He looked at the drawing and symbols for a long time, until suddenly a noise was heard from the depths of the sewer, and the sound of footsteps reached Duncan's ears. He raised his head sharply in the direction of the sound and saw several figures in robes with hoods approaching him. Their heads and faces were hidden by the shadow of their hoods. They seemed like eerie ghosts in the depths of this gloomy sewer. Duncan was not hiding, and in general there was hardly anywhere to hide in this straight section of the sewer, and his temporary body could not do anything like escape unnoticed. So after a short thought he remained standing in the middle of the sewer, openly looking at the approaching figures that could be considered suspicious by any standards. Since he couldn't get out of this body and was destined to die soon, he could at least return to the ship with more detailed information. The next moment... Hooded men emerging from the depths of the sewers noticed Duncan's presence. Obviously, the hooded figures could not help but notice Duncan standing in their way. Duncan stood in the middle of the road, in the very place where he found himself as soon as he left the cave. His thin, wrinkled body was covered in tattered clothes, rags that he had temporarily thrown over himself to cover a large hole in his chest. He just stood silently in the middle of the road, but it looked as if the sudden appearance of the hooded figures scared him. The hooded figures were also clearly surprised and froze for a moment before the leader of the group suddenly shouted, One of the sacrifices has escaped! The next thing Duncan saw was how they were running towards him and shouting, Faster! Stop him! Don't let him get away! Duncan mentally shrugged his shoulders, and silently continued to look at the figures rushing towards him, trying to assess the situation. He had no intention of running, but several figures still shouted, Don't let him get away! The sacrifice has escaped! As a result, the calm behavior of Duncan who continued to stand in place, gave a certain awkwardness to the situation, and the men who were running towards him, screaming, felt that something was wrong, 
and stopped shouting, but did not slow down. Duncan could almost smell the aroma of embarrassment and irritation coming from under their dark hoods. Within seconds, the men surrounded him. Only then did Duncan look around and after a moment of hesitation said, Maybe I should run away right now. After all, the atmosphere here, however, the hooded figures did not seem to hear his grin. They only cast a wary glance at him and then looked in the direction from which he most likely came. Two hooded figures lowered their heads to talk. Duncan could vaguely hear the content of their conversation. Why did only one escape? Maybe those church hyenas found this hideout, but he doesn't look like he was released. It doesn't matter for now. Let's take him to that place first. There is something wrong with this sacrifice. We need to get rid of it quickly. Let the messenger make a decision. Duncan had no idea what these men were talking about, let alone what they meant by the word messenger. But in light of what he had seen on the way here and their mention of the word sacrifice, he had a vague idea of what was going on here. He didn't know how he should react to be considered a normal sacrifice. And he wasn't going to participate in their show, because outside of the Lost House, in this temporary body, he obviously had nothing to worry about. So after a few seconds of observing his surroundings, he asked, Where are you taking me? The hooded people were clearly surprised by how calmly the sacrifice spoke. Although their hoods were covered with a black veil that completely hid their faces, even so Duncan could imagine they were surprised. One of the hooded men cast an evil glance at the sacrifice and growled, You are in no position to ask us questions. Several hooded figures immediately stepped forward, but before they could grab Duncan, he stepped forward of his own free will. You don't have to do this. I'll go with you anyway. Several hooded figures looked at each other, probably thinking that there was something wrong with the sacrifice in front of them, but their leader just waved his hand. The right choice. You won't be able to escape anyway, but come with us, and maybe you will meet your glory with dignity. With these words, several hooded figures surrounded Duncan, blocking all escape routes in front and behind him, and led him deeper into the sewers. The stench in the sewer was disgusting, but the hooded people walked along the musty, moldy path, as if not noticing it, and Duncan, following them, remained silent and listened to their conversations, remembering from there the words Prand, Consul, Church, and others. Is this the city state of Prand? Duncan suddenly spoke, and so openly as if he was talking to his friends. Nonsense! One of the hooded men responded subconsciously, but then he reacted and looked at Duncan as if he were a ghost. You are very calm, boy. Do you know what will happen next? I can probably guess, Duncan nodded. An uncertain smile even appeared on his face, followed by an equally uncertain question. The true god of the sun, right? Several hooded figures slowed their pace for a moment, seemingly misinterpreting Duncan's strange response. One of them whispered to his companion, Wait, maybe this is also a follower of the Lord? Impossible, he's definitely an escaped sacrifice, whispered another hooded man, then looked at Duncan. You're pretty smart, but don't think that this will save you. The Lord has determined your destiny, and you better accept it with joy. Duncan remained silent. He knew that his too calm reaction had given the people in front of him the wrong idea. Most of them figured out that he was trying to survive by pretending to be a believer, but only Duncan knew what was really going on. This body temporarily occupied by me can hardly move, and the muscles on my face are stiff, as if due to necrosis. Therefore, the expression on my face does not change. But he didn't care what the cultists thought of him. He just wanted to gather as much information as possible during this one-time reconnaissance, so he casually asked, Do you think the current sun in the sky is a false sun? Do you think it will fall sooner or later? Of course, the false sun will fall eventually. This topic clearly excited the cultists, and Duncan heard a positive and passionate response from one of them, as he had hoped. Perhaps even church henchmen will have to admit in universal history that the sun in the sky is a perverted monster that appeared after the Great Annihilation. It is the sun god who truly brings life and order to all things on earth. But the power of my lord has been usurped by this vile hypocrite. But sooner or later this despicable counterfeit must fall from the sky. Immediately after this, Duncan heard the cultists around him echo. Sooner or later the false sun will fall. The true sun god will soon rise from blood and fire. And the excess seawater will be driven back into the deep void by the greatness of the sun god. And then the earth will return to an era of fertility and stability. Listening to the words of these cultists, Duncan began to think. He understood that it was impossible to reason with such fanatical cultists, and that what they believed in was mostly distorted and altered information, but some of the information they revealed was still worth considering. The sun hanging in the sky is a fake. The power of the true sun has been usurped. They believe that the true sun is a fallen god and that he will rise from blood and fire. They also spoke of excess seawater and an era of fertility and stability. What do these words mean? Thoughts raced through Duncan's head like small wild animals, while the cultists soon calmed down, remembering the matter and the fact that they were escorting an escaped sacrifice. 
Therefore those closest to Duncan fell silent again, while two at the back of the group began to whisper, Don't you think this sacrifice is behaving strangely? It seems to me that it is not entirely healthy, but I'm not entirely sure about this. Maybe it spent too much time underground in this hopeless dungeon and became obsessed with something. That's good. The power of God will cleanse it. Duncan listened to the conversation behind him, especially noting the words hopeless dungeon. But just as he was about to learn more information from the conversation, the hooded figure at the head of the group stopped. We have arrived, the man said in an icy tone. Ahead was the end of a section of road where several sewer pipes converged, and in this space, which was as wide as a small underground hall, was a gathering place for hooded cultists. The enormous size of the sewer system, which Duncan considered more than necessary to fulfill its sole function, as well as the gas lamps with runes painted on them, and the fortified structures that served as shelters here, made him wonder about the location of this place. But whatever the original intention of the builder of this place, one fact is clear. In the bowels of this huge structure, out of sight of the whole world, this dark, cold place has become a breeding ground for the growth of certain evil forces. A cult that nominally worships the sun, but which sends a chill down your spine. At the intersection of several sewer corridors was a vast underground space with massive concrete columns supporting a masonry dome. Metal pipes webbed around the dome, lit by gas lamps and people gathered in this place. At first glance, there were at least several hundred black-robed people gathered in this dirty and damp place and in the middle of them stood a platform on which stood a tall figure, also dressed in a black robe. Apparently this was the leader among the people in black robes. Instead of the same hood as the others, the man on the platform wore a strangely shaped golden mask, resembling a disc, which emitted endless light in all directions. At the same time, its entire surface was covered with a large number of small cracks. Behind the masked man stood another strange object, a totem, or more precisely, a tall wooden stake, on top of which a flaming ball was fixed. At its core, which seemed to be made of some kind of metal, there were many small holes through which flames came out. It was this scene that Duncan saw when he was escorted here. He was also noticed by the black-robed people gathered at this meeting place. We caught an escape sacrifice on the way here. One of the black-robed men who led the group accompanying Duncan respectfully said to the leader on the platform, This sacrifice has been in the dark for too long so his thoughts are confused. Please use your power to bring the glory of our Lord to this pitiful body. The cult leader in a golden mask on a high platform turned and looked intently at Duncan's emotionless face, and then, with a hint of surprise and coldness in his tone, asked, An escaped sacrifice? Duncan, however, did not respond. He simply looked at the scene with curiosity, including the golden mask on the cult leader's face and the totem with the flaming ball behind him. Perhaps for ordinary people of this world, these symbols were bizarre and outlandish, but he almost immediately realized that they imitated the sun. Not the ball of light in the sky today, surrounded by a massive stream of flame and two concentric rings of runes, but the scorching sun that Duncan knew so well and from which so much light came. These people actually worshipped the sun, a sun that seemed to have fallen in very ancient times, as if it were some kind of god. Duncan, with an indifferent expression on his face, looked up at the man in a black robe standing on the platform, but perhaps due to the death of his facial muscles, his indifferent expression looked more like some kind of emotionless numbness. The golden-masked cultist looked at Duncan for less than two seconds, then turned his head and ordered one of the men standing next to the high platform, check the place where the sacrifice ceremony is being held and quickly return. Having given the order, he nodded to the other men who accompanied the sacrifice, and with a note of praise in his voice said, You did a good job. Even if it is only a small service to the Lord, it will bring you eternal glory when the sun shines again upon all things. It was just a compliment but it seemed to inspire the people in black robes, and they, praising the true sun god, pushed Duncan to the high platform. And only then did the cultist in a golden mask turn to him. Unfortunate one who has lost his way. Oh, unfortunate one, do you feel the deep cold between the rocks and the earth? Duncan couldn't understand what he meant, so he could only remain silent. But the cultist did not seem to expect an answer from him. His words were not addressed to Duncan, but rather to the believers around him and the sun god in whom he believed. Cold and darkness are the two main evils left to us by the false sun. Under his rule, deep dark seas lay waste to the world, leaving behind only small fragments of land for survivors. But even in these fragments the world is not free from suffering. The shadows of bygone days have taken root underground and are waiting for their opportunity. The earth is full of hatred and strife, and the pure souls of people are stained by the breath exhaled by the evil gods. How can we endure this long suffering? How can we bear the distortion and abnormality of the world generated by the false sun? We cannot bear it. 
We wish for the return of our Lord. We wish that the true God of the Son would descend to earth again, rise from blood and fire, and return order and prosperity to the earth. One after another, the excited cultists, first quietly, and then with voices turning into fiery exclamations, exclaimed, May the true God of the Son descend to earth again. Let him rise from blood and fire. May the true God of the Son descend to earth again. Let him rise from blood and fire. May the true God of the Son descend to earth again, shouted the man in the golden mask, and then extended his hand and pointed at Duncan. And today our Lord will awaken even more from sleep, and fresh blood will soften his wounds after sunrise. Make a sacrifice. Several cultists approached Duncan from the side, but he was faster than them. He didn't even have to be carried. He pushed himself off the ground and climbed onto the platform. Although this body was in a deplorable state, he was still able to climb onto the platform. Rising, he approached the masked cultist, who still maintained a majestic and mysterious pose. The change happened very suddenly, and the way it unfolded was completely beyond the cultist's past experience, which immediately threw him into a kind of stupor. He looked at Duncan through his golden mask while a strange silence reigned around the altar. Duncan, however, seemed completely oblivious to the change in atmosphere. He only felt satisfied that he was able to gather more information about the world and looked forward to learning more before this temporary body became unusable. So what? Duncan rubbed his hands together with a certain feeling of inquisitive anticipation and looking intently into the eyes of the cultist, asked, What's next? What is the next step? The masked cultist was silent. Didn't you hear? Duncan frowned, but his expression did not change. I asked, What is the next step? And then the cultist, although there was obvious confusion in his eyes through the mask, answered in a choked voice, The shadows in the darkness have indeed affected your mind. But do not worry. The Most High and Holy Son will end your suffering. Bring a sacrifice to the totem. Two robed cultists immediately approached the platform from the side and led Duncan by the hand towards the totem with a flaming ball on top. Duncan didn't know what would happen next, so he didn't do anything on his own like last time. He did not resist, and within a few seconds he stood next to the flaming ball in the grip of two cultists. Even though Duncan did not resist, two black-robed cultists squeezed his hands with great force, as if they were afraid that the sacrifice would resist violently and break free at the last moment. They squeezed his hands with such force that at some point Duncan felt the bones in his temporary body crack. This made him look at the two cultists with considerable surprise, and immediately after that, the masked cultist approached him again. Duncan's attention was immediately drawn to a strange dagger that he pulled out of his pocket, strangely curved, like a dry, crooked finger, with a black blade that seemed to be made of obsidian, on which the fire of the totem was reflected, which gave it a strange appearance. Duncan mentally prepared to turn off the soul projection, realizing that this was the end of the information he could collect using the temporary body. The next moment, the cultist's voice came from the platform. O oh, most high and holy sun god, please accept the sacrifice on this high platform. I offer you her heart, and may you rise from blood and fire. Duncan immediately stopped cutting off the projection of his soul, and looked at the cultist standing in front of him as if he were a fool. Immediately after he heard the cultist's prayer, Duncan stopped and interrupted the cutting off of his soul's projection. He looked at the masked cultist who had just finished fanatically reciting his prayer, at the small obsidian dagger he held in his hand, and at the crowd of cultists around the altar who were chanting the name of their lord the legendary true sun god who had already fallen, many years. They brought a special sacrifice to their lord, a fresh heart. Now Duncan finally understood what happened in that cave, and what the madness of these cultists was. He then saw the masked cultist take a step towards him, and a layer of dark black flame suddenly erupted from the surface of the obsidian dagger he was holding in his hand. This startling supernatural phenomenon instantly intrigued Duncan, and he began to wonder if the dagger was also some kind of anomalous object and if the cultist in front of him was some kind of special person, capable of harnessing extraordinary power. Did such people even exist? If so, then he was very interested in how many such people there are in the civilized society of this world, and what role they play there. At the same time he watched indifferently as a blazing black dagger with a dull sound pierced straight into his chest, piercing several layers of rags. The flames burned his body from the inside, but did not come out. Behind him on the totem from the flaming ball, there came a sudden, alarming series of crackling sounds, which seemed to be accompanied by some kind of tearing, dizzying noise, and Duncan had a vague feeling that from the flaming something is spreading around the ball. The next second he felt a cold touch. It was difficult to describe the sensations, not only because his senses were dulled in this temporarily occupied body, but also because it was beyond anything he had ever felt before. He knew only one thing clearly. In a world where anomalous phenomena were a reality, 
there was no doubt that something had gone wrong with the ritual of sacrifice. The change in the symbolic sun on the totem immediately attracted the attention of nearby cultists. There were suppressed exclamations, but after a few seconds, everything became quiet, and even two people in black robes, holding Duncan's hands in a death grip on either side, as if shocked by something, unclenched it in fear and knelt in front of the totem. The cultist with the obsidian dagger stood frozen in place, staring into the face of the sacrifice in front of him, but through the hole in his mask, Duncan could see eyes in which confusion reigned. Duncan tightened the corners of his lips and finally forced out a creepy smile, slowly raised his right hand and placed it on the cultist's obsidian dagger, while threads of emerald flames, like water, slowly began to envelop the dagger. Almost instantly, Duncan felt feedback from the dagger, but strangely enough it seemed weak and empty, as if the dagger was some kind of poor imitation, and only a small amount of borrowed power remained in its empty shell. But it didn't matter to him whether the dagger was an imitation or not. He smiled at the masked cultist with the corners of his lips and said leisurely, I have two things to say. The next moment, the cultist felt that his connection with the obsidian dagger was suddenly interrupted by some external force, as well as his ardent faith in the sun god, as if he had encountered an insurmountable barrier. First of all, I am a man of broad views. So broad. Having said this, Duncan tore off the fabric, already torn, and now cut with a knife, and revealed to the eyes of those present a huge hole through which the masked cultist, who was conducting the ritual of sacrifice, could clearly even see the wall behind Duncan. Secondly, try not to offer your lord expired food, Duncan said and gently pushed the cultist's hand away. Somehow, after engulfing the obsidian dagger in his emerald flames, the cultist in front of him suddenly seemed to lose most of his strength, so much so that Duncan could now easily push him away. His muscles trembled. He raised his hand and pointed at Duncan as if restoring order at the sight of the sacrifice. Resurrected abomination! The resurrected soul of the deceased! You have profaned this sacred rite of sacrifice! What impudent necromancer is behind you, abomination? Aren't you afraid of the sun? I don't understand what you're talking about, Duncan said casually, and glanced at the obsidian dagger, feeling a faint response of power in it. He then looked at the masked cultist standing in front of him and listened to the crackling noise coming from the totem behind him and suddenly a bold and bizarre idea came to his mind. But I suddenly wanted to satisfy my curiosity. With these words, he suddenly threw the obsidian dagger up, and in front of the crowd of cultists, still in a state of confused horror, pointed to the masked cultist and said loudly, O oh, most high and holy sun god, please accept the sacrifice on this high platform. I offer you her heart and may you rise from blood and fire. The next moment he saw the obsidian dagger fly into the air and the cold touch emitted by the totem gathered into one point and headed towards the masked cultist. The cultist looked at the totem with wide, horror-filled eyes. He seemed to want to leave the platform immediately, but the dagger was faster. The dagger flew out of Duncan's hand, drawn by some invisible force, and shrouded in flaming black flames and faint emerald ones, pierced straight into the cultist's chest. There was a terrible scream, and the cult leader's chest was pierced, and his heart turned to ash in an instant. The next moment, the dagger was again in Duncan's hand and in a few moments the power contained in it was completely exhausted. In the area where the sacrifice was carried out, there were two people, one with a heart, the other without, and some evil god today certainly wants to taste the human heart. The question arises, who will lose it? Of course it will be the one who has it, but even with this logic, everything went more smoothly than Duncan expected. He didn't think his attempt would actually work until he saw the masked cultist fall to the ground dead. Only then did he turn his head, look at the calm totem, and mutter in a strange tone, so, anyone can perform the ritual, as long as the words are correct? Of course, the flaming ball on the totem did not answer his question, but the cultists around the altar had reacted by now. Most of them panicked. But in addition to the panic, the most fanatical cultists burst into anger that surpassed even the fear they felt from the totem. Several of the cultists closest to the altar were the first to react, and shouting the name of the sun god, rushed towards Duncan. The rest of the cultists followed. Some even pulled short swords and daggers from under their robes. Duncan was about to shout, I will sacrifice the hearts of all people on the altar of the sun god to test the appetite of this strange evil god. But he changed his mind when he saw that some of the cultists took out revolvers from under their robes. And given the time required for the ritual to take effect, he simply showed the middle finger to the cultists and began cutting off the projection of his soul. Let the madmen continue their madness, but he was about to return to the lost house. Meanwhile, rhythmic footsteps were heard on the deck of the lost house plowing the endless expanses of the sea. Alice, a doll in a magnificent gothic dress, left her cabin and headed towards the captain's cabin. This time, 
The ornate wooden coffin did not follow her, but remained in her room. The captain said that she could move around the cabins on this level as much as she wanted, as well as walk along the deck, and that if she didn't understand something, she could turn to him for help at any time. Alice remembered it well. Alice stopped at the door to the captain's cabin. Looking at the dark, dull oak door in front of her, she noticed words written on the door in beautiful fancy letters, door of the captain's cabin of the lost house. The presence of such a line on the door of the captain's cabin of the lost house, of course, did not surprise Alice, but she subconsciously frowned not because of this, but because she knew these words. She didn't remember teaching them, she didn't remember learning anything at all, and she didn't remember where she learned to communicate with people. However, this knowledge was naturally present in her mind. She could read the letters on the door to the captain's cabin and understood the purpose of various objects in the room, which she could not learn by simply lying in a wooden box and listening to people outside. So where did this knowledge come from? Until today, Alice had never thought about these questions. But for some reason, after a conversation with Captain Duncan, such an emotion as curiosity suddenly appeared in the mind of the doll, which should have initially been calm. She remembered that this change occurred after Duncan asked about the origin of her name. It was at this point that she began to doubt something she had taken for granted, and began to try to remember the origin of her name. And then something in her mind weakened. Alice didn't know whether the weakening was for the better or not, but she didn't like the feeling of confusion. So she shook her head sharply, throwing away her doubts, and turned her gaze to the door of the captain's cabin, then put her hand on the handle of the oak door and pushed it forward slightly. The door did not budge. Stunned, Alice tried again, but the wooden door did not move, as if it were made of steel. Then, when she tried again, a voice suddenly came from the captain's cabin, hoarse and low, as if coming from a piece of rotten wood. The door opens outward, lady. The voice definitely didn't belong to Captain Duncan. So a startled Alice quickly reacted with a panicked ooh before carefully pulling the door open. Only then did she remember that the captain, when he brought her here, opened the door this way. It seems that the knowledge that appeared in my head was not enough. I'm still too inexperienced in real life after so many years of sleeping in a box. After a moment of thought, Alice carefully poked her head into the captain's cabin. There was no one in the captain's cabin. An amazing table stood silently in the middle. On this table lay a map, the surface of which was covered with a thin haze, and next to the map stood a dark wooden head of a goat, whose eyes carved from obsidian looked at it. Madam, please come in. The captain is busy now. You can wait for him here, the goat head said, more politely than Alice could have imagined. Also try to act calmer. Any action you take may anger some overly sensitive guys on the lost house and calming them down is a very troublesome and unpleasant task. Moreover, if your head falls again, it will be a problem because I don't have hands to lift it, she says. The wooden statue can actually talk, although Captain Duncan had said before that the goat's head on the table could talk, but Alice couldn't help but flinch when she heard the wooden statue speak, and it took her a moment to recover before she answered. Ah, uh, yes, but actually my head doesn't fall off easily, and last time I installed it, I deliberately... Wait, you said some are too sensitive. There are guys on the ship. Elisa, only now having completely digested Goathead's words in her head, looked around with surprise and nervousness. At that moment, it seemed to her that in the dark corners of the captain's cabin, and even throughout the entire lost house, there were creatures that looked like a goat's head. But then the voice of the goat head reached her. Is this strange? It takes a lot of hands to set a ship this size sailing. And do you really think that the great Captain Duncan will wash the decks himself? Goathead's words sounded quite reasonable. And the recently awakened Alice, although she felt she was wrong, could only nod. Yes, that's why there are a lot of people like you on the ship. The captain has only one faithful assistant. The rest are a bunch of guys who are slightly more stupid assistants. You don't need to think about interacting with them, because they are not interested in communicating with people, Goathead interrupted her. But considering that you are new to the ship, it is normal that there are a few rules that you are not aware of. And it is quite natural that as the most faithful first mate of Captain Duncan, second mate, I should tell you about the rules that you must know in order to survive on this ship. After all, it is not right for a captain to stoop to explaining such things to newcomers. Madam, are you ready? Alice listened in confusion. She had already forgotten her original purpose for coming to the captain's cabin. Now she only felt how much her head was buzzing due to the fact that every time she tried to say something, Goathead would interrupt her and shoot out a bunch of incomprehensible words like a revolver. Therefore, when Goathead finally fell silent, Alice subconsciously nodded her head. Oh, okay, okay. Very good. Then I will tell you a few rules that every crew member of the Lost House should know. These rules will help newcomers quickly adapt to life on the ship and receive full blessing from the ship and the great Captain Duncan in this dangerous and endless sea. Goathead was clearly satisfied with Alice's answer. He shook his wooden head and continued with a clear note of pride in his voice. 
First of all, Captain Duncan is the absolute master of the Lost House, and he is always right. Even if reality contradicts Captain Duncan's words, Captain Duncan's judgment must prevail. Secondly, any crew member can only move in areas authorized by Captain Duncan. You cannot enter areas that Captain Duncan has not given permission to be in, because these areas do not exist. Thirdly, if you set foot in prohibited territory and are lucky enough to survive for the time being, you must remain where you are and wait for Captain Duncan to bring you back, or calmly await death. It is strictly forbidden to return without a captain because you will not return to the Lost House. Fourth, the Lost House always sails on the correct course. Don't question the captain's plan. If you find that the scenery around the Lost House is not what you expected, or find that the ship has entered deeper waters, then this is all part of the captain's sailing plan. Fifthly, from time to time the captain will leave the ship, but he will definitely return. During his absence, the ship will continue to sail, but crew members will be prohibited from approaching the helm, which will be unsafe while the captain is away. And those brave souls who dare to take the helm will immediately be strangled by the mooring lines. Sixth, on board the Lost House, there are six and only six basic rules for the crew. Seventh, the door to the captain's cabin opens outward. Goathead seemed to have taught new crew members these rules more than once, because he told them fluently and naturally. But Alice immediately noticed that something was wrong when she heard the last two rules. Wait, Mr. Goathead, you just said in number six. Sixthly, there are six and only six basic rules for the crew on board the Lost House, Goathead repeated. For a while, Alice wondered if she had misunderstood something or if it was the first mate in front of her. But you just mentioned rule number seven. Seventh, the door to the captain's cabin opens outward, Goathead answered very naturally. Alice looked with glassy eyes at the blackened wooden carving of a goat's head on the table. Having doubted her hearing, she then began to doubt her ability to reason sensibly. But, soon realizing that there was nothing wrong with her, she decided to ask, Aren't these two rules contradict each other? They don't contradict. Hearing Goathead's confident answer and looking into his empty, dark eyes, Alice opened her mouth, intending to say something, but suddenly, suddenly swallowed all her doubts. Alice knew little about this world, but at least she, lying in a wooden box, heard whispered conversations mixed with fear and tension countless times. From the mouths of the crew and guards, who were particularly nervous about their responsibility for escorting the anomaly, she gained a very basic understanding of some unusual things. If something is clearly out of the ordinary, and it actually exists in this world, then you should first try to ensure your safety, and only then consider conducting research and analysis while maintaining a safe distance. Alice didn't really realize she was abnormality 099 and didn't realize what she could do or had already done, that people were so afraid of her. She didn't know how to think normally while being a sentient anomaly, so for the moment she just thought like a human. Since Goathead said that there were only six rules for a crew, that means there were six of them. And since Goathead mentioned the seventh rule, that means she remembered that too, just in case. But she still had questions that she couldn't help but ask. I already tried to push the door to the captain's cabin, but it only opens outward, as a matter of course. So why does this rule even exist? The wooden head of the goat silently looked into Alice's eyes for two whole seconds, and then with unprecedented brevity he answered, Sometimes it can open inward. This. If you see a door opening inward, never enter it. In the entire lost house, only the captain has the right to do this. For the first time since that moment, Goathead spoke in such a serious, even somewhat frightening tone. He wasn't that serious even when he talked about the rules for crew members. Alice was taken aback for a moment by the unusually serious tone of her interlocutor. But then Goathead's tone softened again, and he spoke as cheerfully as if there had never been a serious conversation at all before. Well, the necessary process of introducing the rules to the new crew members is completed, so let's go. Now let's talk about something else. Oh, by the way, madam, what brings you to the captain's cabin? I don't quite understand what you are looking for here. If you don't know how to use the amenities on the ship, then don't bother the great Captain Duncan about it. If you want to chat, then you've come to the right place. I have a knack for finding things to talk about and I know countless wonderful things about this ship. Are they not interesting to you? Then I can introduce you to some of the most famous dishes of the Endless Sea. I know a little about cooking. As Goathead began to speak, Alice tried to interrupt him several times. Needless to say, all attempts were unsuccessful. But by the time she realized something was wrong, it was already too late. Anomaly 099, a doll named Alice, faced the second biggest horror on the Lost House today, not counting Captain Duncan. Meanwhile, in the bedroom located across the wall from them, Duncan calmly listened to the commotion coming from the captain's cabin. He just woke up. His soul returned to the ship from a distant shell, and he did not hear the entire conversation between Goathead and Alice, 
but he heard the rules for crew members and the conversation about the captain's cabin door opening outward. Important information and unexpected gain. Duncan barely had time to digest the information he had just received from the cultists when he accidentally overheard a conversation between Goathead and Alice. And both the strange rules for crew members and the last message from Goathead were of extreme importance to him. Of course, when he pushed the door of the captain's cabin inside to return to the other side, Goathead knew that for him it was a return to his bachelor pad, but for the lost house on this side, it meant that the captain had abandoned ship for the time being. Goathead had no doubt about this and considered it a step that Captain Duncan himself would have taken. So, the real Captain Duncan opened the door of the captain's cabin and found himself in some mysterious world. And this happened more than once, so it became not only a matter of course in the eyes of the Goathead, but even part of the rules for the crew members of the Lost House. This news made Duncan slightly happy. It meant he wouldn't have to worry if he wanted to return to the other side. Even if new crew members appear on the ship, he can always disappear without fear that someone will follow his example and find out his secret. But on the other hand, the thought inevitably arose in Duncan's head that this was somehow connected with the 6 plus 1 crew rules, which Goathead deliberately mentioned. What exactly do these rules mean? What are they based on? Some of them sound like they are meant to emphasize the captain's authority, but there seems to be more to it than that. It appears that these strict restrictions were designed to ensure that the people on board could survive in a dangerous environment, so that the crew could avoid unseen dangers through established rules. Duncan frowned slightly as he thought about his true place in these rules. Judging by their contents, it seemed that he, the captain, was the only one who had the most freedom, and who did not have to worry about the invisible dangers of the ship, but only if he was the real Captain Duncan. It was this part that caused the most concern, but then he suddenly remembered his own research aboard the Lost House for a long time, and how he calmly walked around the ship. Goathead never reminded him of the rules. He considered him the real Captain Duncan. Duncan himself, while on board, never encountered any invisible dangers and the second captain did not give him any restrictions on his activities. From this point of view, it seemed that the dangers mentioned by Kozlinogolov and the rules for crew members did not concern him. Duncan exhaled quietly, continuing to listen to the sounds of movement coming from the captain's cabin. After half a minute, he hated himself for being able to hear. The talking doll and the noisy goathead were communicating, and the latter was clearly gaining an overwhelming advantage. His crackling nonsense echoed through the captain's cabin like wind and waves across an endless sea. And even Duncan, hiding in the bedroom and secretly watching what was happening, could no longer bear it. He felt that he had to go in there and save the poor doll lady, because socially inexperienced Alice was clearly no match for Goathead. But after a moment of hesitation, Duncan stopped. He had just made an amazing spiritual journey, and now he had a lot of information to deal with and learn from it. He had to find out what happened to him, and whether this process could be controlled. For now, it seemed that this ability to mentally project a soul into the future would be his best tool for gathering information about the Earth. Normally, he'd have to worry about whether he'd attract Goathead's unwanted attention if he stayed in his bedroom for too long learning a new ability. But now the noisy assistant's attention was diverted by Alice. It couldn't have been better. Mentally asking Alice for forgiveness, Duncan looked at his right hand, and the next moment his expression took on a worried expression. The brass compass, which was slightly larger than a pocket watch, disappeared at some point. He remembered that just recently it was lying in his hand. Duncan's eyes glazed over for a moment as he realized that he had not noticed how or when the compass disappeared from his hand, the first time since his arrival on this strange and bizarre ghost ship that he had made such an oversight. The next moment he waved his right hand and an ethereal emerald flame flared up between his fingers. Immediately after that, he rose from the table preparing to use the connection between spiritual flames and supernatural things to check the entire bedroom for the latter. But as soon as he stood up, he suddenly froze in place as a thin thread of communication appeared in his mind. He subconsciously looked in the direction where it came from and then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw several seemingly real feathers appear in the air out of nowhere and fall down. Duncan looked in amazement at the place where they were falling and saw a phantom rapidly forming before his eyes. In just two or three seconds, this phantom turned into a snow-white dove. The missing brass compass hung on the pigeon's chest, and at its paws lay an obsidian dagger already familiar to Duncan. The snow-white dove stood motionless on the table. On its neck hung the brass compass that Duncan was looking for, and at its paws lay a familiar obsidian dagger. Duncan looked at the dove in amazement, and the dove looked at Duncan in the same way. It is impossible to read the expression on the bird's face, but for some reason it seemed to Duncan that he could do it, and not only read, but even see some wisdom in her slightly reddened eyes. As soon as Duncan glanced at the pigeon, one of his eyes apparently paid attention to it, but the other continued to look at the ceiling of the captain's cabin. This dove. It took Duncan a few seconds before he finally muttered subconsciously, Why dove? 
Why did a dove suddenly appear in front of me? And why is my brass compass hanging around his neck? And how did the obsidian dagger get here? Or in other words, can anything normal happen on this abnormal ship? And while more and more questions were appearing in Duncan's head, the pigeon, which had been standing in place for some time, as if frozen, finally woke up. After which it nodded its head, took two steps, walked up to Duncan, stretched out his neck and cooed loudly. Silently watching the bird, Duncan for some reason suddenly remembered many classic images of pirates, and then looked down at his clothes. The captain and the bird. It seems that it should be so. But shouldn't it be a parrot? Why a dove? The dove, hearing Duncan's words, immediately nodded fervently and said in a female voice with a somewhat strange intonation, The transfer is complete. All the words that Duncan wanted to say immediately stuck in his throat, and he almost choked on the saliva that entered his lungs, and then stared at the dove with an astonished expression on his face. He remembered how he felt when he first stepped onto this ship and saw the talking goat's head in the captain's cabin, but at least he had been aboard the Lost House for several days, and during that time he had already seen the anomalies of this world, so the fact that this dove spoke took him by surprise only for a moment. The next second, his face acquired a serious expression, and an emerald spiritual flame already flared up on the finger of his right hand. Warily watching the pigeon in front of him, Duncan asked, Where did you come from? The pigeon raised its head and looked straight at Duncan with one eye, and the other directed towards the ceiling. Wrong address. Please double-check the address or contact the system administrator. Duncan. Compared to a few seconds ago, now a storm was raging in his head. The words of this dove did not at all resemble the style of this world. Neither Goathead nor Alice nor any of those cultists could have come up with them. But he, like Zhou Ming from Earth, knew them very well. However, the pigeon did not seem to notice the change in Duncan's look and face. He only pecked his wings and shook the brass compass hanging on his chest, and then began to leisurely walk around the table. After taking a few steps, he returned to the obsidian dagger, pushed it several times with his paw towards Duncan, and said in the same strange female voice as before, Take this battle axe and show them how those who follow the path of honor fight. Duncan rose from the table with a jerk, his chair hitting the floor with a crash, and stared at the dove in front of him, while his mind was filled with extremely strange, but at the same time very cheerful emotions. This dove is definitely not something that was originally on the Lost House, and is unlikely to be anything that was originally on this world. After all, only Zhou Ming could understand the meaning of the words he spoke. Perhaps the sound of the chair hitting the floor was so loud that the commotion was heard even in the captain's cabin, so Duncan suddenly heard the voice of Goathead in his head. Captain, are you okay? Duncan didn't take his eyes off the dove on the table. He knew that Goathead wouldn't dare look into the captain's chambers, so he answered in his usual calm voice, I'm fine. Mrs. Alice has come to you, do you want? You first. Yes, Captain. Duncan exhaled and looked back at the door to the room leading to the captain's cabin. The Goathead continued to bombard Alice with words. The doll tried several times to get up and leave, but was stopped again and again. Duncan felt like he had to go and save the unfortunate doll, but now he had more important things to do. Work hard, Alice. Duncan sat down at his desk again, ready to try to see if he could communicate properly with the pigeon, and that's when he suddenly saw a scene he hadn't noticed before. From the clot of spiritual flame jumping between the fingers of his right hand, a line as thin as a hair stretched upward, the end of which stretched for ten centimeters, after which it went out. Duncan noticed an emerald flame on the strange dove. It hid in the gap between his feathers, and its end also rose into the air where it extinguished. Duncan frowned, snapped his fingers, and from one thought the flame flared up, and the dove on the table instantly disappeared. The next second, a dove appeared on his shoulder and began pecking at Duncan's hair, making loud cooing noises. Duncan snapped his fingers again, and the dove reappeared on the table. The brass compass hung on the dove's chest, its shiny body enveloped in emerald flames. Duncan furrowed his brows. Does this have anything to do with the brass compass? He was able to establish that the dove had some connection with it. This connection was even stronger than the one he had with the Lost House, which could explain why the dove knew words from Earth that only he knew. He just could not determine the reason for its appearance. After thinking, he focused his suspicions on the strange brass compass. From the moment he learned about the spiritual flame until now, all the anomalies began with this brass compass, whether it was the previous experience of projecting the soul onto a corpse, or the fact that the compass simply disappeared and then appeared on the chest of the dove by the source of everything that seemed to be a compass. Duncan looked at the dove for a while, and then raised his hand to the compass. He wanted to take this thing off and study it properly. The dove did not dodge or try to stop it, but Duncan's fingers did not touch the surface of the brass compass, but passed right through and touched the soft down on the bird's chest, as if they had passed through an illusion. The pigeon jumped in place twice, apparently because of Duncan's touch, and then shouted, 
Today is Crazy Thursday at KFC. Only half price. The corners of Duncan's eyes twitched several times. He checked again and was finally convinced that he could not remove the brass compass from the pigeon. This thing has apparently turned into some sort of illusion, tied to the dove, which cannot be removed or touched. Or is the dove the brass compass in its present form? The only thing he could be sure of was that the appearance of the dove was inextricably linked with his experience of using the brass compass for spiritual travel, and that this experience could change him form. Or maybe this is the nature of the brass compass itself, its inherent property as a certain anomaly, or the price of use. As for why the dove says this, it is not because of the compass, but because of Zhou Ming, a man from Earth. At this point, none of this could be confirmed or denied by Duncan, unless he could find guidance on the various anomalies on the Lost House. And now he needs to think about what to do with this strange pigeon. After some thought, he decided to first give the pigeon a name. I have to give you a name, he said seriously to the dove in front of him, tapping his fingers on the table. I guess you can understand me, right? I? The dove bowed its head, probably feeling that Duncan didn't hear him and quickly repeated his words louder than before. I. Duncan finally understood what the bird meant. You mean your name is I? The dove nodded proudly and walked across the table, cooing. Duncan rubbed his eyebrows thoughtfully. Now communication with this bird seemed stranger to him than with Goathead, and mainly all the strangeness lay in his style of speech. Do you know how you were born, or how did you end up here? Duncan asked the pigeon. The pigeon thought for a while. Both of its eyes became clouded, and looked in different directions at the same time. Oops. The page has disappeared. Try refreshing it. Duncan. He had absolutely no idea what was going on in the bird's head, and wasn't even sure whether the sentences popping out of it had anything to do with the topic being discussed or not. But he was absolutely sure that the bird thought and communicated with itself in a very serious way. It just obviously had its own understanding of communication. Duncan again tried to talk to the pigeon who called himself I, but the conversation seemed to be on different frequencies. Essentially, they were talking to each other but each was talking about his own things. For example, Duncan asked the pigeon a question, and the pigeon answered it, sometimes, of course, answering on the topic, but most often with sentences that were not related to Duncan's question at all. Not having made much progress, Duncan furrowed his brows and muttered, Again, some nonsense. He felt that it would take a long time before he could establish normal communication with the pigeon, and this process might turn out to be even more difficult than getting used to the crackling sound. Goathead. In turn, the pigeon sat opposite him, blinking its little eyes innocently and occasionally shouting out a request for a 50% discount. Duncan ignored him as he curled his fingers and rubbed them together, watching the emerald fire at their tips shoot into the air. He was sure that the brass compass, despite merging with the dove, remained an anomalous object that he could manipulate. The next moment, the emerald spiritual flame flared up even stronger, and at the same time it flared up in the spaces between the feathers of the dove. Then the brass compass hanging on his chest opened with a click, and the slightly illusory arrow under the transparent glass of the compass slowly stopped under Duncan's will, and the dial, which depicted many mysterious symbols, was gradually filled with flames. All this time I did not react in any way but only naturally bathed in spiritual fire, as if waiting for Duncan's command. Duncan voluntarily dissipated the flames before they completely filled the brass compass. Having finished the test, Duncan mentally made several conclusions. The compass still works, but it has another strange carrier. I'm not yet sure what role this dove has in all this. Maybe it somehow helps the compass. I still don't understand what kind of compass this is. So for now it's better to abandon the second spiritual journey. First you need to prepare, and during the next test you need to be sure to monitor the compass and dough for changes. There is a connection between the dove and me, and with the use of the spiritual flame, this connection becomes more pronounced and I can even directly control to some extent where it appears. But that is all I can do with it. I clearly has his own will and moves as he sees fit, and will not necessarily follow all my orders, unlike other items on the Lost House. In addition, it can speak, has some ability to think and independently judge problems compared to ordinary anomalies. This pigeon seems closer in nature to Goathead Duncan mentally summarize the information known at the moment. And finally his gaze fell on the obsidian dagger the black blade of which resembled a dry, crooked finger. It was the same object held in the hands of the cultist who wore the golden sun mask and led the sacrificial rituals in the sewers. Duncan arrived at a meeting place supposedly located underground in the city-state of Prand using soul projection, and returned using soul cutting, and therefore assumed that the entire process took place solely there, and nothing would return to the ship with him. But now before, it literally contained an obsidian dagger used for rituals. After a moment's thought, Duncan reached out and took it. He felt a cool touch. It was a real thing. Duncan released some of the spiritual flames again, allowing them to envelop the blade, and from the blank response, 
it became clear to him that the supernatural power once contained in this dagger had indeed dissipated. As he had suspected during the sacrifice, this dagger was not a true anomaly, but rather an extension of some supernatural force, or a temporary object into which that force was infused. Duncan didn't know what classification system for anomalies existed in this world, but he guessed that the dagger was not considered such a rarity. At least it looked like a mass-produced item. Did you bring this? He asked, looking at I, and raised an obsidian dagger in his hand. Is this especially for me? The dove, without moving, looked directly at Duncan with its small red eyes and did not respond to the question. Duncan. He asked again, but the dove still did not move, as if it had suddenly turned into an inanimate statue. The sudden and unusual change made Duncan frown, but just as he was about to stimulate I with his spiritual flame, the bird woke up, jumped twice in place and shouted, Take this battle axe! Take this battle axe! Axe! Take it! Okay, okay, I understand. You don't have to answer the question I just asked. Duncan hastily waved his hand, urging the dove to shut up while he collected his words. So do you know how you brought this dagger here? Or are you able to take physical objects from your travels? The dove thought for a moment, then lowered its head and pecked Duncan's finger. Special offer. Delivery included in the price. I'll just pretend that I understand, Duncan said and sighed, thinking that it was time to end communication with the bird. He then stood up from the table and looked in the direction of the captain's cabin. Goathead and Alice were still there, and their eager, friendly exchange continued. The doll lady did not make a sound for a long time, and Goathead had just begun to tell the seventeenth recipe for stewed seaweed. Duncan felt it necessary to go and save his only and surprisingly most normal crew member at the moment. On the other hand, he also sat in his bedroom for too long and caused an unusual commotion in the meantime, so he wanted to go out and show himself in order to calm down the Goathead. However, before leaving, he cast a hesitant glance at I, who was pacing around the table. Should he take the dove with him? But how can we explain where it came from? Duncan hesitated for only two seconds before he decisively grabbed the dove and placed it on his shoulder. He planned to stay at the lost house for a long time, and the dove, it seemed, would always be with him now. There was a lot he didn't know about this pigeon, but as an anomaly with the ability to speak and move, it would be difficult to hide as securely as any inanimate thing. He won't be able to hide the fact that there is an extra crew member on board, and if he hides it now, it will cause great damage to Captain Duncan's image in the future if it becomes known. So, he will simply leave the bedroom with the dove and say that this is his new trophy. And he will not explain anything to Goathead. The captain does not need to explain anything to the first mate. The first assistant will figure everything out himself. As for the strange words of the dove that pop up from time to time, which must have sounded incomprehensible to the inhabitants of this world, he will not explain them either. Let Goathead and Alice sort it out themselves. With a well-fed pigeon on his shoulder, Duncan stood up and, straightening up, calmly walked in the direction of the captain's cabin. The dove proudly stuck out its chest and shouted as if announcing, The classic musical voice is as pleasant as the classic herbal tea. Welcome to the show. Seriously speaking, the moment the dove on his shoulder spoke, Duncan suddenly didn't want to go out. From the bedroom even despite his strong nerves. At that moment, he really wanted a parrot to sit on his shoulder like all ordinary captains, or even a little monkey but he had already pushed the door to the captain's cabin and now he could not turn back. In the cabin where the navigation table was located, Goathead was cheerfully chatting about the twelfth recipe for stewed sea fish, when the sound of the door opening to the captain's quarters finally interrupted him. He immediately turned his dark wooden head towards the sound, and seeing Duncan, spoke in a joyful and animated tone. Ah, captain, you're finally out! I have to tell you, Miss Alice is a wonderful conversationalist. I haven't talked to anyone so well for a long time, you know. Duncan simply ignored Goathead's words and looked first at him and then at the doll, which was sitting on a chair and holding its head in its hands, covering its ears. Despite this, Alice's gaze remained as sluggish as if she had sat through twelve advanced mathematics lessons in a row. She didn't even react to the fact that Duncan approached her. Duncan, she tore off her own head, Goathead explained, without waiting for Duncan to say anything. And I don't know why she did it. How powerful was Goathead's chatter that it forced the damn doll to tear off its head and cover its ears. And while Duncan was in shock, Goathead, who spoke condescendingly, finally noticed a strange creature next to the captain. His wooden head turned slightly, and his dark eyes suddenly stared at the dove sitting on Duncan's shoulder. Hmm? Captain, on your shoulder. His name is I, and from now on he will be my pet, Duncan answered briefly, using as few words as possible to avoid possible loopholes, and at the same time observing Goathead's reaction. Your pet? Goathead was taken aback for a moment and then, as if he remembered something, he replied, Ah, earlier the lost house sensed that you had temporarily left the ship. Were you going on a journey through the spiritual world? And this is the trophy you took with you. Journey through the spirit world. 
A phrase he had never heard before suddenly sounded from Goathead's mouth, and Duncan thought about the brass compass that was kept in his bedroom, about the message left once the real Captain Duncan, and about the wonderful experience of moving to distant lands, correlated these events in his head, and, feeling that Goathead's guess might be correct, nodded with an indifferent expression on his face. Just a small trip. After this phrase, Goathead unexpectedly praised him. Ah, how worthy of the great Captain Duncan. Even a simple journey in the spirit world brought you a trophy. What is this? A dove? To become your pet, does it have to be unusual? Did you even hang your compass on it? It's ah, sure. Your decision is always correct, but what's so special about this pigeon? Could it be Duncan heard a delicate hint in Goathead's compliment, and was surprised to realize that he obviously knew something about the brass compass that was now hanging on I's chest? And that this compass was obviously of great importance to the real Captain Duncan couldn't just end up with just anyone. But even if he heard this hint, he could not do anything about it, because the compass was now tied to the dove, and even, judging by the feedback from the manipulation of the spiritual flame, the dove seemed to be a compass. Duncan tried to think of something. His face remained impassive, and in this moment of concentration, I, who was perched on his shoulder, suddenly let out a loud coo, and then, flapping his wings, he flew towards the goat's head. The dark eyes of the goat head instantly turned to the pigeon, and it swooped down furiously and pecking it on the head asked, Do you want to top up your account? Duncan. An anomaly with intelligence? The goat-headed man was clearly amazed, and immediately after that he asked in extreme surprise, Can this pigeon talk? Duncan immediately cut him off, politely reminding him, You can talk too. Once on the table, the pigeon named I walked in the opposite direction from Duncan, repeating, Does this sound like words? Does this sound like words? It's similar to the words. Seeing this, Duncan rubbed his fingertips, and with the appearance of emerald flames, the dove walking on the table disappeared in the blink of an eye, and the next, it was back on his shoulder. Yes, an anomaly that has intelligence and is under my control. Duncan nodded to the goat head. Are there any other questions? Oh, of course not, of course not. No problem, everything is under the control of the great Captain Duncan, Goathead hastily replied. Having finished with Goathead, Duncan turned his attention to Alice, who was still holding her head in her hands. Perhaps previous experience had steeled Duncan's nerves somewhat, or he was simply used to it. But now, watching Alice hold her head in her hands, Duncan found it a little. Dear. He reached out his hand and patted Alice on the shoulder. Wake up! Wake up! Alice immediately jerked, as if awakening from a long nightmare. And then a voice came from the head she was holding in her hand. Ship, 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 ship. Attach yours first. Head back in place, Duncan said. Only after these words did Alice react, hastily returned her head to its place, and after the joints clicked and closed, she spoke again. Oh, Captain, are you back? It seemed to me that you weren't here a second ago. Has Mr. Goathead finished? No, we were just discussing some recipes for stewed sea fish. It can be illuminated. And another time, answered Goathead. Shut up, Duncan said curtly. Hmm? Alice, on the other hand, visibly trembled the moment Goathead opened his mouth. An expression of horror appeared on the face of the damned doll, and even if the next moment Goathead obediently fell silent at the command of the captain, she still glanced towards the navigation table with a trembling in her body. Duncan suspected that she would not set foot in the captain's cabin for a long time. Considering this, he finally asked with curiosity, What is the reason you came to me? I am, Alice thought, as if she had already forgotten her purpose for visiting the captain's cabin because of the conversation with Goathead. But after a few seconds, she still managed to remember. Oh yes, I just wanted to ask if there are showers on the ship. Seawater got into my box and now I feel a little discomfort in my joints. After finishing speaking, Alice was clearly embarrassed, but in fact, Duncan felt even more embarrassed than she did, because it was he who threw her box from the ship into the sea, and he threw it away several times. Despite the embarrassment he felt, Duncan tried to keep his face unchanged and his tone even. Just for this? Alice sat down on the chair with restraint. Just for this. Fresh water is an extremely valuable resource for many seagoing vessels, and swimming is a luxury that requires restraint, Duncan said with an indifferent expression on his face but then suddenly smiled. But you're lucky, the Lost House is not an ordinary ship, so fresh water is not a problem here. Follow me, the bathtub is located just below the middle deck, but to get there, you first need to go up to the upper deck. Alice immediately stood up. She didn't want to stay even for a second in the place where the goat's head was. Duncan looked back at Goathead before leaving the room and ordered, you remain at the helm. Only after that did he get up, open the door to the captain's cabin, and lead Alice onto the deck. Night fell. A clear night sky stretched over the endless sea. For the first time after many days of continuous clouds, Duncan stood under the clear night sky of this world. But suddenly he stopped and stared at the night sky. The night sky, so dark and completely starless. 
Duncan did not see a single celestial body. The only thing he saw was a grayish-white gap, which seemed to tear the entire sky. Small cracks spread along its edges, as if they had cut through the flesh, and from the gap itself, a dull, grayish-white slowly flowed radiance and dissolved in the sky like blood in the deep sea. That pale scar in the sky illuminated the entire endless sea more than twice as bright as the moonlight Duncan remembered. In some ways, this starless, moonless sky with only one scar shocked Duncan even more than the sun encased in runic rings. Because no matter how abnormal the sun is, it illuminates the world under Duncan's feet. And in his perception as an earthling, the so-called sun is nothing more than one of the billions of celestial bodies. All distorted visions are limited to the sun, beyond which there could be stars. Although for a creature trapped by gravity, the sun is equivalent to the entire world, but at least this way Duncan can still understand and accept the scale of the visions. However, in the night sky Duncan did not see anything that could be called a celestial body. No stars, no moon, no distant starry river. There was only a scar that covered the sky with some incomprehensible light and shadow, and emitted a pale semblance of fog. The entire endless sea was enveloped by this pale, snow-like semblance of fog. And further, much further than the sun, there is only distant nothingness and an even greater vision. Duncan silently stared at the sky while countless questions and guesses swarmed in his head. Where are the other planets? Haven't they existed from the very beginning? Or is the world beneath my feet a celestial body located in the vacuum of space, so distant from other stars that the night sky is dark and starless? What is this pale scar that stretches across the sky? Is this a gap in space? Is it possible to touch this celestial structure? Or is it just an illusion floating in the treacherous sky of the endless sea? Captain? Finally a voice brought Duncan out of his thoughts. Alice the doll looked nervously at the captain who suddenly stopped in place and was slightly frightened when she saw that his face suddenly became even more gloomy and serious than before. Are you okay? Has anything changed in the sky? Will there be a strong storm soon? I heard the sailors outside the box say, Nothing, Duncan said quietly, then suddenly took his eyes off the sky, looked at Alice and repeated, as if talking to himself, Nothing. Then we Duncan stepped forward with a calm expression on his face, as if nothing had happened. Come on, I'll take you to the cabin. There you can wash yourself. The world has once again shown Duncan its bizarre and grotesque nature, and this bizarreness and grotesqueness, it seems, is far from over. Duncan already realized that an unknown number of amazing phenomena awaited him in the future, and if every time he meets them he panics, then panic is all that will remain in his life. If the last decades of his life on Earth had taught him anything, it was one lesson that was most useful today. If a problem exists, there is a way to solve it. The problem will not disappear by itself if he denies it. Just as the stars will not appear in the grotesque sky in front of him because he questions it. For the world to be the way it is, there must be a reason. And since everything exists here, it is an irrefutable fact that the most absurd and strange phenomenon is an objective fact of existence. As the captain of the Lost House today, Duncan felt that he would have a lot of time to slowly understand the essence of this world. Alice didn't know what caused the captain's silence during the journey. She only knew that the atmosphere around Duncan suddenly became somewhat oppressive but this oppressive feeling suddenly disappeared as soon as they reached their destination. Duncan led the doll lady into the cabin, which served as a bathroom for the senior sailors. For ordinary sailing ships, such a cabin was considered a certain luxury, and therefore ordinary sailors did not have access to it. Living conditions on ancient sailing ships were actually quite harsh, especially on sea voyages. Limited fresh water, rotten food, poor medical care and the psychological problems of long voyages plagued every sailor. Many of them could not be completely solved on Earth even before the advent of the Industrial Age. As far as Duncan knows, the first sailing ships on Earth did not even have toilets for the ordinary crew, and the average sailor usually solved his problems on the grid facing the sea, a process that also demanded to know which way the wind was blowing. Bathing was an even bigger problem. Some sailors preferred to rinse off with seawater, but most simply did not wash for weeks or even months. After all, hygiene was the least of the problems compared to scurvy, bubonic plague, and mass hysteria caused by enormous mental stress. But ironically or not, on the ghost ship that everyone was afraid of, these problems were solved. The fresh water tanks at the Lost House refilled themselves. The food stored in the warehouse did not spoil. The ghost captain did not get sick. And Alice's neck problem was not the result of sailing. Apart from the headache of dealing with Goathead, this ship is actually quite livable. A pipe next to the bathroom runs to a fresh water tank from where water is collected. The bath plug is hanging there. Don't lose it. Current conditions are limited. There is no hot water on board, but I don't think you need it. Duncan described to Alice the comforts of the cabin. These mundane impressions were, however, the fruit of his research over the past few days. I just need to rinse my joints. 
Alice replied, looking at the various things in the cabin with slight curiosity and excitement, and nodding her head as she listened to Duncan. I'm just a doll and I don't need hot water. Duncan nodded, but then looked at Alice with a somewhat strange expression on his face. By the way, do you know how to take a bath? Do you have similar life experience? Alice froze for a moment, confused, and then said very seriously, I guess this should work. I'll just take the joints off, wash them and put them back. Duncan. He looked at Alice, who was looking at him with innocent eyes. Have you thought about how you will put them in place yourself after you take them off? Duncan asked, realizing that the doll standing in front of him, who had never left its box before, might not know about this. I can't help you with this. Alice. Now that you've said it. And I highly recommend that you don't disassemble your joints too often. Duncan warned again in a serious tone. Even if the structure of your body allows it. Alice was slightly confused. Why? Your body parts will start falling off if you take them off too often. Duncan said helplessly. He didn't think there would be so much nuance to being on a ship with a cursed doll. It was never mentioned in the novels, movies, or TV shows. I wouldn't want you to come out on deck one day and suddenly fall apart before my eyes. No one on board knows how to put the doll's joints back in place. At the same time, he paused and added, In addition, you already have enough problems with your neck. Alice imagined this picture in her head for a second, and then frowned. Oh yes, yes, I understood what needs to be done. This is to the best, Duncan said, giving the doll with less than enough life experience one more worried look before turning and walking away. I'll go. I still have a lot to do. Just don't get into too much trouble here. Yes, Captain, thank you, Captain, Alice replied. But just as Duncan was about to leave the cabin, she suddenly spoke again. Oh yes. Captain Duncan paused and glanced towards her. What else? Captain, I suddenly thought that you don't seem so scary. Alice looked at Duncan's back and carefully weighed her next words. This goat's head said that you are the most formidable captain in the endless sea, the most incomprehensible disaster, but... But what? But you seem quite talkative to me, and like a slightly worried parent. Duncan did not turn around and was silent for a couple of seconds before suddenly asking, How do you know what a family is? Do you have it? Alice hesitated for a moment and slowly shook her head. I don't think so. Then don't talk about parents. Stay and live on this ship, and I will take care of your accommodation. Oh yes, Captain. Real life is different from what we are shown in various stories, films, and television shows. And one of the biggest differences is that, while living in reality, you have to think about a lot of real and trivial details. For example, does a moving cursed doll need maintenance? Will Alice's frequent disassembly of joints cause her to suddenly fall apart when walking in the future or not? Are the corned beef and dried cheese on the ghost ship expired or not? Do superheroes who fight the forces of evil day and night sleep? Do the forces of evil that fight superheroes usually go to the supermarket after the fight or not? History never tells you this. The people in them are always shown to be almost perfect. The cursed dolls in these stories only need figures to pop out of corners and crevices to scare people. Just as the ghost captain in them never bothers that his ship only has corned beef and hundred-year-old dried cheese. Standing outside the cabin, Duncan sighed increasingly realizing that it seemed like it would take more than just determination to last long on this ship. He also had to resolve a number of practical issues, especially after increasing the size of the crew. There weren't many food supplies left on the ghost ship, as Duncan knew very well. The ship had an unlimited supply of fresh water, and only that. The ingredients stored in the food pantry were not automatically replenished, and the only edible items there were corned beef and dried cheese. And although the food showed no signs of rotting due to the special nature of the lost house, Duncan still suspected that they had been stored for at least a century. In addition, the ship did not have a change of clothes that would fit Alice, although the damned doll did not mention the need for it. And there was no entertainment, not even chess or poker. The Endless Sea was called that for a reason, but the Lost House was unlikely to receive supplies from it, and it did not seem to have a reliable port for stopping and repairs, let alone a communication channel with civilized city-states on land. Goathead didn't seem to be worried about this at all. But Duncan was right now seriously thinking about how he could improve the situation with the lack of supplies on the ship. In addition, he was also thinking about how to establish contact with land-based city-states. Drifting blindly across the sea forever was not the most effective way to explore. Information about the world must be obtained on land, which Duncan became even more convinced of after traveling through the spiritual world. Putting that aside, even for the sake of his physical and mental health, he should try to communicate more with the city-states on land and the civilized society of this world. Otherwise, he was very afraid that after a long life at sea, he would truly turn into a twisted, dark, and lonely ghost captain. Ghost. Duncan turned his head slightly to look at the pigeon named I, who was sitting on his shoulder preening its feathers. Mainly, his gaze fell on the brass compass on I's chest. The dove tilted its head, looked at its owner, and said, Build another base. Arrange the slime. Do you even know how to control them? 
Duncan was silent for a while. Most of the time the dove spoke absolute nonsense, but sometimes his words were so appropriate that one could not help but suspect that he was actually quite wise. It seems that for now, traveling through the spirit world is the only effective way to get to surface city-states. Despite the fact that there were too many uncertainties and mysterious incidents in this matter, similar to what happened after the previous journey, Duncan knew that he would soon make his next journey through the spirit world, not only to collect information about the land, but also in order to test and master a very useful ability as quickly as possible. No less important than traveling through the spiritual world, Duncan considered I's special ability to bring back objects from these journeys. If he returned the dagger, could he return anything else? What are the rules and restrictions on what this bird can bring? Can I control this process? After several minutes of thought, Duncan decided to ask the pigeon directly. Do you know how you took that knife from there with you? The dove thought for a moment, then said in a deep tone, You need more crystal ore. Duncan. He decided that it was better to refuse communication with the dove for now, and that it would be safer to check everything in person the next time he went on a journey through the spiritual world. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk inside the cabin with the bath, Alice finally figured out how to get water into the bath, and generally understood how to take it. In the limited conditions of the ghost ship, she could only take a cold bath but for the doll this did not pose much of a problem. But before she climbed into the bathtub, she decided to greet the entire cabin first. She patted the huge oak trunk, tapped the supports supporting the cabin, and then her toes on the floor, and stood on her tiptoes to pull on the ropes and hooks hanging from the ceiling. Hello, my name is Alice, she cheerfully greeted the icy-to-touch things, just as she had greeted Goathead before. From now on, I will live on this ship. Nothing in the cabin responded to her greeting, but Alice didn't care at all. Goathead said that the Lost House was alive, and so were many things on it, although none of them seemed truly intelligent like Goathead, and could not even talk. This did not stop Alice from treating the entire ship as a neighbor who needed greet. The Lost House is a living object, like herself. Making sure that her greeting sounded polite and appropriate, Alice, in high spirits, took off her luxurious dress, and somewhat awkwardly, climbed into an oak barrel filled with water. The first step is to remove my head and wash it, since the joints of my neck are not particularly strong. The doll lady thought her plan was very reasonable. Deep into the night in the city state of Prand, the bustle of the day finally died down, and under the pale, clear light of the night sky, the prosperous pearl of the sea fell into sleep. But in this silent darkness, the sleeping city has watchers. In the great bell tower, the tallest building in the city state of Prand, a young woman with long gray hair and unusually large stature stands at a window overlooking the city. She had beautiful features but there was a conspicuous scar running across her left eye. She is taller than any average man, dressed in light silver-gray light armor and clearly well-trained judging by her muscular arms, in which lay a silver sword. Runes symbolizing waves are inscribed on the hilt of the sword, and the blade is covered with shimmer that seems to slide along it. Behind the woman, the sounds of the mechanism continued to be heard. This mechanism of a huge bell tower moved smoothly under the influence of a steam engine. A complex structure of gears and connecting links running through the roof and floor drove a dial on the upper floors, which faced four sides, and something like a starry sky projector hidden in the depths of the building. Judging by the sound, the huge and complex mechanism was working perfectly, and no evil forces had disturbed the sacred steam core. But in Inquisitor Vanna's heart there was still a vague uneasiness, a bad feeling, as if something was about to happen or had already happened, and she could not do anything about it, which made her feel irritated. Footsteps were heard from the direction of the stairs, and the gray-haired woman at the window turning towards the sound saw a priest in a long robe ascending the stairs. The priest carried a brass incense burner in his hands, the smoke from which slowly curled around him. The priest walked to the machine column in the center of the room, removed the old incense burner that hung on the column and replaced it with a new one. After observing the smoke coming from the incense burner and making sure that it was flying unimpeded around the functioning gears and mechanisms, he whispered the name of the storm goddess, and turned his head to the gray-haired woman standing in front of the window. Your Excellency Inquisitor, are you on night guard again? I have had a bad feeling for the last few days, and especially this night. Bad feeling? Why? The priest raised his head, his eyes reflecting deep concern. Did the goddess send you an omen? Not very clear. The young female Inquisitor shook her head. I had a vague feeling that something was approaching the city. Gods, possessing supreme power and incredible abilities live in the cornerstones of this world, observing it with the help of visions that transcend space and time, and initiates who turn to the gods with the help of their spiritual powers can, to some extent, see the future or changes taking place in some unknown corner of the world at the moment, thanks to their hidden connection with the gods. These visions are not bound by space and time, 
and therefore carry the danger of subspace erosion. But for the determined believers, this dangerous and powerful force is the only thing they can rely on to protect the fragile flames of civilization in this endless sea. And for many days now, the devout inquisitor had seen a similar vision. One day, half asleep, she saw a vast sea, painted black, and then a thunderous sound from the depths of the sea. A sea split in two, a terrible depression reaching to the seabed. Then a huge ship, blazing in emerald fire, rose from the hollow and slowly floated through the air like a bird. And behind it, a formless giant appeared, covered from head to toe with starlight, and began to walk step by step in the direction of the city-state of Prand. Only twice in her life has Inquisitor Vanna had an omen of such magnitude and horror. The first occurred as a child, when she awoke from a blood-filled nightmare, and subsequently lost her parents to a cultist attack, leaving a scar on her face that would remain there for the rest of her life. The second time was four years ago, when she dreamed of a dark sun rising beneath the city-state, resulting in the destruction of the largest stronghold of the Sun God cult that had infiltrated the city-state. To this day, the ghosts of the cult's minions lurk in the vast, complex and ancient tunnel system beneath the city-state, waging a pointless battle with the guardians of the church. For the third time, she saw a ship rise from the depths of the sea and bring a giant with it into the world. She lied to the priest about the omen. It was in fact very clear. So clear that she, the Inquisitor, lost sleep for several days. The priest looked into the stoic, gray-white eyes of the woman standing in front of him and, after a long hesitation, spoke. But you prayed to the goddess and it seems you did not receive bad responses? The goddess does not always warn of all dangers. Sometimes adversity is a kind of test, Vanna answered calmly. Enough about this. Is there any news from the Society of Explorers? The priest nodded immediately. We just received a message from there. The holy relics at the Society's headquarters have sensed the ship's presence in the southwestern waters. But there appears to be a problem with the telegraph on board the ship. We are currently unable to contact its crew. All we can determine so far is that the ship is approaching the coast of Prand. For some time disappeared from the perception of the holy relics, and then appeared from the air into the sea far from the intended course, at the moment out of reach and heading straight towards the city-state. Was on a mission to escort an anomaly before contact with him was lost, the Inquisitor muttered, frowning slightly. Instincts gained from years of encounters with terrible things screamed, making her wary. I remember the ship was called White Oak, right? Yes. White Oak. Captain Lawrence Creed, member of the Society of Explorers, an experienced captain. This ship, before sailing from the city-state of Rennes, reported to the church about the special cargo it was carrying, the priest said, remembering. By the way, the priest who accompanied this ship is a registered member of the Church of Storms. A member of the church? I hope it's not that bad, Vanna said in a serious tone. In any case, something happened to this ship. The entire route between Rennes and Prand is in a stable zone under the control of the Exploration Society but the ship was still able to disappear from the field of perception of the holy relics. I suspect that the White Oak may have briefly left the real world, or even gone somewhere it shouldn't. Inform the port guards that once the White Oak enters port, they will keep an eye on it, and no one or nothing will be allowed to leave the ship until all checks are completed. Did the city guards say anything? Please rest assured that it is your uncle. His Excellency the Consul ordered the port perimeter to be taken under control and raised the alarm level. From now until the alarm is lifted. All ships entering and leaving Prand will temporarily moor at the alternate port on the western side. That's good. Uncle has always been a cautious person. Finally, the tense expression disappeared from Vanna's face. If only he didn't involve ordinary people in this. The priest looked into Vanna's gray eyes and, carefully choosing his words, said, Do you think this ship was polluted? It's too early to say for sure, but ships that leave the real world for a short time, even when they eventually return, rarely remain normal. Maybe some items on board have unknowingly become anomalies. There may be mental illnesses hidden deep within the crew, or it may even be new sailors or the captain. It is never wrong to be the one who exercises the utmost vigilance on a sea vessel on which anomalous phenomena have occurred. Oh, I hope that everything is fine with this ship and its crew. The priest could not resist, and placing his hand on his chest, began to repeat the name of the goddess of storms. May the goddess of storms shelter those who dare to go out to sea. May they all be healthy, Vanna whispered a blessing, lowering her eyes, and then, as it were, reminded the priest standing in front of her. But if, unfortunately, they are not healthy, we must be prepared. Yes, I understand. Vanna nodded. But just at the moment when she was about to turn her attention to the cityscape outside the window, suddenly there were sounds from the direction of the stairs. Hasty steps. The next moment, a man in a black uniform with silver trim and an emblem on his chest depicting a wave and a dagger ran up the stairs with a brisk step. Your Excellency Inquisitor. 
the young guard took a couple of breaths and then said in a sharp tone, We discovered a place in the sewer for rituals of cultists who worshipped the sun god, and captured several of them. Vanna's expression instantly became very serious. Cultists who worship the dark sun. Wait, did you say you found a ritual site, not a shelter? Do they have the nerve to perform the rituals again? Yes, this was the site of the rituals, and we found evidence that a sacrifice was made, the guard said quickly. And yet, not far from the site of the ritual, a large number of victims were found. The hearts of most of them were sacrificed. Only something is wrong there, at the site of the ceremony. Vanna saw a mixture of absurdity and confusion on the guard's face. She picked up a heavy sword, blessed by the goddess of storms, and putting it on her back, headed towards the stairs. Lead on. I'll go to the place myself. Yes. The heavy consecrated sword hit the metal armor with a ringing sound, and descending the long staircase inside the great bell tower, Vanna entered the small square in front of her and saw that several members of the guard had already gathered here in combat readiness, and two steamwalkers, with a clanging sound emanating from their spider-like mechanical bodies. Without stopping, Vanna motioned for the guards to go and headed straight for one of the walkers, a massive machine the size of two two-wheeled carts that resembled a mechanical spider lying on its back. Its steel limbs were edged with wheels for sliding on level surfaces and steel hooks for special conditions, and on both sides there were cabins for firing weapons. Purely technological creations are unlikely to have much impact on anomalies or visions, but the devastating firepower will destroy the heretics who hide behind them and manipulate them. Of course, the power of this thing is limited in the sewer, but it can easily block the exit, which will be very useful. Holy 8 mm rounds in a weapon can send an entire crowd of heretics trying to escape to serve their lord into subspace in the blink of an eye. The silver-haired and gray-eyed inquisitor jumped into the walker as two other guards easily climbed into the cabins on either side of the armor, followed by a series of sounds from a series of cylinders and compression tubes building up pressure. White steam erupted from the walker's joints, and then a massive mechanical spider rose, leaped onto the nearest main road, and slid towards the nearest sewer entrance. The massive, heavy mechanical spider clamped its long limbs on its belly, and using the wheels on its belly, slid down the straight road at breakneck speed, but Inquisitor Vanna stood as steady as if she was part of the machine herself. The cold night air that flowed through the streets was a great way to clear her mind. The cultists who worshipped the sun god were a mortal danger to modern civilization, and unfortunately, there were many such dangers. There will always be evil glances cast from the depths of subspace, and there will always be foolish mortals trying to gain these unknown powers. And between such conspiracies between the ancient gods and mortals in the depths of the city-state since ancient times, distorted things, forbidden children and polluted remnants remained, ready at any moment to tear apart the fabric of the order of society. Of all these dangers, the followers of the sun god caused the greatest anxiety and worry among the defenders of the city-state of Prand. They are not only cultists, but also a product of a lost part of the history of the old world. And the most dangerous thing about these heretics, compared to most other cults, is that they have a certain belief that has not changed for a thousand years. This belief revolves around the age of order under the old sun, and it is not only self-sufficient, but even has a true solar calendar, which is not recognized by modern civilization. They are firmly convinced that they are the descendants of some ancient civilization that has long since sunk into oblivion, and that this glorious ancient civilization will definitely be reborn. As an inquisitor of the Church of the Deep, Vanna had little interest in the sophistry of the cult, but she knew that it was the existence of this sophistry that gave the followers of the sun god a stubbornness far superior to that of other heretics, allowing them to withstand blow after blow and grow day and night in the shadows of many cities, states. But their revival in Pran still came as something of a surprise to Vanna. After the unprecedented repression that occurred four years ago, the believers of the sun god and the city-state of Prand were exterminated. Several subsequent investigations revealed that the heretics had likely moved their core members to the neighboring city-states of Lunds, Moko, and even further afield to Cold Harbor, leaving only a few unruly minions in Prand. These minions began hiding in the sewers, relying on their knowledge of the underworld and the twisted blessings given to them by the Dark Sun to escape the guards. Four years later their numbers have dwindled, so all they can do now is survive. But now, four years later, they suddenly gathered again and even dared to risk exposure by performing a ritual of sacrifice. Who or what gave them such courage? Or is something big about to happen in this city-state? Some reason enough for the cultists to turn the Dark Sun's attention to Prand, even at the risk of having the last remnants of their flames extinguished? Between the vibration and noise from the steam core working inside the mechanical spider, and the faint scent escaping from the steam vent into the night air, Vanna momentarily broke from her thoughts and looked up at the sky. The pale glow of the creation hung high in the night sky, illuminating the houses, chimneys, and towers of the city. 
Now their group was walking along the edge of an industrial area and huge hydrothermal steam pipes that spanned the factory buildings like giant blood vessels. Vanna vaguely recalled the past, the deepest and most terrible night she could remember, that same blood-filled night when her uncle fled with her on his back from the raging flames. All the streets they came across along the way were littered with walking corpses, engulfed in a general hallucination. The next moment, due to a strong shock under her feet, Vanna emerged from her memories. The smooth road ended, and they found themselves in an abandoned area on the edge of the city. The road surface here was full of potholes, so the two mechanical spiders finished sliding, and stretching out their long, lumpy limbs, began to walk along the uneven surface. It didn't take them long to reach the entrance to the abandoned sewer. Another group of eight people were already waiting for them here, cordoning off the nearby area to prevent anyone else from getting close to the entrance. Here, Vanna greeted her men, and then followed the leader straight into the depths of the sewers. Through deep tunnels and muddy paths, Vanna eventually reached a secret ritual site, where she saw more guards and priests performing purification rites. In the center of this place stood a makeshift altar, a wooden platform that looked as if it had been burned by flames, and on it could be seen a blasphemous totem erected by believers in the sun god, also scorched by the flames, but not damaged. Around him lay dozens of cultists on the ground with their hands tied, most of them trembling, a few with parted lips silently muttering their blasphemous prayers. But since the ritual site was destroyed and the goddess of storms was already focused on this place, the prayers of these heretics made no sense. Not far from the altar, the remains of the fallen, recovered from nearby caves, lay on linen painted with runes, and hastily arrived grave diggers inspected the condition of each body. Several priests walked around the altar, holding a slightly swaying copper chain in their hands. The incense burners at the ends of these chains emitted white smoke that touched the ground near the altar, and immediately turned an alarming shade of black, while more white smoke carried away the pollution left here by the dark sun. Your Excellency Inquisitor, please come here. This is where we found something wrong, said the young guard, pointing to several corpses next to the altar. Please be careful, it's very dirty here. The bathtub walked straight to the corpses and subconsciously frowned at the sight of one of them. It was a cultist in a golden mask, undoubtedly a priest directly responsible for the rites on this blasphemous altar, and there was a terrible hole in his chest. What happened here? Vanna frowned. Did this fanatical heretic get too excited at the end of the ritual and also sacrifice himself? I've never heard of cultists who worship the dark sun having such rules. That's what's strange, because he didn't sacrifice himself. The man who brought Vanna here immediately shook his head. A look appeared on his face. A bit of a strange expression. According to the descriptions of the cultists, caught in the act, their envoy was sacrificed. Sacrificed. Vanna's eyebrow shot up. What kind of nonsense is this? Indeed, it is very similar to the delirium of a madman. The guard helplessly spread his hands. In fact, when we arrived here, most of the cultists had already become half crazy. Already half crazy? Yes, their ritual of sacrifice clearly did not go according to plan. Many of them became infected with madness, and some even began to kill each other. At that moment, they seemed to consider each other monsters, possessed by some kind of horror, and it was because they ran madly out of the sewers that they were noticed by guards patrolling nearby, which led to the discovery of this place. When we arrived, few could remain conscious and answer questions, and the few who could still speak freely insisted that they be sacrificed. Have you become infected with madness? Did they start killing each other, and thought that others became monsters? Vanna's expression immediately became very serious. Have they already been examined? Is this really the result of pollution from the dark sun? There are no traces of pollution from an external source, more like spontaneous madness, the causes of which are rooted in their inner world, the guard said, after which he pointed his finger at a young woman in a long black dress who was walking among the cultists. Mistress Heidi is already here, and if she confirms that these cultists are not tainted by the dark sun, we will only have to think of it as mass hypnosis. Vanna looked at the woman in a black dress who was checking the mental state of some cultists, who, noticing her gaze, also looked at her in greeting. This woman looked about twenty years old, but there was a calmness about her that was much more mature than her age. Her long black hair was pulled back into a neat bun, and the pale blue crystal earrings on her earlobes reflected the glow of the nearby gas lamps. So, Heidi is here too. She was sent by the mayor's office? Vanna asked the young guard standing next to her. No, Mrs. Heidi happened to be nearby when it happened and as soon as she received the news about this, she immediately came. Is there anything bad about that? There is nothing. Heidi, although she is an employee of the mayor's office, has also been associated with the church for a long time, and upon her return, it will not be difficult for her to write everything down. 
Vanna shook her head and again focused her attention on the current matter. After examining the insane and deceased cultist, she casually asked, What else did the cultists who could communicate say? What happened to them? They were confused in their speeches, but we were able to understand something. They mentioned that the ritual of sacrifice had already ended when suddenly someone caught a runaway sacrifice near the meeting place. So the messenger decided to sacrifice this sacrifice, God of the Sun, the guard said, remembering. The cultists stood to the side of the altar and did not exactly see what was happening there. They only saw that the sacrifice pierced in the heart did not die, but instead pronounced the name of the Sun God and pointed to the messenger as a sacrifice, as a result of which the messenger was sacrificed as a sacrifice. The person who was chosen as a sacrifice said the name of the evil god, and then sacrificed the person who performed the ritual. As if she had heard something out of this world, Vanna's mind took everything said as absurd, but then again, these words came from a trained, loyal, and reliable church guard, so she had to take it seriously. However, a strange expression still appeared on her face. How is this even possible? And even if that were the case, wouldn't all sacrifices kill the cultists? Did someone say that this is possible? Even the worst cultist takes an absolutely dominant position when performing the ritual. So how can the words of a weak commoner cause a ceremony to get out of control? Moreover, we examined this cultist and found traces of deep pollution on his body. He is a real baptized person, and according to the cultists at the crime scene, he was holding a dagger with a blessing in his hand specifically for the rituals. Having said this, the young guard shook his head and then walked over to another body lying next to him. But let's better take a look and see everything for yourself. This is the sacrifice that killed the cultist. Vanna glanced at the guard, and then her gaze fell on the corpse, and in the next second it became sharper. It was a thin young man, even closer in size to a teenager due to excessive thinness, and the most noticeable anomaly on him was a large hole in his chest. He was sacrificed. Yes, and judging by the marks on the altar and the statements of the cultists, I am afraid that this sacrifice had already lost its heart before it ended up on the altar, the guard said in a serious tone. So what actually happened is this. A walking corpse, in full view of everyone, killed the cultist who led the ritual on the altar. Necromancer's trick? Vanna thought. No, the power of the Dark Sun restrains the necromancers, so the walking corpse he controls would not be able to approach the Dark Sun totem. Maybe he came to life under the influence of an anomaly. Have you checked the lighting around? She asked, suddenly looking up at the guards next to her. Are there any unlit underground rooms within a radius of 500 meters? We checked everything. There are no unlit underground rooms nearby. Even the cultists are aware of their danger. They left torches and oil lamps in the caves where they disposed of the remains. And, it must be said, they did so with great care. For a moment Vanna said nothing, but only bowed before the young man's body, studying the sacrifice that sacrificed the cultist in front of everyone, and caused the ritual to completely get out of control. At the same time she reached out her hand to open the eyelids of the corpse, trying to find any trace of the heretical power left behind. Suddenly a light seemed to flicker in the corners of her eyes, and she saw that the young man's eyelids opened slightly, and an eerie emerald light burst out of his empty eyes. A tiny spark flashed at the tip of the index finger of Vanna's outstretched right hand, and then disappeared. Vanna instantly took the dagger from her belt with her left hand, and without hesitation waved it, cut off the index finger on her right hand, and then threw it at the forehead of the corpse. The sacred dagger with runes immediately burst into flames which completely consumed the corpse. It took her less than a second to do all this, and at the moment when the corpse was engulfed in flames she straightened up and took two steps back, after which she took a bottle of sacred oil from her belt and poured it on her right hand, which was bleeding like crazy. The moment the oil touched the flesh, a cloud of white smoke instantly formed at the sight of the wound. The pain was excruciating, but Vanna's expression remained unchanged, as she saw that the guard walking behind her quickly took the sword from his belt and with one blow cut off the head of the burning sacrifice after which he threw a mixture of seaweed extract and silver powder into the flames. Accompanied by a continuous roar and flames that suddenly shot up and almost touched the ceiling, the corpse was reduced to ashes in the blink of an eye. The flames did not spread to the other bodies nearby. The reaction of the guards was not long in coming. One half pulled out their steel swords and surrounded the bath, while the other half pulled out the revolvers hidden under their clothes and formed a guard around the perimeter. The two priests at the scene also took out their revolvers blessed their barrels with incense, chanted the name of the storm goddess Jemona, and pointed their weapons at the cultists, who became agitated by the change in the situation. Your Excellency, a young guard with a steel sword in his hand approached Vanna. Are you okay? Just now, there was some power left in this sacrifice, and it bypassed all the protection that the goddess had given me, even my psychic alertness. Vanna waved her hand and her gaze fell on her right hand. 
the gift of the goddess took effect. The index finger, cut off dagger, trembled and gradually recovered, but even when she felt the excruciating pain dissipate, her mind did not calm down. Something is wrong. Not only was the dark sun here, another powerful force may have attended this ritual, and it did not leave completely. It still has a plan, the Inquisitor said, and quickly made a decision. Remove all evidence from here and deliver it to the church under reliable guard. From now on, all examinations and interrogations will be carried out inside the church, and the crime scene will be completely cleared. Did you find anyone else here? The guard standing nearby immediately responded. Yes, we rescued a group of imprisoned sacrifices from another nearby cave. They are now temporarily housed in the next room with pipes. Take them with you and bring them to church. Although they are victims and must undergo a strict search before they are allowed to go home, Vanna said only then, as if suddenly remembering something. Where is Mrs. Heidi? Is she okay? I'm here. A calm female voice was heard nearby, and then a psychiatrist in a black dress, hired by the mayor's office, nodded measuredly to Vanna. Don't worry, I just didn't react at all, so what happened? As many classic stories say, the cultists attracted something more sinister than themselves. Vanna looked at the psychiatrist. I strongly recommend that you add an extra layer of protection when examining these cultists and hypnotizing them. There was a power here that shouldn't be there, and it's still here. When the night faded and the pale scar that dominated the sky dissipated, Duncan still stood on the deck and watched the sky, not missing a single detail of the alternation of day and night. He saw how the scar became transparent and illusory, as if it were a waking dream, and the grayish-white fog swirling around it first merged with the sky, and then with the scar itself, which did not change its position throughout the entire process. Duncan blinked, and another guess crept into his head. The scar in the sky had not changed its position, did this mean that it was not some distant astronomical structure? Is it just some kind of phantom imprinted on the atmospheric layer, moving in tandem with the endless sea? Or is it because the planet on which the endless sea is located, if it really is a planet, is in synchronous motion with the scar? Or maybe the scar really moves, but due to the short observation time, it cannot be detected with the naked eye. All sorts of guesses swarmed in his head, but Duncan understood perfectly well that until there was sufficient evidence, these would only be guesses. The sun rose. First a golden glow appeared at the border between sky and sea, then a huge luminous structure appeared from the sea, and a sphere enclosed in two concentric rune circles appeared in Duncan's field of vision, accompanied by a bright glow. The sun rose solemnly under the slow movement of these runic structures. This magnificent process seemed to echo in Duncan's mind like a sound, a low, powerful, slow-motion hum, but when he really focused on it, the sound suddenly disappeared. Duncan frowned slightly, wondering if he was imagining it but the memory of the sound was so vivid that he simply could not deny it. Is this the sun announcing its rise, or is this one of the many hallucinations caused by the endless sea? No one and nothing could answer his questions. The vast expanses of the endless sea kept all their secrets, as always. Pigeon Eye, as usual, sat comfortably on Duncan's shoulder and then abruptly stood up, flapped his wings, and looking at the sea, loudly demanded, More French fries! More fries! Duncan couldn't help but laugh as he looked at the strange pigeon. He suddenly felt that it was not so bad to have such a bird next to him, whose occasional barbs brought back pleasant memories of home. It's a pity that there are no French fries on board, he said, clicking the pigeon's beak, and turned towards the captain's cabin. But you're right about one thing. We need a snack. A few minutes later, the captain of the Lost House prepared himself a traditional breakfast of the ghost ship specialties in the captain's cabin. For dining, Duncan used a navigation table and placed several plates on it next to the map. Today's breakfast was the same as yesterday's dinner. Yesterday's lunch and every meal in the past. Corned beef, dried cheese, and water. Duncan sat down at the table and carefully laid out a napkin for himself. Opposite him stood a goat's head calmly. To his left sat Alice, a damned doll who had run in early in the morning to say hello. And to his right on the tabletop sat a strange dove. Duncan suddenly felt that this scene was starting to fit his ghost captain persona. A wooden goat sculpture symbolizing the devil. A cursed doll that couldn't be gotten rid of a bird with knowledge of the other world, and the ghost captain taking center stage. However, about the situation with the food on board, the Lost House was known only to those who were directly involved in it. Duncan sighed and looked down at his plate. The film's advertisement-like prologue ended and was followed by real life on the Lost House. He took a table knife and tried to cut off the cheese. A creaking and grinding noise was heard from the strong friction, but the cheese did not give way. Duncan then poked the corned beef next to him with his fork and was met with the same result. Alice watched this scene with curiosity and finally couldn't help but ask, Captain, is today's food the same as yesterday? Tomorrow it will be the same, Duncan answered and looked at the damn doll. Do you want to try it? Alice thought for a moment, then took a piece of corned beef in her hand, 
put it in her mouth, chewed it a little, and then spat it out. This is not tasty at all. You couldn't eat it even if it was delicious. Do you even have a stomach? Duncan reached out and took the remaining half of the corned beef from Alice's hands. You only tried it when I told you to. With these words, he cast another somewhat concerned look at the food on his plate. It was all he could find on board. The corned beef tasted like thick cardboard sprinkled with salt. The cheese tasted like firewood mixed with sand. And no matter what he did with the food, it smelled strange. But there was good news. The food, at least, was not rotten and would not poison anyone. The bad news was that the power of time nevertheless turned it into something extremely tasteless. Duncan had every reason to believe that the cheese was several years older than himself, and the corned beef had survived at least a century. The captain of the Lost House may not have had to worry about scurvy, but Duncan still craved healthy food. At the very least he wanted the food on his plate to be a little younger than himself, or at least the same age. The supply plan for the Lost House, and the land reconnaissance plan that he had been thinking about yesterday, popped into his head again. But their implementation will have to be postponed for a while. Duncan sighed and continued to frantically chop the firewood on his plate, while I, tilting his head, approached with curiosity and looked first at his master, and then at the contents of his plate. Little crystal ore. Duncan looked at the pigeon and threw it a few crumbs of cheese, which he managed to pinch off. I pecked at a few crumbs, and then froze in place, as if he had suddenly died. The bird froze for three or four seconds before suddenly moving, fluttering its wings and flying to a shelf nearby, said in an indignant voice, I'll die of hunger. I'll die on the street. I'll jump out of here, but I won't eat it. Duncan felt felt a little hurt, and the goat's head, which had stood silently on the table for half a day, finally gave up and began to make creaking wooden sounds. Before she could drill a hole in the table, Duncan finally nodded. If you have something to say, say it. Yes, Captain, Goathead exclaimed enthusiastically when he finally got the opportunity to speak. I've been wanting to ask since yesterday this one, the bird you brought. His name is I, right? Why can't I understand what he's talking about? I was thinking about this all evening yesterday. What do you mean you want to top up your account? Duncan immediately raised an eyebrow in surprise. He really didn't expect Goathead to hold out with the question until this moment. He underestimated the self-control of this creature. No need to worry. This bird thinks strangely. Duncan did not stop his carpentry work, but casually laid out a long, thought-out excuse, while creating a grinding sound with a knife and fork in his hands. She seems to communicate with people in a language that only she understands. And if you listen to her more, you can perhaps guess what her words mean. Really? Goathead muttered. But it always seemed to me that there was some kind of logic hidden in her words. As if behind them there was a complete, self-consistent set of knowledge. You were traveling in the spiritual world when you found her. Maybe this is some kind of projection from the depths. You know, the deeper you go, the more information from another time comes to the surface in the form of projections not the least of which is some fragment of a lost era, or even a future we didn't know about. Perhaps I is talking about another time and place. For a moment unnoticeable to the naked eye, Duncan stopped cutting the cheese, after which everything became as usual, and he said in an even tone, Then I wish you good luck in generalizing the logic of his language. Goathead's words may have been a random guess, but the message they revealed inevitably caused a storm of emotions in Duncan's head. During my journey through the spiritual world, did my soul get closer to the deep layers of the world? The deeper you go, the more projections you see from the wrong place in time. These projections could even show moments from other timelines. Duncan didn't see any moments from other timelines when he traveled in the spirit world. But Goathead was right that I came from another time and place. So was the dove brought to this world by an earthling named Zhou Ming? Or did it really come from the depths of this world as Goathead said? Their breakfast tasted like wax and even worse. After an unsatisfactory breakfast, Duncan's mood did not improve at all although his stomach was now full. Rather, he was slightly annoyed by some of the thoughts that appeared in his head after the words of the goathead. He looked at the pigeon eye, who perched on the shelf, and felt that the thoughts in his head were already crossing all boundaries. He had always thought that this earth-speaking dove came into being because it had the soul of an earthling, and that Zhou Ming's personality had reacted with the brass compass when he was traveling in the spirit world, thus giving birth to such a strange bird like I. But what if this is not really the case? What if, as Goat had said, the dove is just a phantom that came out of the depths and took shape by chance? Then the words from Earth that keep popping out of Ai's mouth have nothing to do with Zhou Ming's memories, but are a projection of some history recorded in this world. The possibility of this worried Duncan. Alice stood up, and her voice interrupted Duncan's thoughts. Do you want me to wash the dishes? Duncan cast a somewhat surprised glance at the doll lady, who awkwardly scratched her hair because of this. I thought that since I would live on board and eat your food, then I must find something to do. Otherwise, what good am I? You don't eat at all. 
Duncan reminded her. But it's good that you thought about it. Then take the dishes to the washroom, talk to the sink, and if she doesn't object, wash them. With these words, he, without waiting for Alice's answer, stood up, walked to the door of the captain's cabin and said casually, I'm going to inspect the lower deck. Don't worry if I'm gone for a while. The pigeon that had been walking on the shelf immediately flew onto Duncan's shoulder and followed him out of the cabin, leaving Alice standing wide-eyed at the navigation table with Goathead. Is the captain in a bad mood? Alice asked Goathead cautiously after a moment of hesitation. The captain's mood is like the weather in the endless sea. Don't think about it. Just accept it, Goathead answered in a deep voice. Alice did not wait for Goathead to continue talking, and quickly continued. By the way, the captain just said that I should talk to the shell and see if she would mind. But how will I understand that? Everything is extremely simple. You start washing dishes. If splashes get on you, it means the sink doesn't like you. By the way, do you know how to wash dishes? If not, then I have some knowledge in this area. Before Goathead could say anything, Alice quickly grabbed all the dishes from the table and rushed to the door shouting, No, I'll teach myself. Thank you, Mr. Goathead. Goodbye. Silence suddenly reigned in the captain's cabin. Only the goat's head remained standing on the table, looking with empty eyes in the direction where everyone had gone. A long time passed before a sad sigh was heard from the navigation table. It would be nice if I had legs. Then his gaze returned to the map. The fog around the lost house slowly dissipated, and the captain entrusted the task of steering the ship to him. Under precise control, the huge and living ghost ship adjusted the angle of each sail and began to move across the endless sea, while Goathead, in a rough, hoarse, drone-like voice, hummed a ship's song from some unknown time. Set sail, set sail, the sailors who left home set off on their journey. Among the wind and waves, among the hubbub of birds, we are one step away from death trying to live. Lower the sails, release the mooring lines and hold on to the side. We are at sea. This is it. Away from the fish. Away from the fish. We'll dock safely and have a party asterisk asterisk asterisk. Duncan looked around the warehouse where supplies were stored, then the galley, and then returned to the middle deck. No matter how hard he searched, he couldn't find anything on the ship that tasted better than corned beef and cheese. The good news was that he didn't have to eat maggot cookies like the sailors on Earth. But the bad news was that there weren't any on board. There was even this. He put these thoughts aside for a while and slowly walked to the edge of the deck. Looking out at the endless sea, he continued to think, No matter what, I must find a way to replenish the supplies needed to live on the lost house. Although I can't be too demanding about the quality of life on a ghost ship, but in the end... I can't live like a real ghost. Alice might even need a change of clothes, and there isn't a single dress for her on this ship. I also need to establish contact with the city-state on land as soon as possible. The Lost House has been adrift at sea for too many years, and the city-state on land probably developed during this time to a degree that even Goathead couldn't predict. And from what I saw in the sewers, at least the city-state of Prand is a large, strong, and developed city, and the revolvers that the cultists carried with them indicated the technological development of the society. The ancient ghost ship, perhaps not so already invincible against a civilized society. The remnants of the Lost House's former influence have not yet disappeared, and in case there are any left, I will have a hard time. Duncan looked over his shoulder at I. Perhaps it's time to try my next journey into the spirit world after I've had a little refreshment. Cuckoo? I cooed and raised his head, finally making several movements that an ordinary pigeon would make. Duncan couldn't help but grin, and then, out of the corner of his eye, he suddenly noticed a flash of light on the sea. Having caught the flash, he subconsciously looked at the sea and noticed that there was actually something floating under the surface of the water nearby. After a moment's hesitation, Duncan suddenly hit himself on the head. Ouch! What a reaction! It's the sea! And of course there are fish in it. He understood that establishing contact with the land and ensuring uninterrupted supplies to the ship is not something that can be done overnight. But couldn't the sea itself help him with this? There were fish in the sea, and he was already quite tired of the corned beef and cheese on the ghost ship. Duncan's enthusiasm flared up, and he remembered that somewhere in the warehouse there were fishing rods, and places for attaching fishing rods could be found at the edge of the deck. And what regarding bait I wonder if corned beef and cheese would work. And so, while the damn doll was washing the dishes, and the talking goathead was concentrating on steering the ship, the captain of the lost house decided to go fishing. Soon Duncan found what he was looking for. He brought three heavy fishing rods and a set of baits onto the deck, which he rather roughly secured on the edge of the side. And after casting the bait, he pulled an empty barrel towards him so that it would serve as a chair for him. Duncan had no experience in sea fishing. All his fishing experience was limited to the ponds and small river at home, and he was not sure that he would be able to catch any fish as a result of this whim of his. But so what if he still doesn't do anything? He saw this as a respite before his next journey into the spirit world, 
and also a great opportunity to get some tasty food. Duncan took a seat between a pair of fishing rods, and after waiting for a while, felt a little calmer. Today the situation at sea was very calm. There were a few clouds floating in the sky, but there was no sign of a storm. Duncan sat on a barrel, leaning against the windlass used to secure the cables, and squinted slightly at the slight rocking of the ship. At some point, he fell into a half-asleep state. He dreamed that he was standing barefoot on a calm sea. The water was blue and the sun was warm. The familiar and normal sun that he remembered hung high in the sky, bright but not scorching. Suddenly he heard the sound of a splash, and raising his head, saw a fish suddenly jumping out of the water nearby. It was a whole group of small palm-sized goldfish. They blew bubbles into the air and wagged their tails as if they were swimming in water, slowly circling Duncan. These fish swimming in the air approached Zhou Ming, and he looked at them curiously, at their bulging eyes, at their thin scales, at their mouths that opened and closed, and at the thin lines like waves of water that they left behind them in the air. Yes, they smell very, very good. The sudden sound of the waves woke Duncan from his sleep. He suddenly opened his eyes. Only blurry silhouettes remained from the visions he had seen in his half-asleep. All he could remember was that he saw fish floating in the air and that they seemed incredibly tasty. But what exactly did they look like? And can fish swim in the air? Duncan blinked, the strange sensation of reality and dream mixed together briefly confusing him. He looked at the three fishing rods that he had secured on the edge of the side and did not see any signs that the hooks had caught a fish. And at that time, in the distance, waves began to rise one after another on the sea and roll onto the hull of the lost house. Immediately after this, the waves became even larger, and from a distance visible to the naked eye, huge waves came one after another. The huge body of the lost house swayed in the wind and waves. The sound of the waves filled his ears. Duncan looked at the sky and noticed that the weather was still fine. Only the wind had increased a little. But this did not mean at all that a strong storm or something would begin soon more. This may not be the best day for fishing, Duncan muttered wondering whether he should put away the fishing rods. But then, out of the corner of his eye, he suddenly saw how the front end of one of the fishing rods was severely bent. An elastic fishing line, specially prepared for fishing in the sea, instantly stretched to its limit. The short, thick and strong rod seemed to have caught something large, its entire front half bent in an arc, accompanied by an ear-piercing sound. The holder used to hold the rod in place also made a similar sound under the enormous force of tension all of which served as a signal to Duncan that a fish was approaching. Big fish. He immediately discarded the thought of putting the rods away, and with the enthusiasm of an avid fisherman burning in his chest, he took two steps towards the curved rod, grabbed it with one hand so that it would not fall out of the holder, and with the other hand began to slowly reel in fishing line. I told you so. Fish can't swim in the air, Duncan muttered excitedly to himself, fighting with something huge at the other end of the fishing line. It was a difficult struggle. The creature at the end of the line was clearly not going to give up without a fight. A huge force was pulling the fishing rod to the bottom of the sea, and even Duncan with his strength began to slowly lose. The wind and waves around the lost house increased a little, but for Duncan, this little shaking was nothing. Right now he was quite angry at the stubborn prey, and was worried that a possible new food was about to escape him. The line tightened even more, and the fish on the other end was about to escape from his grip. After an unknown amount of time, Duncan finally mustered his resolve an emerald flame suddenly appeared from his hand wrapped around the rod. The emerald flame, spreading like water, quickly flowed along the fishing rod, and then along the fishing line to the bottom of the sea. The next second, the flames appeared at the bottom of the sea around the lost house, and outlined a huge silhouette located there. This silhouette seemed to be an unsteady mass of flesh, enveloping almost the entire surface of the sea within a radius of several hundred meters from the ship, and at its edges stretched a mass of changing, growing darkness, writhing like a thousand arms, which agitated the waters around the lost house and controlled the waves. Duncan heard some strange movement in the sea and controlling the hopeless situation with his prey, looked out with curiosity. But he saw nothing but waves, which were not much different from a few hours earlier. And he clearly felt how the force of resistance emanating from the fishing rod weakened a little. The prey began to fizzle out, which brought a wide smile to his face. He began to reel in the line faster, pulling his prey out of the sea. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The roar and howl coming from outside the cabin pretty much frightened Alice. The ship began to shake violently under her feet, causing objects in the cabin to ring and rattle. She quickly grabbed the nearest support with both hands, which saved her from falling, and an incredulous expression appeared on her face. What's happening? The lost house shook so violently as if a great storm was raging outside, and from the depths of the old ghost ship came some low, oppressive, strange sound, as if the ship was roaring. 
struggling against the horrors of the depths of the sea, against some monster that was trying to absorb it. All sorts of things were rattling around the cabin, and at first Alice thought it was all the noise from the shaking of the ship, but she soon realized that many of these objects were actually chattering. They made sounds, thereby communicating with each other, but Alice could not understand their language. Perhaps only the Lost House itself understood him. All she knew was that something was happening outside. The doll lady decided to check the deck and stumbling every few steps walked out of the cabin, and then, holding onto the nearest wall to avoid falling, ran towards the deck. After nearly tripping over flying ropes and rolling wooden barrels several times, she finally made it to the end of the steps. Pushing open the wooden door, which was swinging in the wind and waves, she saw amazingly sized waves crashing against the side of the ship. The sky was as black as ink. The thick dark clouds had almost condensed into a huge bank of clouds that was approaching the sea. And underneath the dark clouds, furious waves were raging, crashing against the side of the ship over and over again. It was the first time Alice had seen such a sight, and she wondered if this was normal for the sea, but she knew that she had to find the captain right now. She glanced around the deck and effortlessly found Captain Duncan standing on the edge of the deck. The wind and waves around him were a little annoying, but for Duncan, who was on the verge of success, they were minor obstacles. With the help of feedback from the Emerald Flame, he could clearly feel that his prey had stopped resisting and would soon emerge from the water. Get out! He cried out joyfully, giving the rod a last strong tug. A large fish jumped out of the sea, really big, almost half the size of himself. For a brief moment, Duncan met the fish's eyes. It was quite ugly. That was the first thought that came to his mind. It was in fact an extremely ugly fish. A dark-colored body, covered in some places with swellings that looked more like bumps. Strange grayish-white patterns randomly spreading along the fins on both sides. Many structures similar to bone spurs visible on the head, and a pair of sunken white eyes looking at Duncan from under those bone spurs. Duncan felt uneasy. It seemed to him as if the fish was looking at him unkindly. But the next moment he saw how the fish twitched strongly, and its eyes, which were watching him, burst in some unknown way. The fish fell heavily onto the deck, jumping and writhing wildly, as if it had been electrocuted, and fell silent after a few seconds. A blood flowed from the burst eyes, and little by little flowed onto the deck. Duncan, watching in amazement as the ugly fish quickly died at his feet, vaguely remembered what he had read in books. Most of the fish in the depths of the sea were indeed ugly, and since they had lived under under enormous pressure, then after they were pulled out of the sea due to the pressure drop, they quickly died from rupture of blood vessels. So, something similar is happening to the fish in this world too? While he was thinking, a crashing sound came out of nowhere. Duncan followed the sound with curiosity, and saw several smaller strange fish landing on the deck right after the big one. They were similar to the previous fish, but much smaller in size, and like the larger fish, were already bleeding profusely as soon as Duncan saw them. Duncan was perplexed for a long time before saying, Are fish in this world so stupid? Why did they follow their friend to death? Asterisk, 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 Alice tightly grabbed the side rails, nervously watching the spectacle of a ferocious fight nearby that would easily drive ordinary people crazy. She saw Captain Duncan standing on the edge of the deck, his body blazing with a monstrous emerald flame. He stood at the edge of the side like a flaming giant, with three fishing rods extended from the deck, one of which was blazing with a terrifying flame. She saw how a huge shadow suddenly appeared in the endless sea, and then a tentacle stretched out of the water almost as thick as the mainmast of the lost house. Many evil eyes and sharp teeth appeared on its surface, as if it was going to smash the entire ship into pieces in the next moment. Alice nearly screamed in shock as she tried to warn the captain to take cover. She tried to rush to his aid but did not have time. The tentacle had already fallen on him. She saw Captain Duncan look up, his face beaming with joy at the catch as he looked at the many eyes on the tentacle and the countless eyes on the tentacle looked back at him. The next moment, all the eyes on the tentacle opened simultaneously. Hundreds of sharp teeth hissed in pain, and then the tentacle flew into the air, as if some huge creature at the bottom of the sea had severed the connection with the tentacle and thrown its end onto the deck. The tentacle hit the deck with a crash, and sticky flesh and blood gushed out from the gap, landing right at the captain's feet. The sea calmed down. Alice saw the tentacle fall to the deck, and sticky flesh and blood fell at the captain's feet, from which life was rapidly draining. And at the same moment, something huge, hiding under the water around the lost house, began to quickly sink to the bottom. After paying the price with one of its tentacles, it hurriedly left the area where the lost house was located, as if running away in a hurry. After the huge shadow sank to the bottom of the sea again, the sea calmed down with amazing speed, and the huge dark cloud in the sky disappeared without a trace. Perhaps it wasn't a cloud at all. Alice looked up at the sky, trying to remember what that cloud looked like, 
First she remembered its outline, and then, finally, she vaguely matched it with the shadow of a creature that was hiding under the water next to the ship. This huge cloud in the sky was a shadow, a shadow cast onto the sky by some sea monster. Suddenly a crackling flame came from the edge of the deck, interrupting Alice's thoughts. She hurriedly looked towards the captain, but saw that he had returned to his usual appearance. A tall man with a pleasant smile on his face. Noticing Alice standing nearby, he waved his hand and called her to him. Seeing that Alice had approached him, Duncan kicked the deck and said quietly, Look what a big fish I caught. A big, big fish? Alice looked with amazed eyes at the mass at Duncan's feet, between the twisted and torn flesh and blood. Many eyes still looked at the sky, and in the spaces between them their jagged, sharp teeth still shone with a cold shine. From Duncan's blow, half of the eyes on this severed tentacle suddenly blinked but then immediately closed. Yes, a big fish, Duncan said confidently. You see, to get this thing out here, I had to work hard, even though she was just a doll. Alice felt as if a muscle twitched in the corner of her eye for a moment. She opened her mouth to speak but did not know where to start the conversation. Then she decided to look at the fish that lay at Duncan's feet. At the captain's feet lay a large, ugly fish, dark and lumpy, with a strange grayish-white pattern on its fins, bone spurs on its head, and a pair of lifeless eyes that met Alice's. There were also many other smaller fish scattered around the deck. Suddenly, Alice lost all ability to think and speak. She stared with wide eyes at what was happening in front of her, at the fish that had not been there a moment before. The doll lady, who had no life experience, did not yet understand what it meant to doubt life, but at that moment she suddenly doubted everything. She even wondered if it was all a dream. Perhaps her momentary confusion was so obvious that Duncan immediately noticed the strangeness in Alice's behavior and glanced at the doll. Something happened? Is there something wrong? Duncan raised his eyebrow questioningly. I... Alice began to say. But just at the moment when she was about to say, the rules that Goathead had told her about suddenly surfaced in her memory. Rule number one. Captain Duncan is the absolute master of the lost house, and he is always right. Even if reality contradicts Captain Duncan's words, Captain Duncan's judgment must prevail. Everything is fine, she said quickly. Then, as if hiding the nervousness creeping into her voice, she hastily changed the subject. By the way, Captain, this storm was so terrible. Storm? You mean those waves? Duncan looked at the doll suspiciously. Yes, the waves were rather big, but they didn't reach a real storm, but yes, you didn't see a real storm. Alice, you, right as always. Captain Duncan called the waves that covered almost the entire sea simply waves, which means that's what it was. And if Captain Duncan believed that the creatures he caught were fish, then that's how it was. Hmm, I think you're a little nervous. Are you really okay? Duncan, however, still sensed something odd in Alice's voice and so looked at his number one crew member with some concern. Is it seasickness? Are you seasick? I'm fine, the ship just rocked a little. Alice answered the worried captain in front of her, but she didn't know whether to feel relief or fear, so she could only change the subject. By the way, what are you planning to do with these fish that you caught? Are you asking? Duncan burst out laughing. To eat, of course. Alice's face became frozen for a moment. To eat? What else is it for? Don't you think the food at the Lost House is too monotonous? Duncan was clearly in a good mood. I'm going to divide this big fish in half, stew one half, fry the other, and salt a little smaller fish and make dried fish. He happily talked about his future plans, but although he spoke confidently, in reality, he was completely unsure that he will succeed. His cooking skills were only average, not to mention his experience in handling such huge fish, and his technique for preparing dried fish was based only on theoretical knowledge. But how will you know if you don't try? The only problem is not to die from this food. Duncan did not lose his sanity from the large catch and looked warily at the large fish at his feet, wondering if this gift of the sea could be poisonous. The most reliable option would be to find someone who was unlucky enough to try it first. At first, he thought about the goat head in the captain's cabin, then instantly ruled out this option, then looked at the damned doll. This option was also not suitable. After all, Alice didn't have a stomach at all. Finally, he looked at the dove that was sitting on his shoulder. The dove also looked at him, tilting its head. AI didn't look much like a normal creature, but if he needed to find a living creature of flesh and blood on the ship, then he seemed to be the only one. A few minutes later, Duncan left the deck with his catch, as lunchtime was approaching, and he was eager to improve diet on the lost house. Alice stood still for a while and then headed towards the door of the captain's cabin. In fact, she had no intention of coming to Goathead. Since the last time she had seen the first mate expertly rant non-stop, she had felt extremely in awe of the entire captain's cabin. Therefore, she was reluctant to cross her threshold at any opportunity. But what happened today was so strange, 
that she felt the need to consult with an experienced goathead to find out if this was a common occurrence on this ship. She would not violate crew rules with this question, but would simply inquire about the situation. After ten seconds of hesitation, Alice finally plucked up the courage and opened the door to the captain's cabin. The next moment, she was surprised to find that Goathead had already turned towards the door and was looking at her with his eyes, as if he was waiting for her to enter. What happened outside? Goathead asked unusually laconically. Alice felt a hint of something unnatural in his behavior. She hastily turned, closed the door, and went to the table to tell Goathead what she had seen. At the end of her story, Goathead fell into the most unnatural silence. He didn't say a word for a full minute. And although Goathead didn't say anything, Alice clearly felt that what was happening was a little beyond the scope of the first mate's judgment. Alice suddenly became nervous and subconsciously leaned forward. Isn't this what usually happens on the Lost House? Is it really true that the captain, everything is normal at the Lost House, finally burst out from the Goathead? The next moment he hastily added, as if correcting some flaw in his words, Listen, everything is fine at the Lost House, as with the great Captain Duncan, and it will always be so. But, your reaction. What happened slightly exceeded my expectations, but this happened only because of the weakness of my imagination, Goathead quickly said. He seemed to have recovered a little and returned to his normal state again, and then his emotions clearly began to rise, and even his tone from emotionless became excited. Yes, the great Captain Duncan, he deserves to be more powerful. This is not surprising, Mrs. Alice. Listen, on the Lost House everything is as it should be. Let the captain do what he sees fit and do not continue to discuss this topic. Just remember from this day on the following fact. Fish appeared in the galley of the Lost House, and fish is a very tasty food. Cooking a fish of this size for dinner is not an easy task. It requires not only skill, but also proper physical strength. Fortunately, Duncan was driven by both a sense of duty as an angler and a passion for the best food. So he took on the day's catch with complete dedication. After fiddling around in the galley for a long time, he finally managed to remove the bone spurs from the head of the ugly fish. He threw the head itself aside for now, because there wasn't much meat in it. He first decided to tackle the meaty parts of the belly and back, which would be ideal for the Lost House. It was a little strange that the captain himself was working in the galley, but Duncan was quite happy with it. I wonder what the reaction of ordinary people who feared the Lost House like a natural disaster would be if they saw this. Will they be shocked that the menacing ghost captain can be so easygoing and cheerful? Or will they first admire his superb fishing skills? While cutting up the fish, Duncan suddenly remembered this question and smiled. He thought that perhaps one day he would be kind enough to invite guests onto the ship. The lost house would not always be synonymous with a natural disaster, and he himself was not going to be a cold-blooded and ruthless ghost captain, and would naturally want to integrate into the modern civilized society of this world as he learned more about it. And when that time comes, it would be a good idea to treat the guests who come aboard for fishing. Having finished cutting up the fish, Duncan put most of the meat into barrels of sea salt and pushed them into storage in the back of the galley. He planned to deal with the smaller fish later, marinate and dry them on deck, where the sea air would turn them into dried fish, if all went well. It's a shame there wasn't any liquor on board, otherwise Duncan could have used a few more processing methods. Of course having fresh fish every day was good, but Duncan knew that fishing was a matter of chance, and although he had a good catch today, he might not be so lucky in the future so he had to think about what to do with the remaining ingredients. After all, although the corned beef and cheese stored at the Lost House showed no signs of spoilage, he could not be sure whether this was a feature of the ship itself or a feature of the corned beef and cheese. Besides, he didn't want the fish he'd worked so hard to catch to begin to rot. Dried fish would at least taste better than corned beef from a hundred years ago, even though they had very different flavors. Duncan saved the most tender, meaty-looking parts and threw them into the pan along with the corned beef which acted as a seasoning during the cooking process. This was considered wasteful, and any real chef would instantly have his blood pressure skyrocketing if he saw what Duncan was doing. The best way to prepare this delicate fish would be to cut it into pieces and then fry it sparingly. Duncan himself knew about this, but due to safety reasons he decided to act differently. Although theoretically, sea fish do not carry harmful parasites, and he, as the ghost captain, should not be afraid of them. But what if? Braising, on the other hand, is the most effective way of preparing unfamiliar ingredients. He will first try the fish prepared in this way, and if he is sure that the fish is really edible, then he will think about another method. It was nearing midday when he finally prepared his belated lunch. Duncan placed a bowl of fish soup on the table, the delicious aroma of which whetted his appetite, but not before he carefully picked up a piece of fish with his fork, blew on it and placed it in front of the pigeon eye. Pigeons, of course, do not eat meat, but I can hardly be considered an ordinary pigeon. Duncan needs to satisfy his curiosity. There were so many things on the Lost House that he wanted to know about. 
What if this abnormal pigeon really gets poisoned by eating fish? Duncan thought and mentally prepared himself. Firstly, he had already processed the ingredients as best he could, and secondly, if something really happened to I, he could use the emerald flames to put him into a spirit state. He's done this before. In the state of mind an invisible connection is formed between the dove and the brass compass, and the dove as it were becomes an object that can control the emerald flame. He can even dispel I's spirit and teleport it to a specific location near him, in which case ordinary toxins will definitely not affect him. I, raising his head, watched Duncan's actions, and, making sure that the piece of fish was intended for him, first pecked at the table, and then, incomprehensibly, looked at Duncan with one eye and at the ceiling with the other. Is this melon already ripe? One, just tell me, will you eat it or not? asked Duncan. I flapped his wings and repeated after Duncan, just tell me whether you will eat it or not. And then he lowered his head and rushed to peck at the already cooled fish. He destroyed it with amazing speed, something that in no way resembled food for a pigeon. Having finished, I craned his neck and strutted across the table, as if he was very amused. Having made a circle, he returned to Duncan and said loudly, It smells so delicious. Very tasty. After waiting for a while and making sure that everything was fine with the pigeon, Duncan relaxed. The captain of the lost house and his pet immediately disappeared into the galley and began to greedily devour food. This fish really smelled delicious, just like the one Duncan saw in his dream. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The setting sun slowly approached the high walls at the edge of the city. The towering chimneys and towers of the city-state of Prand were bathed in its pale golden glow. In the very center of the city, on the hill where the Cathedral of the Depth stands, a loud sound of bells was heard, accompanied by the sharp whistle of steam escaping from the bypass valve. A white mist poured out from the top of the towers of the Cathedral of the Depths, and, like clouds, covered the entire sky above the hill, reflecting sunlight from the sea. It is a signal indicating the change of day and night, a reminder that the power of the sun is rapidly fading, and that the creation of the world is about to dominate the sky. Then the order on earth will change from strong to shaky, and the influence from the deepest parts of the world will quickly increase, and this process will continue until the next day when the sun rises. At night, those who are careful will prefer to stay at home, and those who are forced to go out will, if possible, stay in brightly lit places, because gas lamps, blessed by priests, successfully ward off evil forces hiding in the darkness. But in any case, it is at least a large and prosperous city-state. Under the protection of the sacred cathedral of the depths, even the strongest influence from the depths will eventually be suppressed. Occasional anomalies in the city are a minor and harmless problem, and ordinary residents are well aware of how to secure their homes. In addition to this, members of the cathedral patrol the city at night, ensuring order in it. But just as no matter how bright the streetlights shine, there are always dark places that cannot be illuminated. Even under the noses of the cathedral members there are fools who crave darkness and chaos, who fear and hate the existing order, and eagerly await a beautiful era that they have never even seen. Fortunately, in a city-state where the forces of order prevail, these saboteurs spend most of their lives hidden in the shadows. On the outskirts of the city-state, deep in an abandoned sewer, several black-robed figures huddled in the corner of a room. This room once served as a temporary shelter for sewer workers, but has now been forgotten due to changes in the city's layout. Now this unkempt corner served as a haven for cultists. A man in black clothes, about thirty years old, lay on the floor on a pile of rags, clenching his teeth. His face was deathly pale. His breathing was weak and ragged. Others were sitting next to him, and one of them cursed in a low voice. Damn cathedral hyenas. We lost most of our comrades, and the envoy died during the ritual, said another in a hoarse voice. How a sacred rite suddenly went out of control. That sacrifice was clearly all because of that sacrifice. He is a damn henchman of these heretics. Listen, said the man in black, putting his hand to his ear, and then raised his finger. The ringing of a bell and the sound of a steam whistle. Now it will be night, the first man swore in a low voice, and cast an alarming glance at his comrade, who was lying on the floor in a clearly deplorable state. Damn it, I hope he survives the night one a phrase uttered by one of the characters in the Chinese series. Means to express doubts about whether it is safe. The ringing of a bell and the steam whistle echoed faintly through the deep, damp corridors of the dark, cramped sewer. The signal of approaching night further upset the cultists hiding in an abandoned room. One of them, for unknown reasons, became seriously ill and was now slowly dying in this dimly lit underground world. He's alive, one of the cultists said hesitantly. He looked at his comrade lying on the floor and saw that the eyeballs were slowly rotating in his half-open eyes. The unlucky man still heard movement around him, but he did not have enough strength to open his eyes. As long as he's alive, another cultist answered quietly. 
The bell has already rung. He will not die in this room. The Lord grants him a peaceful sleep in the darkness. The man lying on the floor moved his fingers. He was obviously clearly aware of his position and did not want to die like this. But death was already holding him tightly, and it seemed that his dear fellow believers were already thinking of eliminating this hidden danger before real death came. The room was filled with silence, so oppressive that the cultists could clearly hear the faint breathing of the dying man. It was only after an unknown period of silence that the cultist who had been cursing the members of the Storm Church suddenly broke the silence. Let's wait a little, at least until he dies. Before this, no changes should occur to him. Then we'll wait, another cultist agreed, looking at the man who was struggling to catch his breath. But why did he suddenly have an attack? Are you sure this is a normal attack? I know it. He runs an antique store in the lower area that is about to close. All the goods in this store are fake, began one of the cultists who had been silent before. He was already sick and I think he never got better. It's likely that the time he spent in the sewers and the shock he experienced earlier only weakened his already fragile health. At this explanation, the cultist who asked the question finally relaxed a little. Although he was not a noble priest, he had believed in the sun for many years and was now something of an expert in the occult. He knew how many hidden dangers remained after a failed sacrificial ritual and that every person who participated in it could be a carrier of these hidden dangers. And this man could just be such a carrier if it weren't for his faith in the words all the children of the sun are brothers and sisters and the fact that there are people next to him, he would without hesitation throw this unlucky man into the darkness. After a long silence, one of the cultists suddenly took a step, took a pale gold amulet from his pocket and stuffed it into the clothes of his dying comrade. What is this? asked the most curious of the cultists. This is a sacred amulet. I bought it from the envoy for a high price, he answered in a quiet, sincere voice. May the mercy of the Lord protect our brothers and sisters, and the light of the sun protect us from further pollution in the darkness. The two cultists standing next to him immediately lost all doubt. They looked with admiration at the senior member of the church who presented the amulet, and then pressed their hands to the place between the eyebrows and reverently whispered, All children of the sun are brothers and sisters. The cultist in a black robe also pressed his hand to the place between the eyebrows and whispered, All children of the sun, brothers and sisters. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. When the sun completely dropped below sea level, a starless and moonless sky appeared before Duncan again. A pale gap in the sky, illuminating the endless sea and the lost house floating on the sea. Duncan stood on the deck, looking up at the sky, and let out a quiet sigh. No matter how much he looked, he would never be able to see the stars that simply did not exist in this pale, clear sky. But compared to the last starless night, today he felt much better. On the one hand, he came to terms with the oddities of this world, and even adapted to them. And on the other hand, this fish he cooked turned out to be truly wonderful in taste. He is a very optimistic person, and any small improvement in life makes him happy, not to mention the fact that nature has given him much more than he could have imagined. At this rate, he could at least improve the living conditions on this ship, even if he couldn't make contact with land any time soon. Thinking about this, he turned his head to look at Ai, who was sitting on his shoulder, and asked in a joking tone, Do you think it will be easier for me to do what a pirate captain should do? For example, to find a busy shipping route and rob a ship passing along it or something like that. The dove raised its head and looking with both eyes in an unclear direction but definitely not at Duncan answered, Does this look like words? Does this sound like words? Does this sound like words? Yes, it's not in my spirit, Duncan smiled. Besides, I need to find this busy shipping route first. The sea was empty, and the lost house floated in close proximity to civilization. He had not seen another ship in sight since his last encounter with the ship carrying Anomaly 099. But then a voice suddenly came from the side, interrupting Duncan's thoughts. Captain, are we going to rob ships? Duncan looked in the direction where the voice was coming from, and saw that Alice was sitting on a very high board not far from him and looking at him with curiosity. A gothic figure in a long dress perched high on the ghost ship, her long mercury silver hair glowing coldly in the night. Mysterious, she sat elegantly and with a curious look in her eyes as if she had stepped out of a classical painting. Duncan was momentarily surprised that after several events in reality, he had almost forgotten the elegant, mysterious impression that the doll lady made on him when she lay in the wooden box. So he was a little taken aback when he saw Alice in her calm state. Alice, however, had no idea what the captain was thinking. She simply asked with curiosity, Captain, are we going to rob? This question pretty much spoiled her elegant and mysterious image. Duncan gave the doll a perplexed look. Do you like to rob ships? No. Alice shook her head. It sounds boring, but I kidnapped you from that ship, Duncan reminded her, smiling. Yes, said Alice with a thoughtful nod, followed by a question. So are we going to rob? 
No, Duncan waved his hand and walked with measured steps towards the captain's cabin. I also think that robbery is a rather pointless thing compared to traveling, which is more suitable as an after-dinner workout. Duncan returned to the captain's cabin and after ordering Goathead to take control of the ship, he entered his bedroom and closed the door behind him. He decided that tonight he would make his second journey through the spirit world, but unlike last time, this time he would test this ability through a dove. Emerald flames burst from Duncan's fingertips, and at the same moment the dove walking on the table disappeared in the blink of an eye, and the next moment appeared on Duncan's shoulder. Feeling an invisible connection between himself and I, Duncan slowly calmed his mind, and then, remembering the feeling he felt the last time he activated the brass compass, he began to try to interact with I using spiritual fire. The emerald flame turned into a thin thread and wrapped itself around I's wings, and the next moment the dove was completely engulfed in flames. Engulfed in flames, the dove's feathers took on an illusory appearance. The emerald flame seemed to rearrange his flesh and bones. After that, I spread his wings, and the brass compass hanging on his chest suddenly opened. The symbols depicting many occult runes lit up on the dial, and the arrow, after several rotations, began to point forward. His eyes grew dark. Duncan again found himself in a dark space already familiar to him with streams of light and countless stars dotting the sky. Duncan mentally followed his feelings and looked to the stars in search of the next target suitable for contact. Suddenly, one of the stars caught his attention. He didn't know if it was Captain Duncan's intuition that Goathead always talked about, but he decided to fly to that star, regardless of who it belonged to. Now he and Captain Duncan would share a common destiny. In an abandoned sewer on the outskirts of the city-state of Prand, the few cultists of the Sun God who managed to escape from the church members remained silent. The overworld was plunged into deep night, and the underworld was illuminated by only a few faint lights. Even the most ferocious and inhuman cultists felt incredible terror of the coming darkness. On the floor next to them lay a dying man who was about to breathe his last breath. Listening to the breathing of the dying man once again, several cultists simultaneously turned their gazes on him. They looked at their comrade, and each of them understood perfectly well that this man would not survive the night. As several pairs of eyes watched, the chest of the man lying on the floor rose and fell one last time. He breathed the last breath of his life. May the sun continue to illuminate your soul in the darkness, the black-robed cultist said slowly before waving his hand. Take him in. The next second, his voice suddenly stopped. In front of his eyes, the corpse with its eyes tightly closed began to breathe again. The corpse began to breathe, as if it had wandered a little in the kingdom of the dead and returned to the kingdom of the living. Some of the cultists did not even realize that the person in front of them had just died, because the moment of life and death was so short that they could not determine if they just didn't watch it very carefully. They simply felt that the breathing of their dying comrades somehow suddenly became smoother and calmer, which caused them extreme surprise. The next second, the man lying on the ground opened his eyes. It seemed that he had been in the dark for so long that even the dim light from the oil lamp in the room blinded him for a moment. He blinked to adjust to the light and then slowly looked to the side and noticed three black-robed men gathered around him. Thank you, Lord, for your protection. One of the young cultists could not resist exclaiming with delight. You survived! I thought you— Wait! No! Back! Another cultist suddenly said in a low voice. Stopping the others, he looked warily at the awakened man and beginning to retreat, said in a threatening tone, He just stopped breathing, I'm absolutely sure of it. Something is wrong with him. When Duncan finally adapted to his surroundings, and the ringing in his ears disappeared, he was able to see the figure surrounding him. His first thought was, Why am I seeing these cultists again? And why am I in the sewer again? He chose his target, following his intuition, but he never expected that for the second time he would find himself among the cultists. Well, what kind of bad luck is this? But from the reaction of those around him, he realized that something was wrong, and the next moment he noticed black clothes on his body. Duncan was silent for a few seconds, and in these seconds of silence it suddenly dawned on him. Last time he was a sacrifice, and he was sacrificed by the cultists, and now he himself became a cultist. An invisible connection arose between these people and him. There's something wrong with him. At that moment, a low voice with hostile overtones suddenly interrupted Duncan's confusion that he was experiencing after waking up. He looked in the direction of the voice and met a cold, wary gaze. The owner of the gaze looked at him coldly, and next to him two other men hastily retreated, taking wary poses. Duncan froze for a moment, suddenly realizing that perhaps like last time he had fallen into a corpse. To these cultists, he was a reanimated corpse. When he understood the whole situation, the nervous reaction of the cultists seemed logical to him. Duncan thought about it. He felt lethargy and numbness in this body, so it was extremely difficult to move. He could not escape from the cultists, so he began to think of a way to calm them down. Just as he was thinking, fragmented, vague memories suddenly appeared in his mind. He suddenly remembered many fragments of a life that did not belong to him. 
He remembered himself hiding in the sewers. He remembered himself offering his family's money to the messenger of the sun, participating in dark, crazy, and bloody rituals to cure his illness, and drinking the blood of innocence in exchange for the protection of the sun. At the end of this series of jumbled memories, he saw the ritual sacrifices. How many people dressed in black clothes stand next to the platform and how the sacrifices pushed onto the platform with a stone and terrible face. He saw how the messenger of the sun sacrificed this person, and then all the people around the altar suddenly fell into madness and began killing each other. Flames erupt from the totem on the platform, angry hisses and incoherent murmurs fill the area, and the original owner of his body and the last few remaining cultists quickly flee. Duncan did not know how long he had been in this state. Perhaps only a moment passed before the strange memories ceased to rage through his mind. A life full of sadness and hatred was reduced to a series of pale fragments that were stored in his mind as a kind of recharge. These were the memories of the original owner of his body. There were only a few of them left, but the source was beyond doubt. Duncan blinked. This had not happened during his last journey through the spirit world. Last time he did not receive any memories from the body he was in. Why was everything different this time? Maybe because the owner of this body died recently? or because I somehow strengthened the brass compass. Duncan slowly rose from the ground, realizing that whatever the reason for this change, now was not the time to dwell on it, as the alarmed cultists had apparently realized that something had gone wrong with the resurrection process. As Duncan rose to his feet, the three cultists simultaneously took a step back, and then a cultist with a deep voice broke the silence. Don't move! Tell me your name. Ron, Duncan said after a short pause, and then quite naturally said the name he had just learned from his memories. Ron Strain. His name is Ron, another cultist whispered to the deep-voiced cultist, who unknowingly became the leader of the trio. However, the deep-voiced cultist did not lower his guard at all. He stared at Duncan, and then suddenly said in a strange tone, In the name of the sun, may the light of the Lord shine. In the name of the sun, may the Lord send down mercy. Duncan froze for a moment at the sudden movement of the cultist, and then felt a burning sensation in his chest. Reaching subconsciously, he pulled out the object glowing under his clothes and saw that it was a pale gold amulet of the sun. The streams of heat he felt came from its surface. The next second, a flame suddenly burst out on the amulet, which seemed to be full of malice, and rushed straight to Duncan's heart. The light of the Lord rebelled against him, reacted the cultist, who had just read the prayer. Then he grabbed a sword from his belt and shouted, His soul has been replaced. Kill this heretical creature. The other two cultists hesitated, but eventually also reacted. These people who a moment ago considered Duncan a comrade without hesitation drew their swords and daggers and rushed at him shouting, Kill him! Duncan, with the amulet of the sun burning in his hand, watched as three cultists ran towards him, and the next moment, another shadow suddenly appeared at the edge of his field of vision. A ghost-like bird, shrouded in emerald flames, pierced the air and flew right under the ceiling, emitting a strange, piercing cry and scattering invisible shards of ash and feathers as it flapped its wings. The three cultists were positively drawn to this bird, and they subconsciously looked at I in his spirit form. The next moment their movement slowed down, as if the connection with the real world had suddenly become distant and weak. Their movements seemed like images superimposed on each other, as if they were moving in slow motion. Slowly landing in comical slow motion on the floor they found themselves less than two meters in front of Duncan. With great horror in their eyes, they watched as the bird circled the ceiling and then landed on the shoulder of their comrade opposite and then they saw that the amulet of the sun in the man's hand continued to burn. But in the next moment the flame became an eerie emerald color and took on the same shape like the flame on the bird. Duncan clutched the amulet in his hand, and emerald flames wrapped around its surface. The threads of flame from the amulet described a semicircle in front of him, and then stopped, and like obedient animals, slowly wrapped themselves around his hand. Holding the amulet of the sun in his hands, completely captured and transformed, he leisurely approached the three cultists looked into their horror-filled eyes and said with a note of regret in his voice, How nice it would be for you to pretend that you don't know anything. The next moment, the figures of the three cultists suddenly flickered, and then immediately disappeared. A ghost-like bird, engulfed in emerald flames, jumped twice on Duncan's shoulder, and with the crackling of the flames, it released a piercing, hoarse cry. Oops, the page has disappeared, try refreshing it. The dove, as always, said this in his characteristically comical and stupid tone. Now, however, this bird is a ghost, shrouded in flames, its translucent flesh, skeleton and sinews, its cry, a mixture of wheezes, similar to the wheezing of ghosts when the gates to underworld. As it turned out, very often the distance between evil and good is not so great. Duncan, with spiritual fire wrapped around his hands, watched as the three cultists disappeared before his eyes, 
but did not know how to explain it. He only knew that it was I's power. After a few seconds, making sure that the three cultists would not return, he turned his head slightly to the side and asked the dove on his shoulder, Where did you send them? I flapped his wings, then straightened the feathers in his wings with his beak, which acquired a translucent shape, and after a few seconds exclaimed, Retreat back into the shadows! Duncan frowned. For some time now he had been learning to understand the true meaning of the dove's words. Do you mean that you banished them to some parallel dimension? Or turned them into some intangible state? The dove raised its head, looked at Duncan with two wandering eyes and cooed. Now he was pretending to be a real pigeon again. But Duncan believed that he had learned the truth. He pressed a finger to Eye's head and then looked around the dimly lit shelter once more. In the flickering light of the oil lamp, everything in the small room was clearly visible. The cultists of the sun god who had once hidden here had disappeared from this world, and now only the ghost captain who had taken possession of the cultist's corpse and his dove stood here. But, standing in the pitch darkness, Duncan seemed to feel that the three cultists were still here, next to him, locked in this room, in some kind of spatial crack that could not be detected by any means. He could even feel the cultists screaming, struggling in vain, as they desperately tried to return to the real world, from which an invisible barrier fenced them off. This feeling was invisible until at some point Duncan saw its confirmation, during one of the certain swings of the oil lamp, during one of the certain interactions of light and shadow, he suddenly saw a mark on the neighboring wall, as if formed from the blow of a short sword, but when he looked there again, the flame of the lamp had shifted, and the mark on the wall had disappeared without a trace. This was the three cultists' last contact with the real world. Duncan exhaled quietly and turned to leave the room. Outside the abandoned room was a much narrower channel than the sewer corridor Duncan had seen earlier. A deep, long tunnel that stretched in both directions. One end of it led to a fork, and the other connected to a ramp that went up. Even though the sewer was abandoned, the city apparently maintained at least basic maintenance, which is why gas lamps were still burning on both sides. Duncan looked around quickly, and having figured out the route to the surface from the fragments of memory that remained in his head, stepped towards the inclined ramp. With each step he walked faster and faster. Soon, a stream of fresh air poured onto Duncan. A cool breeze ruffled his hair, and he heard some vague, distant sounds that seemed to be the roar of some factory on the surface and a more distant noise waves crashing on coastal reefs. Duncan stood up almost at a trot. Dove Eye, having returned to its normal appearance, flapped its wings and let out a joyful cry. Time is calling! Time is calling! One Duncan suddenly stopped and looked into the pigeon's eyes. Don't talk here. Ordinary pigeons don't talk. I thought for a moment and energetically flapped his wings. Aye, Captain! Duncan was surprised that the pigeon answered him correctly, and wondered whether it was a coincidence or something else but he soon stopped thinking about it. He must prepare to face the world. The black robe he wore was definitely not meant to be worn outside. As far as he could remember from his memory, these clothes were only used for the secret rites of the followers of the sun god, and on the streets of the city located on the surface, seven or eight guards could be immediately tied to a tree for these clothes. The city-state of Pran has a strict curfew, and wandering around at night seems quite dangerous. Ordinary people must have permission to go out at night and report them in advance. The cultist whose body he fell into obviously did not have such a right, so to move around the city Duncan must avoid night patrols. The people who keep order in the city at night are called guards, and they appear to be the military forces of the Church of the Deep. From his memories, Duncan learned that the original owner of this body had deep fear and hostility towards these guards. Duncan quickly went over in his mind the fragments of memories that he inherited from the corpse. Most of them were jumbled and vague fragments and he could not piece together a complete history of the life of a representative of modern civilization, nor all the information about the city-state of Prand, but even the most basic parts were enough to give him a rough idea of U-200 but U-200B what to expect. First of all, he took off his black robe, revealing the most ordinary clothes under it that did not arouse suspicion. He thought about setting his black robe on fire, but the flames and smoke might attract the attention of the night patrol, so in the end he just crumpled it up and hid it in a corner near the ramp. The sun amulet could also raise suspicions, but it could also contain valuable information. After some hesitation, Duncan decided to take him with him and return with him to the Lost House, and at the same time check whether I could take him with him. At the Lost House he could study it thoroughly without worrying about anything. He removed traces of the hidden black robe and generally took care of his appearance, trying to look like an ordinary citizen and not like a pathetic cultist hiding in the sewers. When he was done, he stepped onto the ramp. It wasn't too far to go. As Duncan ran up the ramp, fresh air filled his chest. He could already clearly hear the noise of factories and waves in the distance, 
and a few minutes later, he even saw a cold glow appearing on the steps a short distance ahead. He took several long steps forward, and the cold light finally enveloped him completely. He rose to the surface. Solid ground, bathed in pale light. Duncan's eyes widened as he saw the city. A city that stood on an endless sea. A city that represented a mortal civilization. A large gap in the sky illuminating the rooftops and towers that lined the city, and the buildings beyond. The dilapidated edge of the city ahead. Many magnificent buildings that could be seen in the distance, and the upper district, where the church and towers were located. Duncan suddenly laughed, and the laughter almost took his breath away. However, after a moment he stopped laughing, took a deep breath of the cold night air, and then walked in the direction he remembered. Most of the cultists lived their normal lives, with the exception of a few who were completely dedicated to harming ordinary people. The Church of the Sun, like most other cults, relied on a large number of ordinary people. Typically these were destitute residents, unkempt old people, uninitiated youth, or as in the case of Duncan's body, which he now occupies, an unnoticed, seriously ill, ordinary man running a crooked antique store who was struggling to make ends meet after paying taxes. The sad life of an antique store owner named Ron is over. His debt to some evil god ended with his last breath, but he still had a place in this world, a place that Duncan loved. One gymnastics for primary and secondary school students. Waking up from a grotesque and disturbing dream, Vanna discovered that it was still deep night outside the window. The cold, pale radiance of the creation of the world still calmly and quietly illuminated the windowsill, on which the runes of the deep sea were depicted. And yet the vision from the grotesque dream still stood clear before her eyes. A ship, a huge ship, shrouded in emerald flames, appeared from beyond the line where the sea meets the sky, and loomed over Prand like a mountain. And in the very thick of the emerald flame, Sad cries and deserted songs rumbled in unison, as if they wanted to turn the whole world upside down. And when the ship appeared, she saw the blazing sun rising from the depths of the city-state. It was not a sun encased in ancient runes, but a blazing celestial body similar to the ancient sun described by those who believed in it. It rose from the depths of the city-state, its flame melted the earth along with the people, and all the people flowed through the streets like molten wax. The Cathedral of the Depth stood silently in the heart of the molten city. In her dream, Vanna prayed, hoping to receive the guidance of the goddess of storms, but all that could be heard from the cathedral was the loud and meaningless ringing of bells. No instruction came. Vanna got out of bed and in her nightgown went to the window, fixing her gaze on the calm city and the creation of the world, but her mind was seething with anger. After a few moments the young inquisitor tore her gaze away from the city and walked over to the chest of drawers next to her bed, where she opened a drawer. There was a dagger in the chest of drawers, a curved dagger for rituals. At the base of his blade, the runes of the Church of the Depths flickered, as if under the influence of an inexplicable force that resonated with them. Vanna's gaze lingered on the shimmering runes for several seconds before she made a cut on her arm with the blade. As blood flowed from the wound, she placed her hand on her chest and whispered the name of the Storm Goddess, seeking her guidance. However, for some reason, she only heard the illusory roar of the waves, and the state of psychic sensitivity, into which she could easily plunge before, did not respond today. It was as if an invisible wall had suddenly been erected around her, blocking her connection with the storm goddess Jemona. Vanna furrowed her brows slightly. This happened very rarely, but it could still happen, since the connection between subspace and the real world was so deep and complex that the wisdom of mortals could not fully comprehend it. Sometimes even the layers of subspace, depths, and the spiritual world influenced the power of the gods. These temporary changes in power, coupled with constant disputes between gods and goddesses, may well have been the reason why some believers may have suddenly stopped hearing the voice of the gods. But this should not apply to the goddess of storms Jemon. Mortal civilization was surrounded by an endless sea, and the power of the goddess of storms permeated all dimensions and influenced all reality. All gods could lose contact with the real world. Even the god of death sometimes left loopholes, for example, necromancers, but not the goddess of storms. It is for this reason that the church of storms became the most powerful in the world. Am I the problem? Naturally, Vanna began to doubt herself, but looking at her palm, she saw that the wound she had just caused was beginning to heal quickly. The blessing of the goddess was still with her and took effect without the slightest delay. Bath again remembered the grotesque nightmare from the past and the ominous signs that she had seen for the past many days. There must be some connection between all of this. Ghost ship with emerald flames, ghost ship. Vanna mentally began to go through all the occult knowledge she possessed, and soon her gaze became serious. She was no expert in navigation and had rarely encountered the outlandish and bizarre stories that circulated among superstitious sailors. But even in canonical church texts, 
one ghost ship held a special place. It was an ominous ship returning from subspace. His captain, the same terrible captain, because of whom a century ago the thirteen islands of Wiserin were swallowed up by the collapsed border of reality, Duncan. Vanna quickly got up, intending to go to the archives, but then remembered that it was already night, and the archives of the church, like any other library, were closed at night. If her dreams really pointed to Captain Duncan, then there was a high probability that he would be able to sense the mortal through the connection established by the dream. So she decided not to talk about him with anyone for some time after the dream for their own safety. After all, this is a ghost ship that may be returning from subspace. The safest thing she can do now is to wait patiently until the sun regains its dominant position in the world and until the connection established by the dream dissipates. Only then will she turn to the archives or the archbishop of the church to discuss these ominous omens. In any case, if these ominous dreams truly point to Captain Duncan, and thus inform her that the legendary lost house is searching for Prand, then as the city-state's inquisitor, she must at all costs prevent the ghost captain from landing ashore asterisk 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 high. A thin figure walked quickly along the deserted streets of the lower district, casting a long black shadow in the light of the gas lamps. A completely unfamiliar city, completely unfamiliar buildings, memories of it in his head, and a civilian area that seemed dark and eerie during curfew. Yet Duncan felt a special joy as he walked through these humble alleys. He managed not only to make a second successful journey through the spirit world, but also to control his body on the surface, on the surface of the city-state of Prand. Now he could communicate with the civilized society of this world, observe with his own eyes the architecture of this era and its technology. And he ended up in a body that from the outside looked absolutely normal. Although, to be honest, the health of this body left much to be desired. Even when traveling in the spirit world, when he could ignore most of the shortcomings of his body, Duncan could clearly sense his sad state. But he did not complain about it, but took it for granted. After all, in both cases, after traveling through the spirit world, he ended up in a corpse that had been dead for a certain period of time. But is it really a corpse if it is alive and kicking? A dog barked from the end of the street, and Duncan carefully slowed down, hiding in the gap between the buildings. He didn't know if it was the patrol dog the church guards had brought with them, but it never hurt to be careful. The light emitted by the pale rift cast intermittent shadows between the huge structures of pipes that stretched above the low houses located nearby. From time to time, steam leaked from the valves of some pipes, forming a haze. Dogs were barking in the distance. Duncan came out of his hiding place, looked around to see if there were people on the street, after which he calmed the pigeon eye, who was sitting on his shoulder, and walked down the street following to your memories. Between a row of small two- or three-story buildings, there was an old door with a dirty sign hanging above it, and gray, unkempt windows could be seen on the walls on either side. It was here that the fragments of memories in his head led Duncan. He walked up to the old door and looked at the sign above it, a row of letters, faintly visible in the darkness. Ron's Antique Store, Duncan muttered. A very laconic title. With these words he searched the doorway, and since the memories in his head were only vague fragments, it took him some time to search before he found the spare key on a hidden hook under the windowsill. Out of the caution of an experienced cultist, the original owner of this body did not take with him a key or anything that could help identify him or lead to his antique store. But for the ghost captain who had taken possession of his memories, such caution was pointless. Duncan opened the door to Ron's antique shop and rushed inside, quickly closing the door. The wooden door slammed shut, but no one heard it. With a bang, the sign hanging above the door was slightly askew. The letters trembled, and in the blink of an eye, new words appeared on it. Duncan's Antique Store. The interior of the antique store turned out to be just as cluttered and gloomy as Duncan had imagined. Looking at the dust accumulated near the windows, any visitor to the store could imagine how poorly the owner had organized his life. The first thing he saw once inside was shelving against the wall. Low, stable tabletops with large vases, sculptures, and unidentifiable totems. Wall behind shelving with its compartments for smaller items. A counter located directly opposite the door. A long bar counter, behind which there were also shelves, a little dustier than the previous ones. They were filled with picture frames and small decorations done in dark colors. Behind the counter was a staircase to the second floor, which was currently too dimly lit for Duncan to see. At the bottom of the stairs there was a small door, which, according to his memories, led to a warehouse at the back of the store, half of which was littered with odds and ends. Duncan had a hard time imagining that the cultist he'd hit lived in a store that no one seemed to frequent. And what's more, he even had money left over for the cultists of the sun god. The old wooden floor creaked quietly under his feet as Duncan walked deeper into the counter. As he passed the stairs, he noticed a lantern mounted on the wall. It was an electric lantern. 
Duncan immediately frowned. The style of the lantern seemed unusual to him. The iron outer frame and gray lampshade created an exotic feeling, but the internal structure of the lantern made it clear at first glance that the light source in this lantern was electricity. In this world, electricity has already become such a common occurrence that even ordinary residents of the lower region used electric lanterns. Then why were gas and oil lanterns and even torches used as light sources in sewers? Why were there gas lamps in the streets on the way here? Great confusion arose in Duncan's head. It seemed to him that this was pointless, especially since gas lamps in the sewer system had obvious disadvantages compared to safe electric lamps. At first he thought it was technological limitations that forced city officials to use gas lamps as a light source for sewers, but now it seems. That technology, at least in the city-state of Prand, has long advanced so much that electricity has firmly entered the homes of ordinary people. A feeling of dissonance filled Duncan's mind as he tried to search the fragments of memories in his mind for relevant knowledge, but received only the answers that it was common sense. This is how it should be, and the city was planned this way. It seems that this knowledge was not public knowledge, so the cultist who was hit knew nothing about it, or they were so basic that they did not leave a strong enough impression in his mind, with the result that the corresponding memories quickly faded after his death, leaving only the impression that it should be so. With the confusion in his head temporarily unresolved, Duncan reached out and flicked the switch, instantly lighting up the area around the stairs and counter. There was another switch on the opposite wall that controlled the lights in the rest of the store on the ground floor, but Duncan had no intention of touching it for now. A small light in a closed antique store at night can be explained by the owner waking up and going to the toilet, but a sudden bright light can attract unwanted attention. In the limited light near the stairs, Duncan's gaze slid past the nearby merchandise. What first caught his attention was a totem carved from wood, less than half a meter high, painted red and blue, as well as an antique ceramic vase with an outrageous price tag. Its original price was 420000 and that was at a discount of 36%. There was an air of despair about her. Duncan quickly scanned the entire store with his eyes. If there was at least one genuine item here, he would have immediately hit his head on the lost house. It didn't even take a real collector to verify the authenticity of the items in this antique store. No one in their right mind would believe that this antique store in the lower area was selling real antiques. The oldest thing in this entire store was probably the sign on the door, but the existence of the store did not surprise Duncan in the least. Its original owner knew that he was selling fakes, and the people who came here to buy things did not expect that there would be a thousand-year-old sculpture in their house. They understood everything perfectly. In the end, even on Earth, under the overpasses, shops selling Jediites still flourished, 98 bracelets in which, according to the store owner they were made from ancient Judaite, turned out to be made of glass. Duncan was not interested in the store owner's bad life. He was only interested in one thing. This store would be his first landfall as captain of the Lost House, a so-called outpost for exploring the world and modern civilization. He had already decided to preserve his current body as long as his strength allowed, and use this antique store as a cover to move around the city-state of Prand. And if eyes training is successful, and he is able to transfer physical objects between the Lost House and Prand, then the antique store will also become a secret intermediate warehouse. Duncan walked behind the counter and sat down on a chair, turning over fragments of memories in his mind and simultaneously pondering possible hidden dangers. The original owner of this body was a sun god believer, but he was only a lower member. Due to the constant suppression of cultist activities by the city authorities, the number of sun god believers in the city of Prand was reduced to the limit, therefore. When contacting other believers, they behaved extremely carefully. This is undoubtedly good news for Duncan, since he has only had one or two similar contacts. This meant that there was only one person within the cult who knew who he was and how to contact him. And once this person is gone, no one will know about his secret activities. Then he will be able to stand with dignity before the most powerful person in Prand, as the most respectable citizen. The even better news was that after carefully reviewing his memories, Duncan confirmed that his biggest problem was gone. After all, his contact turned out to be one of the three cultists whom he saw when he woke up in this body. These three unfortunates had already suffered from the paws of his dove. He relaxed a little and settled into a more comfortable position in his chair. With the biggest problem gone, if there was anything left to worry about, it was the other sun god cultists who had previously performed sacrificial rites underground, and the even larger, secretive and dangerous church the sun god standing behind them. If Duncan's memory served correctly, four years ago, the city-state of Prand dealt a serious blow to the Church of the Sun. Since then, this heretical faith has disappeared from the city, not to mention the rituals. But now these cultists have done something very resonant. The purpose of the sacrificial ritual was, on the one hand, to please God, and on the other, 
to gain power or strengthen God's influence on the real world. But would these lesser members of the church be able to gather on their own for such a big event? Duncan didn't have many memories in his head, and it was unlikely that a lower member of the church would have access to its main secrets. But from the information he had, he could assume that those cultists were gathered by senior members of the church. The heretical cult that worships the true sun god wants to do something big in the city, and the sacrificial rite that went wrong because of me is probably just a minor blip before the big event begins. Duncan didn't have much love for Prand, but if he wanted to use him as a starting point for his development, he would have to think about what a bunch of crazy people like the sun god cultists would do to him. With curfew, the city was not suitable for exploration, and Duncan's excitement at setting foot on the ground prompted him to tirelessly explore the entire building. The original owner of this body was a cultist, but at the same time he was also an ordinary person who needed a normal social life, the comforts of modern civilization in order to survive, communication with people, and, in the end, ordinary everyday things. Therefore, Duncan needs to explore the entire city, and only then will he be able to approximately determine how he can survive here, as well as the general level of technology and the standard of living of people in this era, despite the blurring of his memories. In a secret compartment behind the counter on the ground floor, he found a small amount of cash, including a handful of scattered coins and several blue and green bills of varying denominations, which were considered legal tender in most city-states. Certified and issued jointly by the consuls of the city-states and the Chamber of Commerce of the Vast Sea, the primary currency was the Sora, and the peso, which was a tenth of the Sora, was issued as a secondary currency. The money Duncan found turned out to be a little more than 200 rubles, which, according to his recollections, would be enough for a family of three people to live in the lower city for a month. It seems that even though the store was doing poorly and most of the family's assets were being donated to the church, the original owner of the body was still maintaining some kind of standard of living. This means that the antique store had its own clientele. The first floor of the store could be divided into two parts. Most of the area was occupied by the store itself, located in front of the stairs, and the remaining part by the warehouse behind a small door on the stairs. Inside the warehouse there was another door that served as a back entrance. Through it, the original owner of this body usually brought goods into the store. On the second floor of the store, things were a little more complicated. A restroom, a small and a large room that were located on either side of the stairs, and a plumbing room shared with the neighboring building. In addition, there was also a small kitchen on the second floor, but the dust in it screamed that it had been used at least half a month ago. After looking around, Duncan headed to the master bedroom on the second floor. He looked around the room, which was a size smaller than his bachelor pad and his eyes fell on the small chest of drawers next to the bed. There was a frame with a black and white photograph. It depicted a family of three, a young man and woman in ordinary clothes with a little girl who looked to be four or five years old. They stood in front of a composition that was obviously made artificially and looked straight into the camera with a faint smile on their faces. Duncan walked over to the frame, picked it up, then examined it carefully and continued to match the vague and jumbled clues in his memory. The original owner of this body is not in this photo. The person in this photo seems to be a very close relative of this body. Looking at the young couple, Duncan seemed to feel a faint feeling of longing emerge from the depths of his memories. However, the rest of the information about this photo is vague, as if. The memories of her disappeared from this world along with the last breath of the original owner of this body. He put the frame back and wondered how many people in the lower area could afford a black and white photograph. He then wondered at what stage of development the photographic technology was in this world, and on what principles the equipment used was based. At the same time, his gaze fell on the neatly made bed, and a doubt arose in his mind. How could a cultist who completely dedicated himself to believing in the sun god have the time to regularly keep his room clean? Why were the beds in this bedroom so carefully made when the store on the ground floor was clearly run down? He walked into the small room opposite the stairs and looked at the equally neat and clean bed, as well as the desk. After going through all the memories in his head, he was convinced that the original owner of this body had left the store a few days earlier and went to the secret gathering place of the followers of the sun god. This was his last time in the store, but the most surprising thing is that Duncan did not find any memory of cleaning before leaving. In other words, is there anyone else living with this cultist, that same relative? Duncan frowned slightly. Looking for clues, he walked to the desk in the small room. His gaze wandered over the neatly folded papers and pencils and finally settled on the book. On the table, in a prominent place, lay a book in a dark blue cover with a drawing of gears and connecting rods on a valve and a title written in beautiful handwriting. Tutorial on the Art of Steam and Gears 3. Duncan frowned, already vaguely guessing that this room belonged to another person. But subconsciously, he still picked up the book. 
There were no books on the lost house that he could read, and he hadn't found any books in the master bedroom or anywhere else in the store, so this book could help him understand this world better. Having opened it, he drew attention to the illustrated page. It was indeed a textbook on the basic laws of mechanics and the principles of operation of steam engines. And between the paragraphs of the book, Duncan saw many notes left by its owner. These notes, written in thin, beautiful letters, seemed to belong to a young woman. Duncan rubbed his forehead. It seems that the original owner of this body did not have many friends or relatives. Most of the images or impressions in his memory were of cold and lonely colors. But after looking through his memories several times, he finally vaguely remembered another person, a girl with dark brown hair. It seemed that this was the only figure that the cultist named Ron was continuously thinking about as he breathed his last. Duncan's eyes dropped to the pages of the book. He didn't bother reading words and pictures that dealt with specific principles, but chose sections that resembled introductions and explanations of concepts. Suddenly, his attention was attracted by the following lines. Flame, or more strictly speaking, the specific fire released when burning oils of the deep sea and crystals of shelf minerals are the cornerstones that ensure the functioning of modern society and protect our civilization. The prosperity and order of modern civilization are based on fire and steam. Safe and convenient electricity cannot replace the expelling action of fire, nor can it keep large machinery running continuously for long periods of time. Experiments have shown that steam is the most stable form of energy when exposed to deep space. In this chapter, we will discuss three typical steam architectures, nuclei, and explain the principles of their operation and the ideas associated with them. Duncan closed his eyes. He remembered the gas lanterns, torches and oil lanterns that hung everywhere in the sewers, as well as the gas lanterns on the city streets and the doubts that arose in his mind when he saw an electric lamp in a store. So what is the reason for all these seemingly strange situations? The reason for the use of gas lamps in sewers and streets, even when electricity was developed to a certain extent, was that fire could, to a certain extent, counteract the spread of certain dangers. Duncan's mind was filled with inexplicable emotions. After a few seconds, he looked down at the page and saw a complex drawing, covered with notes, probably left by the owner of the book. It was a machine that he could not understand at all, and certainly not the steam engine that he knew about in his previous life. Complex gears, even more complex cylinders connecting tubes and valves between various parts went far beyond the concept of a steam engine. It was more like some kind of device that jumps straight out of a science fiction book. It is the heart that supports the development of the current civilization. Deep in thought, Duncan slowly returned the book to its original place, for he could no longer understand anything from it. But despite this, some kind of vague enlightenment arose in his mind. The development of civilization in this world seemed to be going completely differently from the one he knew. To survive in a world riddled with danger, the mortal realm has taken on a bizarre appearance. But no matter how bizarre this world is, if it can still be called a civilization, it must have its own logic by which it has developed until now. Gas lamps burning in the sewers, electric lamps lit in shops, steam engines created by the wisdom of an unknown number of people, all testify to the resilience of the current civilization. Duncan put the book down and looked around the rest of the room, finding nothing of value. The small bedroom had very few items and appeared to have been little used. The most valuable things Duncan found were a book and two old notebooks in a desk drawer. The notebooks were filled with entries concerning steam engines and engineering principles, interspersed with the occasional complaint about certain teachers or students. From them, Duncan easily deduced the following. A school-age girl lived in this room. Slowly turning over fragments of memories in his mind, Duncan returned to the main bedroom and returned the room to its original appearance. After sitting thoughtfully on the edge of the bed, he stood up again and went to the closet next to him opened the door from memory, and then pulled out one of the drawers. Inside the box were several bottles of hard liquor and half a box of pain pills, left there by a cultist named Ron. He was seriously ill, and at some point his illness worsened to such an extent that no medicine could help, and low-quality alcohol and painkillers clearly did not help prolong the life of a man who was so seriously ill. Therefore the man who had lost all hope of healing turned to the cult of the sun, who assured him that the healing power of the sun god could cure any disease and purify the body and mind of a person. Of course, to a certain extent, they actually fulfilled their promises. The fact is that the members of the sun cult were able to perform a strange ritual, during which blood from the bodies of innocent people was injected into the bodies of sick believers. Duncan didn't know how the ritual worked or whether it could actually cure the incurable, except that, according to what was left in the fragments of memory, a cultist named Ron actually felt better after the ritual. After this, he began to believe in the sun even more, and even donated half of his family's money to the messenger. But Duncan didn't care what happened among the dead cultists. Reaching deep into the box, 
he managed to find a secret compartment, and after fiddling around a little there, discovered a revolver and a box of cartridges. The city-state of Pran did not prohibit its citizens from owning weapons, but purchasing and storing them required legal formalities, and the counterfeit antique dealer living in the lower region apparently had neither the means nor the status to obtain a permit to possess weapons. So it was definitely an illegal weapon. Out of an abundance of caution, the original owner of this body left the weapon in his room instead of taking it with him to the collection site. He usually used it to protect his magazine, but now the revolver belonged to Duncan. Of course, Duncan knew that it was a very ordinary weapon, not to mention that, compared to the anomalies on the Lost House, even his flintlock gun probably possessed special capabilities compared to this revolver. But Duncan was a realist. The body he was using now was made of flesh and blood, and most of the city was not safe at all. After all, he can't always rely on the dove. Eyes' abilities could easily attract unwanted attention from the church. At that moment, Duncan's attention was attracted by a quiet noise. He heard the sound of a key turning in the lock coming from the door of the store on the ground floor, then the movement of the door opening and the sound of hurried footsteps. Duncan quickly put the revolver away, and only then noticed that it had become surprisingly light outside the window. It turned out that he had been exploring this antique store all night. You've got mail! The pigeon eye sitting on his shoulder suddenly said, Quiet. Duncan immediately glanced at the pigeon and walked towards the door. For now, stay in the room and wait for my orders. If strangers come here, be silent. I immediately flapped his wings and flew to the nearest closet. Aye, Captain. Duncan quickly left the room, and only when he reached the stairs did he hear sharp steps already on the steps, and then a young girl's voice came from below. Uncle Duncan? Are you back? The next moment a girl with long dark brown hair dressed in a long red-brown skirt and a white shirt came into Duncan's field of vision. She looked to be about seventeen or eighteen years old, and the morning dew was still dripping from her hair. This thin and small girl did not stand out too much in appearance but she had the youth and freshness inherent in her age. She looked at Duncan, standing by the stairs on the second floor, with wide eyes and a surprised face. Duncan, however, did not answer. He stood silently on the second floor. The sunlight coming through the narrow window near the stairs rested on his back, making his expression seem hidden in a haze. He looked at the girl silently for several seconds before finally speaking slowly. What did you just call me? Uncle Duncan? Surprise flashed across the girl's face, and then slight nervousness. She grabbed the railing of the stairs next to her with one hand, looking up warily, as if wanting to see the expression on the middle-aged man's face. Is something wrong? Have you been drinking again? Hello. I was away from home for several days. I saw a light on the first floor. The changes in her facial expression and voice did not escape Duncan's eyes and ears. She clearly didn't yet know, or didn't think at all, how to hide her emotions. According to the memories he absorbed, this girl should be the niece of the original owner of his body and his only family. Duncan was vaguely sure that the girl saw nothing wrong with what she said, and did not understand that Uncle Duncan was not the name of the original owner of this body. But what went wrong? Why did the name Duncan sound so natural from the lips of a girl who theoretically cannot know my secret? At the same time, Duncan found in fragments of memories a little information about a girl, a child with dark brown hair, the last remaining relative of the original owner of this body. Nina, Duncan said in an even tone and without changing his face. Did you stay at school yesterday? I stayed at school all these days, the girl answered immediately. I thought you would be gone for at least a week, as always happens. So I packed my things, and then went to borrow a room from a classmate. Mrs. White, who runs the hostel, agreed. I only returned today because I forgot my book at home. Are you all right? It seems to me that you... kind of strange. I'm fine. I just didn't get enough sleep, Duncan answered, and then took a step towards the first floor. One extremely outrageous suspicion crept into his head, and now he had to check it. He walked past Nina and the girl looked curiously into Duncan's eyes, turning sideways. And only when he was almost down to the first floor, she suddenly asked, Uncle Duncan, will you leave again later? Maybe you'll stay at home for a few more days? Depending on the circumstances, Duncan said without looking back, trying to imitate the tone in which the original owner of this body spoke. I'll just go and check something. If everything is okay, then I'll stay at home for a few days. Oh, okay, then I'll go and buy groceries. We don't have much left at home, the girl said in a somewhat animated tone and then ran up the stairs. Duncan, on the contrary, reached the door of the store, and pushing the door sighed softly. He turned his head and looked at the sign hanging in front of the store. On the old, dirty sign the line was clearly visible. Duncan's Antique Store. The first letters were as old as the subsequent ones. Duncan saw no signs of their change, as if it had been this way from the very beginning. He frowned and slowly walked to the nearest window, where he leaned forward and peered at his reflection. It was indeed an unfamiliar face not the imposing and grim ghost captain, 
but a middle-aged man with a beard, deep sunk eyes and haggard gaze, belonging to a cultist named Ron who had died in the sewers. Having finished examining his face, Duncan straightened up. Then he heard the city around him slowly come to life. The ringing of bells in front of the shops that opened early in the morning, the sound of bicycle bells, and the voices of talking passers-by gradually filled the street. Someone passed in front of an antique store. It turned out that it was a neighbor because a greeting reached Duncan's ears. Good morning, Mr. Duncan. Have you read today's newspaper? It looks like the Cathedral of the Deep has ravaged a large cultist lair. This is a big deal. The price of one copy of the Pran News newspaper was 12 pesos, which corresponded to the meager breakfast of an ordinary person. The cheapest newspaper on the block could be bought from a passing newsboy, or you could walk a few extra steps to a newsstand at the end of another street. Duncan decided to walk to the kiosk. Its owner turned out to be a middle-aged man with his head buried in a book. Hearing Duncan put coins into the box, he waved his hand as a sign for him to take the newspaper. During all this time, he did not even look up at Duncan. Duncan glanced at what the other man was reading and found an analysis of past lotteries, with all the unrealistic fantasies outlined in flowery lines. He looked down at the newspaper he had just bought. On the first page was the headline of the news that interested him most. The venerable forces of the church, led by Inquisitor Vanna Vane, successfully eliminated the lair of the cult of the sun god and captured a large number of worshippers, as well as rescued several citizens. The Inquisitor, whose photograph was located on this page, to Duncan's surprise, turned out to be a rather young woman with a scar over her left eye, but this did not detract from her beauty. In the photograph she stood next to men presumably also guards, but she was half a head taller than them. The Inquisitor wore tight-fitting light armor and a two-handed sword that looked like it came straight out of the Cold War era, and behind her in a group of church guards was a huge steam engine with cabins for weapons. A strange and eerie picture, contradictory and at the same time harmonious. Duncan's gaze lingered on this photograph for a long time. The news of the destruction of the cultist's lair made him happy since he could see the capture of the villains who performed the sacrifices without fear of his identity being revealed. But on the other hand, he was more worried about the information that was revealed to him photo. A female inquisitor specializing in fighting cultists, heavily armed steam engines, and the armed forces of the church. Information that Duncan could not practically obtain aboard the Lost House, he easily obtained in a civilized society from a newspaper for only 12 pesos. No matter how Duncan thought at the beginning of the century, when the Lost House was drifting blindly, times have changed. Even if we look at everything from a superficial point of view, the civilized society of mortals, represented by the city-state of Prand, has evolved to a very remarkable stage. Remembering that his niece named Nina was waiting for him in the antique store, he went back. A local resident with his inherent trust factor will be a better source of information than a loner wandering aimlessly around the city. As for the Lost House, Duncan was not worried. Even in a state of traveling through the spiritual world, he could still clearly sense the situation on the ship, feel the state of his other body, and with Goathead at the helm and Alice, it seemed, quite settled, he could be in this body for some time yet. In any case, Lost House crew rules stated that the captain would leave the ship from time to time, so a couple of days in this body shouldn't be much of a problem, right? And as his journey through the spirit world continued, Duncan felt that he was becoming increasingly adept at controlling mental projection. Perhaps soon he would be able to try to control both his bodies at the same time and then he would not have to worry about what was happening on board while he was away. Suddenly, a sweet smell wafted from somewhere to the side, and Duncan subconsciously stopped and looking to the side, saw the windows of a dessert store, behind which freshly baked cakes and pastries were laid out. This was the lower region of the city-state of Prand, and naturally there were no expensive dessert shops, but even the cheapest ones stopped Duncan in his tracks. He had a few coins left in his pocket, which amounted to less than 20 pesos, but was more than enough to buy the cake. After hesitating a little, he went into the store and paid for a piece of the most ordinary sugar cake, which was called B. The material used to wrap the cake reminded him of something like rough paper. Duncan walked towards the antique store with the newspaper and cake in his hands, in an inexplicably cheerful mood. He can walk down the street, talk to people, buy things, and then return to his home. Simple things like that made him feel like he was in another world. He enjoyed the sensation of breathing on dry land, almost savoring it and viewing these mundane things as a kind of valuable life experience. Yes, he liked life on the Lost House. Goathead was noisy but reliable, and Alice was quite funny, but it was nice to get a taste of life on land sometimes. It didn't take long before Duncan found himself in front of the antique store again. Before going inside, he looked again at the sign, which silently displayed the same letters. He entered the store, and immediately the ringing of bells was heard, and then hurried footsteps were heard coming from the direction of the stairs. 
A young girl with long dark brown hair hurriedly ran down the stairs and stopped abruptly. She leaned on the railing and stared at Duncan with wide eyes and a worried expression on her face. Uncle Duncan, where have you been? She spoke. You said you were going to check the door but disappeared in the blink of an eye. I thought you ran away to the tavern or casino again. Duncan looked at the girl in front of him with some surprise. He could tell from her voice that she was genuinely nervous and worried about something. She was worried about the only family member she had left, even if that family member was addicted to alcohol and gambling, and was also a cultist. An incomprehensible feeling washed over him, but it had almost no effect on his face. I just went out for a walk and to do some shopping. Having said this, he walked up to the counter and prepared to put the newspaper and cake on it, but Nina suddenly ran upstairs quickly saying, Uncle, wait a minute. I'll drop off breakfast. You probably haven't had breakfast yet. I made corn and beet soup. Before Duncan could say anything, Nina's figure disappeared down the stairs, and a moment later she carefully descended with a large tray. On the tray was a modest breakfast for two. Duncan, with a somewhat stunned expression on his face, watched as the girl fussed around him, as she deftly cleared space on the counter, arranged the food, and then stepped aside and pulled out an extra chair for him. She did everything with extraordinary skill and besides, she radiated joy that appeared out of nowhere. Watching her fuss, Duncan decided to try to help her, but was unable to intervene. He had dealt with many young people her age, but had never seen such a hard-working and fast child like her. On earth she would have been considered a school student, but here it seems she was already considered a student. It suddenly occurred to Duncan that living with an uncle who had fallen into a cult was not easy, but this girl, Nina, seemed to have adapted perfectly to this life who was by no means happy, and found something in her that supported her. Let's eat, said Nina, who had finished preparing by this time. She looked at Duncan and spoke as if she had repeated these words a million times. Dr. Albert said that if you eat breakfast regularly and maintain a good mood, then in the long run it will, will bring greater benefits than alcoholic drinks, etc. Painkillers. Duncan didn't say anything for a while but just looked at Nina silently, and before her expression became tense, he took the cake, which he had put aside opened the package and placed it in front of Nina. As Nina looked at what appeared before her, her eyes widened in surprise and confusion. It's cake, Duncan answered casually. You're growing up. Eat something nutritious for breakfast. Nina, however, froze in place. She just silently looked at the cake in front of her, and only after a while she almost whispered to herself, Are you really okay? Of course I'm fine, Duncan said with a completely natural expression. It just occurred to me that I haven't bought you dessert for a long time. Indeed, more than a year has passed. Nina muttered, and therefore suddenly burst into laughter and took her table knife. Then half is for you. Dr. Albert said that you also need something nutritious. Duncan felt strange, but after a moment of silence he nodded. Good. Duncan was overcome by a wonderful feeling. He felt with all his being how the lost house was drifting in the endless sea, how a living ghost ship was charting a course under the sensitive control of the goat head, how a damned doll with a weak neck was rushing around different cabins, as if studying and getting to know the situation on the ship and how the deep, dark sea, hiding in its depths, a myriad of strange things, slowly ripples around the ship. In another vision, however, he was sitting in an antique shop in the lower district of the city-state of Prand. The sounds of people talking and cars passing on the street reached his ears, and opposite him sat a girl named Nina, taking a small piece of the cheapest cake in the lower part of the city. He, Captain Duncan, is the owner of the Lost House, the main disaster of the Endless Sea. But at the same time, he is the most ordinary person calmly having breakfast in the very depths of the city. It is not known whether he dreamed it, but he felt that some part of himself, which was uneasy, calmed down a little. Perhaps it was due to the long stay on the ghost ship or something else, but he didn't think it was that bad. As if noticing his gaze, Nina, who was eating her cake, suddenly raised her head and looked at Duncan, curiously. Uncle Duncan, why aren't you eating? Duncan looked at the food on her plate. Is this enough for you? Yes, eating too many sweets is harmful. Hmm, Duncan nodded, took the cake and took a bite, enjoying the rich taste that he had not felt for a long time. He felt the delicate sweetness slowly dissolve in his mouth, and then clearly felt that this body was beginning to process the food he had eaten. He calmed down, realizing that everything was going as he expected. This body was better than the one in which he first found himself. Its parts are intact, and it had been dead for a short time. So its own soul took over and revived it almost unhindered. He breathes, his blood flows, and his heart beats. Although it seems to beat a little slower than a normal person's, it is still within normal limits. He didn't have to worry about the body rotting, and this eliminated the need for it to be soaked in preservatives, reducing the likelihood of detection by ordinary people. But Duncan still doubted one thing. He knew that this body must be suffering from illness. In the memories he received from the original owner, 
the negative impression of illness was much stronger than all other memories, and the alcohol and painkillers he found inside the box earlier served as confirmation of this. He didn't know what kind of disease was bothering this body, since the memories of the time of its onset and its causes were so long ago that they had long been blurred. But he knew one thing for sure. At the moment he did not feel any pain. Nothing bad in this body except for the feeling of weakness. Has the disease disappeared? Was this body healed by traveling through the spirit world? Or is it because my soul projection is so limited in its perception that I cannot sense the problems of my body and its health is still deteriorating? Duncan thought while eating, and then suddenly looked at Nina, who was eating opposite him. Don't you have to go to school today? Nina lived in the lower part of the city, which was not exactly prosperous. But the city-state of Prand had apparently developed to the point where basic education was very widespread. She attended a school run by the church and the mayor's office that specialized in steam engines. Such a school could be viewed as a kind of vocational high school, designed to train skilled steam engine technicians. One half of her tuition fees were paid by her uncle, and the other half by the mayor's office. For a city-state in the industrial era, even subsidies for the training of masters in this field were very justifiable and it cannot be denied that such schools at least solved the problem of illiteracy of ordinary people. Nina was a good student, and as far as her uncle could remember, the girl had relatively good grades in all subjects. I don't have any classes this morning, Nina nodded. Only two history lessons in the afternoon. Besides, I have to talk to Mrs. White this afternoon about how I won't be staying at the dorm. Duncan suddenly froze, gave Nina a serious look and asked, Don't you think being here to look after someone like me is a big deal? We'll slow down your studies? You could have stayed in school. It will be more useful for your studies. Nina looked at her Uncle Duncan in confusion, and then suddenly got angry. You shouldn't say that. You're just sick. Just follow your doctor's advice and take your medicine. Mom and Dad entrusted you to me. Your mom and Dad entrusted you to me, Duncan corrected her, looking through the memories in his head, when you were six years old. But now I'm seventeen. Nina puffed out her cheeks and heavily pricked the last piece of cake with her fork. And you don't even take good care of yourself, unlike me. If I moved, it wouldn't take you three days to get your room in order. In fact, you could ask me to look after the store, or at least clean it up. The windows here are so dirty that you can barely see anything through them. Duncan helplessly listened to the girl's incoherent lecture, not expecting such a reaction to his random test. But soon he could not help himself and smiled softly. He felt from this girl, warm as if she were bathed in sunlight. Well, I said it without thinking, he said, shaking his head and stirring the last bits of soup in his bowl. How are you doing with your history lesson? Are you really okay, Uncle Duncan? Nina's eyes widened in surprise. You never, well, at least never asked me about school affairs over the past two years. Duncan opened his mouth and was about to say something when the girl in front of him spoke again. We were talking about ancient history recently, and Mr. Morris told us about the consequences of the Great Annihilation. Honestly, it was quite interesting. Ancient history sounds like a story in many parts, but much more interesting than modern history, and modern history is very interesting. Duncan thought, it looks like you're a good student, then let me test you. What does the Great Annihilation mean? Uncle Duncan was acting strange today. Nina couldn't say exactly what it was about his behavior that seemed strange to her, but something definitely seemed strange. But she didn't think too much about it. The moment Uncle Duncan perked up, the simple-minded girl felt happiness, and she was glad that he asked her a question about her knowledge. So, with a smug smile, she began to tell Duncan about what she had just learned. The Great Annihilation occurred about 10,000 years ago. Although for unknown reasons ethnic minorities with unique cultural heritage, such as the Elves, Senjin, and Jipu, recorded conflicting dates in their own calendars, it is generally accepted in archaeological circles that the Great Annihilation occurred at the end of the Age of Order, 10,000 years ago. Duncan and listened to her story with a calm face, but a lot of questions accumulated in his head. Elves? Senjin? Jipu? Who is this? So people are not the only intelligent race in this world? And are Elves the same Elves as people understand in my past world? Is there an elven city-state in the Endless Sea, living in the era of the steam industry? He couldn't help but think of some very strange images in his head. Meanwhile, Nina continued to tell, Tales of the Great Annihilation vary slightly from city-state to city, but one of the most common parts is that the Age of Order before the Great Annihilation was a much more prosperous, stable, and secure time than today. In that era, there was a huge continent in the world. The sea was much smaller than it is today, and there was no such thing as the border of reality at all. The era that followed the Great Annihilation is known as the Age of the Deep Sea, which continues to this day. Its most striking feature is that the vast sea covers almost the entire world, while the land constitutes less than 10% of the land in old times. 
It is divided into small and large islands or misty foreign lands, with many of the modern city-states built on relatively stable islands, with various ships serving as a means of communication between them. At the beginning of the Age of the Deep Sea, the remnants of the Old World faced a terrible catastrophe, due to which almost all the old civilizations were destroyed. The ancient kingdom of Crete, the first to rise from ruins, is the earliest known ancestor of the Age of the Deep Sea civilization. Although this ancient kingdom lasted less than a century, it left behind a vast legacy that would have a profound impact on future generations, including the most primitive and crude ways of classifying the numerous anomalies and visions of the Age of the Deep Sea, as well as vast and valuable experience in surviving the Great Annihilation, a turning point in the history of this world and the beginning of what was now called the Age of the Deep Sea. Based on what Nina told him, Duncan finally understood why this world had changed so much, and that it used to not be as strange and dangerous as it is today. If history is to be believed, then before the Great Annihilation the world was a prosperous and safe paradise. Then there was no endless sea. Water did not cover more than 95% of the Earth's surface as it does today. Humanity lived on vast and safe lands, and even in the oceans there were no such dangerous visions such as the spiritual world, the abyss or subspace. The age of order that was spoken of in the history books was more like the world Duncan knew, and while modern people would look with wonder and disbelief at a time when anomalies did not exist, for Duncan the world today is completely wrong. The key event of the Great Annihilation was not explained in detail in history books, and despite the efforts of the archaeological community, the ancient history of city-states and peoples is so fragmented that no one knew what caused it or what kind of disaster it was. A fog of mystery shrouded this event and after the fog came the age of the deep sea. Seawater that appeared out of nowhere flooded more than 90% of the land. Surviving civilizations built city-states and fleets on the remaining islands and patches of land, and the endless sea and fog brought strange things with them, called anomalies and visions, which still threatened the survival of civilization. Nina had no idea that the ghost captain was standing in front of her and learning from her words. She just thought it was her uncle testing what she learned at school. He had not been in such a good mood for a long time and Nina was happy about his current state and even considered these moments unusually precious, since she was worried that Uncle Duncan would turn back into his former self. And judging by past experience, this was almost inevitable. Once the alcohol wore off or the painkillers ran out, her uncle became unusually irritable, short-tempered, and hysterical. So before Uncle Duncan had another attack, she wanted to show him all the progress she had made so that he would be in a good mood for another day or two. Mr. Morris is very interested in the history of the ancient kingdom of Crete, he is an expert on the subject, and he told us that although the ancient kingdom of Crete lasted only a hundred years, it was the first civilization to rise from the ashes to combat the anomalies and visions after the age of the deep sea. They spent a hundred years fighting them, and the lessons they learned still guide most cities to this day, the most important of which is their ways of classifying anomalies and visions. Ways of classifying anomalies and visions? Have you already learned them? Duncan asked, raising his eyebrows high. From the very beginning of her story, Duncan was worried and only then became more and more convinced that in the eyes of ordinary people of this world, there is a strict set of differences between things that do not make sense. Some of these things were called anomalies and they even had a number, while others, it seems, were called visions. He had never heard the details of this from Goathead before, and now what Nina learned at school will finally fill in the gaps in his knowledge in this area. Nina nodded and began to remember what she heard in class. Mr. Morris taught us that the easiest way to separate anomalies and visions is scale, as a rule, anomalies are small in scale and limited to one object, animal, or even person. Most anomalies can be moved, and their sphere of influence is limited. Many of them affect only one target, and with certain techniques they can be safely sealed or isolated. Visions, on the other hand, are much larger in scale than anomalies. The smallest of them are the size of a house, and large ones span entire city-states or even larger. A significant number of visions cannot be moved. They are either fixed in one place or act of their own free will and their ability to influence the environment far exceeds that of anomalies. As a rule, visions can influence an infinite number of targets within their sphere of influence, so they began to be equated with natural visions, phenomena, hence their name. Unlike anomalies, almost all visions cannot be sealed or controlled. They exist in the world, and like natural phenomena, act without external intervention and naturally affect all purposes within their sphere. Since most apparitions are dangerous, all people can do is stay away from them or use special techniques to avoid being targeted by them. Fortunately, the most dangerous apparitions usually do not move, and church members have identified them in advance so we can stay away from them at a safe distance," Nina said seriously, and then, as if suddenly remembering something, she hastened to add, Oh yes, 
Mr. Morris also mentioned that these methods are usually valid. Anomalies and visions are things that defy common sense, and so no matter how many of them a person learns about, there will always be anomalies or visions that do not fit the definition. Sometimes anomalies and visions can even change places, and there have also been cases when visions were destroyed by human hands. For example, in 1830, an anomaly known as Giffa ran out of control in the city-state of Lunds. Local church members banished her to a nearby island at great expense and in 1835 the island was recognized as a vision and named Mushroom Island. But in 1844 the great Saint Palatine, having given his life, sealed it in a vase with his ashes, and so the Mushroom Island anomaly became the anomaly known as the Palatine Mushroom Vase. She is now sealed in the underground sacred vault of the church in the city-state of Lunds. Duncan listened carefully to Nina's story, thoughts raging in his head, but the calm expression on his face hid his inner turmoil. In that short breakfast, he had collected more information than in all the days he had been in the Lost House. Establishing contact with land and creating an outpost in the city-state was indeed the right decision. Civilized society is where most of the knowledge from all over the world was accumulated. He subconsciously looked at the girl in front of him, who was still talking, and an epiphany occurred in his mind. A civilization that had developed to the industrial stage would have found a way to cram the basic functioning of society into its own educational system and a child living in this system would hardly have realized what a treasure trove of textbooks he was regularly exposed to. This knowledge, accumulated by countless people over countless years and brought together over the years into one structure, was best suited for teaching children. These textbooks, into which a huge archive of knowledge was crammed, were created for only one purpose, to turn a blank sheet of paper into a functioning part of society with minimal time and effort. This is something that even Nina, who usually loves to study, does not appreciate. Only Duncan, an outsider, understands how valuable this knowledge is. Nina didn't understand what Duncan was thinking. She simply continued to remember what her venerable history teacher said in class. So, at the end of the last lesson, Mr. Morris told us that people dealing with anomalies and visions have generalized many laws, but only one of them always works, and that is that, no matter how many laws we generalize, there will definitely be anomalies or visions in the world that violate them. This law, also known to scientists as the Law of Eternal Zero, always ranks first in all textbooks and works on this topic. In accordance with it, scientists formulated the famous law of the eternal discrepancy between anomalies and visions, and to date this law has never been violated. Right now Nina was happy, because she had not eaten with Uncle Duncan like this for a very long time, had not discussed with him what had happened to her at school and she didn't see a smile on his face. It even reminded her of the old days when her uncle was still healthy. After she lost her parents at the age of six, this man became her only family in this world. But four years ago, an illness, the cause of which even doctors could not determine, turned her uncle into a completely different person. And to tell the truth, she experienced these times very hard. Her uncle still paid for her studies and provided her with everything she needed. But Nina felt like all the colors of the future were disappearing from her usual store and dissipating among the alcohol, painkillers, and suspicious friends with whom she uncle was dealing. She had long ago given up hope that she could return to those past times. Duncan was also happy because he finally received more information about the world, finally touched her history. Even if it was only a small part of it, he was still glad that he was able to learn at least something. The lost age of order, the great annihilation that changed the world, the age of the deep sea that continues to this day, anomalies and visions around the world which he was completely unaware of or had seen. What he previously knew nothing about or knew little about was now outlined more clearly. They finished breakfast, and Nina got up from the table to clear the dishes. From the speed of her skillful movements, Duncan immediately realized that she did this work on a regular basis, and no doubt, it was she who cleaned the upstairs bedroom. A sick man who devoted most of his energy and enthusiasm to the cult obviously would not do this. But looking at the busy girl in front of him, Duncan finally couldn't stand it, and standing up, took a large tray from Nina's hands. Let me carry this, since I'm going upstairs anyway. Nina looked at Duncan in surprise. She was about to say something, but he was already heading towards the stairs. The girl could only hurry after warning, Uncle, be careful. The doctor says you're still unwell. Dr. Dr. Albert? Duncan asked without turning around. Climbing the stairs, he tried to find an impression of this doctor in fragments of memory, but found only a few fragments. Everything is fine with me. In any case, to date he has not even been able to find out the cause of my illness, and the most effective medicine he prescribed was a painkiller. You should listen to his advice, Nina muttered, following Duncan up to the second floor. At least he knows what to do to stay healthy. She was suddenly interrupted by the sound of flapping wings. He and Duncan looked in the direction it was coming from, and saw a shadow momentarily flash behind the door of the master bedroom. Uncle Duncan, something flashed in your room, Nina said in surprise. 
before stepping forward and grabbing the doorknob. Maybe it's the neighbor's cat. Wait. Before Duncan could finish speaking, Nina pushed the bedroom door open, and a dove hiding in the room appeared before their eyes. I stood at the very top of the chest of drawers, grabbing a small piece of potato with one paw and trying to stuff it into his beak. But the door suddenly opened, interrupted his plans, and he froze in place, trying to stuff a small piece of potato into his beak with one paw. One of his beady eyes stared at Nina, and the other, accordingly, at the wall on the other side. Then he saw Duncan, and flapping his wings twice, cooed loudly. Out of the corner of his eye, Duncan noticed that the window nearby was wide open. Apparently, I had escaped through it. And in the distance, directly opposite the window, he could see a port, flooded with sunlight. The pigeon went to the port and returned with a piece of potato. Pigeon? Nina finally reacted, looking at I in surprise. Uncle Duncan, there is a pigeon in your room. I see, Duncan said indifferently. I've never seen him before. After his words, I immediately threw a piece of potato and flying up, landed on Duncan's shoulder. He arrived this morning, Duncan sighed. Someone must have raised him. True, he understands little. I gave him a treat and because of this he doesn't fly away. Listening to Duncan, I cooed loudly again. If it weren't for the presence of strangers in Duncan's order, he would have already started saying something at the top of his lungs. Nina did not doubt her uncle's words. She looked at the dove with shining eyes and then carefully approached and asked Duncan, while at the same time observing the dove's reaction, You. Do you want to keep it? Can I keep it? The girl's thoughts were written on her face. In her eyes, I was just a sweet and cute white dove. Hi. After Duncan's words, tilted his head and looked at him questioningly. Duncan suddenly thought that the bird was surprisingly more understanding when it was silent than when a moment later he pretended to hesitate, and then nodded. Yes, but only if he himself the pigeon will want it. He can fly away at any moment and then you shouldn't complain. Nina broke into a wide smile. Great! I knew you were truly a prudent man, Uncle Duncan. Asterisk. 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 In the very center of the prayer room of the Cathedral of the Deep, Valentine, the Archbishop of the City-State, dressed in a clergyman's robe with gold stripes on a black background, stood with a serious face in front of the statue of the Goddess of Storms. He is a tall and thin old man with thinning gray hair and calm eyes. In the prayer room a large candelabra burned quietly, illuminating the room with holy flames, and on the stage stood a statue of Jamona. The statue of the goddess had no face. Her entire head was covered with a black mourning veil, and a long skirt with waves depicted on it hung from her body to the very edge of the stage. Although it is only a statue, it exudes such a strong sense of presence that anyone near it will feel as if someone is watching and protecting them. This feeling of being watched and protected was real, and it was because of it that Vanna, who had come to discuss matters with the archbishop, was able to speak confidently and openly about the images she saw in her dreams. If this is what you saw in your dream, then this is really the lost house. The archbishop turned around and looked at the young inquisitor who came to him early in the morning. Although from the point of view of the church hierarchy the inquisitor and the bishop were equal, it was not uncommon for the inquisitor to turn to him for advice or even guidance when it came to studying supernatural events. So this is really the lost house? Even though she already knew the answer, Vanna couldn't help but be surprised when she heard the archbishop's verdict. I thought, did you think that these days the ship is just a legend? Like all those stories about ghost ships that sailors brag about in taverns? Valentine understood what Vanna wanted to say. The old man with thinning gray hair shook his head and said in a deep voice, The existence of the lost house is a fact recognized by all city-states in the church. This is not a legend, but something that can be found in the archives of the cathedral. I know that the lost house actually existed. The archives of the city-state of Prand even contain some of the drawings of its design and records of its maiden voyage over a century ago. But all this information is limited to the time when it was still sailing in the real world, and when Captain Duncan was a man, Vanna said seriously. The next moment she glanced at the statue behind the archbishop and decided to be more careful in her words. We know for sure that this ship fell into subspace. A century ago, thousands of fugitives from the thirteen islands of Vizarin witnessed how the ship, along with their homeland, was swallowed up by the edge of reality, and they plunged straight into the shadows of subspace. And in the decades since, although we have received eyewitness reports of seeing the Lost House reappear in the real world, all of them have no real evidence, and a significant number of scientists doubt the ship's return, said the young inquisitor, looking at the old man standing in front of her. Is it possible for something absorbed by subspace to reappear in the real world? Until now, no one and nothing except for the Lost House has returned to the real world after falling into subspace. And even in the case of the Lost House, there are only eyewitness reports, and scientists from all walks of life doubt the return of this ship. But that's not the point, said the old man. 
and his serious gaze fell on Vanna. The point is different. Inquisitor, are you afraid of something? In front of the statue of the Goddess of Storms, a thin, blessed candle shone with an even flame, and light spread around it, so that the Archbishop of the city-state, dressed in dark robes, seemed to be bathed in divine grace. His words seemed to carry some kind of magic, and Vanna mentally heard the gentle sound of the waves, followed by a thunderclap. With the assistance of an external force, the blessing of the storm goddess finally broke through the veil in her head. Vanna suddenly inhaled sharply, as if she had suddenly returned to land from the depths of the sea. Her chest heaved violently, her heart was pounding. The feeling that the goddess was looking at her overwhelmed her, and being in a semi-trance, she continued to hear Valentine's voice. The existence of the lost house is a historical fact, and the omens you encounter are an objective fact. Given these two things, your normal reaction would be to first assume the threat exists, and then look for a solution, but you subconsciously doubt its existence. Inquisitor, why do you deny the existence of the lost house when it really exists, and apparently is slowly approaching the borders of the civilized world? Vanna felt beads of sweat form on her forehead. The curtain that had appeared between her and the goddess seemed to disappear, which made her feel much better and the words of the archbishop made her realize what had happened. She unwittingly fell under the influence of the lost house. This was the peculiarity of many visions or anomalies. They caused confusion, subconscious ignorance and denial, so that the person unwittingly fell under more and more influence. This subconscious ignoring and denial is an instinctive reaction of intelligent beings in an attempt to protect themselves, to avoid danger. But when in contact with anomalies, this instinctive reaction could become a source of numbness, and ultimately lead to them themselves becoming unwitting victims of visions and anomalies. As an inquisitor who often dealt with supernatural phenomena, Vanna believed that she knew everything about them, but she never imagined that she herself could fall into this psychic trap. Didn't her powerful will have the slightest effect against this? I don't know when I came under the influence, she admitted. She didn't hide her weakness in front of the archbishop, because it was quite natural for her to be influenced by anomalies or visions. Shame and concealment will not help the matter. I came here immediately after waking up from the omen. Along the way, I didn't talk to anyone or touch any books or objects. I believe that it is not the outside world that is to blame for my current state. But you just completely ignored your omens so that you were influenced much earlier, the bishop said, peering intently into Vanna's face, as if expecting changes in her eyes and breathing. Have you been exposed to anything unusual in the recent past? This may be pollution from the lost house, which has previously left an anchor point in your subconscious. In the recent one, Vanna frowned, then suddenly remembered the sacrifice that fell at the sight of the ritual by the Dark Sun cultists, the emerald flames that flared up in his eye sockets, and her severed finger. Her eyes widened and she stared at the archbishop. When I led the team to dismantle the Dark Sun cultists' ritual site in the sewers the day before yesterday, did I report any unnamed contamination? The archbishop shook his head. No, you left right after you sent those cultists to the church. Vanna thought. Have any of those who participated in this liquidation reported anything about this? No. All the materials contain things related only to the cultists of the Dark Sun. Under the statue of the goddess, the archbishop looked at Vanna, and she looked at him in return. It looks like we have found the moment when the pollution first came ashore. The archbishop exhaled quietly, his expression remaining calm, but his eyes were tense, as if a storm was brewing. In the holy name of my goddess, Jamona, Inquisitor. Are your memories of that night still clear? Vanna took a deep breath. In the holy name of my goddess Jamona, I clearly remember all the details of that night. The archbishop nodded, turned and set fire to specially made incense, and then, placing a copper incense burner with incense near the statue, said in a deep voice, What happened there? And Vanna told everything she remembered, without missing a single detail. With the help of the sacred incense, her mind became clearer than ever and the experience of that night was as clear as if she were there again. She remembered how the eyes of the sacrifice suddenly opened, how emerald flames burst from its eye sockets, how it fell on her finger, and she immediately carried out the cleansing, as on the way to the church she told herself that the pollution is completely cleansed, completely cleansed, completely cleansed. She muttered these words all the way, and all the guards who walked with her muttered them too, and not one of them saw anything wrong with it. What a terrible and strange scene that pale knight must remember when a small group of guards walks along the silent and deserted streets, and each of them whispers to himself the same phrase again and again. And all this time, they did everything as usual, looked after the heretics who had just been captured, cleansed the ritual site. Spiritual flame affects the soul, so cleansing on the physical level caused by cutting off a limb is useless. All you will get in this case is deceptive consolation. 
it is best to immediately burn incense, sprinkle sacred oil on the ground to create a temporary sacred space, and then perform a prayer ritual to invoke the power of the goddess to carry out spiritual cleansing. It's my mistake, Vanna said in a heavy tone. I should have been more vigilant. An omission, but not a mistake. The old man shook his head. You have a lot of power, but ultimately a little less experience as an inquisitor. Fortunately, you are now free from the consequences, which means that the pollution was not too strong and only affected you on a psychological level. Thanks to the incense ritual that I just performed, I can roughly judge its strength. At this point he paused, as if thinking and assessing something. The guards who were with you at that time should have suffered much less. They were just standing nearby, so the effects of pollution should quickly disappear after praying in the church. In general, the pollution to which you were exposed, although ominous and strange in nature, but its influence did not lead to anything more terrible, since it was cut off from the source. Based on what you just did and the feedback from the incense, even if you didn't come today, in a few days you would have sensed something was wrong yourself. Instead, we need to worry more about the future. The future. Vanna repeated the archbishop's last word, her expression gradually becoming serious. Yes, the future. Nothing is over yet. The image appearing in her omen served as a warning sent by the goddess that what she had encountered so far was likely just a prelude to the storm. Many years have passed since the Lost House appeared within sight of the borders of civilization. Many thought that he returned to subspace and became one of the many shadows in the depths of the world. But now it seems that Captain Duncan is still obsessed with the real world, Archbishop Valentine said slowly, turning to the statue of the Goddess of Storms. A century ago the Lost House crashed in the depths of subspace, and although there is no clear evidence of this, many eyewitness accounts say that a strong storm raged in the nearby waters, and that the ship's crash was partly due to its influence. Storms are the power of my goddess. Vanna frowned. Do you think that Captain Duncan is going to take revenge on the goddess? It goes without saying that even for a ghost returning from subspace, it is unthinkable to take revenge on the gods. The gods reside in the realm of the gods, which is hidden above reality and it is logical that everything in the world tends to descend from the upper levels of the world. No one has ever traveled in the opposite direction, to the realm of the gods, which is above the real world. But if this Captain Duncan seeks revenge on the viceroys of my goddess on earth, the sacred church of the storm patrols the world on behalf of the goddess in the endless sea. Most of the time, he floats in a secret place where no one can find him, while in contrast, the city-state of Prand is the greatest point of faith in the goddess of storms on earth, besides the church of the storm. It is also a point of faith that anyone can visit. From this point of view, it is quite logical that a vengeful ghost would decide to head to Prand. The gods live in the realm of the gods, far from the real world, and the world believes that this dimension is the cornerstone of the world, which, contrary to common sense, is not located on bottom and at its top. In surviving texts, the ancient kingdom of Crete described the structure of the world as they knew it something like this. At the very top of the world is a cornerstone, guarded by eternal truth and order. Inside it is the kingdom of the gods, which is inherent in eternal existence. Below the kingdom of the gods is the real world, where earthly beings enjoy the afterglow of order, and thanks to it can live in relative safety. Below the real world is the spiritual world, gradually moving away from the perception of mortals. Here the blessings of the gods wane, and perverted and grotesque forces take over. Below the spiritual world stretch the depths, an uninhabitable place where strange forces dominate. This is no longer part of the material world but rather a reflection of non-existence, and beyond it lies the bottom of this world, subspace where the shadows of all things, extremely dangerous ancient gods, and all sorts of sinister creatures live. According to the stories of people from the ancient kingdom of Crete, the gods made a covenant in the cornerstone. He is the source of all the laws of the world, an order that flows down and penetrates everything on earth. And as you descend, the power of this order begins to weaken, and gradually subspace takes over. The cornerstone where the gods live, and subspace are like the upper and lower points of the world, between which order flows in one direction. This is an ancient gift from the glorious civilization that ushered in the age of the deep sea 10,000 years ago. Over the years, countless scientists have carefully studied this layered structure, and, finding no flaws in it, have accepted it as the standard model of the world. In this standard model, ordinary mortals may fall into the layer below, but few return from there. And even if from time to time one or two lucky ones return from the spiritual world to the real one, no one has ever heard of a being who would come from the real world to the realm of the gods. It is for this reason that the return of the lost house from subspace to reality is one of the most outrageous visions of the world. Its return defies the standard model of the world. But on the other hand, the existence of the lost house is consistent with the classical law of anomalies and visions. In any case, 
Neither Bishop Valentine nor Vanna thought that the ghost captain was capable of taking revenge on the storm goddess, even if he had the courage to do so. Since the cornerstone, the realm of the gods, is in no way connected with the real world, there is no interchange of matter between them, as, for example, between the real and spiritual worlds, or between the spiritual world and the depths. Until now, no scientist has found evidence of a direct connection between the keystone and the real world. Even the gods can only indirectly exert their influence on the real world only through projections, let alone a ghost ship. Since it is impossible to take revenge on the goddess of storms herself, the only remaining option is, of course, her believers. The Church of Storms, headquarters of the Cathedral of the Deep, is an ark that floats like an elusive ghost on the vast sea, and the Pope, seated on the ark, has the power to control the storms on behalf of the goddess. Not an easy goal. On the other hand, the city-state of Prand, open to the public, was the best choice. Eighty percent of its inhabitants believed in the goddess of storms. Vanna had already decided for herself that the ghost captain was thirsty for revenge. After all, the lost house was wrecked during a storm a hundred years ago, and she could not think of any other reason why he, who had disappeared for so many years, suddenly returned to the real world and headed to city-state of Prand. But what exactly was he going to do? Vanna furrowed her brows and said slowly, pondering each word, Bishop Valentine, do you think the Lost House has anything to do with the recent changes in the city-state brought about by a group of followers of the Dark Sun? Having said this, she paused and added, Last night in a dream, I saw the scorching sun and the Lost House appear together in Prand. The simultaneous appearance of these two disasters could be an omen sent to me by the goddess. Don't forget that in the sewers, a tainted sacrifice killed a dark sun cultist, a baptized envoy. The bishop shook his head. At least at that place of the ritual, the captain of the lost house and the cultists of the dark sun were at enmity. Vanna fell silent for a moment, deep in thought over the bishop's words, and the old man opposite her, after a short silence, continued. As for those followers of the dark sun, this morning I received several leads from the city-state of Lunds. Vanna immediately raised her head. Leader? The followers of the Dark Sun have become more active not only in Prand. Recently they have been moving across many city-states. A large number of them had recently transited through the ports of Lunds and Moko and assembled at Pranda. Some of them were caught. The old bishop nodded. During the interrogation these heretics mentioned the Sun Shards. The Sun Shards are the decayed remains of the true Sun God as these heretics call him after he disintegrated. Vanna asked. They think they are hidden in Prand? So far it looks like that. I don't know where the heretics got this information from. Perhaps it was a revelation that they received in another attack of madness. In any case, they are now convinced that part of the remains of their lord are hidden in this city, said Bishop Valentine with a stoic expression. And they see in this hope for the revival of the Dark Sun. Madmen, Vanna could not resist cursing. How many lives have they already crippled to resurrect this dark and blasphemous sun? The Dark Sun is what we call it. And for them, the sun god is a bright and shining light, representing the truest order in the world. You can't expect this bunch of crazed cultists to have any conscience when their hands are full of blood. Valentine shook his head. They are convinced that everything they say and do is righteous, and there are only two languages that work best when dealing with them. One of them is caliber, and the other is an eye for an eye. The corners of Vanna's lips twitched as she listened to the bishop's cathedral of the deep style statement. Looks like we'll be pretty busy soon. There is never peace in the endless sea, but the city-state is located right in the middle of it, said Valentine. The captains of ships will have to face the storms of the sea, and we will have to face the storms of fools. Inquisitor, get ready. The city-state of Pran may face a serious challenge. Two challenges, Vanna corrected. In addition to the followers of the Dark Sun, there is also a secretive and terrifying ghost captain. If the Lost House and the followers of the Dark Sun are not the same thing, then we will face two challenges. Archbishop Valentine thought for a moment. Perhaps there is another possibility. Based on what happened in the sewers, could the Lost House be at enmity with the followers of the Dark Sun? Then these two challenges will merge into one destructive disorder, Bishop Valentine. Vanna looked at the old man, who clearly began to lose his train of thought. With a ghost ship returning from subspace, a group of cultists fighting in the city-state of Prand, and the possible appearance of the Dark Sun in between, I can't think of a worse situation than this. Valentine sighed, admitting that Vanna was right. Teaming up with the city authorities to capture all the heretics who have infiltrated the city-state to eliminate the Dark Sun threat before things get serious is an easier goal, Vanna said. And as for the ghost ship, we don't yet know its further actions and cannot do anything except better monitor the spiritual world and the waters around the city-state. Having said this, the young Inquisitor could not help but shake her head, feeling her complete helplessness. Damn it! Who knows what the ghost captain will do next? Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. I would like some more sauce. Duncan turned to Nina. Just give it to me. I'll do everything myself. 
Nina immediately handed over the sauce. Okay, Uncle Duncan. It was now midday, and Duncan and Nina were having lunch in the small kitchen on the second floor. The food at the antique shop was simple. Pancakes with local herbs and sauce and vegetable soup. It's not exactly a delicacy, but both Duncan and Nina ate it with pleasure. It had been a long time since Duncan had a proper lunch. The same applied to Nina. Duncan felt that he was beginning to like this place. After dinner, Duncan watched Nina clear the table. He wanted to help her with the dishes, but was forced to refuse on the grounds that the doctor said you should keep your hands out of cold water. So he leaned against the stairs and watched the girl potter around in the kitchen, reading the morning newspaper. At the sight of this ordinary home environment, a strange feeling came over him. At that moment, Nina's voice came from the kitchen. Uncle Duncan, is there any news in the newspaper? Duncan looked down at the newspaper and immediately saw the date August 14, 1900, followed by the news that the Inquisitor had led a team to capture dozens of cultists. The most significant news, and therefore it was on the front page. It says here that the Inquisitor led a team that captured dozens of heretics, he said casually, and that this was the largest gathering of heretics that the Council had managed to disperse in the last four years. Further here they remind the population of the need to be safe at night and to report any heretics you see around. Oh, I heard about this on the way here. Nina quickly put the washed plates back in place with a quick movement of her hand. This is scary. I heard from my teacher that cultists who worship the sun even sacrifice living people to the sun god. How crazy do you think a person needs to be to believe in such a cult? Duncan didn't know what to say because whatever he said, he felt it would sound too subtle. Should he say that not long ago they tried to sacrifice him? Or should he say that your, was your uncle just that crazy? But Duncan understood one thing. Judging by Nina's reaction, she clearly did not know that her uncle was a cultist. She even had a normal, ordinary opinion that belief in the sun god and sacrifices are terrible things. In her mind, her uncle was acting a little grumpy because of his illness, alcohol, and some strange friends. The body he occupied could have belonged to the most rotten man in the world. But at least he raised Nina and still protected the girl from her faith in the sun god. Maybe someday in the future, a cultist named Ron would actually take the final step and drag his last family on earth into this endless abyss but at least until today this has not happened. And it won't happen in the future. Uncle, why did you suddenly become silent? Nina was a little interested in the silence behind her, and she looked around with concern in her eyes. Feeling bad again? No, just a little carried away. Duncan replied, shaking his head. You're right. To believe in this cult, you have to be really crazy. The newspaper also mentioned that you need to be safe at night and promptly report heretics that you see around. These days, you should try not to wander outside of school and home. Nina nodded, but then gasped with a hesitant expression on her face. But I have a meeting with a classmate, and I'm going to visit a museum in a couple of days. Museum? Duncan asked casually. What museum? The one next to the school on the outskirts of the upper district, the Maritime Museum, Nina explained. I heard that samples of sea minerals were recently exhibited there. May I? Go if you want, Duncan said with a thoughtful nod. Cathedral guards are patrolling everywhere now, and I don't think the cultists have the courage to show themselves in the city. Nina nodded happily. Mmm, do you still have to go to school this afternoon? Asked Duncan. Well, there's a history lesson this afternoon, and I don't want to miss old Mr. Morris's lesson, Nina said, nodding her head. He is a very famous expert in the field of history. But it is strange why an old man like him does not lecture at a university in the upper part of the city, but comes to a public school in the lower part. Half the class doesn't like his history lessons, and they are all asleep when he starts the lesson. Duncan frankly shook his head. How should I know? Jokes aside, not to mention old Mr. Morris, who taught history, he himself met Nina only recently, and he had to rewind his memories a few hours just to find out where the public school she went to was. And, I'm afraid, even the original owner of this body did not know too much about his niece's recent past. He was apparently too deeply mired in heretical beliefs by the time Duncan took possession of his body. After lunch, Nina had classes, so she didn't stay long in the antique store. Hastily packing her things and taking a textbook left at home, the girl ran out of the house. It was almost an hour's journey from the antique store to the public school, and she had to not waste a minute so as not to be late for Mr. Morris's lesson. Of course, there was public transport in the city. Even in the more backward lower region, steam locomotives and trackless buses traveled the streets, but a ticket cost between four and six pesos. But Nina smiled and told Duncan that a little jogging was good for her health. Having a bicycle would make her way to school much easier. Duncan had seen people riding such vehicles on the streets of the lower district. In a society that developed steam engines, an industrial product such as a bicycle was not so expensive that the average person could not afford it, but for the inhabitants of the lower region, things were very different. The most ordinary bicycle could cost a family of three from half a month to a month's subsistence level. Duncan had no idea where this body would lead him in the future, 
but watching Nina disappear around the corner of the street, he felt that he absolutely had to show this girl more kindness. Even if it was just for vegetable soup and pancakes. Moreover, she studied hard. Perhaps I should think about how to make money in this civilized city-state. Thoughtfully, he put down the newspaper and slowly walked to the end of the second-floor corridor, where he opened a narrow window and looked out onto the sun-drenched streets of the city. In this world, anomalies and visions have long gone hand-in-hand -hand with civilization, and neither the authorities nor the council hid supernatural things from the public. Even a girl like Nina, who was still in school, could learn about anomalies and visions directly from textbooks. She knew the ways of classifying them, left over from the ancient kingdom of Crete, knew their numbers, and even some of their names. Yes, this part of knowledge is open to the whole society, although not completely. The authorities and councils of each city-state recognize a list in which the most famous or dangerous anomalies and visions have their own special numbers, which, however, are not constant. In exceptional cases, some anomalies and visions for various reasons may disappear or change, and their numbers may be changed or left without an owner. But whatever the changes, one thing is usually certain. Anomalies and visions that have a number and name must have its own special danger or power. The authorities have made a list of some of these anomalies and apparitions public, partly to ensure that every citizen is aware of their specific dangers and to achieve a general sense of self-protection, and partly because some anomalies and apparitions are too close to people. They have seeped into every corner of their lives, into every part of the functioning of society. People can see them at any time, they cannot be hidden, and there is no need to hide them. Duncan raised his head and silently looked at the sky. Vision 001, the sun, a huge body of light rotating in the sky, a great vision that dominated the skies during the age of the deep sea. It was born in the early morning the day after the destruction of the ancient kingdom of Crete. The area of influence, the whole world, the unit of influence, is not limited, rotates and moves on its own. People cannot influence it, fully corresponds to the definition of vision. The story goes that on the day the ancient kingdom of Crete perished, the waters raged, all the people died, their blood soaked the sea, and from it Vision 001 rose. Since then, peace reigned on the vast sea. The ancient kingdom of Crete, the first city-state built by the survivors of the Age of the Deep Sea, lasted only a hundred years, but left a legacy that is used to this day. The word Crete in the ancient language means eternal night. It was a night that lasted a whole century. All this is recorded in the history books of Nina. This world has undergone spectacular historical changes, with the Great Annihilation being the point where even the fundamental laws of the world changed so radically that the Age of the Deep Sea, after the Great Annihilation and the Age of Order before the Great Annihilation can almost be considered two completely different worlds. Even so, there are those who continue to piece together the history passed down after the Great Annihilation, trying to sort it out from the scattered and sometimes even contradictory records of the various city-states. Unfortunately. Due to inconsistencies in the records of various city-states, no one has yet been able to obtain a more complete and reliable account of the history of the city-states before the Great Annihilation. No one knows what the world was like during the Age of Order. However, fortunately, a clear historical legacy remains from the time of the ancient kingdom of Crete, despite the rise and fall of city-states on the vast sea. The continuity of civilization itself was never broken, and memories of the ancient kingdom survive in the records or ancient secret families and associations. And scientists believe that more than half of the credit for preserving the heritage of past civilizations to this day, despite extremely unfavorable conditions, belongs to the miracle that illuminates this world. Vision 001, the sun. It is the most powerful vision known to man, so vast and so natural in its existence that many scientists debate whether the sun itself is a vision or a natural phenomenon. The first people left alive after the fall of the kingdom simply called him Vision 001, and since then his number has not changed. Obviously, not all visions are terrible and harmful. And Vision 001, for example, brought safety to half the world. It shone during the day, suppressed almost all pollution from the depths of the world below sea level, and made the development of city-state civilizations possible to this day. According to information left by the ancient kingdom of Crete, for a full century after the beginning of the Age of the Deep Sea, and before the appearance of Vision 001, the entire world was shrouded in night. The cold, dim glow of the creation of the world illuminated the endless sea for a hundred years. That is why the inhabitants of the ancient kingdom called their kingdom, and even their time by the name Eternal Night. Duncan stood in front of a narrow window and looked thoughtfully at the world flooded with sunlight. What was the world like before the Great Annihilation? Was there a world where the sun illuminated everything before the terrible hundred years of Eternal Night came? It certainly existed, for no matter how many contradictions there may be in the ancient records of the various city-states, 
They have one thing in common. The Age of Order was considered a time of light, security, and prosperity. But this time of prosperity and light has passed, and now the Endless Sea is illuminated by Vision 001. The world knows about it and is grateful for the daylight it brings. It is in this context that cultists who worship the true sun of the past call it the false sun. They are not just attacking the sun in the sky, they are attacking human civilization's dependence on it. Duncan understood that the sun that the cultists worshipped was most likely the true image of the sun that existed before the Great Annihilation. In a sense, the cultists were involved in the true history. Unfortunately, in our time, this true history has become a source of distortion for them. Duncan did not think that the cultists would be able to realize their ambitions. Nor did he think that they would be able to create a blazing thermonuclear star by sacrificing the living. The world was much more confusing than he could have imagined, and the death of a star could not be the only explanation for the beginning of the age of the deep sea. Here in the night sky, there is not a single star. Duncan returned to his room, closed the door behind him and walked to the nearby cabinet, on which I was sitting and sharpening his beak on its surface. The dove landed on his shoulder and tilted his head. Who is calling the fleet? Duncan did not pay attention to the bird but went to the bed and found in the corner the amulet of the sun, which he had hidden earlier. Then he thought, and returned to the closet again, found the right drawer where the alcohol was stored, and, opening the door, took out two bottles from it. There were some pieces of paper attached to both bottles. Duncan turned them over curiously, and saw that it was a small note written in Nina's handwriting, Drink less. It looks like the note was attached to the bottle for a very long time. The note was attached to every bottle, but they never had any effect. Duncan laughed closed the drawer and closet, and returning to the bed with two bottles and the amulet of the sun, poked eye so that he could see what he was holding in his hands. Try to take them to the lost house if you can. The dove immediately flapped its wings and made a triumphant sound. Free delivery! Duncan nodded, then lay down on the bed and began to prepare for the journey. He had been away from the lost house for too long, and although nothing would happen to the ship without his supervision, he, as the captain, could not lie in his room forever. Nina had already left for school, and after that she had a few more things to do, so she would come late. Duncan had already discussed with her that she should stay in the school dorm one more night and come to the store tomorrow. Meanwhile, Duncan worked on the details of the journey, and also tested whether he could control both bodies without completely turning off the soul projection, as he had previously planned. Based on his perception of the lost house, it should be possible. When he took over this fresh body, the connection between him and the lost house body became much stronger and more stable which gave him confidence and inspiration. Having finished, Duncan exhaled quietly. A small emerald flame flashed above his shoulder. The dove eye took the form of an illusory bird, and a brass compass opened on his chest. Endless darkness, luminous threads, twinkling stars, a rush of familiar sensations, and a bright path back to the lost house. Duncan's consciousness flew along this path, and in the blink of an eye he felt his core consciousness awaken in the captain's quarters of the lost house. But before leaving this dark space, he, controlling the spiritual flame and his own soul, slowed down, trying to maintain his connection with the antique store. Inside the captain's quarters on the lost house, Duncan slowly opened his eyes. He looked at his hands and around him saw a familiar environment and heard the familiar sound of the waves. He slowly rose from the bed and in the depths of his mind clearly felt a connection with another body. A smile slowly appeared on Duncan's face, and then he began to try to feel and control his other body located in the antique store, through this subtle connection. He tried several times. On the second floor of an antique store in the city-state of Prand, the owner of the antique store, who was calmly lying on his bed, suddenly opened his eyes. The next moment, the body lying on the bed turned its head slightly, and looked around the room with glassy eyes, like a zombie, and then slowly moved its arms and legs. If outsiders saw this scene, they would be so afraid that they would go to the nearest cathedral to report that he was possessed by an evil spirit. Looking at it from a different angle, doesn't it seem wrong to report it? While these strange thoughts swirled in Duncan's head, he slowly began to move his body using a kind of telepresence. It was difficult, perhaps even more difficult than asking a beginner to manipulate a 28-jointed puppet. But after many attempts, he managed to force the body in the city-state of Pran to sit down. In the next moment, the image that mentally came to him from a great distance suddenly swirled before his eyes. The body lay on the floor, Duncan sighed. Well, it looks like I'll have to train for a long time. One will focusing on two bodies at the same time, and controlling them became a completely new experience for Duncan, and also an extremely difficult test. He did not consider himself a normal person, but even in this case, it was difficult for him to control two bodies. He tried his best to get comfortable with the sensation of having two consciousnesses. But in the end, after some time of barely being able to control his body in the antique store, he could only crawl back into bed. 
but judging by the feedback he received from the depths of his mind, he decided that sooner or later he would be able to master this technique. It would just take a lot of time to practice. Having finished with the body in the antique store, Duncan finally breathed a sigh of relief. Ensuring contact with his remote body as soon as he finished traveling through the spirit world was extremely important, since it directly depended on how long he could use it. After all this, his mood improved significantly, and he was able to focus on other things. At that moment, the flapping of wings was heard from the side, and a pigeon named I landed on Duncan's shoulder. The bird puffed out its chest, a proud expression was visible in its eyes. The teleportation was successful. Duncan's gaze slid past the pigeon and fell on the table behind it. A pale gold amulet of the sun and two bottles of alcohol lay silently on it. A smile slowly appeared on Duncan's face, which then became even wider. It worked. The dove can bring items through the spirit world, and not only supernatural ones, but also ordinary ones. With a satisfied smile, he stood up and took the sun amulet to make sure that there was still a faint power flowing through this supernatural item that had been completely absorbed and transformed by his spiritual flame. Then he took one of the bottles of alcohol, opened it and putting his nose to it, at the same moment smelled the corresponding smell. The next moment Duncan glanced at the pigeon which, with its head held high, began to walk around the table. Efficiency. Guaranteed. Free delivery. He was starting to like this pigeon. The pigeon noticed the look of its owner, and immediately ran up to Duncan, pecked the table with its beak and demanded, More fries! More fries. There are no fries on board yet, but I think that soon will not be a problem, Duncan said cheerfully grabbing the pigeon with his hand and meeting his gaze. I'm more interested in what is your limit on transferring items at a time. Is it limited to dead creatures? And can packet loss occur during transfer? This will require a few more tests. The dove thought, and after a while tilted its head. Packet loss? Oops, the pages disappeared. Yes, that's exactly what I'm afraid of. Duncan thought for a moment. Pleased that the pigeon managed to transport objects to the lost house but it also made him think of more effective attempts than just delivering items to the ship. But the bird's unstable condition and the lack of logic in his words prevented this. After thinking it over again, he decided that he needed to conduct a few more tests first. Having previously considered his next step, Duncan stood up and headed towards the door to the captain's cabin, but after taking two steps, he stopped. Moving his joints, he stretched his legs and feet, enjoying the sensations emanating from them. His limbs were flexible, strong, and not at all tired as if he had recently sat at the table. And yet he was well aware that he had been away from the lost house for more than a day, and that during his journey through the spiritual world he had remained in the captain's cabin in the same position in which he had sat at the table. Duncan carefully felt his limbs, and from an accurate perception of his own body, he was almost sure that it remained exactly the same as it had been when he set out on his journey, as if it had fallen into a kind of stasis the moment consciousness left him. This special power of Captain Duncan, or... Am I tireless because I'm half a ghost now? Duncan thought with curiosity, but these thoughts led nowhere. He began to understand the history of this world, the rise and fall of civilized city-states, and yet he could not even solve the mystery of his body. But, in any case, it didn't seem like a bad thing to him. The body did not require special maintenance, which means he could easily direct some of his energy to other areas. Duncan was a far-sighted man. Or rather, he knew how to put temporarily unrevealed secrets aside. Therefore, having finished with his thoughts, he went to the door and pushed open the door to the cabin. Captain Duncan returned. The oak door creaked quietly, breaking the silence. The next moment, the wooden head of the goat on the edge of the table suddenly clicked. The piece of wood turned its head in the direction from which the sound came, and looking intently at the entrance slowly said, Name? Duncan Ebnemar. Duncan looked at the goat's head. I'm back. Ah, the great Captain Duncan has returned to his faithful ship, the Lost House. Sorry, Captain but this time you had a very long journey through the spiritual world, so I had to make sure of everything further. In the end, this rule was set by you yourself. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? How is your body? What have you learned from your long journey through the spirit world? Did you find anything interesting? Would you like to share this walk with your trusty first mate and so on? Did you notice that I used the phrase so on? Mistress Alice told me it would make the conversation shorter and you might like it better. Shut up. You made up for what little you missed with this subsequent nonsense. Duncan looked at the noisy creature with an indifferent gaze. Did anything happen on the ship while I was away? Ah, Captain Duncan, stern and humorous as always, you taught me a lesson. Everything was in order on board, and your faithful mate performed the duties of helmsman with which you entrusted him admirably. In addition, Mrs. Alice visited here twice, but nothing serious happened. Once she struggled with the mooring line, and the other with the anchor ropes. Duncan was about to leave the wheelhouse to check the situation on deck, but at the words of the goathead he stopped. The look on his face a questioning expression appeared. 
Why did she fight with the mooring line and anchor ropes? He felt what was happening on the lost house during his journey through the spirit world, but did not pay much attention to it, only vaguely aware that Alice was walking around the ship, exploring. How did it happen that she had such a lively time on board while he was away? Oh, actually, Mrs. Alice is too kind, Goathead answered immediately. She was unhappy that she was not doing anything on board, and she decided to find something to do, so she went to adjust the mooring and anchor ropes. But I forgot to tell her that mooring lines are very afraid of tickling, and anchor ropes like to take a nap, Duncan. You are you angry, Captain? Duncan's sudden silence made Goathead tense, and he shook his wooden head back and forth. In fact, nothing special happened. In addition, a new member of the ship always needs a little bonding before he can find a common language with the old sailors. Now they are in the struggle stage, which means that Mistress Alice is making progress. In fact, she is quite popular on the ship, most of them on the Lost House before Goathead could finish his sentence. Hurried steps were heard from the deck outside, then the door to the captain's cabin swung open, and Alice ran inside. Mr. Goathead, why are there shells in the ammunition depot? They roll all the time and don't let me. Duncan silently looked at Alice. Alice also noticed Duncan standing at the table and looked at him with some awkwardness. Well, this is the third time, sighed Goathead. This time she is fighting with cannon shells. I admit that the process of approaching Mrs. Alice with the ship is too lively. Alice craned her neck, probably straining her joints, and nervously looked at Dukan, who had an indifferent expression on his face. Captain, you're back. Well, Duncan nodded indifferently. It looks like you had a good time on the ship while I was gone. Alice. During his departure from the Lost House, Alice behaved a little more actively on the ship than Duncan expected. He always considered the Gothic doll an elegant and proper lady. Although she sometimes lost her head, surfed and talked incessantly, under normal circumstances she did behave elegantly and quietly, was reserved in everything she did on the ship, and behaved honestly and correctly in unfamiliar surroundings. When she had nothing to do, she calmly lay in her box, like the most ordinary harmless doll. But it seemed like she was only this quiet when he wasn't around. The sudden change in the cabin made Alice feel a little nervous. She cast a cautious glance at the indifferent Duncan and asked, You're not angry, are you, Captain? I can explain everything. I know you're helping. At least you're trying. Duncan looked at the doll lady, and a little helplessness was heard in his voice. But since you also know that many things on this ship are alive, next time you want to do something, could you please consult with me or my first mate first? Elisa immediately nodded her head and loudly agreed. Yes, Captain. No problem, Captain. Then she immediately turned to Goathead and muttered in an undertone. Can you try to help? In a rare moment, Goathead answered briefly. Now you can. If you really want to help, go and check the dried fish on the deck, or go to the galley and free up space in the warehouse where the ingredients are stored. Perhaps in the future we will have a chance to replenish food supplies at the Lost House. Duncan sighed, looking at Alice. Just don't talk to the guns below deck in the ammunition depot. They don't have full intelligence like Goathead. These dangerous creatures only react instinctively to external stimuli, and if the ammunition depot decides that it has been invaded, then I will have to rescue you with a broom and dustpan. At these words, Alice cringed and immediately turned and left the captain's cabin with a quick yes. However, Duncan could not help but smile on his face as he watched her leave. She was certainly a very interesting person. A little chaos was nothing, but the ghost ship was definitely animated by the commotion she was creating. It looks like you're in a good mood, Captain. The goathead's voice came from the side. Oh, you have something in your hands. What is it? Is this your spoils from this journey through the spirit world? How was that little dagger last time? Duncan glanced at the amulet of the sun in his hand. He'd left the bottles in the bedroom and taken the amulet with him, ready to study it when he got bored. This is a trophy, he nodded. Same as that little dagger. Oh, not bad for the great Captain Duncan. You always come back with trophies, and even such unusual ones which, at first glance, have amazing power. Wait, is this an amulet of the sun? Uh, do you know what this is? Duncan's eyebrows shot up. Yes, this is an amulet of the sun. Several brave cultists slipped it to me. Quite a generous offer. I really don't know much about this subject. The goathead seemed to be carefully studying the amulet with his eyes. Followers of the ancient true sun. They believe that by casting metal in the shape of the true sun and tempering it with human blood, they can infuse the power of the sun into an amulet, and thus mass-produce supernatural items. This amulet is a special item for those who have a certain status among the followers of the sun, and is also used by them to identify their compatriots and identify believers and heretics. Identifying believers and heretics? He also has such a function, Duncan nodded, although I consider it of little use. What happened to these daring cultists? Goathead seemed to hesitate when he said this. Stupid fanatics. Even the most insignificant pirate would not want to deal with such renegades pursuing ancient things. If they dared to offend, 
They are no longer in this world, Duncan said, observing the change in Goathead's voice and controlling the expression on his face. And it seems you don't really like these self-proclaimed sun worshippers either? After a long conversation with Goathead, Duncan already had a rough idea of what his strange first mate was like. He was almost sure that as long as he, Captain Duncan, commanded the ship, Goathead would not get out of control. Based on this, he gradually became bolder in conversations with him. Now he decided to try to find out useful information from him. Who can like those madmen who follow the true son of the distant past? All the light and order that they strive for has long ceased to be acceptable in this world. As usual, Goathead answered Duncan's question. Even the lost house is bathed in the sunshine of this age, and even the evil spirits that roam the deep, deep sea do not like the sun until the age of the deep sea. Probably only the cultist will consider the resurrection of the true sun a good thing. Having said this, Goathead paused for a moment and continued, but then again, 99% of the cultists are just a bunch of brainwashed fools who don't know what they follow or worship. They view the so-called descendants of the sun as prophets and saviors, and strive for the ancient world, which the descendants of the sun describe as paradise. But it seems to me that the descendants of the sun do not consider fanatics their people at all. In this they are no different from the descendants of the deep. Descendants of the sun? What does it mean? And it looks like there are still some descendants of the depths? What the hell is this? New and unfamiliar terms flashed through Duncan's thoughts, which confused him, and he, frantically clutching the amulet of the sun in his hands, asked, as if by chance, Descendants of the sun? I haven't met them. That's normal. They don't dare stick their heads out. Even if they disguised themselves as humans, the hyenas of the church would smell their heretical stench in a minute. Although, to be honest, they, as the descendants of their kind and the remnants of something ancient, should obediently remain in the gutter of history. Alas, of all types of descendants, they are the only ones who create so many problems. Duncan suddenly realized that Goathead's periodic rantings were actually quite useful. Although 9,000 of his 10,000 sentences a day were nonsense, he could sometimes give out useful information if luck overtook him. Since he had not yet fully figured out who Goathead was, Duncan's inquiries were only light in nature, and he did not dare to ask too many overt questions. But even so, he quickly learned a lot of information that he had not been able to find out before in the city-state of Prand. For example, that in this world there are beings called descendants. The civilized world hates each of them, and Goathead calls them remnants of the ancient world. Those who worship the true sun god, although vast in number, are mostly seen as insignificant pawns, ignorant, blind, and brainwashed fanatics. But within the structure of their church there is a higher true ruling class called the descendants of the sun. These descendants of the sun rarely appear in the civilized world. They seem to have other secluded places unknown to the world, and influence sun cults around the world from a distance, secretly collecting sacrifices and energy. And, finally, the main thing for Duncan at the moment, and what should worry him. Goathead was full of contempt for the cultists and the descendants of the sun behind them. This means that the lost house, or the real Captain Duncan, is not at one with these heirs, but rather the opposite. It seems that I made the right decision in telling Goathead about my relationship with the sun cultists during my journey through the spirit world. Otherwise there is no telling when I would have learned this useful information. This kind of secret knowledge will not fall into the pages of Nina's textbooks. Duncan left the captain's cabin with the amulet of the sun in his hand, and thoughtfully walked along the deck of the ship. There were many different types of descendants, and based on Goathead's information that they were remnants of something ancient, and combined with the fact that the sun followers followed the true sun of the past before the Great Annihilation, he had reasonable grounds to suspect that, that these so-called descendants are most likely a product of the Great Annihilation, and that their birth can be traced back to the Age of Order. Above sea level there are descendants of the sun, and in the depths of the sea there are descendants of the depths. Duncan unconsciously walked to the side of the ship, looked at the deep blue sea and felt a slight curiosity. The sea is not just fish, is it? In the end, Duncan still did not understand what these so-called descendants were. The goathead did not answer him this question, it seems, because he himself did not know what these ancient creatures were, roaming the outskirts of civilization. As for Duncan, he could only formulate a couple of ideas based on the meager information he had. Descendants are products of an ancient era who are disgusted with the modern world. They have strange and dangerous abilities, but they hide in the shadows. And, with the exception of the descendants of the sun, the rest of the descendants are almost never shown in the civilized world but are on its outskirts, threatening the safety of the seekers. And in all this information, there is another interesting point. The descendants of the sun seem to be able to disguise themselves as people. Only strong churches could distinguish the disguised descendants of the sun from ordinary people. Duncan thought about the recent changes in the city-state of Prand and about the followers of the sun, who had suddenly come to life after several years of inactivity. 
The loud activities of the cultists were ordered by these descendants? What are these ancient and bizarre creatures planning for the city-state of Prand? Duncan stood on the edge of the deck of the Lost House and looked longingly at the undulating sea below him. Down there were the descendants of the Deep, ancient beings, unlike the descendants of the Sun, and they threatened the safety of the ships sailing between the city-states. Duncan was wary and curious about these creatures of the Deep. Although he had never dealt with them, he believed that as long as the Lost House roamed the sea, it was only a matter of time before he encountered them, and it would never hurt to be more prepared for this. Whether it was gathering information, increasing control over his powers, or unlocking the potential of the Lost House, he began to prepare. Of course, he was not afraid of the dangers lurking in the depths. After all, he had sailed the sea for so long that he could more or less guess how many strange things there were in the depths, and the descendants of the depths were just one of them. As the captain of the Lost House, he had a lot to fear here. He thought for a long time, standing on the deck, and realized that the main thing he needed to worry about was whether the supply channel he had managed to find would be affected. The descendants of the depths on his, as he called it, fishing. His pigeon eye had the ability to bring various items to the ship, but Duncan could not say how many items he could bring or how reliable he would be, not to mention that the city-state of Prand is a civilized place, and for supplies, brought on board, had to be paid, so he could not say with certainty when he would be able to use this supply channel again. Duncan understood perfectly well that living conditions on the ship would not improve without the gifts of nature, but now these descendants pose a problem. They can interfere with receiving the gifts of nature. Duncan was a little worried, and at the same time he hoped that the evil creatures in the sea would not affect his fishing. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk gas lamps shone brightly, dispelling the darkness of the underground chambers of the cathedral, and the runes of the deep sea, inscribed on the walls of the long corridors, radiated a calming force. The lines symbolizing the waves and the shore contained in these runes connected with each other, and like a giant invisible web, enveloped the entire underground structure of the building in a sacred, unshakable atmosphere. As Vanna walked through the temple's underground sanctuary, this sacred and quiet place calmed her restless thoughts. The storm goddess is the being responsible for the most powerful force on the vast sea, but she is not only a symbol of the cruel side of the storm. This ancient goddess also has the power to stop any storm. Just as the sea has two sides, calm and storm, which always accompany each other, so the power of the goddess, the underground structure of the cathedral, is a symbol of the mirror reflection of the storm. There are many gods in this world who have two sides, or the characteristics of two sides. For example, the god of death, who also rules life, the god of wisdom, who also has the power to deprive of reason, stupidity, and madness. This may not be very clear to ordinary people, but as a high-ranking cleric, Vanna had a lot of knowledge in this area. She also knew that the two-faced nature of many of the gods had given rise to some highly controversial, even heretical ideas, and that some scientists believed that the world itself was two-faced, that in one dimension there was even dry land with very few rivers and oases dotting the arid landscape, and intelligent civilizations that are not like theirs, and the sea is its mirror image. These outrageous assumptions based solely on guesswork, were, of course, not recognized by the world, and even the famous Archbishop Valentine of the city-state of Prand, hearing them, laughed contemptuously. According to the old man, there is already enough subspace in the world, the existence of which made his head spin. Have some people forgotten about him? Vanna shook her head sharply, collecting her thoughts. It was easy to wander uncontrollably in the silence of the cathedral, because the mirror image of the storm brought with it an overwhelming psychological suggestion that could weaken the mental barriers of mortals to the maximum extent possible. This effect was so invisible and powerful that even a highly skilled inquisitor like her was not immune to it. But on the other hand, this environment also has a special purpose. For example, to make some fanatical and crazy cultists talk. The bath stopped at the end of the underground sanctuary's corridor, where there were several doors leading to various interrogation rooms, and in the foyer between them stood a statue of the storm goddess silently. This statue was different from the one above, that one had open arms, as if it was receiving a pilgrimage from people, surrounded by boundless grandeur. Here the statue of the goddess folded her hands in front of her chest, quietly and meekly, like a maiden listening to something or someone, but in both cases, her face was covered with a veil, a symbol of the unknowable nature of the gods. This statue with folded hands is another pose of the goddess of storms, the virgin of the calm sea. She suppresses the waters below sea level and preserves the peace of the city-state's underworld. Vanna bowed before the statue of the virgin of the calm sea, then turned and pushed open the door of the adjoining interrogation room. The sound of a rotating door hinge broke the silence of the underground room. The door opened, revealing a spacious but dimly lit room in front of Vanna. 
In the center of the room there was a large table, from behind which Lady Heidi, dressed in a long black dress, rose, and opposite the table there was a chair with chains, on which the heretic sat. The heretic's eyes lost all sparkle, and he leaned on the armrest next to him as if his mind and will had left his body, leaving only confusion. There was a strong scent of incense in the room, and on the table lay Lady Heidi's medicine cabinet, in which one could see large empty syringes, writhing thorny vines and gold-tipped cones that seemed to still have traces of blood on them. Oh, Mrs. Vanna, you're just in time, Lady Heidi greeted, turning her head towards the sound of the door opening. I just finished a session. Vanna glanced at Heidi's first aid kit. It's hard for me to relate this kit of yours to a healing session. These are standard psychiatrist tools, although I admit that I probably use them much more often than ordinary doctors, Heidi said, shrugging. Shoulders. But who made me a hypnotist hired by the mayor's office and often helping the cathedral? The patients I encounter are not ordinary patients, especially cultists like this one, and shaking crystals and low-frequency pendulums don't work as well as a triple dose of midnight magnolia. I highly doubt that the reason you give the cultists triple doses at a time is because you can only fit three times the dose in that big syringe of yours, Vanna said, but then shook her head. But it is not important. The main thing is that you were able to get him to talk. Tell me what you learned. Yes, the situation is strange, Lady Heidi immediately answered. I put several cultists into deep hypnosis and also used some special techniques. And now I am almost sure that these cultists who participated in the sacrifice did not go crazy after the ritual got out of control. Not after how did the ritual get out of control. Vanna immediately frowned. Although she knew after her conversation with Archbishop Valentine that it would be very difficult to find out the truth, Heidi's words still exceeded her expectations. What does this mean? I rummaged through their memories and discovered that the thinking or cognitive logic of these people was disrupted even before the start of the last unsuccessful ritual of sacrifice. More strictly speaking, it seems that these cultists were influenced by someone. Cognitive filter and their memories, hmm? Madame Vanna, it seems that my words did not surprise you too much. Heidi, a psychiatrist who often works with the cathedral, did not escape the surprised expression on Vanna's face, and she immediately guessed something from the Inquisitor's reaction. After a slight hesitation, she carefully asked, It seems that there is a big problem behind this matter? Vanna nodded. Very big. Heidi thought for a moment and quickly said, Packing her first aid kit. Tomorrow I'm going on vacation and will probably be away for a while. Mrs. Heidi, perhaps you are confused about something. Vanna looked at Heidi. Everyone who was present at that time, including me, was subject to some kind of infection. And the mental problems that you found in these cultists happened to us at one time or another, but... Thanks to the blessing of the goddess, we were lucky. Damn, I knew that sooner or later I would encounter something like this while doing this. Heidi finally stopped packing the first aid kit and covered her forehead with her hand. I should have taken my father's advice and pursued a career as an antiques appraiser, or even followed my mother's advice and become a public school history teacher. It would be much safer that way than dealing with cultists. Look at it from the other side. At least thanks to this job you can lead a carefree life in the upper region. Vanna shook her head. In the presence of Heidi, who was the same age and had known her for many years, she behaved more friendly than with her subordinates. Tell me what you found out. This may help the cathedral figure everything out. In fact, it's very simple. I found one obvious discrepancy, Heidi sighed, talking about the clues that she dug out from the subconscious of the cultists. On the night of the sacrifice ritual, the sun totem went out of control and chose the cultist who led the ritual as a sacrifice. According to the evidence we found at the crime scene, the sacrifice that caused this loss of control was actually a corpse that had already been sacrificed once before, right? Vanna nodded. Of course, I remember it very well. Then the question arises, if this person had already been sacrificed, then why didn't any of the cultists recognize him at that moment? Why did not even the cultist himself, who led the ritual, recognize that the person in front of him had been sacrificed by his own hands not so long ago? Vanna slowly frowned. The cultists at the scene watched as the man who had already been sacrificed once appeared before their eyes again, and no one noticed anything unusual. Their memories were falsified and their perceptions distorted. Even we didn't notice this obvious discrepancy at the time, did we? Heidi spread her hands with a bitter smile. In fact, only an hour ago I realized that I had not paid attention to this as something taken for granted. And only now have I learned from you that the pollution has affected me too. Without saying a word, Vanna turned to the cultist, who was still in a confused state. The cultist, hypnotized by both a large dose of neurological drugs and a powerful incense, only slightly shook his head and looked blankly at the tall woman standing in front of him. Vanna suddenly turned around and asked, After the ritual got out of control, did the cultists attack each other also because of the influence of the cognitive filter? Yes, I saw several frames in their memories, Heidi answered. 
and it seems that these images made a strong impression on them, leaving them convinced that everyone at the ceremony site was possessed by evil spirits or something similar. They thought they were expelling evil spirits from the bodies of their fellows. Most likely this was a warning to their spiritual instincts. Cultists are also religious. After all, there is a dark sun behind them that blesses these people. When danger arises, these blessed religious people probably feel something, Vanna analyzed. Their mad visions actually showed more or less the true picture. But unfortunately, these untrained commoners did not know the meaning of these warnings, and therefore fell into a collective madness. Heidi looked at the serious Vanna, and after several hesitations, finally spoke cautiously. So what the hell is behind all this? Is this even greater evil than that ancient sun? Vanna thought for a moment and gently shook her head. It's better for you to mind your own business, Mistress Heidi. Your connection with this is not yet so deep, but if you find out more, I'm afraid it will become inextricable. Well, since even you, the Inquisitor, say so, then I'd better take care of my little life, Heidi said, picking up the first aid kit that already collected. I need to rest a little. Don't worry, I won't run away. In a couple of days there will be an exhibition at the Maritime Museum that interests me very much. Vanna nodded. Visiting the Maritime Museum is a great way to relax. Moreover, all exhibits are protected by the blessing of the goddess. Heidi smiled, took the first aid kit and went to the door. But as soon as she was about to push it, she stopped abruptly and again looked anxiously at Vanna. I want to clarify something. Has the pollution really disappeared? Of course, you don't have to worry, Vanna said, waving her hand helplessly. We are simply destroying the remains. You have been in this quiet underground refuge for so long that the blessing of the goddess has long since cleared you of the consequences. Then I'm calm, Heidi said with relief, opening the door. See you next time, Inquisitor Vanna. Vanna watched as Mistress Heidi left the room. The heretic next to her, intoxicated by powerful incense and drugs, opened his eyes slightly and stared at Vanna in bewilderment. The medicines created by modern civilization, the incense of ancient times, the silence of the sanctuary, the blessing of the sun rooted deep in the soul. All of this is intertwined, exerting a subtle influence on the body of the cultist. The cultist's eyes reflected Vanna's vague figure. He saw the Inquisitor standing in front of him, her posture, unwavering and decisive. He saw a blurry figure standing behind Vanna, an almost transparent illusion shrouded in pale emerald flames. This towering illusion stood silently behind Vanna. Duncan sat in the captain's cabin watching the doll named Alice go about her business. She brought out a large tray with clean cutlery and a large bowl of soup that was steaming. It smelled as if it could be fish soup. Apparently, after further acquaintance with the structure of the Lost House, the doll lady came up with a new idea to do something for the captain. Is this dinner? Duncan looked at the doll with curiosity and watched as she laid out cutlery and fish soup in front of him. What suddenly gave you the idea to cook this? I finished cleaning up the galley and supply warehouse and then I saw fish in a bucket. Alice beamed with pride. I can't help with many things on the ship, but cooking is always necessary, so from now on I will cook for you. This is good. Duncan didn't know what to expect from this strange doll's cooking, but when he saw her sincere smile, he was embarrassed to refuse her. But can you cook? He decided to be curious. I can learn, it's quite simple, Alice answered. I can ask Mr. Goathead about the basics. He told me so much about cooking before Duncan glanced at Goathead and then at Alice. A wooden sculpture and a doll made of an unknown material. These two did not even have a digestive system, but they came together to study cooking. One dared to teach, and the other to listen? He did not know how he should feel after these words. He simply took a spoon and stirred the fish soup, thinking that at least it smelled normal, but the next moment his hand froze. After a moment of silence, he reached down and fished out a long clump of silver-white hair from the bowl. Your hair fell into the soup, Duncan said with an indifferent face. Oh, I didn't lose my hair, Alice immediately waved her hand. I dropped my head in, but don't worry, I immediately caught it and no one helped me, Duncan. In the end, Duncan couldn't eat the bowl of fish soup. The thought of the doll lady's head floating in the bowl of soup made him think that this dinner was the real murder weapon. Even if Alice didn't want to drop her head into the bowl, Alice was slightly offended and, looking at the food that Duncan had pushed aside, she squeezed the lace trim on the sides of her dress with both hands. Are you angry, Captain? Duncan looked at her physically and mentally exhausted. You can just tell me if you're upset about something, eh? I'm not upset. Then try to stay away from the kitchen from now on, Duncan said casually. But noticing the upset expression on Alice's face, he finally shook his head helplessly and changed his words. Never mind. You started on the right step. I'm actually very happy, but cooking can lead to some accidents if you don't master the art. You'll be able to handle it when you master it in the future. Alice immediately got to the point. Then can I try later? Duncan fell silent for a while, and then finally nodded. Just be careful. Then he plunged into thought. This damned doll was clearly very tired of life on the lost house. 
Perhaps she does have a certain quality that makes her do things on this ship to calm herself down. After all, she is very much like a person with her own personality. Duncan felt that he could not always treat her the same way as an ordinary doll. So it's better to let Alice help in the galley than continue to fight with cables and cannon shells. At least the pots and pans have a relatively calm disposition. He looked at the fish soup, which, to be honest, tasted quite normal. Even with the limited amount of seasoning on the ship, and like a doll with no sense of taste or digestion, Alice was able to make this dish with just a few instructions, from Goathead, who also didn't eat human food, which was actually quite a feat. What more could you ask for two creatures that don't eat human food to get together and create a dish that humans can eat? Duncan believed that with a little desire, Alice would learn to cook well, so at least he, the captain, would not have to cook himself in the future. So, Captain, would you like me to prepare you something else? Alice's voice was heard next to him. I learned how to cook fish and fillet from Mr. Goathead. I think there's just something in the galley, appropriate. No, I'm not hungry. Duncan shook his head. His body did not have a strong need for food, and he usually took three meals a day just to maintain his human habits. Besides, Alice's bowl of soup had already killed his appetite for the day, so he simply left the table. I'll go to the bedroom. Are you going to the bedroom? Alice thought for a moment, and then remembering something, said in a trembling voice, You. Mm, can you go down? Down? Duncan frowned. The lower cabins are the ones I can't go into, Alice said. I constantly hear creaking sounds coming from there, and sometimes it seems to me that someone is muttering there, below deck. So maybe you could go there and have a look. What's going on there? When Duncan saw the excited expression on Alice's face, his heart sank with some strange feeling. He still hadn't explored the depths of the Lost House, because the deep part of the ship gave him a strange and dangerous feeling, and at that time he had not yet taken the helm and mastered the power of the spiritual flame. Therefore. All previous research stalled at the place leading to the deep cabin. Of course, in the future he planned to explore them, but now it seemed obvious that his plans were clearly not keeping up with the changes taking place. At this moment, the voice of Goathead suddenly rang out from the side. It looks like something is wrong in the hold. Would you like to go down and take a look, Captain? Before Duncan could say anything, he heard Goathead continue. Come to think of it, it looks like you haven't checked on him in a while, and the hold needs some reassurance from the Captain. You know, after all, it has been under the surface of the sea for a very long time. Would you like to grab your lantern? It hangs where it usually does, behind the door. You've been upstairs all this time, and it's so noisy on the lower deck. You can't imagine how tired they are. Alas, I'm too calm and do not listen to these creaks and rattles in the middle of the night. Duncan silently looked at Goathead, and he soon fell silent. To be honest, after hearing Goathead's words, he suddenly became more relaxed about the strange hold. It seemed that it had clearly been more deeply affected by the endless sea, and had become such that even on the Lost House its structure would be considered irregular. But the thought lingered in his mind for less than a second. Sooner or later he would have to explore the rest of the ship, and the sooner the better. His mind told him this. The Lost House was huge, not only in terms of its incredible size, but also in the sense of the many levels into which the lower area was divided, and the only area that Duncan knew about so far was the upper one, the deck the upper cabins, the ammunition store and the armory rooms below deck, storage, fresh water tank and part of the crew's cabins. And based on several previous explorations, he could easily imagine how much more extensive structures lay hidden in the dark depths beneath this area. These structures were located below sea level and judging by their size almost completely. Gloomy, eerie, hollow echoing sounds of wind or whistle. The deeper you descended, the stranger the situation became. Duncan did not know his ship completely. This situation of course could not last forever. He was already a captain, and the Lost House was his home and base for operating in this world, so he could not help but know everything about it, even if only for in order to survive longer in this huge sea of anomalies and visions. He should have known the ship's potential and its dangers. Who knows if they might face some kind of danger tomorrow? Who knows if the Lost House will next encounter the descendants of the depths, or the collapsing boundary of reality? Not to mention that Goathead had just mentioned that the hold needed the captain's calm. The captain has not appeared in the hold for too long, and if this continues... Something bad will surely happen. Duncan stood up and walked towards the door to find the lantern that Goathead had mentioned. It turned out to be a fairly old lantern with a brass frame in the shape of a hexagonal prism, wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, and a glass, slightly cloudy lampshade set into the brass frame. Inside the glass lampshade, Duncan did not see any structure even remotely resembling a wick. He did not ask Goathead about this, and after a short and still thought, he tried to activate the ethereal emerald flame and poured this power into the lantern. Immediately, a bright emerald flame appeared inside the lampshade, and the ancient lantern began to glow. For some reason, where the lantern was shining, a gloomy atmosphere reigned. But Duncan felt an inexplicable sense of calm and control. 
he vaguely felt his power spreading along with the rays of light, and the details of everything they fell on appeared clearly in his mind. Suddenly a dove flew towards him and landed on his shoulder. It took the form of an illusory bird, although Duncan did not activate it. Apparently, he transformed on his own under the influence of the light from the lantern. Duncan looked down at the lantern in his hand and thought that it might be quite a useful thing. With the help of the lantern, he seemed to be able to project his power into the surrounding space with minimal loss and maintain a force field capable of detecting, warning, and even controlling, which was generally quite suitable for long-term exploration of unfamiliar or dangerous areas. Captain, can I come with you? Duncan looked back and saw Alice standing behind him, looking at the lantern with curiosity. I've never been downstairs. Mr. Goathead says that you can't go down there without your permission. Duncan thought for a moment and nodded his head slightly. Okay. He didn't know what was at the bottom of the ship, but in any case it was part of the Lost House, and since he successfully piloted the ship, it was unlikely to be dangerous there, and if he took the doll with him, it might even help him. The goat head left on the table said nothing. Apparently from his point of view, it was quite normal for the captain to explore the Lost House, as well as to take an assistant with him. Outside, night was falling on the ship, and the cold glow of the creation illuminated the sea and the empty deck of the ghost ship translucent sails fluttering in the wind, slowly adjusting the angle of inclination. With lantern in hand, sword and flintlock, Duncan crossed the empty deck with Alice and descended the wooden stairs deeper into the ship. The staircase at the end of the crew quarters is exactly where Duncan stopped during his previous explorations. There was a strange darkness swirling around the stairs going down, and only the columns and some wall structures that served as supports for the cabins were dimly visible. It's so dark here, Alice said standing at the entrance to the stairs and nervously peering into the darkness. Is there really no light here? In other places there are oil lamps that never go out. No, there is light down there, Duncan said slowly, holding the lantern, and for once he could finally see more clearly than before, thanks to the power emanating from him. Only he's black. Huh? Alice said questioningly. Black light? Duncan did not answer, only slowly moved down with his lantern, and only after Alice followed him did he quietly say, after all, we are already under the surface of the endless sea. Subconsciously clenching her hands, Alice followed Duncan, and as she descended, she finally saw what the captain meant when he said black light. It was indeed light down there, at least in terms of structure and layout, and in the hold that she saw, there were the same support pillars as above. The same oil lamps hung on them, which did not go out, but because of the burning flame, it seemed even darker near the lamps than in the distance. Yes, the closer you stood to the lamps, the darker the light became and the lamps themselves were almost completely shrouded in darkness, only their faint outlines were visible. Whereas further from the lamps the light intensified, in the far corners of the hold the brightness was even higher than at the top. It was because of the two lamps hanging on both sides of the stairs that such darkness reigned here. Visually it seemed that these lamps were actively emitting darkness, which neutralized and destroyed all the light in the hold. Elisa looked at the hold for a long time, which was mostly in the kingdom of darkness, before saying, Is this logical? You illogical doll are talking to me about logic? Duncan gave a noticeably nervous Alice a look. The logical nature of things is the most illogical thing under the surface of the endless sea. He said this, as always, with a very indifferent expression on his face, as if this ominous situation had long become familiar to him. But in fact, he had this in his head the same reaction as Alice's. Even the dove on his shoulder suddenly flapped its wings and said a heartfelt, Is this really so? Is this really so? Duncan ignored him. Instead, he carefully examined the hold, which he had never set foot in before, while adjusting the angle of the lantern in his hand and trying to see at least something. Below the waterline of the lost house, the light was the opposite. It seemed that the lamps did not emit light at all, but absorbed it from space, as if, this is a kind of mirror image of the world. However, the spiritual glow emitted by the lantern in Duncan's hand obeys the logic known to him. It is bright around the lamp and dims as it moves away from it. Is there any explanation behind this? Is it simply the influence of the endless sea, or is it a mixture of characteristics of the lost house itself? Is the brightness of the hold itself real? If you turn off the light-absorbing oil lamps, will the place become brighter? For a moment this bold thought actually crossed Duncan's mind, and he actually wondered what would happen if the oil lamps were extinguished. But the next moment he pushed that thought away. He couldn't turn off the lamps here, even if they seemed to make the whole hold darker. There must be a reason why they were lit. Suddenly he remembered something. In the city-state of Prand, it was said that burning flames could dispel strange dangers. In this expression, it was the flame itself that had this effect, not the light it emitted. Does this mean that under certain circumstances, light and darkness in this world are opposites, and that in these opposite conditions, the only thing one can believe in is flame? 
This also indirectly explains why the light emitted by electric lamps and lanterns does not have a banishing effect, because it is only light, and there is no flame in it. Captain? Alice's worried voice suddenly rang out. Did you find anything unusual? Nothing unusual, Duncan answered indifferently. The expression on his face did not change, and he slowly stepped forward. Light-absorbing oil lamps burned silently on the support pillars on either side, and loose ropes lay around the pillars. And as Duncan passed them, the oil lamps hanging on the poles made a slight crackling sound, and the ropes on the ground slowly moved, making room for the captain. For some reason, one phrase suddenly came to Duncan's mind. Light and shadow are illusions generated by the depths, and below sea level, which no longer inspired confidence, only the flame itself remained the faithful guardian of the riches of the lost house. He looked towards the silently burning lamps and nodded slightly, as if as a sign of appreciation and gratitude. The next moment, flames began to jump wildly under the glass shade of each oil lamp. The whole hold became much darker Duncan. He suddenly regretted a little that he had come ahead of time. He should have waited until he was ready to return before lighting those oil lamps. Alice followed him, looking around carefully. She saw large barrels and some boxes stacked in the corners of the cabin, as well as several closed rooms and corridors leading to nowhere, and muttered in a thin voice, It looks like this is also a warehouse. Was it a cargo ship before? If it were a cargo ship, the cargo would not be stored so closely. There is such a thing as loading costs, Duncan said casually, shaking his head. These are sea supplies for the lost house, which will be consumed during the long voyage. Alice blinked. Sea supplies? Duncan did not answer. He stepped forward to inspect the cargo closest to him. Some of the wooden barrels were filled with some kind of liquid, dark brown and viscous, but not strongly smelling, probably some kind of fuel. But it had clearly been there for a long time, for a long time. Duncan even suspected that the fuel was supplies that had been loaded here before the lost house became a ghost ship, and that it could be used to drive away evil spirits. But after the ship became a ghost ship, much of what was in the hold was no longer useful. In the remaining barrels Duncan found something familiar. Cheese that was older than himself, and corned beef that could split mountains with its hardness. Duncan closed the lid silently. Most of this level contained supplies, and although much of it now looked of little use, it was enough to justify his previous judgment of the lost house. The ship, at least in its original form, was intended for some kind of expedition. It could transport large quantities of supplies, and there were strict security measures between the various warehouses to prevent the spread of fire or loss of supplies due to insect or rodent infestations. From the large number of guns on board and the impressive stores of ammunition, he could dimly guess what ambitious dreams of exploration this ship had originally dreamed of. The longest voyages, the most dangerous voyages, the most dangerous conditions, and the most dangerous enemies. A voyage that required would be a whole ship of devoted sailors and an unshakable captain. However, now these dreams have disappeared into oblivion without a trace, and the lost house has turned into the most terrible disaster on the endless sea. The sailors have disappeared, and only the ghost captain remains at the helm of the ghost ship, having lost its purpose. He and Alice continued on their way, and after crossing several separated warehouses, entered a corridor. If the structure of this level corresponded to the upper one, then the staircase to the lower level would be located further down the corridor. The further, the more anxious I feel, Alice whispered, squeezing her hands and looking around warily. Can you hear the wind? Do you hear? Where is the wind coming from here? I heard it. Don't be nervous. It's normal, Duncan said casually, glancing at the doll. Why are you so cowardly? You at least have the name Anomaly 099, don't you? Having said that, he also thought about the information received from Nina. In this world, there were many lists of anomalies and visions available to the public. These lists helped people avoid danger, identify supernatural phenomena, and of course, they were incomplete. The list of some anomalies has been closed to the general public due to their controlled threat or special nature, and anomalies and visions that ordinary people did not have the opportunity to encounter in their lives were clearly not one of them. He tried to ask Nina about Anomaly 099, but the girl had never seen it in her textbooks. This meant that Alice, the cursed doll, either had a special secret that was kept secret by the authorities in the church, or was such a great danger that she was kept in complete isolation from civilized society. In any case, this was enough to give Alice a touch of mystery in Duncan's eyes. But the mysterious doll only frowned when she heard Duncan's words and said nervously, Having a number doesn't make me brave. I am Anomaly 099, not Brave 099. Duncan sighed and thought that perhaps he had met the most cowardly anomaly in this world and it was good that the sailors who had accompanied her before had never seen her like this, otherwise her image would have been destroyed. Duncan had always been curious about what was so special and dangerous about the gothic doll who called herself Alice, why the sailors accompanying her were so worried, 
and how exactly she earned her different name in this world full of dangerous and bizarre things. Of course, a sentient and moving doll is a strange thing in itself, and the sight of it running around with its head in its hands could be completely frightening. But according to Duncan, this is not enough to qualify for a higher number, and the simplest comparison is information, which he heard from Nina. Anomaly 196. Blood. A dangerous anomaly sealed within the underground sanctum of the cathedral of the city-state of Prand. Her body contains blood equal to the blood volume of an adult man. She has some consciousness and can move independently. Having received freedom, she begins to actively search for the body of the nearest suitable host, after which she takes it over. The way to prevent it from spreading is to store it in 22 separate jars and keep them frozen. But if someone begins to bleed within 10 meters of the storage location, the seal is instantly broken, and the blood in the victim's body is replaced with Anomaly 196, resulting into her complete control over body and mind. Anomaly 196 ignores any countermeasures below Saint level and will unconditionally kill any host that meets the requirements. As one of the most dangerous anomalies controlled by the Pran City State, information about it is available to the public at all times, so that if an anomaly leaks into the city, the authorities can quickly detect it and take action. Duncan didn't know what holy meant, but the name suggested that it corresponded to some fairly powerful supernatural being or object. Perhaps Inquisitor Vanna, who appeared in the newspapers, was on the level of saints, and saints like her could potentially fight against anomalies. But how many saints are there in the entire city-state of Prand? And this is only anomaly number 196, and Alice's number is 099, almost a hundred places higher. Although, according to Nina, there is some uncertainty in the numbering of anomalies and visions, and it is not always possible to make a comparison between different anomalies and visions. But in general, anomalies and apparitions that rank higher tend to be more dangerous, or have more bizarre and uncontrollable features or, alternatively, have once caused great damage to the world or contributed to special historical events. Either way, a number in the hundred range implies a level of strangeness and danger that is extremely problematic for the civilized world. Or it did something impressive. But that damn doll named Alice Duncan looked back at Alice, who was silently following him, and she, noticing the captain's gaze, immediately raised her head, returning a harmless and slightly embarrassed smile to him. <sighs> It was not expected that she herself would guess about her danger. For this, she would have to look into the historical archives of the city-state of Prand. But how does an antique dealer in the lower region have access to such confidential information? Certainly not through his contacts in the antiques industry. Most of the items in the store were no older than last week. Duncan thought quietly, not stopping, while the emerald spiritual fire silently burned in the lantern he held in his hands, gradually spreading deeper into the ship's hold. The surrounding bizarre light mixed with the glow of the lantern creating an eerie, even dizzying play of light and shadows. To the untrained eye, this scene would seem insidious, eerie, and frightening. However, Duncan felt a vague sense of calm. His power absorbed the light of the lantern, like a stream of water penetrating the depths of a cabin that had been closed for many years, and the structure of the hold previously unknown to him slowly became clear in his consciousness. The last area of the lost house outside the captain's control was returning to his control, and Duncan increasingly felt the vague uneasiness of the hold around him subside as he explored it. True, as Goat had said, the hold of the lost house was a little restless due to the long immersion in the endless sea. But as soon as the captain himself descended, he calmed down. You're really afraid of the bottom of the sea, even if you're just in the hold, Duncan suddenly said to Alice, who was following him. So why did you need to come with me? I didn't think it would be like this here. Alice forced herself to calm down. All I could think about then was that soon I would explore the entire ship. How could I have any idea what a hold is? I'm just a doll. You don't have a digestive tract, but you're still studying cooking. Don't use your essence as an excuse, Duncan said casually. You need to improve your knowledge about the ship. Alice sighed in disappointment. And Duncan, after a short silence, asked curiously, Why are you so afraid of the depths of the sea? Or why are you so afraid of all this swimming in the sea? I know that the deep sea is dangerous, and many people are afraid of it for the reasons you gave. But you seem to be much more nervous, to the point that even just being in the hold and thinking about the water outside makes you panic. Don't pull on the lace on your own dress. The Lost House is wearing no other clothing. If you tear it, you'll have to sew it up yourself. Oh. Alice hastily unclenched her hand but then involuntarily touched the button. I didn't think about it at all. I'm just scared. Isn't it normal to be afraid? Duncan didn't answer. He silently looked at the end of the corridor, where the stairs were visible. It went deep down and probably led straight to the bottom of the hold, the deepest place where the ship came into contact with the endless sea. Duncan and Alice stood by the stairs and looked down, 
but instead of seeing the structure of the bottom of the ship's hold below, in the light emanating from the spiritual fire, they saw a door standing in the dark depths. Seeing this door, Duncan couldn't help but frown. The structure didn't look normal. Firstly, the path to the bottom of the hold seemed too long. The stairs between several cabins on the upper level were continuous, allowing quick access to all levels of the ship, but on this level the stairs were located at the end of the corridor and you had to go through almost an entire level to get before her, and this undoubtedly influenced the speed. Secondly, surprisingly, at the end of these stairs there was a door. After hesitating a little, Duncan picked up the lantern and slowly moved down. Alice hesitated even longer, but finally followed him. Now she would never dare return to the upper deck alone. Besides, she felt safer following the captain. Duncan soon reached the door, picked up the lantern, and shone it around, trying to make out if there were any inscriptions. And then, as expected, the A line of letters on the doorframe, the last door in the hold. What does this mean? Alice looked at the letters with curiosity. Last door in the hold. Shouldn't the door usually indicate the function of the room? Obviously, this is a reminder. Duncan tore his thoughtful gaze away from the door, his hand lay on the door handle, and he pushed the door. If there is another door inside, don't even touch it. Alice nodded nervously, and then saw Duncan open the last door to the hold. They were greeted by a strange, pale shimmer. They stepped forward into the open space. Alice's eyes widened as she looked at the door. She repeated this word several times before finally saying, Ship Captain, the bottom of the ship is broken. It's broken! She screamed, but Duncan did not answer. After all, at that moment he too was dumbfounded at what was happening around. The deepest level of the lost house, the bottom of the hold, immersed in the endless sea, was fragments. They were immediately struck by countless cracks, from which shimmer seemed to flow. Hundreds of fragments of the hold floated in space, maintaining a certain fragmentary order, regular outlines and structure. And through these cracks between the countless fragments, Duncan could clearly see the landscape beyond the hold. And there was not at all the deep, dark, endless sea that he had imagined, but a pale, indistinct nothingness, and myriads of dimmed, unidentified lights rushing through it. Standing at the end of the stairs leading into the hold, Duncan and Alice beheld a strange and frightening sight. The entire bottom of the hold of the lost house was broken into fragments, and beyond there was some kind of nothingness and an unclear flickering. Is this really the real structure of the lost house hold, and what lies beyond it? Could something like this even exist under the level of the endless sea? Duncan took two cautious steps forward, stepped on the largest fragment and looked back in the direction from which he had come. The last door still stood in place, fixed on a floating board, behind which one could see a dark staircase going up, but there was no wall around the door, only emptiness. The door floated alone in this space. Duncan carefully walked around the door and found nothing behind it, but through the open door he could see directly opposite the bottom of the hold in its fragmented state. Captain! came Alice's nervous voice. The doll looked around with a scared expression on her face before her gaze finally fell on Duncan. This is normal, right? Duncan doubted it even more than Alice. After all, she could blindly trust the captain, but in whom could he, the captain, find confidence? However, looking at Alice's worried look and thinking about the rules for the crew that Goathead spoke about, Duncan managed to curb his anxiety and maintain his usual serious and calm expression. Don't worry, he said calmly. The Lost House is a ship whose structure you cannot imagine. Really, truly unimaginable, Alice said enthusiastically, apparently slightly calmed by Duncan's words, and began to curiously look at the fragments of the bottom of the hold and the chaotic flickering beyond them. Captain, outside, don't you think there is no water there? Duncan thought for a moment and suddenly looked at Alice with curiosity. Do you think we are now under the surface of the endless sea? Eyes was confused. Huh? Why are you asking me? Duncan looked puzzled. Because you had a similar experience. But you threw it away, Alice subconsciously wanted to say but stopped in time and instead answered, I don't think so. The sea should be full of water. Even if the endless sea is not quite ordinary, there should still be water in it, but it looks like nothing filled with chaotic flickering. Duncan shook his head and slowly walked forward. He walked to the edge of the fragment beneath his feet and looked down at the streaming shimmer outside the hold. The bottom of the lost house is not within the bounds of the endless sea. Alice froze in surprise. Huh? But then where? Duncan was silent, as if trying to look arrogant and powerful. In fact, he didn't know either, but he still had a vague suspicion. Maybe the ship really floats in several different dimensions at the same time. At first glance, it seemed that the Lost House was floating on the endless sea of the real world. But in fact, different parts of the ship are in different dimensions. This explains why the deeper one descends into the Lost House, the more eerie and gloomy the cabins around them become. Perhaps it is not the cabins themselves that are creepy and gloomy. What then is the incomprehensible space outside the hold, if not the endless sea? It doesn't look like the spirit world, 
nor does it look like the dark space I saw while traveling through the spirit world. Maybe it's deeper? Deeper? Subspace? With a huge number of assumptions and hypotheses in his head, Duncan slowly reached out and took his sword from his belt. Then, holding a lantern in one hand and a long sword in the other, he slowly leaned towards the edge of the fragment at his feet. At this moment, he was very careful, and although the crack between the fragments looked as if he could jump over it in one fell swoop, he did not did not take a single step, but first tested her with his long sword. Who knows if something might suddenly emerge from these cracks and devour anyone who tries to recklessly step through them. The next second, his eyes widened slightly in surprise. He saw the tip of a long sword disappear and appear on the edge of a fragment on the opposite side of the crack. Duncan frowned and tried to point elsewhere, but the same phenomenon repeated itself. Finally, it slowly dawned on him. These seemingly separate regions were actually spatially continuous. What appeared to be a fragmented hold structure was in fact intact. He straightened up, looked at the cracks and the flickering pouring out of them, and realized that they were just an optical result, and did not affect the continuity of space in any way. The hull of the ship was intact, but for some reason, the projection from the outside appeared on its inside. But what caused this? Is this spatial overlap? Or is it a false projection from a higher dimension to a lower one? Duncan subconsciously went through all the reliable and unreliable knowledge in his mind to try to explain this strange phenomenon, while Alice with a puzzled expression looked at the captain, who was doing some strange things at the edge of the fragment, shining a lantern and poking into a crack with his sword. Captain, do you use a special ritual to calm the hold? Duncan turned his back to Alice and silently putting away his long sword, froze in place. Yes. About. It's amazing. Alice's eyes lit up. So you are going to perform this ritual for all these fragments? Enough for one. Duncan replied with an indifferent face, then quickly distracted the curious doll's attention before it could continue speaking. Let's move forward. Having said this, he took a cautious step forward, holding his lantern in his hand. He tensed almost all his muscles and nerves as he took this step, ready to guard against anything unexpected when he crossed the crack. But nothing happened as a result. Then, as in the previous longsword test, he skipped the next passage through the crack and headed straight towards the opposite fragment, as if he were walking through an ordinary cabin. Alice watched in amazement as the captain walked ahead of her, oblivious to the cracks under his feet, and followed his example. But she still became nervous about crossing the crack, and in the end she could not resist, ran, and jumped. And what quite naturally, she collided with Duncan standing in front of her. Duncan felt a sudden gust of wind behind him, and then something hit his back hard, and he subconsciously turned around, raising his hand. The next second, he calmly stared at the headless doll, which was rushing back and forth in search of its head and at this time her head rolled a dozen meters away from him and muttered, Yes, 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 wait here, I'll pick her up, Duncan sighed, mentally thinking about why he brought this loser doll. Quickly catching up with Alice's rolling head, he lifted her up with ease. Would you like to think about putting a screw in your neck? Alice's head, however, did not seem to hear Duncan's last words. She suddenly opened her eyes wide and looked in some direction next to her. This. There's something there. Frowning. Duncan turned his head in the direction where Alice was desperately gesticulating with her eyes. At the end of one of the fragments, a dark wooden door stood silently. Door surprisingly, there was another door there. When he saw the clue on the door at the end of the stairs, Duncan wondered if this classic situation would happen. But when he saw that there was another door at the bottom of the hold, his heart sank. At that moment, Alice's body stumbled, and Duncan, still looking at the door, returned her head. Has this door been here all this time? Alice put her head back in place and looked around. I think not. She appeared only after we got closer. Duncan nodded vaguely and carefully walked towards the door with a lantern in his hand. In fact, he did not need the light of a lantern in this bizarre room. The chaotic flicker seeping from the cracks was unclear, but sufficient to maintain a comfortable level of brightness, but he still kept the lantern in his hand at all times, as a necessary precaution. Although Goathead did not warn him about this, Duncan decided never to extinguish the lantern while he remained in the hold. The new door was simple its dark doors not unlike those of the last door at the end of the stairs, and in style and material it was similar to most of the doors in the cabins on the Lost House. Duncan looked up and saw above the door frame a line of letters that appeared to be cast in bronze. This door leads to the Lost House. The letters above the door frame appeared to be cast in bronze and looked as if they had been there for hundreds of years. In the light of the spiritual flames and chaotic flickering that permeated the hold, each letter seemed to be covered with a layer of frozen time, giving them an ancient and mysterious appearance. Duncan looked at the letters for a few seconds, and then turned his head and walked back. Alice's voice came from the side. Captain, are we leaving already? Shouldn't we check this door? Even if we don't open it, there's nothing to see there. It's the end of the hold, Duncan said casually. 
but then suddenly there was a quiet knock that made him stop. Duncan turned his head and looked at Alice, who had settled down behind him. Alice looked around nervously, before finally turning her head towards the dark wooden door. The sound seems to be coming from behind this door. Duncan stopped, his face taking on a serious expression. He looked at the wooden door and waited patiently for several seconds before suddenly he heard two more knocks, weak and indistinct, as if someone was knocking through extremely dense matter, as if the door was shrouded in something invisible, but not at all an illusion. After a brief but intense weighing of his options, he finally returned to the door and Alice followed him, nervously waiting to see what might happen next. Holding a lantern in one hand and a long sword in the other, Duncan carefully examined the dark and gloomy wooden door in front of him, and then he suddenly realized that it was in fact not completely closed. In the side clock of the door, there was a gap about a centimeter in size. The door was ajar, as if someone had forgotten to close it when leaving in a hurry, or as if something inside had deliberately left it open to attract the blind. Duncan picked up the flashlight and carefully shone it inside, peering through the crack to see what was on the other side of the door. With his other hand, he was already pressing his longsword to the gap, ready to plunge it into any creature that appeared from behind it, but he never expected to see what he saw. Through the doorway he saw a room. A small room with dull and wrinkled wallpaper on the walls and slightly cluttered furnishings. It looks like its owner hasn't cleaned it for a long time. Directly opposite the door was a single bed, next to which stood a table with a computer, books and a small decoration. Chest hanging over a long, narrow table. A tall, emaciated figure was feverishly writing something. She was wearing a white shirt from a regular store. Her unkempt hair stuck out in all directions, and her body, which had clearly not been subjected to physical exercise, had a somewhat thin appearance. Duncan's eyes were drawn to the familiar figure over there through the doorway, the room and the reading figure, and as if suddenly sensing something, the figure stopped writing, sharply raised its head, stood up and ran to the door. Running up, she looked through the crack and stared at Duncan. Duncan stared back at her, at a face he knew well, his face. After a few seconds of staring at each other, the figure on the other side of the door suddenly became agitated and began to push the door to get out, but the door did not budge, as if it had been pushed into space. She then tried to break the lock and then break the door with objects in the room, as if she was doing everything she could to get out, but to no avail. Finally, the man behind the door gave up these futile attempts and, knocking on the crack, shouted something. But from behind the door, only some indistinct noise was heard, from which not a word could be heard. Duncan watched this action in amazement. Looking at his self, locked in the room, he understood perfectly well what the person behind the door was trying to do. His gaze slowly fell on the doorknob next to him. The doorknob was just out of the figure's reach, but from this side, the door could probably be opened very easily. However, Duncan simply looked at the handle and did not move. The man locked in the room seemed to be in despair. Realizing after the last shout that his voice was not reaching the other side, he ran back to the table, bent down and quickly wrote something on a piece of paper, and then rushed back again and showed the piece of paper to Duncan. Through the doorway, Duncan saw the words scrawled on a piece of paper. Help! I'm stuck in this room! I can't open the windows and door! Duncan suddenly broke into a wide smile. His smile did not go unnoticed by Zhou Ming who was locked in the room. His eyes widened as if in horror, but at the same time, as if he was angry with this smile. The next second, Duncan suddenly took a step back and aimed his long sword through the narrow gap, straight at Zhou Ming, who was standing on the opposite side of the door. The latter, pierced by the sword, opened his mouth, as if screaming in agony. A series of hoarse and noisy sounds reached Duncan's ears, but he did not move at all, only tightened his grip on the hilt of the sword and leaned forward a little, close to the door, and whispered, if you can't write, in Chinese better not write. Pigeon Eye, who had been silent all the way to the bottom of the hold, at that moment suddenly flapped his wings and uttered a hoarse voice. This is an illusion. What are you hiding? One. The next second, the figure behind the door, as if made of wax, suddenly began to melt and quickly dissipated into a distorted and shapeless light, and the appearance of the room, which seemed so real and familiar, instantly disappeared. Now the room appeared to Duncan as it really was, a dim and old cabin, empty, dusty, and dilapidated. There was nothing on the tip of his sword, as if it had only pierced air to begin with. Is this extra door just leading to another cabin? Duncan looked through the crack again, but this time, no matter how he looked there, he saw only a very ordinary cabin. But is she really real? Duncan slowly pulled his sword out of the crack and took a step back with a quiet sigh of relief. He didn't know if it was just an illusion or something else, but one thing was for sure. The door turned out to be much stranger and more dangerous than he could have imagined. If the illusion that appeared on the other side of the door was based on his own memories and distorted perception, then the danger on the other side of the door exceeded his strength, like Captain Duncan, 
and if it was not an illusion based on his perception and memories, but made by someone something is even worse. After all, no one in this world should have known what that room looked like. No one should have known about the existence of Zhou Ming's personality. But something on the other side of the door knew. He took a deep breath. He was right in being careful not to open the door no matter what. At the same time, he was slightly frightened. Because for a moment, when he looked at the door handle, a thought flashed through his head. Open the door and let himself out. Captain! Alice's voice rang out, breaking Duncan out of his thoughts. He looked up and saw a worried and scared expression on her face. Are you okay, Captain? What's behind that door? Why do you have such a gloomy face? Duncan shook his head. Nothing. Behind this door is not the place where you should go. We have explored the hold and can now return. Having said this, he reached out and grabbed the door handle to see if he could close it. But the door did not budge. Despite all his efforts, it stood so motionless in place, as if it were one with space. It reminded Duncan of the sealed windows in his bachelor pad. He removed his hand thoughtfully. The door didn't close, but he definitely wouldn't open it. Eh? Oh, oh, yes. Alice, for her part, did not pay attention to the captain's attempt to close the door. She fell silent for a moment, but then joyfully answered, Then we'll be back soon. To be honest, it's creepy here, and I'm starting to get nervous again. Duncan chuckled vaguely, took Alice with him, and turned to the last door leading to the stairs. Even he did not want to stay in such a terrible place. After that, nothing unusual happened. They made their way through the destroyed hold through dark stairs and corridors and returned to one of the upper cabins. As soon as they returned to the regular cabin, Alice felt a sudden relief, as if the previously unnoticed shadow that had enveloped her body had disappeared. She saw that there was light around her again, and the usual one. The cabin was no longer gloomy and dull, and as for Captain Duncan next to her, the captain was no different from his former self, as if he did not feel depressed and did not feel relieved now. It seemed that the situation in the depths of the lost house did not have much influence on him, only after returning, the captain was noticeably silent and had a very preoccupied look. Are you tired, Captain? Alice asked carefully. Should I go and make you something to eat? You had a bad dinner today. Her question interrupted Duncan's thoughts, and he looked at the doll. An expression of sincere concern was visible on her face, the same as Nina's. He suddenly relaxed, and some of the dark thoughts that had been bothering him seemed to disappear without a trace. This time, don't drop anything strange into the pan. My head is not strange especially my head. Hmm. One reference to the game World of Warcraft Duncan returned to the upper deck of the Lost House with Alice on his tail. The cold creation of the world still hung high in the sky. Duncan felt as if he had been exploring the ship for a long, long time. He even suspected that the night had passed, but now, looking at the dark sky, it turned out that he had only been there for a few hours. But the strange and unusual things that he saw during these few hours amazed him. He still remembered the hold, in which light and shadow alternated and the door located at the bottom of the hold, especially her. What was behind it? The lantern in Duncan's hand went out, and he slowly walked towards the captain's cabin along with the doll. They barely spoke. The doll seemed to have already begun to mentally rehearse cooking, while Duncan's attention was focused on the surrounding structures. Comparing his memories, he was convinced that the dim, dilapidated cabin behind that door was indeed part of the lost house. The style of the two buildings was identical, and vague continuity could be traced in the architecture. And now that he remembered it, it seemed to him that in the deep depths of this dilapidated cabin, hidden in the darkness, there was something else. Namely the hidden area of the lost house, which even Duncan, the captain, could not sense or detect. Does Goathead know about this door? Does he know what's behind it? Should I ask him about it? When the captain's cabin appeared before his eyes, Duncan was still thinking confusedly. When he led Alice inside, he saw Goathead standing silently on the table. His sunken dark eyes turned towards the door. Duncan turned to hang the lantern and then he heard Alice behind him, with a slight excitement in her voice, already greeting Goathead. Mr. Goathead! I went down into the hold with the captain. It's so amazing there. The bottom of the hold is broken into pieces, and there is a very strange door there. Duncan was mentally wondering how he could start a conversation on the desired topic with Goathead. He had almost forgotten that he had an inquisitive and ignorant doll with him. He tried his best not to laugh, pretending that he was minding his own business. He listened to the conversation of two crew members, and heard the voice of Goathead, in which there was undisguised surprise. I knew that you would be surprised. Madam Alice, now do you understand what a wonderful ship the Lost House is? He is able to swim in different dimensions at the same time, and at the same time safely. Duncan listened to his words with bated breath. Everything was as he had expected. The reason why such a strange sight was revealed outside the cracks at the bottom of the hold was because it no longer belonged to the time and space in which the endless sea lay. At the same time, he quickly made a mental note. 
The curious Alice was quite interested in the strange scene on the lower level of the lost house. She seemed afraid to ask him the captain about her, so much so that she preferred to ask the chatty Goathead, but if he stood there and listened, it would look strange and suspicious, and perhaps Goathead would turn the conversation to him. He thought for a moment and immediately came up with a plan. His face took on its usual expression, and returning to his seriousness, he said, You speak, and I'll go outside. Goathead, Alice is already a member of the crew, so you can tell her everything you know about the ship as long as it's not too secret. At these words, a happy smile flashed on Alice's face, and Goathead immediately agreed. Of course, Captain. Your faithful follower will always treat new members warmly. Duncan pushed the door open and left the captain's cabin. But the next second he left the captain's cabin, he regained his concentration, and using his close connection with the lost house, began to closely monitor the movements in the captain's cabin. As his mind focused on one place, his vague perceptions turned into a clear observation in real time, and everything that happened in the captain's cabin appeared clearly in Duncan's mind. He saw Alice pull up a chair and sit down opposite Goathead, and excitedly talk about her experience exploring the hold and the strange scene. She seemed to have completely forgotten about cooking for the captain, but Duncan didn't care at all. He most appreciated the doll's divine help at critical moments. When night fell, I suddenly flapped his wings and flew up to the nearby mast, as if standing guard, and Duncan walked slowly forward, as if making his usual rounds of the deck. The conversation in the captain's room sounded loud and clear in his mind. Alice had already spoken with Kozlin Ogolov about the strange door, and nervousness was felt in her voice. This door looked scary. The captain didn't even allow me to approach it. Of course you can't go to this door. Not to mention you, even I can't touch her. Don't show it. I know that I don't have arms and legs and when I say touch I mean something else. Contact, control, understand, peep, you know? This door is inviolable in this sense. If you touch it, you're done for, you know? Alice seemed surprised by Goathead's unusually serious tone and she hesitated for another second or two before speaking. So, what is this door anyway? Duncan, who was walking along the deck, concentrated for a moment but did not hear anything. Goathead fell silent for a long time. After a while, he spoke in a deep voice, without answering any question positively. You really didn't touch this door? I didn't touch her, Alice assured him, but then hesitated for a moment before continuing, not quite confidently. But the captain came up to her and looked through the crack, and then poked his sword at something on the other side. At these words, Alice Duncan suddenly felt the whole ship shake, then all the main and side sails emitted a quiet howl in the wind, and immediately after that all the masts and shrouds creaked, and all of this was currently controlled by Goathead. He looked in amazement at the swaying masts and shrouds, as if sensing through them the panic of their manager, and a frightened cry from the captain's cabin, the cry of the Goathead sounded in his head. What did you say? Did you say a crack in the door? Was this door ajar? Yes, yes. Alice said, frightened. The door was ajar, and there was a gap there, probably about the width of a finger. Did the captain look through the crack? And then what? He pierced him with his sword. Did he change after that? Did he seem hesitant or in a trance as he led you away? No, Alice answered immediately. The captain just looked serious, and he brought me back soon after. He seemed to be thinking about something on the way, but he was definitely not in a trance. Oh, and he was discussing cooking with me. Oh, I urgently need to go to the kitchen. Don't think about the kitchen just yet. Do you know what's behind this door? Oh, what's behind it? Alice looked puzzled and scared. She had never heard Goathead speak so seriously. She had the impression that the ship was about to sink. Goathead's tone suddenly became low, and he slowly said, Beyond this door is subspace. Duncan, who was walking along the deck, immediately stopped. Is there subspace behind this door? He was so taken aback that the strong pulsations in his mind almost prevented him from observing the captain's cabin, and then something else occurred to him. A fragmented hold, a dark chaotic shimmer behind the cracks at the bottom of the hold. The lost house was floating in different dimensions at the same time, and outside the hold there clearly existed a time and space different from the real world. And at the bottom of the hold there is another door, with subspace on the other side from her. Is it possible that the lower part of the lost house is actually floating in subspace? And judging by what Goathead said, this is an unstable state. Not only do I have to constantly calm the hold, but also the door at the bottom should theoretically be closed. But now there is a gap in it. What does this mean? Does this mean that there is something wrong with the tightness of the bottom of the hold? Or was something from subspace trying to penetrate the lost house? He remembered trying to close the door before leaving the bottom of the hold. But no matter how hard he tried, it remained ajar. He didn't think much of it then. But when he remembered it now, a strange creepy thought came to his mind. Perhaps when he tried to close this door, 
something on the opposite side of the door resisted this and prevented him from closing it. It is likely that the bottom of the lost house floated through subspace. From this information, Duncan's mood suddenly deteriorated. He had always known that the lost house was a strange and dangerous ship, but he had never imagined that it could be so strange. Duncan didn't know much about subspace, and perhaps even a lot less than Nina's history teacher, but at least he knew that subspace was the most dangerous thing in the world. This is the bottom of all things, capable of making saints stay awake at night and gods feel fear. It evoked such primal fear that some superstitious sailors on board a ship about to set sail did not even dare to utter the word subspace out loud. Even though subspace is not a sentient deity that glances at people just because they call it by name, people were still afraid to mention the word when they found themselves in the sea. But part of the Lost House, a ghost ship that wandered for a century, floated in subspace and was even located at the bottom of its hold. The door leading there. The dim cabin behind this door is perhaps the very structure on the Lost House that was completely destroyed by subspace, and this door served as a seal. Duncan subconsciously looked down at the dark deck beneath his feet as if trying to penetrate the layers of wood and see the fragmented cabin and the chaotic light beyond. It suddenly seemed to him that he was standing on an already lit keg of gunpowder, and the small crack in the door was his wick, and he did not yet know how long it was. But after a brief moment of confusion and excitement, Duncan little by little began to come to his senses. Goathead's behavior revealed something else to him. Judging by the way Goathead panicked after hearing Alice's words, Duncan felt that something terrible was about to happen. After he looked through the door into subspace, Goathead still continued to ask Alice in the captain's cabin about the captain's mental state, to make sure that he did not say anything strange on the way back, did not make any unusual sounds and did not cast any unusual shadows. But Duncan knew his condition well enough and understood that everything was fine with him. The vision behind the door threw him into panic for a while and the thought flashed through him of opening it, but this was a purely psychological change. In fact, he did not feel the influence of any supernatural forces. Duncan looked down at his hands again and again convinced. Here, his name was Duncan Ebnemar, captain of the Lost House. In another time and space, his name was Joe Ming, an ordinary high school teacher stuck in a bachelor's apartment surrounded by fog. Maybe Goathead was just worried. This is just a crack in the door, and not an open passage into subspace. The Lost House swayed slightly on the waves. Masts and shrouds creaked, translucent sails fluttered lazily in the wind demonstrating the excitement and dereliction of duty of their manager. Duncan looked up at the sails, calmed down and said in a deep voice in the depths of his mind, First mate, take the helm and control the sails. Ship captain? Goathead's voice immediately sounded with a tinge of panic. Oh yes, yes captain! Duncan maintained his usual silent seriousness, waiting for Goathead to speak first. Captain? I just heard Mistress Alice say that that door at the bottom of the hold is ajar. Goathead broke the silence after a few seconds. Yes. Duncan answered calmly. I checked. A Mrs. Alice also said that you looked through the crack in the door. The goat head seemed to be trying with all his might to find the right wording. Do you feel Van now? Slight confusion? Behind this door. Subspace, I know, Duncan interrupted without waiting for Goathead to finish. Do I look like someone who has a little brain fog right now? Don't stutter so much when you speak. Of course you look completely normal, Goathead answered immediately. Perhaps I was overly worried. After all, this has never happened before. The barrier between the Lost House and subspace has been stable since you returned the ship, and I did not expect the situation to change, and this is by no means a question for you. Did you return the ship? Where from? Duncan sensitively grasped the new information in Goathead's words, and quickly guessed a small part of the truth, but did not show it outwardly, and simply said as if by chance, As far as I can tell this passage is still stable, but the possibility of its further expansion cannot be ruled out, so I'd like to hear your opinion. Stability is already good news, Captain, said Goathead, not doubting the words of his captain, but he looked very sad. As for my advice, I must admit, I don't know what to do. You closed that door with your own hands and never told me what the plan was after that. Didn't mention what changes would happen after that. The hold was always handled by you personally. I see, Duncan answered immediately and in his usual tone. And you don't think you have anything to advise on this matter. It seemed that Goathead also did not know all the information about the door at the bottom of the hold. He only knew that there was subspace behind the door, and that if it was opened, nothing good would happen, and more information was in the hands of the real Captain Duncan. But where can I look for him now? Captain, the goathead's voice sounded in his head again. What are your future plans? Plans? What are your plans? Reach land on the ship and disembark? If Captain Duncan truly has a reputation as a world-famous enemy, then upon his arrival on land he will attract an entire fleet of ships. So what else can I do but continue to drift into the sea? 
Duncan rolled his eyes and looked helplessly at the sky, and I, who had previously fluttered up onto the mast and pretended to be standing guard, at that moment flew down and landed on his shoulder, shouted, It's a trap! Abandon the ship and flee! Flee! Duncan said subconsciously, but then he noticed something. Wait, do you hear my conversation with Goathead? He was talking to Goathead via a mental connection. So why did this pigeon suddenly fly in and say such a seemingly appropriate phrase? The dove flapped its wings and said with an important look, Damn chicken, don't repeat after me. I know that myself. Duncan suddenly became a little curious about what pigeon soup tasted like, but he had not forgotten that Goathead was still waiting for him, so, sitting comfortably, he ignored the pigeon on his shoulder and mentally continued, Mind your own business, and I, like I will always keep an eye on the door from time to time. Yes, Captain! The next moment the bow of the lost house lowered, the sails changed the angle of inclination so that the massive ship could continue its journey across the endless sea. The bow of the ship broke through the waves, and there was a roar as smaller waves crashed into the hull. Having finished his conversation with Goathead, Duncan slowly walked to the edge of the deck and looked out at the dark sea. The cold, pale glow of the creation of the world was reflected in the seawater. He would watch the door at the bottom of the hold, but surveillance alone would not change anything. He needed more knowledge, more understanding and control over his powers, and perhaps some help. Something that is not on the ship, but may be in the city state of Prand. Tomorrow Nina will return from school, and for the rest of the day, every day after school, she will be at the antique store. Her uncle Duncan should be there too. Before that, he must transfer his main consciousness to the city state. Changing bodies so often was a last resort until he could control both bodies at the same time. This transfer would come with another test for AI. He wanted to see if I could move items from the lost house to the antique store, and if so, to see if there was a limit to how many items he could carry. And will he lose some of the items if he tries to move more than a certain limit? A plan slowly formed in Duncan's mind as his eyes unconsciously followed the movements of the waves. The reflection of the creation of the world in the sea seemed hazy and chaotic, the flickering light flowing like an invisible stream of light. The creation of the world? Duncan froze suddenly feeling that the reflection of the creation of the world in the sea was very similar to something. He raised his head sharply and looked at a huge, scar-like crack in the sky. The huge gap was filled with a chaotic, unclear, flickering light, and the sky around was a pale mist that flowed out from the gap. Upon closer inspection, the so-called fog was actually a myriad of intersecting, tangled and blurry streams of light, just like the landscape outside the cabin at the bottom, the hold of the lost house. Duncan looked longingly at the huge gap in the sky, from which a dim glow emanated, trying to discern in the chaotic flicker some detail that he had already seen before, in order to verify the suspicion that had arisen in his head. The landscape outside the bottom of the hold of the lost house is the creation of the world? If the bottom of the hold is subspace, then the creation of the world is part of it? Or at least somehow connected with him? But in the end he could not see anything, and the guesses in his head remained just guesses. The gap was so far away that even with a spyglass he couldn't see much detail, and from what he could, the scenery was only slightly similar to the scenery outside the bottom of the hold. But Duncan could not be completely sure of this, because after exploring the hold he began to be suspicious of everything he saw. Duncan spent a lot of time on deck in the sea breeze, thinking and calming down. He also observed Goathead and noticed that his first mate seemed to have calmed down and was now steering the ship carefully. But Duncan still felt a vague tension running through the ship, a tension that seemed to have no source and permeated the entire living ghost ship the towering masts, the clutched sails, the cables stacked on the deck. All this, silent in the darkness, seemed to whisper nervously and depressedly about the door. For the first time, Duncan felt the mood of the ship directly in his mind. It seemed that after returning from the hold, his connection with the ship deepened. Now the entire ship was watching the captain, expecting anything unusual after he looked through the door. As the evening breeze began to blow, Duncan took a deep breath and walked slowly towards the captain's cabin tapping his fingers on the rail at the side, as if to say, Relax, this matter is clear as day. This time he finally felt the changes more clearly. The tension that filled the ship gradually dissipated, the ropes were no longer taut, the sails were raised, and the slight creaking from below the deck had ceased. It seemed that the ship was finally convinced that the captain was still the captain. Duncan returned to the door to the captain's cabin, but instead of pulling it towards himself, as he usually did, he hesitated a little, took the handle, and gently pushed it open door. The door opened, and a gray fog appeared inside. Duncan took a step towards the gray fog, and the pigeon eye, sitting on his shoulder, suddenly flapped its wings and flew to the mast nearby, while shouting, There is no way ahead! There is no way ahead! 
Duncan watched the dove suddenly fly away with a somewhat curious look, but still took a step forward, and he returned to his familiar bachelor's home. Zhou Ming lowered his head and examined his body. Familiar hands, familiar shirt, familiar trousers, not as strong a body as Captain Duncan's, but quite normal for an ordinary person. Then he raised his head and looked around the room. Everything was exactly the same as when he left. Even the dust had not changed much. Zhou Ming thoughtfully looked around the situation in the room, then suddenly turned to the door. He was looking at the door of the bachelor's apartment, remembering the door that he had seen in the hold of the lost house, its location and angle of inclination. He took the appropriate position, first assuming that there was a person on the other side of the door, and then looking in the opposite direction. From this position he could actually see the center of the room, and a somewhat disorderly table with a computer and other miscellaneous objects. At this table he usually worked, read, wrote, or corrected students' homework and exam papers. Zhou Ming slowly opened the door and looked through the crack. At that moment, he felt his heart pounding. Although his mind told him that this was an illogical thought, he still couldn't help but wonder, could an eye suddenly appear in the doorway? Or a ghost captain with a thoughtful, serious expression on his face? Will it suddenly pierce me? Pirate sword? Opening the door slightly, he slowly looked outside. Outside, as always, there was only a gray fog. Zhou Ming suddenly felt relieved, but for some reason, a strange feeling of loss arose in his heart, a feeling that the anticipation had disappeared, and as if he had lost some pleasure. He shook his head vigorously to clear away this strange feeling, and then slowly walked towards his desk. All the things he had left in the room before leaving were in their places, including a scribbled piece of paper, a scribbled notebook, and a computer screen that was working despite for a power outage. It seemed that nothing had changed. Zhou Ming exhaled in relief but suddenly froze in place. Something had changed. His gaze stopped at the corner of the table, and in this inconspicuous corner a small thing appeared. An elegant composition, similar to a model of the lost house. Zhou Ming was struck by lightning and he froze in place for half a minute. He was completely sure that there had never been such an object on his desk, especially since it was a model of the lost house. After a long time, he suddenly blinked, reached out, carefully picked up the model that had appeared on his desk at some point, and brought it to his eyes to take a closer look. The ghost ship was only about half a meter long, and the weight in his hand was not much different from a regular model, but at the same time, it was so detailed that Zhou Ming could see every rope and bucket on the deck. Compared to the real lost house, the difference between it and this ship was, perhaps, only in size. Suddenly, as if remembering something, he brought the ship closer to his eyes and carefully opened the door of the captain's cabin at the stern with his fingers and looked inside. There was no sign of Goathead on the miniature table. Alice was also nowhere to be seen. Something strange was going on in Zhou Ming's head. He didn't know why he suddenly decided that Alice should be present at this miniature version of the Lost House, which was obviously an outrageous thought. Maybe the mere presence of this model was outrageous? Zhou Ming held the tiny model of the Lost House in his hands and pondered over it for a long, long time. He didn't know how the ship ended up on his desk, but it was clear that the connection between his bachelor pad and the world beyond the door was deeper than he could have imagined. Perhaps the changes occurred after he took the helm, or after he looked through the door into subspace. He sat back and tried to calm himself. He found that he could still sense what was behind the door. He sensed the Lost House, sensed Goathead, even sensed the city-state of Pran some distance away, and another body in an antique store. After an unknown amount of time, Zhou Ming suddenly woke up and blinked his eyes at the model of the ghost ship he was still holding in his hands, and then at the empty shelf at the end of the room. This shelf had been there for many years, but he had not found the opportunity to put anything on it until the vision came. At the moment, there were only a few decorative crystal bottles on it that he had been tricked into buying online. Holding the lost house in his hands, Zhou Ming carefully placed this exquisite model on the shelf. After placing it on the shelf, he took two steps back and carefully examined his achievement, seeming quite pleased with the choice of place. How she ended up here was a mystery, but at least he would be able to decorate his humble abode during his days of being trapped. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. A loud whistle disturbed the calm of the sea, and Vanna, who arrived at the port before everyone else, immediately went to the edge of the observation deck and looked around the docks. The area had been cleared before arrival, and the once bustling main port of Pranda was now empty. All workers abandoned the docks and were replaced by the city's heavily armed forces and cathedral linked guards. Twelve steam walkers blocked all approaches to the docks, and on the sea outside the port, between the slightly rising waves, a beautiful steam-powered ship was slowly approaching. White Oak. The White Oak has returned. After a long journey, the most advanced steamship belonging to the Society of Explorers has finally returned to the city-state of Prand. Many people were waiting for the ship to return, 
and countless eyes nervously watched its silhouette approaching the port. As soon as the white oak whistle sounded, Inquisitor Vanna saw the workers on the docks begin to move. Some took position to signal the white oak with lights and flags. The cathedral guards went to activate the sacred relics that had been placed throughout the first pier the previous night. Many cast made of bronze signs with the name of the storm goddess Jemona inscribed on their bases, and grooves in the upper part, filled with symbols of the sea. When they were activated, the area where the white oak was going to land became a sanctuary under the supervision of the goddess herself. After them, people sent by the mayor's office got down to business. They were ordinary people and did not have the skills to work with the supernatural, so their main task was to block all routes from the port with powerful weapons. Ordinary guns would be difficult to cope with a strange, invisible curse, but if it was pollution, then powerful weapons would be very useful. Sometimes Vana couldn't help but thank humans for technological advancement, for the crystallization of engineering that gave even the weak and powerless common man some power to intervene in such events involving the supernatural. While the results of technological progress have been mixed, at least the introduction of rotary barrel machine guns and artillery has significantly reduced casualties among cathedral members over the years. Vanna's gaze slid along the pier and rushed to the distant sea. A second whistle sounded on White Oak, and, guided by the light signal from the shore, the ship began to slow down and stopped at some distance from the pier. The priest standing next to the bath felt some relief in the depths of his soul, and said in a whisper, White Oak carried out his order. It appears that this ship is still under human control. This cannot be confirmed at this time. Many people affected by anomalies or visions appear normal until a mutation occurs. Vanna shook her head. Send a second set of signals, send out a search boat, and have the shore guns ready to fire if there is any movement on the ship. The Inquisitor's orders were quickly relayed to the appropriate people, and since the communications device on the White Oak was damaged, the people on shore could only communicate with the ship using lights and flags. After a complex set of lights and flags, the bow of the White Oak was illuminated with three lights, after which a rope ladder was lowered from its side. A boat was immediately launched from the pier, which, with the help of a small steam engine, headed towards White Oak. There was a whole detachment on board the boat, eight soldiers, a commander, and a priest. The priest lit incense and chanted the holy name of the storm goddess on board the boat. But instead of immediately boarding the White Oak, they first circled the ship and sprinkled the nearby waters with holy oil mixed with seaweed extract. Having fallen into the water, the oil immediately glowed with a faint glow and gradually formed a circle around the white oak. Only after this did the priest in the boat climb up the rope ladder onto the side of the ship. Vanna watched all this incessantly. Bringing a ship lost at sea home was an extremely dangerous undertaking, especially if it was a ship responsible for transporting anomalies. The white oak could not dock immediately. It first had to be inspected from a safe distance. After this, the ship was allowed to dock, but the crew members could not disembark. They were subjected to a second inspection by members of the council, and the entire ship was subjected to a more stringent search and cleansing. According to the rules, the ship was cleaned for at least a week, and the crew members were closely monitored for several days. Only after all these procedures did the civilized world dare to accept them back home, and if something went wrong, White Oak and its crew would be buried at sea. The goddess of storms will accept the souls of these unfortunate people. These cold, even cruel rules are not the result of someone's evil intent but a way of life that has developed in human society to date. Of course, there were city-states that were unwilling or unable to enforce these harsh rules, most of which are today concentrated in the first two sections of the second book of high school history, the compulsory final examination. Minutes passed. Everyone was waiting for a signal from the detachment that had boarded the ship for inspection. There could only be two signals. If everything is in order, the squad will send a docking request using special psychic communications, and if the ship is contaminated, the squad will fight to the last man and try to blow up the ship before everyone is killed. If a ship the size of White Oak had truly been contaminated by subspace or something else, then there was no way the handful of people who had boarded it would have made it back alive. Vanna pressed her hands to her chest and lightly tapped her armor. Suddenly a bell rang out from the chapel at the docks. The priest in the chapel received a coded message from the detachment on White Oak, and the chapel's bells alerted everyone on the docks that the ship was safe, ready to dock, and wishing to report special circumstances. Vanna breathed a sigh of relief. The ship, at least for now, was fine, and that was the best news of all. As for the words about special circumstances, she was not too surprised. It would be strange if a ship that was strangely lost returned to port without reporting anything special. White Oak slowly docked. The ship, having survived such a journey, was finally back at the docks of the civilized world, and although the people on board were not yet allowed to disembark, they could relax a little. The cathedral guards began to board the ship in an organized manner ready for a thorough inspection and interrogation, 
and Vanna, leaving an observer on the shore, personally led a detachment of priests to the pier. She walked along the long deck and finally stepped onto the deck of the White Oak, where she was met at the bow by a burly, white-haired captain. The old captain looked exhausted. Obviously, too long a journey under conditions of great stress had tired him. But at the sight of the approaching Cathedral Inquisitor, the old man immediately perked up and came out to meet Vanna. Hello, Captain Lawrence. My name is Vanna, Inquisitor of the Cathedral of the Deep in the city-state of Prand, greeted Vanna, not a fan of unnecessary etiquette. She preferred to get straight to the point. Let's do without introductions. First of all, I apologize and hope that you and your crew understand that the authorities of the city-state and the cathedral are watching you. Of course, Your Excellency the Inquisitor. Lawrence nodded immediately, intending to say Madame Inquisitor since she looked almost as mature as his own daughter, but in the end he switched to a more respectful address. I expected this. After all, we haven't communicated for so long. Vanna nodded. Tell me briefly, what happened to White Oak? Why did you lose contact with us? And why did they suddenly appear in a completely different place after that? What is the status of the cargo you escorted? Anomaly 099. At these words, Lawrence's face instantly filled with disappointment and tension. He sighed and first subconsciously took a quick glance around before slowly saying, You may not believe me when I tell you that we have encountered the legendary ship Lost House. The Inquisitor standing in front of him with a serious expression on her face suddenly froze in place. A strange expression frozen on her face. He couldn't say what that expression meant, but it was similar to the one that appeared on his face after he accidentally ended up on the Lost House. Your Excellency Inquisitor? Lawrence asked carefully. You. Captain Lawrence. Vanna seemed to come to her senses and stared at the captain standing in front of her. Can you repeat? You may not believe me when I say this. Repeat the second half. We encountered the legendary ship Lost House. I believe you. Lawrence was taken aback. Then, you may have to stay at the docks for a few more days, Captain, Vanna said with a serious expression on her face. This is serious, very serious. Wait, you encountered the Lost House but didn't lose anyone. The Inquisitor's expression suddenly changed slightly, and there was much more than just a hint of doubt in her eyes. Lawrence saw this and hurriedly said, My people are fine. But the Lost House took Anomaly 099, the doll in the coffin. I suspect that the ghost ship came precisely for her. Did the Lost House take Anomaly 099? Vanna asked, frowning. And what happened after that? Did he just let you go? Yes, yes, Lawrence answered, nervous and vaguely understanding what was happening. Your Excellency Inquisitor, the city is new, I'll tell you. After all, it seems that your contact may be much more serious than ours. Vanna sighed, looking at the old captain in front of her. Captain Lawrence, you may not be the only person who has dealt with the Lost House recently. Let's find a quiet place. I have a lot to ask you about. The captain's cabin in White Oak has been temporarily turned into a kind of sanctuary. Inside, the aroma of incense hung in the air. Amulets depicting runes hung on the doors and windows. In the corners of the room the priests placed bronze signs, to the tops of which they tied panels soaked in sacred oil. And finally, a copy of the Canon of Storms from the cathedral was brought into the cabin to serve as a sanctuary pillar. After all this, Captain Lawrence entered the captain's quarters along with Inquisitor Vanna. I hope you don't mind our transformation of this place. Vanna said, maintaining the restraint and proper manners expected of a high-ranking priest. All for the sake of safety. Of course, safety is exactly what I lack now. Captain Lawrence nodded with understanding, looking around the cabin with a slight sigh of relief. Thanks to these things, ordinary contaminated things will be afraid to enter here, because otherwise they will die. Here you can calmly talk to me about the lost house. Vanna nodded. Let's start from the very beginning. Where and in what form did you see the ship? Captain Lawrence calmed down and began to tell what he remembered about that terrible day. It all started from that. Captain Lawrence told everything in great detail. Under the gaze of the Inquisitor, he even told what exactly he ate for breakfast that day, and at what time the sailors of the ship began their meal. But in order to tell what those sailors did about whose affairs he did not remember anything, he had to look into the ship's log and the sailor's log. Experienced captains know that many anomalies are preceded by seemingly unusual signs that may be difficult to recognize at the time but experts reviewing later can learn from them and use them as a warning later. Every captain in the endless sea had the habit of keeping a ship's log, and reading his own ship's log was the only safe way to read in the endless sea, apart from reading the books of the church. As Vanna listened to his story about the terrible encounter, her brows gradually frowned. The situation turned out to be much more serious and bizarre than she had first imagined. She thought that the so-called meeting of Captain Lawrence was simply a collision with a ghost ship, and at best, the terrible captain simply took the cargo from the ship without harming anyone. But instead, there was a head-on collision. The White Oak crashed into the Lost House, and the ship was engulfed from top to bottom in emerald ghostly flames. According to Captain Lawrence, 
White Oak has already begun to move towards the Lost House from top to bottom, and he clearly saw his torso transform into an illusory state. The sacred emblem on the ship had no effect, the relics did not react, and the protective material added to the hull material was useless. The priest could only defend himself. The entire ship was in the depths of the spiritual world and could not call for help. One might say that the White Oak was already the captain's prey, and there was no possibility of a happy rescue. Captain Lawrence can still stand here today only because the Lost House refused this trophy without hesitation. Your Excellency, Inquisitor, said Captain Lawrence after he had finally finished telling his story, noticing that Vanna was taking a long time to answer. What do you think the Lost House was trying to do? Was he really just trying to take Anomaly 099? Vanna looked at him. Didn't you always think that way? I thought so before, but now I'm not sure, Lawrence sighed, especially since you just said that the Ghost Captain recently extended his power to the city-state of Prand. I feel like everything can't be that simple. No one can guess what the ghost captain is thinking. Vanna shook her head. All we can do now is to conduct the most thorough examination of the White Oak to prevent any intrusions on the ship. You and your crew will have to suffer a bit over the next few days. You must have no contact with anyone other than priests until the investigation is completed, including relatives. Captain Lawrence bowed his head. I understand. Then he paused briefly and continued. So, about the theft of Anomaly 099. Vanna knew what the captain was worried about. Strange and frightening sea visions represented a threat looming over civilization. But before considering these large-scale threats, this captain was first and foremost an ordinary man who needed to provide for his family. He lost Anomaly 099, and this the responsibility was too heavy to place on the head of an ordinary person. Don't worry. The Cathedral will talk about this with the city authorities, as well as with the Society of Explorers, she said in a quiet voice. The Lost House is a force majeure event, and the loss of Anomaly 099 is not your responsibility, even if you were responsible for its escort. Even if the church ship had been in charge of escorting at that time, I'm afraid the outcome would have been the same. At these words, Captain Lawrence relaxed a little. But there was something else Vanna didn't say. After all, the anomalies themselves were on the verge of sealing away and spiraling out of control. Every year, new anomalies appeared in the world. The inhabitants of the city-state died under the influence of strange creatures, and the church fought these out-of-control anomalies for thousands of years. Against the backdrop of this long and enormous dynamic equilibrium, the loss of an anomaly is not unthinkable, even if this anomaly is in the top hundred. But she, the Inquisitor, could not say such things. And yet, Captain Lawrence suddenly hesitantly broke the silence again. I would like to ask, what is so special about Anomaly 099? Here he paused and quickly added, of course I received a copy of the information when I was on an escort mission, but it was mainly about how Anomaly 099 was sealed and how to handle it after it got out of control, not about its origin and what will happen if it gets completely out of control. You know, after all, this anomaly is in the top hundred, and the more ordinary people around it know about it, the more likely it is that it will get out of control. I understand this rule. But now that the Lost House has taken over Anomaly 099 according to the rules, it should be considered completely out of control so. I can tell you, Vanna nodded without waiting for Captain Lawrence to finish. Anomaly 099 has escaped the control of civilized society, and of course, according to the rules, information about it will be transferred to the Society of Explorers and teams of special people in city-states with the aim of its subsequent capture. You are a member of the Society of Explorers and the last person in contact with Anomaly 099, so you should know this information. She paused for a moment to take it all in, and then spoke slowly. Anomaly 099. The doll coffin is an ornate wooden box, similar in size to a coffin, containing a sleeping doll with silver hair and a purple dress, similar in size to for an ordinary person. The anomaly was originally discovered in the cold sea to the north, and the figure within it bears a strong physical resemblance to Ray Nora, the Frost Queen who was beheaded and executed by rebels half a century ago, but there is no evidence of any tangible connection between the two. The anomaly is not inclined to think and is not intelligent, and most likely, it actively perceives and influences the outside world, guided by instinct. You should know the method of sealing Anomaly 099, so I won't repeat it, as for its dangers. Firstly, the coffin with a doll has a tendency to the so-called subsidence. Once she stays in a certain area for a long time, she will treat that area as her own territory, after which it will be very difficult for her to move from there. At the same time, it will gradually expand its influence in this territory. The strength of its seal will slowly weaken, and the likelihood of going out of control will increase, a characteristic inherent in a large part of the anomalies, and therefore Anomaly 099 must be moved frequently. Secondly, in the event that the doll coffin goes out of control, all humanoid creatures, including humans, elves, 
Senjin and Jipu, within a certain range around it, become a target for detection. This range can be anywhere from 100 meters to 1,000, and increases as Anomaly 099 settles over time. The detection criteria are not yet clear, other than that the chosen target will immediately lose freedom of movement, as if being manipulated by threads, and will unconsciously lean towards the doll's coffin, as the inhabitants of the city-state worship the queen. And as soon as this action is completed, the victim will be instantly beheaded. Beheading cannot be avoided, it cannot be defended against. It is pointless to use any blessing or put armor on the victim. The only requirement for it to take effect is to be chosen by the doll. The victim will be decapitated immediately upon completion of the action, and the doll will then temporarily calm down for four to six hours before beginning to search for the next target until no one remains alive within range or the coffin is sealed. When out of control, she becomes extremely fast and strong and can break out of captivity through various supernatural means. In addition, the coffin itself is extremely strong, making it even more dangerous when it gets out of control. Only one saint survived the loss of control at the coffin of the doll, but this saint happens to have the blood of the people of one of the northern city-states, so it is impossible to determine whether the saint's power resisted the curse or whether his bloodline simply met the criteria for liberation. Listening to the young Inquisitor's story, Captain Lawrence felt himself break out in a cold sweat. His first thought was, the money of the city-state authorities is really not easy to earn. Not surprisingly, the fee for maintaining Anomaly 099 was almost five times higher than for maintaining a regular anomaly. Only a few people from the Society of Explorers specializing in extreme survival would take on such work. At the same time, he heard the voice of Inquisitor Vanna continue, For such a strange and terrifying ability, the Church, archiving Anomaly 099, gave its power a name named after the instrument used by the rebels to execute the Frost Queen a century ago, Guillotine Alice. Alice, head! A wonderful morning aboard the Lost House began with the captain shouting on deck. Standing outside the captain's cabin, Duncan raised his hand, pointing to the head of a doll that hung on the door. He blinked several times before he finally saw the body of a doll in a long, dark, purple gothic dress appear nearby. It ran to the door in a panic and removed its head from there. With a loud crunch, the doll lady put her head back in place and then turned to Duncan. Hey, hey! What is your head doing on my doorstep in the morning? Duncan stared at the damn doll. Who wouldn't be surprised to see a head on their doorstep in the morning? It's good that he's been on this ship for a long time, and his nerves are much stronger than before, otherwise he would probably faint from such a sight. Don't tell me that you were watching the deck. A dove is already watching it. I washed my hair this morning, Alice began carefully, frowning. It never dried, so I decided to hang my head higher so that it would dry thoroughly. Duncan. Alice looked carefully at Duncan. Captain, are you angry? It sounds reasonable. Duncan was silent for a long time. But in the end he could only say this, and restraining himself, was forced to admit that, at least from the point of view of Alice's anomalous 099 lifestyle, there was nothing strange in this. Almost everything on the ship did strange things. For example, the gate on the deck was still dozing as usual, and the bucket of water used to wash the deck was rolled out to the stern every afternoon to bask a little in the sun. In this respect Alice, the doll who has adapted to life on board, has now truly become one with the ship. I'm glad you're not angry, Captain. Alice immediately smiled. She seemed to have adapted not only to life on the ship, but also to the captain's disposition. She was still in awe of the powerful ghost captain, but she was no longer afraid of him as in the beginning. Now she seemed much more courageous. She even dared to bargain with the captain. Then from now on I can hang my head here? No, anywhere, just not on the door of the captain's cabin. Look for another place. Duncan looked at the doll. I don't want to see the head of a crew member hanging on the door, or a headless body lying in front of it. Alice could only bow her head. Oh. Okay. Duncan was still looking at her, his face expressing extreme thoughtfulness. Captain? Alice shuddered slightly at his gaze. Why do you keep looking at me? A question just occurred to me, Duncan said after thinking. You're losing your hair, right? Do you lose them when you wash your hair? And do they grow on you? Alice immediately froze, her expression reminiscent of that of a dove that had fallen into a trap. Another long moment passed before her eyes suddenly widened and she looked at Duncan in amazement. I hadn't thought about that at all. Captain. You. She said the last sentence almost crying and didn't actually finish it. She wanted to ask, Captain, are you the devil? But was afraid that Mr. Goathead would scold her for underestimating the captain's strength as the first natural disaster at sea. Duncan didn't care what Alice didn't say. His thoughts were already running wild. You see, although you can walk, jump, and talk, your body is still like that of a real doll. You don't need to eat or drink. Your head keeps falling off, but you can put it back. So I think your hair is a non-renewable resource, and if you wash it too often you will go bald someday, or if you brush it too often. Alice was on the verge of tears. 
Captain, why did you think of such a terrible thing? Duncan. Actually, I've been wanting to ask about this since you made fish head soup. Alice, despite her sadness, froze for a moment when she heard this. But it was just fish soup. Duncan made excuses. Nonsense, there was both a fish and a head. Why wasn't it fish head soup? Alice. Sounds like it. Reasonable. The wonderful morning at the Lost House began with everyone recognizing each other's words and actions as reasonable. The doll lady was in a trance, as if something important had suddenly occurred to her about her future. Duncan was in a happy mood. He breathed in the sea air for a while and then enjoyed a simple breakfast of fish fillets prepared by Alice herself the day before. Sliced cheese and alcohol from the city-state of Prand. It wasn't very tasty, but so far it was the best food aboard the Lost House. In the captain's cabin, Goathead looked curiously at the joyful Duncan. Captain, what happened to Mrs. Alice? I noticed that she absent-mindedly returned to her cabin and knocked on the door twice as she returned. She seemed preoccupied with something? She's facing a major life challenge, and I don't think you'll have to worry about her struggling with the weirdness on board for much longer. Duncan shook the glass of wine in his hand with a mischievous grin on his face. But I'm interested in one thing. Huh? What are you interested in? Is it true that the damn doll will become a bald doll when its hair falls out? Duncan asked seriously. Shouldn't there be some kind of supernatural force to somehow do this? Well, how can I fix this? Unfortunately, I didn't have time to discuss this with Alice before she ran away. Goathead. Duncan threw a curious look at the usually talkative Goathead. Why are you silent? The Goathead restrained himself for a long time and finally said, You really deserve the title of the first natural disaster in the endless sea. I couldn't ask such a question. Duncan shrugged and stood up from the table. I'm leaving again, he said to Goathead, snapping his fingers, after which a cluster of emerald flames flashed in the air, from which I appeared in the form of a lifeless bird and landed on his shoulder. As usual, you are responsible for the helm. As you order, Captain. Your faithful follower will not let you down. Goathead immediately agreed, after which a curious question followed. Captain, you seem to be. Are you keen on traveling through the spiritual world these days? Are you interested in something on land? Duncan did not answer immediately, but thought a little before speaking. Lately, I suddenly discovered that after a century of development, the world has become a little more interesting. He had thought about this answer in advance, an answer that did not reveal anything obvious or show his lack of knowledge but at the same time laid a foundation that would make his subsequent interest in land more relevant and, if necessary, a reasonable motive for returning to civilization. And this answer should not contradict too much the image of Captain Duncan. The greatest natural disaster on the endless sea can also be a man of pleasure, because people of pleasure are compatible with everything. Goathead didn't react unusually, as if whatever Captain Duncan decided to do seemed natural to him. Oh, you're right. After so many years, it's time for the weak city-states to come up with something interesting and it's only natural that you'd want to dispel your boredom in that case. Shouldn't the Lost House be ready? Which city are you planning to invade? Prand, Lunds, Rens, or to a city in the north? Duncan listened to the first half and nodded mentally, thinking that his follower really knew how to read minds. But then came the second half, because of which the blood in his veins froze, and he had to interrupt. When I said that anything about invading city-states, I just recently became interested. Wouldn't it be a pity to ruin everything? Oh yes, my proposal was reckless. Goathead immediately changed his tone. Actually, I thought that you were planning to take a ride on your ship in the future, but since you didn't intend to do this, this offer is invalid. After all, the large city-state is still quite powerful and approaching it is a bit risky. In the future, don't mention invading city-states, Duncan said, looking at Goathead. We have not communicated with the world for a hundred years, and now I want to regain control over changes in civilized society, which may entail many long-term changes. Don't make unnecessary plans until I have a clear order. As you order, Captain. Goathead is a dangerous creature, not only because he is an unknown anomaly, but also because he served the real Captain Duncan, and to this day acts and thinks according to the old rules. From Goathead's point of view, city-states on land are meaningless. The mortals in them are stupid and ridiculous. Their fleet is food, and robbing and killing them is everyday life in the Lost House. Duncan didn't know how long it would take him to adapt to Goathead's habits, but he knew that the process had to be subtle, some logical reason to change his attitude and that of the Lost House would be the surest way to do it. He took one last look at Goathead, who stood calmly on the table to make sure that he had taken control of the sails and helm of the Lost House, and then went to his chambers. Nina would return to the antique store after lunch, but until then he would have time to conduct more tests on I. The door to the captain's quarters closed. The Goathead silently looked into the darkness in the direction of the door for an unknown amount of time, until he was convinced that the captain's consciousness had gone on a journey through the spiritual world and then quietly muttered, as if to himself, subspace. Really had no effect. 
In the twilight, the wooden carved goat's head creaked and turned several times, as if it was looking around the cabin, and as if its gaze penetrated the room and examined the entire ship. The lost house, oh, the lost house, what a terrible thing you caught. Asterisk, 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 Duncan returned to the familiar darkness and felt his will stretch between countless threads of light. At the ends of these threads were the lost house and the antique store of the city-state Prand. It seemed that as the time of using the double bond increased, his sensations became more and more clear. Now he could sense the environment in the antique store while concentrating on it. He could also remotely control his body in the store to perform some simple actions. Apparently this was quite a good thing, since a shop owner who spent more than half of his time sleeping was arousing suspicion. And if the body just gets up and stands in the doorway for a minute or two, it will dispel a lot of unnecessary glances. Duncan did not immediately send his core consciousness to the city-state of Prand. He paused first in the darkness, feeling the changes in space before looking back. In the darkness nearby, I silently floated in the form of an illusory dove, his body emitting emerald flames as he flew, and several objects could be seen in the center of the area where he was floating. Among them were an amulet of the sun, a short dagger, a piece of cheese, a round cannonball, and a dried fish. These were test items that he prepared to test I's ability to carry objects and how they would change during the journey. He found a dagger in the hold of the ship, and it probably belonged to a certain sailor. He took the cheese, which had the property of not spoiling, from the galley, the colonel from the ammunition depot, and he caught the fish from the sea in the last couple of days, and it did not have time to dry completely. Duncan looked at the dove that was hovering around these objects and nodded slightly. So this is how you carry objects every time. I flapped his wings and let out a hoarse, piercing cry. Hold on, hold on! Grinning, Duncan concentrated his mind and prepared to project his consciousness. But at the very last moment, he suddenly saw a strange flickering light appear at the end of the thread of light, which pointed into the distance towards the city-state of Prand. Duncan immediately stopped and stared in amazement at the flickering light that flashed among countless dim points. It seemed that the light was there initially, but only in a moment of concentration it turned from dark to light as if it had suddenly been noticed and began to radiate a certain presence. What is this? Confused, Duncan tried to approach the flickering light. With just one thought, he crossed the pitch darkness, and then the flickering light quickly expanded before his eyes and turned into a stream of light flowing in waves before his eyes. Only then did he feel that there was a connection between this stream of light and himself, the same connection as between his body in the lost house and another body in the antique store. Is this another body? The thought crossed Duncan's mind, but he quickly shook his head. The flickering light streaming in front of him was much larger than the points of light representing the bodies. It was definitely not a body, but rather some kind of massive object. After hesitating for a moment, he made up his mind and carefully touched the light with his hand. The next moment, a vast and unfamiliar feeling suddenly flooded his mind. He could not see anything around him, but he felt the sea breeze blowing across his body. He felt the waves swaying around him, felt people walking around him and even right on his body. He heard them talking, but all the voices were mixed together, and he could not understand what they were talking about. He was vaguely aware that he was perceiving his surroundings through the prism of a huge object, but this huge object was not suitable for traveling through the spiritual world, or perhaps some force was protecting it, preventing its power from penetrating inside, due to which his perception was so vague. This huge object seemed to rest on the sea next to the land, where many people had gathered. There was a tense and serious atmosphere among the people as if they were solemnly ridding themselves of some element of danger. They were talking quietly and succinctly about something. Duncan had difficulty trying to concentrate on what the voices were saying. It was a long time before he heard one word mentioned repeatedly by many voices. White Oak. Duncan pulled his hand away from the stream of light and looked with some surprise at the flickering light floating in front of him. The flickering light floated in the darkness, dimly reflecting the vague image of the ship. The name White Oak seemed somewhat familiar to him, but he could not remember when and where he had heard it. Duncan tried to remember, and finally pulled out a few superficial impressions from the depths of his memory. He remembered the ship he came across in the spirit world when he first took the helm. He remembered that when the Lost House merged with this ship, he thought he saw it. The name of the ship appears to have been White Oak. Immediately after this, he remembered the newspaper he had bought in the city-state of Prand. One of the headlines in it read, White Oak, a ship that has been missing for several days will return to port in the near future. Duncan looked blankly at the flickering light floating in front of him. It was White Oak, the same one who was responsible for escorting Anomaly 099. The old captain who tried to shout to him and his crew, it seems, arrived in the city-state of Pran without incident, which could not but rejoice. Obviously, he established a connection with the ship. Was it established after a collision in the spiritual world? 
because the fire from the lost house spread to White Oak? Duncan pondered the properties of his spirit flame and at the same time wondered if his connection to the ship could be useful. After all his time on the lost house, he appreciated any connection with the civilized world. But even though White Oak had entered port, it seemed that he was still under some kind of surveillance, and that these nervous people were professionals who specialized in the work with supernatural phenomena. Obviously, a ship lost at sea posed a danger to the inhabitants of the city-state, and the crew's experience of contact with the Lost House was likely an important issue that should have been studied. Duncan was now somewhat aware of his reputation and that of the Lost House. After thinking for a moment, he carefully stepped back, not touching the flickering light in front of him. As the top boss of the Endless Sea, he did not intend to deal with the defenders of the city-state, and did not want to reveal that he had established a connection with White Oak without knowing what kind of professionals they were. He did not want his connection with the ship to be discovered and eliminated. It was established and reliable, like an anchor underwater, and he could wait patiently until the White Oak was no longer watched. When that time comes, perhaps he will even be able to calmly talk to the old captain and find out what he shouted to him while the wind and waves raged. A light, cool sea breeze suddenly swept across the deck, causing Captain Lawrence, who had just left the premises, to subconsciously rub his hands. But he was not sure whether these goosebumps were caused by the cool sea breeze or what the young Inquisitor had told him. Anomaly 099, the doll in the coffin, having gone out of control, not only had the ability to move quickly, but also constantly expanded its sphere of influence and searched for targets within its radius with the goal of unconditionally decapitating them, and only a saint could resist this. He and his crew had spent the last half month of the journey living with this dangerous anomaly, and even though the journey had been uneventful, with the exception of the last encounter with the Lost House, he still felt a little fear when he thought about it. But that's just fear. He was a member of the Society of Explorers, a seasoned sea explorer, and his job was to explore the vast sea. Unlike fishermen who only worked in safe areas, he spent most of his voyage dealing with all sorts of anomalies, and even visions. The authorities or the council were informed in advance about the dangers of transporting anomalies, and this part of the contract was often the shortest, usually consisting of only one clause. The task poses a mortal danger. No more details can be given. Every captain who made his living in the city-states knew what he was up against, and more than half of them suffered from this deadly career in adulthood. When you deal with the vast sea all year round, anomalies and visions always leave something behind in your destiny. Many of his colleagues of the same age retired, suffering either from incessant nightmares, mental problems caused by curses of varying severity, or were left disabled or worse. Captains and sailors on ships had incomes much more lucrative than residents of the city-state could imagine, and occupational diseases were much more common than representatives of any other profession. Captain Lawrence did not consider himself an honorable man. He did this mainly for the money. Of course, in his youth, he had a passion for exploring the sea. But like most people, this passion quickly faded. And now he felt that it was time for him to retire. The time had come to retire while he still could, and before the endless sea became entangled in his fate. Lawrence sighed slightly, turned towards the captain's cabin, and walked away. He could not leave White Oak until the priests had inspected the entire ship. After this, he, along with everyone else, must be transferred to the cathedral for isolation and a series of psychiatric examinations. His eyes scanned the ship he knew. It was a beautiful ship, new, and he had commanded it for only five years, and in the usual language of captains of the Endless Sea, this meant that the captain and the ship were not yet married, so retiring was not easy. But it's better to retire now than to die during some future voyage or spend the rest of your life in a mental hospital. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. In Duncan's old antique shop in the lower district of the city-state, a middle-aged man lying on a bed on the second floor slowly opened his eyes, and his eyes reflected the slightly old and moldy ceiling. Phew. Duncan exhaled quietly, feeling how quickly the perception of this body was stabilizing, and how his control over it was moving from remote manipulation to direct. After two or three seconds, he managed to rise up on the bed with the help of his hands. At that moment, the pigeon eye flew up to the head of his bed, tapped him several times with its beak, and said loudly, Welcome home, dear. Do you want to eat first, or take some food? Shower, or... Duncan was about to stretch his stiff body when the pigeon's words almost gave him a cramp, and he lightly slapped the pigeon on the head. Where did you pick up these words? I, clearly not an ordinary bird, having received a slap in the face from Duncan, as if nothing had happened, moved a little further, and continued yelling. Such a strong blow that my nose broke and blood gushed from my nostrils. It was as if a seasoning trade had been opened in my mouth. There was sour, salty, and bitter. One Duncan immediately stopped paying attention to him. He stood up from the bed and looked at the table nearby. Quietly lying on the table were various items that he had prepared earlier on the lost house, 
the amulet of the sun, a dagger, cheese, a cannonball, and dried fish. It all lay here now. So many unrelated things. The dove turned out to be more reliable than he thought. Duncan rose from the bed and checked everything on the table to make sure everything was in order, and then looked back with some admiration at the pigeon strutting proudly along the head of the bed. Seeing that he had fallen, lay motionless and barely breathing Duncan. Then he sat down at the table and began to examine the objects. First, the amulet of the sun. It did not change, like a supernatural object, completely transformed and controlled by the spiritual flame. A quiet, obedient power still flowed through it. Two successive journeys through the spiritual world did not seem to have any effect on the nature of this object. Secondly, the dagger, which did not have supernatural properties, also did not change. With the exception of the ancient style, its blade remains sharp, and its scabbard remains well-maintained. Duncan's gaze fell on a piece of cheese which he took from the galley of the Lost House. Nothing unusual happened to the cheese either. It was still not suitable for food, but did not rot and did not dissolve into thin air after leaving the Lost House as before. Duncan expected. Then he looked at the cannonball. It lay silently on the table, not reacting to the captain's gaze. Duncan touched it and tapped its cast iron shell. The supernatural properties of the core disappeared. On the Lost House, even the shells were active. Of course, this did not mean that each of them had a separate mind. The entire system of ship snyards was controlled by a single consciousness, and as a subunit of this consciousness, the shells on the Lost House immediately changed their position when the captain looked at them. According to Duncan's observations, the power part of the Lost House was controlled by two consciousnesses. One controlled the ammunition system, and the other controlled dozens of guns below deck. Together, they were responsible for reloading the guns, firing and controlling each of the members of this action. The core in front of him apparently lost control of his consciousness when he left the Lost House and turned into an ordinary piece of iron. Duncan wondered, if this core was returned, would it become part of the ammunition system again? Will the Lost House be able to recognize this returning subunit? These thoughts were developed further. Ammunition on the Lost House was limited, and shells were not returned, like the eight cores spent on Alice. So is it possible to replenish the ship's ammunition? How do new ammo become subunits of the Lost House? Can the Lost House upgrade its weapon system? More advanced guns, more advanced shells. Could they work on this ship? The Lost House is a ghost ship, so resupplying and upgrading it was much more difficult than a regular ship. Everything that came on board was foreign to the ship. And if they do not become part of the Lost House, they will not be able to act independently, like other objects on the ship. But if only there was a way to make them part of the Lost House, then the ghost ship could improve. As did the conditions for life on it. This thought captured Duncan. The more he became acquainted with the modern city-state of Prand, the more he felt that the lost house of a hundred years ago was not, in fact, as magnificent as its reputation said. Yes, this ship had strange and frightening powers, but it didn't even have electric lights or french fries. Its weapon system was ancient weapons, and Duncan couldn't say how effective it would be in a real fight, and there were no french fries. And although the ship had spiritual sails and a steam engine as a backup energy source, there was not even a place to boil hot water on board. And french fries. Duncan silently looked at the pigeon, which had climbed onto the windowsill and looked out. The pigeon looked at him with unblinking green beady eyes. Shall we go to the port and buy some potatoes? Shut up and don't mention the potatoes, Duncan replied before focusing on the last item. Dried fish, an all-natural food made from a heavenly gift caught in the deep sea. Delicious to the taste. It belonged to the category of items outside the lost house. It looks like the dried fish hasn't changed much since I entered the spirit world. I'll give it to Nina. Let her cook something out of it. 1. From the book River Backwaters Having studied all the items, Duncan gained a better understanding of I.I.'s capabilities and the nature of the items aboard the Lost House. I.I. could transport several different items at once, including organic, inorganic, supernatural, and normal. Moreover, the type of object did not affect the success of the transportation process, just as the transportation process did not affect the nature of the object. Some of the things on the Lost House that are clearly active are themselves subunits of a much larger control consciousness. For example, the shells are subunits of the ammunition system. And these subunits lose their nature as soon as they leave the Lost House and become ordinary objects. Also, the transportation process doesn't seem to take up much of I's energy. Whether it was a ritual dagger or this pile of objects, the bird remained cheerful upon its return. Although, it is possible that the total amount of cargo she has carried so far is too little and far from reaching the limits of her abilities. So far, he had only tested different types of items, and it was unknown if there was a weight or volume limit to this ability, requiring further testing. Duncan analyzed everything that was known at the moment, and only when he was sure that he had thought it all through, did he breathe a sigh of relief. 
and slowly leaned back in his chair. He knew that the tests he had administered were still far from perfect, and that there were still many possible variables that he had not taken into account, even in terms of the types of test items. In the future, he would have to select at least a few more objects and use objects of different weights and volumes to test AI's transportation limits and stability. Only with a sufficiently large sample of control objects can he obtain reliable data. In this regard, he was very careful and this caution was not without reason, since he had a very bold plan or idea. Since I could teleport objects intact from the Lost House to land without any restrictions on the type of item, could he transport people? And if he can send people, can he send people who are not exactly considered as such, for example Alice? Duncan understood that there was a limit to what one man could do, and by acting as a link between the Lost House and the land-based city-states with his ability, he would sooner or later face the problem of a labor shortage. And the situation would be much better if he had helpers. The teleportation ability demonstrated by AI gave him a good idea of what to do. Of course, Alice is not a very good choice for an assistant. This Anomaly 099 looked elegant and mysterious when she was silent, but as soon as she spoke, she immediately showed her true nature. But at the moment, Duncan had no other choice. He sighed when he thought about the fact that the only crew member available was a loser who couldn't cook a meal. He did not think that he would be able to find allies in the human world. And if he did, he would only find a bunch of second-rate villains, the kind who every day eagerly await the end of the world, cut gas pipes on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. On Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, people are sacrificed, and on Sundays they fight with the cathedral guards. This kind of people can quickly find common ground with Goathead. They will start getting together in their free time to figure out which city-state to invade, and this is not the help Duncan needs. Well, Alice, at least she's honest and obedient. Duncan sighed and stood up. She can improve if she is trained properly. Probably. Even if it didn't help, he wanted to let the doll see the human world. After all, she had been lying in a coffin for so many years and did not know what the outside world looked like. Having finished his thoughts, Duncan began to collect the items he had taken with him. He would not return to the Lost House for a long time, and many of these items could not be carried with him. So naturally, they had to be left in the store. There weren't many places to hide things on the second floor of an antique store. And since Nina could come in at any time to help with the cleaning, some things that clearly didn't look like everyday items would look especially suspicious. For example, a cannonball. But after some thought, Duncan found a suitable place for each of them. You can take the sun amulet with you, take the dried fish to the kitchen, and with a cannonball and a dagger everything was much simpler. Duncan took these two items to the ground floor of the store and put them in an inconspicuous corner next to the counter. It was an antique store anyway. There was a lot of similar rubbish lying here and the dagger and cannonball were better hidden here, in a pile of fakes, than anywhere else. As for the last item, the cheese from the Lost House galley, Duncan found a suitable place for it, in the trash can. Having taken care of this, Duncan shook off the non-existent dust from his palms and was very pleased with his idea. He then looked at the sky outside the window. The sun, encased in runic rings, hung high in the sky, and at that moment it was just midday. Nina would return home at the end of the day, but before that, he intended to go out and explore the city better. It still doesn't seem like he has anything to do with the antique store. It was chilly, so Duncan changed into a dark brown jacket and tidied up his disheveled hair before leaving the store, keeping his frail body, battered by alcohol, drugs, and illness, looking as fresh as possible. As soon as he was outside, the rustling of wings came from the second floor, and the pigeon eye flew out of the room and landed on his shoulder, shaking his head and triumphantly repeating, to the Erxian Bridge, and then to the Chenghua area. Initially, he planned to leave the pigeon to watch the house. After all, a dove on your shoulder is too noticeable and strange. In any case, there is a connection between him and I, and in case of a dangerous situation, he can use his spiritual flame to call upon him. I just didn't think that I would forget to tell him about it, and he would follow me. Looking at the smug look of the bird, Duncan smiled helplessly and sighed. Forget it. You can follow me if you want. So, taking the pigeon with him, he went out onto the main road near the antique store walked along it for some distance, and heard the ringing of bells and the sound of a steam engine running, looked up and saw a brown double-decker bus with blue stripes that was going down the main road and gradually stopped at a stop nearby. It was the most common form of public transport in the city-state of Prand, powered by a steam engine. For a fare of six pesos, it reached most of the lower district, and, according to the route map on the back of the bus, it made two more stops at the end of its route, at the edge of the upper district, in a block called the Crossroads. Duncan mentally pictured the crossroads and remembered that this neighborhood and its surroundings were considered the juncture of the city-state of Prand, with its thriving businesses and decent housing, and that many residents of the lower district saw it as their goal and dream to rise through the ranks. 
Many middle-class people who couldn't afford the high cost of living in the upper area lived here. The neighborhood also had movie theaters, museums, and some good restaurants. Nina's school was next to Crossroads and the museum she mentioned was also nearby. Thinking about this, Duncan quickly walked towards the bus stop so he could board the bus before it left. The bus was not crowded. More than half of the seats on the first floor were empty, and next to the driver's seat stood a conductor in a dark blue uniform, a young woman with shoulder-length hair and simple makeup, who first subconsciously reached for a ticket when she saw that someone sits down, but then notices a dove on Duncan's shoulder. Sorry, you can't carry pets on the bus, that's the rule, the woman said, raising her hand to point at the pigeon. It also applies to pigeons. Duncan glanced at I, who flapped his wings innocently and looked at him, tilting his head. Climb onto the roof of the bus. The next second, I flapped his wings and flew out of the bus. The young conductor looked stunned at the man communicating with the pigeon, and at the pigeon, which seemed to understand human speech, and remained silent. Now everything is all right? Duncan addressed the stunned conductor, and then raised his hand, pointing in the direction of the roof of the bus. I guess this rule doesn't apply to a bird on the roof of a bus? It took the woman a couple of moments to answer. Oh, yes. The ticket costs six pesos. Duncan reached into his pocket and taking out two coins gave them to the conductor, then found a seat by the window and sat down calmly, ready to enjoy his first ride in this world. The bus started up, followed by a clear ringing bell at the front of the bus before the bus rocked slightly and the scenery outside the window quickly changed. Duncan leaned back comfortably in his seat, feeling the jolts and jerks of the mechanically constructed creation between stops. Steam engines are a good thing, a civilized society is also a good thing, and technological progress is even better. Someday he would have to make one for the lost house, even if it was just a cauldron capable of heating water. In the future, he will at least be able to take a hot bath. He was just indulging in his thoughts when he suddenly felt a sharp jolt, and the landscape outside the window slowly froze. The young conductor opened the window at the front of the bus and shouted, Are you going to get on? There are empty seats. Brought out of his thoughts, Duncan smiled. At that moment, he suddenly felt that this city-state, still unfamiliar to him, was suddenly filled with life. How did ordinary people survive in a world where supernatural visions existed, where pieces of land were separated from each other by an endless sea, and in a city-state defenders and anomalies fought among themselves? Duncan still didn't understand much about life in the city-state, but at least he understood that ordinary people in this world lived in safety and stability. They worked, studied, rested, ran shops, and exchanged goods, went out on their days off to theaters and restaurants, parks and ports, visited museums, and gossiped with neighbors after dinner. In general, they led a not very exciting, peaceful life. The steam-powered bus stopped several times, sometimes at bus stops, sometimes on the side of the road. Passengers got in and out. The silent gentleman driver sometimes talked to the conductor, but was mostly focused on driving, and the young conductor kept glancing at the roof. It seemed that she was still thinking about the pigeon. Duncan sat in his place and watched with curiosity everything around. The lives of ordinary people belonging to this world. It seemed that... Other than the need to know about the anomalies and visions that existed in this world, and to follow this knowledge as a kind of code of safety, life for people in this world was not too different from what he saw on Earth. Near the intersection, the bus stopped again, this time at a stop where many people boarded the bus. Duncan looked with curiosity at the view from here of the smoke and steam pipes towering in the distance, crossing the roofs of buildings, but suddenly he felt a vague sensation of unusual warmth rising in the chest area. This warmth emanated from the amulet of the sun, which he hid on his chest. Duncan, admiring the view, became numb for a moment, and subconsciously touched the place where he hid the amulet, and the next moment he felt that it not only glowed, but also slightly trembling. He didn't understand what was happening, but it was clear that the amulet was resonating with something nearby. He felt the source of this resonance through the connection he had already established with it and the next moment his gaze settled on a figure outside the bus window who quickly made her way through the crowd. The figure was dressed in a black coat and seemed like an ordinary passerby, but the guiding feeling from the sun amulet definitely pointed to this figure. Duncan immediately stood up from his seat and quickly walked towards the door of the bus, and at his command, the pigeon eye flapped its wings, flew off the roof, and landed on his shoulder. The conductor, standing near the door, watched this scene in amazement, and only after Duncan got off the bus she muttered in a whisper, how did he train that pigeon like that? But immediately after this small episode of everyday life escaped the attention of the lady conductor, she turned her head to the passengers who had just boarded the bus. We'll give money for a ticket. Children also need a ticket. This child is taller than one meter. Four years? This can't be four years old. Look, if he crosses this line, he needs to buy a ticket. At this moment, Duncan, however, had already disappeared into the crowd. 
Walking quickly through crowded stops and intersections of passers-by, he followed the figure in a black coat. The man in black walked quickly, and the heavy afternoon traffic on the road made it easy for him to elude searches. And indeed, after a few minutes the figure disappeared from Duncan's field of vision. However, he still felt the resonance of the amulet of the sun, and the guiding sense of its depths constantly pointed Duncan in the right direction. Duncan continued to follow the instructions of the amulet and at the same time thought, Undoubtedly the man in black is very suspicious. The amulet must have sensed something to cause it to react the way it did. Perhaps he sensed the same source of power as that from the true sun god. He already knew from Goathead that the amulet had the ability to recognize its own kind and channel the sun's blessing, but usually only followers of the sun god could use these functions or feel the effect of channeling the amulet. Previously, Duncan used his spiritual flame to gain control of the amulet, but at the time he thought that the flames had destroyed most of the amulet's abilities. But now, it seems that the ability to recognize the amulet remained with him. It is only this recognition that I now use. Using the amulet as a guide, he gradually left the main road, crowded with passers-by, and after several turns he came out onto a deserted footpath. And soon he saw the suspicious figure again. She was quickly walking through the intersection ahead, seemingly completely unaware that she was being followed. Duncan felt that the amulet on his chest became a little hotter than before, and the resonance from it became clearer and stronger. Duncan mentally activated his spiritual flame to read the information coming from the amulet of the sun and many clearly directed sensations immediately burst into his consciousness. These were subtle sensations. Despite the fact that the Amulet of the Sun did not have the ability to think, Duncan felt how it was sending messages to him, a non-believer in the Sun God, with excitement and trepidation about where other believers were. He even wanted to tell the Amulet to be a little more restrained. After all, not so long ago he was the sacred relic of the Sun God. At the same time he became more and more convinced that he was approaching a secret meeting place where many followers of the sun god had gathered. As he had predicted, more and more heretics of the sun were gathering in the dark corners of the city-state, and the people destroyed in the sewers were just some of the cockroach-like cultists. He didn't know what the cultists were up to, but he understood that they must know much more about ancient history, faith in the sun and the age of order than the teachers at Nina's school. To comprehend the deep secrets of the world, he needed to turn to the forces of the supernatural kingdom. And if it was difficult to get close to the cathedral and city authorities by ordinary means, then with the cultists, everything was much easier. Just mix with them. Thinking about this, Duncan suddenly stopped. He came to the end of the path, and the man in black had just disappeared behind the nearest intersection. The signal from the sun amulet was clear and strong, and not a single person was visible nearby. Suddenly, through the amulet of the sun, he felt other brothers approaching his position following a signal. Duncan silently pulled up the lapel of his jacket, hiding half of his face behind the collar. And almost as soon as he did this, he heard several footsteps in the shadows of nearby buildings. One by one, figures appeared in front of him. They were a dozen men, no different in clothing from ordinary townspeople. After all, no cultist would walk around in robes in the middle of a city in broad daylight. Just as an ordinary assassin should not wear a rushing in your eyes a white cloak with a hood and walk around the city in it. Only the warmth and clear signals from the sun amulet convinced him that these people were followers of the true sun god. Duncan looked towards the intersection at the end and saw that the man in black he had been following was also among them. The man was looking at him warily, and the tall thin young man standing next to him whispered something to his companion before looking in his direction. This is private territory. Why did you sneak in here? He said trying to create the impression that we are ordinary townspeople, and you are behaving very suspiciously. And because he didn't understand why Duncan was following him, he didn't take a step or let his guard down. Duncan immediately thought that he was an amateur who was not suited for such a difficult job as surveillance, but also wondered what the cultists would do to him as a stalker if he played dumb. Would they pretend to be a bunch of criminals and scare him off? Or would they kidnap him? Him for his god? For his... You didn't hear me? The tall, thin man said impatiently and frowned and simultaneously with his words, the figures around him took half a step forward, forming a ring around Duncan. I'm asking you. Duncan shrugged and casually took out the amulet of the sun from his pocket. I'm one of you. First we need to try to talk to them. Perhaps this will be more than enough. If they don't believe it, then I'll mix with them. The moment Duncan held out the amulet of the sun, silence reigned for a few seconds. His words hung in the air attracting a dozen pairs of eyes that suddenly and looked at each other warily before a tall, thin man who looked like a leader demanded in a quiet voice, Quickly, put this away. Beware of cathedral spies. They are somewhere nearby. Did the amulet really work, or did my words convince them? Duncan was amused by this, but outwardly he maintained his mysterious pose with a half-covered face, and putting away the amulet said indifferently, 
If there are cathedral spies nearby, then your large group will be more noticeable than my amulet. As soon as he said this, the bearded man subconsciously spoke, No, at best, we will attract a sheriff who will accuse us of disturbing the peace. Quiet. The tall, thin man immediately stopped the chatter of his men, and then his gaze fell again on Duncan. This is a necessary precaution. The city is very unsafe now. Go forward and don't make unnecessary movements. Duncan walked carelessly down the street, and another man carefully looked at him from head to toe. And only after a few minutes of such staring, a tall, thin man quietly asked, Are you a believer living in this city? Duncan thought for a moment and nodded. Yes, the original owner of this body really lived in this city, and now he lives in it. He decided to tell the truth when it came to the obvious. His plan was simple. Find a way to infiltrate the cultists, and then see what information he could get without being exposed. And if they are exposed, allow the dove to transform. A tall, thin man, who did not know about the dangerous thoughts swarming in the head of his fellow believer, asked, As far as I know, a few days ago, the Cathedral of the Depths attacked the gathering place in the sewer a ritual took place there. It got out of control and we lost a lot of people. But I managed to get out. Duncan answered without hesitation, observing the reactions of the people around him. The tense atmosphere among them had clearly eased, and only the tall, thin leader in front of him was still vigilant. Three more escaped with me, but we split up, and now I can't contact the main ones, until I met you, and the sun guided me. The tall, thin man chuckled, and then his gaze fell on Duncan's shoulder. What is this? My pet, Duncan answered casually. Don't you see? An ordinary pigeon. I shook his head and cooed loudly. He's noisy. The tall, thin man seemed to have finally let his guard down. Perhaps because subconsciously he did not think that the priests of the cathedral would move around the city with a bird on their shoulder. Come with me. It's not safe to talk on the street. Duncan sighed with relief. It seemed to him that his first step in the fight against the cultists was successful. He then followed the group of cultists deeper into the alley. The alley was deeper than he expected, and seemed to lead into the most forgotten and shadowy corners of this decaying city. The group of cultists led Duncan in a circle passing through old steam pipes, through sewer channels, and finally into a low, dilapidated complex of buildings. The deeper he went, the darker and decrepit this side of the prosperous city became for Duncan. He thought that the place where he and Nina lived was a lower-class area, but now he suddenly realized that the shabby antique store was a very decent place. Most of the dilapidated houses along the road had long been destroyed and abandoned, but in the shadows of some of them, there was a numb or gloomy look as if homeless people were hiding in this forgotten part of the city, indifferently watching intruders. But, in the end, the scowls quickly disappeared. The dozen or so people being led by a tall, thin man were clearly enough to strike fear into the hearts of the homeless people living here. You see, this is the most prosperous city-state in the endless sea, Prand, said the man in black clothes, which attracted Duncan's attention. He seemed to be saying this to both himself and Duncan at the same time. It's the same everywhere. Wrens, Cold Harbor, and even in the Port of Lightwind, which the elves call the Land of Peace and Justice. They claim that the so-called sun shines justly on the world and brings light and order to all things. But how much sunlight reaches these gutters? Duncan said nothing, only looked up and saw how the pipes for supplying steam and fuel, stretching from the city center and industrial areas, crossed the buildings above his head, like huge valves and entire structures under pressure, located like many strange monsters on the tops of low, dilapidated buildings around them, as sunlight pours through the cracks in these pipes, causing the sewage between the buildings to emit an unpleasant odor. Much of it condensed from steam escaping from nearby pipes, and as the day wore on in the city, it mixed with chemicals from the factories and accumulated in the lower area day after day. Duncan did not have to live long in the city to immediately guess how this abscess appeared. Duncan silently looked at the indignant man in black. His expression remained indifferent, whether under the compulsion of the descendants of the sun or under the influence of the harshness of life, these cultists were born for a reason. But so what? The cultists, who believed that the city had forced them to live in the gutters, came to the lower area and captured the poor who had no one to turn to, after which they sacrificed them. There were many people in that cave, but none of them lived in the upper area. As an outsider who didn't know much about the world, Duncan didn't feel the need to evaluate the city-state. But at least as a former sacrifice, he found the cultists quite unpleasant. In complete silence, he finally reached the cultist's base. It was located underground in an abandoned factory. These cultists, buried in the sewers, always found a suitable one and turned it into their gathering place. Perhaps in this prosperous city there already existed countless sewers suitable for breeding something dark and blasphemous. The group crossed the dilapidated outer wall of the factory and opened the iron gate to the underground facility. Duncan intended to look inside the factory to satisfy his curiosity about the steam age. 
but instead he was led straight to the stairs that led underground, and soon found himself in the cultist's secret base. It may have once been a factory warehouse, an engine room or something like that, but by this time it was deserted and all that remained of the huge room was a system of pipes on the roof and gas lamps on the walls. Dark rooms dangerous, and even the cultists knew this, so they lit the entire room with oil lamps using sperm whale oil. In the light from the oil lamps, Duncan could see that a dozen cultists had gathered here. How could so many sun worshippers have gathered here after the cathedral had struck the sacrificial site? Where did they come from? They are just like moss, appearing where there is a sewer. Duncan looked in amazement at the accumulation of figures in the huge room. The cultists looked at him with curiosity and apprehension, a stranger who appeared out of nowhere, and then a tall, thin man stepped forward, followed by several stronger and taller ones who surrounded Duncan. Duncan frowned. Another search after entering? I didn't know there was such a rule. If you really are a cathedral spy, a search won't help, said the tall, thin man, taking a cloth-like object from his pocket and handing it to Duncan. Relax, this is just a test, a necessary precaution. We have lost many of our brothers over the years for various reasons. Take this and read it after me. Duncan looked at what the man handed him and saw that it was a dirty strip of fabric like something torn from an old shirt with dark brown stains on the surface as if it were dried blood. Is this really another way of testing the believers of the sun? Duncan was slightly surprised and then thought with a sigh that this was indeed a group of professionals who were being hunted all day long. Although he didn't see anything special in terms of combat power, their methods of defending against infiltration surprised him. Then he took what was handed to him and heard the tall, thin man begin to mutter, In the name of the sun, let the light of the Lord shine. The words seemed familiar to Duncan. He had recently heard the cultist say them to him. The cultist even gave him an amulet. Duncan silently raised his finger, and the emerald flame, unnoticed by the others, seeped into the strip of simple-looking fabric in his hand, after which he followed the example of the tall, thin man and said a prayer. The cloth which seemed to be soaked in blood, did not react at all. The tall, thin man's gaze fell on the cloth, and after a long moment he finally nodded softly, smiled, reached out, and took it from Duncan's hand. Welcome back to glory, gentlemen brother. In truth, the cultists behaved quite cautiously. They did not take Duncan at his word just because he pulled out the amulet of the sun, and did not accept his story about what happened in the sewers at face value. They observed Duncan's words and actions on the way here, and even after arriving at this premises, they conducted another check on his identity, the best they could do as a group of cultists in hiding. But all their verification measures concerned Duncan as a normal person. For the captain of the Lost House, they made no sense. The tall, thin leader took an inconspicuous strip of fabric from Duncan, who seemed completely unaware of the changes in the power of the transcendental object, and greeted his new brother, after which he raised his hand and pointed to the corner of the room. Brother, rest over there. You're not the only strange face here. Duncan nodded and headed towards an inconspicuous corner, not taking his eyes off every face that appeared in this room. To his surprise, unlike what he had seen earlier in the sewers, the cultists in the room were not wearing the signature black robes, but normal clothing without hoods to hide their faces. So he curiously asked the believer sitting next to him, shouldn't people hide their faces when they gather here? The believer he addressed looked surprised. Are believers in Pranda supposed to cover their faces at such meetings? Duncan immediately frowned. You are not from Prand. We are from Renz, said another believer next to him completely seriously. The followers of the sun apparently let their guard down after they were convinced that the stranger before them was not a member of the cathedral. We arrived last week, but before we could make contact with the local believers, that attack happened. Are you all from Renz? Duncan was surprised. He finally understood where so many sun worshippers came from in this city after the destruction of their brothers in the sewers. Well, all the people gathered here are fellow citizens from Renz but there are also groups from other city-states. They are scattered in different places. Another believer next to them joined the conversation. Alas, we have all heard more or less about the situation in Prand. For the past four years, that damned consul and the hyenas of the cathedral have been fighting our cause. It hasn't been easy for each of us, but it's all over now. Duncan nodded casually, and immediately after that, he heard the cultist to whom he asked the first question speak again. Gorgeous dove. The corners of Dunk's eyes twitched. He knew that this man was not the only one who had noticed his pigeon. There was nothing strange about the pigeon itself, so to speak. The strange thing was that he came here with him. This is my pet. He helps me in many ways. At the same time, he began to think. The influx of followers of the sun into the city-state of Prand confirmed one of his early suspicions. The Church of the Sun was up to something truly grandiose in the sewers. So this time he had found the right place. At the same time, he understood why the cultists at the meeting did not hide their faces and wore ordinary clothes. In the sewers, hooded robes that conceal their faces 
and a one-line communication system between the lower ranks, are the last resorts to combat the cathedral purges, as well as the possibility of traitors emerging or key members being arrested. And the people gathered in this room had no such experience. After all, they were cultists, not professional special forces. On the other hand, now such disguise was not required, since all those gathered came from the same city-state. They already knew each other, so there was no point in hiding their identities at the meeting. Moreover, in ordinary clothes, it would be easier for them to escape if their base was discovered and disperse among the civilian population of the lower region, where there was no strict control. Thinking about this, Duncan looked around the crowd and suddenly felt that someone's gaze fell on him. He immediately followed his feelings and saw its owner. Ten meters away from him stood a miniature girl with short, dark hair. This beautiful and calm girl, about the same age as Nina, was dressed in a black dress with white lace, and the most striking thing about her was that she wore a dark red ring with an elegant silver bell on her neck, which looked very cute, but at the same time it's a strange time. When Duncan looked away, the girl naturally also looked elsewhere. She tried to do it unnoticed, but Duncan was sure that the look came from her. Why is there such a small child among the cultists? Question after question swarmed in Duncan's head as he examined the girl's dress. For some reason, it always seemed to him that this girl did not fit into the surroundings. A few minutes later, the tall, thin leader of the cultists ordered the door to the basement to be closed, and then walked out into the middle of the room. All eyes immediately turned to the leader, and Duncan, gathering his thoughts, began to follow what was happening. The tall, thin man stood confidently and calmly. A slight smile played on his shadowy face, and then he took something out of his pocket and raised it high. It turned out to be a pale golden mask, the same one worn by the cultist who performed the sacrifice ceremony in the sewers. Pay tribute to the glory of the Lord and meditate on the truth under his gaze, the tall, thin man said loudly and reverently. Bow your head before this blessed mask, and may the protection of the descendants of the sun help guide my brothers and sisters gathered here. All the believers immediately chanted the name of the true sun god, then pressed their hands to their foreheads and bowed their heads in respect, not to the tall, thin man, but to the golden mask, as if it were the body of some higher being, and the man was just the means by which she moved. Duncan also pretended to chant the name of the true sun god, but he did not know it. So he muttered the multiplication table a couple of times and began to carefully observe the movements of the cultists, extracting from their movements the meaning of each part of the ritual. The tall, thin man solemnly put the mask on his face. The next second, Duncan immediately felt that something had changed in this man. He couldn't say exactly what, but it seemed to him that the moment he put on the mask, his aura changed, or an additional shadow was added to his figure. Duncan looked at the golden mask, imitating the shape of the sun, and saw that the lines on it were slowly floating. At that moment, the mask seemed to come to life. It was as if a distant but powerful consciousness was projecting its power onto the mask giving this ordinary object supernatural properties. An ordinary person wearing a mask became a symbol of some divine power. The believers chanted in unison, May the glory of our Lord be eternal. May the truth of our Lord descend upon the earth. By this time, Duncan had recited almost the entire multiplication table, while memories flashed through his head. He had already seen the golden mask on the cultist in the sewers, but he had already completed this process. At that time, Duncan did not understand what was so special about this ordinary-looking golden mask, since he had recently found himself in a new body. He also didn't think about why a masked cultist is called a messenger by ordinary cultists. But now it seems that the so-called mask is a communication device used by the descendants of the sun, who are hiding outside civilization to remotely control their followers and observe the world. Or, to be more precise, some kind of mental projection device. Suddenly realizing that this was a very interesting object, Duncan began to look at the golden mask differently. This thing could have some connection with him. Duncan quickly looked away from the golden mask, and following the example of the simple believers around him, lowered his eyes, pretending to be ready to listen carefully to the prayer. He had not yet heard anything useful, and therefore could not allow himself to be revealed. And a moment after he lowered his eyes, the feeling that someone was looking at him came over him again. Duncan frowned slightly and followed this sensation. And of course, the source of this glance turned out to be a girl in a black dress with a strange bell around her neck. When Duncan looked at her, she quickly turned her head the other way. This made Duncan confused. He was sure that he did not know this girl, and there was no information about her in the memories of the original owner of this body. Why would a follower of the sun god, whom he met for the first time, pay so much attention to him? Maybe because the dove on his shoulder was really gorgeous. After thinking, he heard the voice of the leader of the believers suddenly heard from ahead. 
After the leader put on the golden mask, he became the embodiment of some divine power, and even his the voice seemed majestic. Duncan didn't know if this was because he was consciously controlling his voice, or if the mask was somehow affecting his voice. The prayer is over. The Lord has testified to our devotion and reverence. Grace has illuminated our souls. Brothers and sisters, be grateful that another day of our perseverance in this difficult and dark world has brought us closer to the day when the blazing sun will rise and order will be restored. The golden-masked cultist opened his arms and spoke in a convincing tone before his gaze suddenly fell on the believers and his voice became calm and inviting. But before we continue today's meeting, we would like to welcome two fellow believers, two people who were once trapped in darkness, but fortunately, were guided by the Lord and joined us again. Introduce yourself. Two brothers? Duncan instantly remembered that the leader seemed to tell him earlier that he was not the only strange person in this room. Remembering this, Duncan looked in the direction where the leader was looking and saw a girl in a black dress. For some reason, he was not surprised. You can call me Shirley. The girl took a half step forward and graciously spoke. My parents were believers, but four years ago they were killed by the minions of the Cathedral of the Depths. All these years I have been hiding in a neighborhood called Paracrestock, deprived of any connection with other believers. Fortunately, I found you. She spoke quietly and well-mannered, and it would be difficult to associate such a sweet child with cultists if Duncan had not seen her with his own eyes. Welcome back to us, young sister. The leader nodded, and then looked around at the believers. Shirley's parents were killed during the Great Purge of the Cathedral four years ago. We found their names in the previous year's list. Our other brother will be next. Finally, the cultist's gaze fell on Duncan. Duncan, I live in the lower area. Duncan took half a step forward. I survived the sacrificial ritual in the sewers that disrupted the Cathedral of the Depths a few days ago. He was brief, but quite frank, and the news about the attack of the Cathedral of the Depths on the cult stronghold in the sewers received wide publicity, occupying the front pages of several newspapers, so immediately after his words, Several believers around began to whisper, and the leader nodded and added, This fellow has also passed through. Trial. After the cruelty of those cathedral hyenas, he has found a way to reunite with the Lord. He has a blessed amulet and is trustworthy. At these words from the leader, the ignorant believers turned to Duncan. Some nodded, others sighed, and Duncan continued, covering most of his face, mentally reciting the multiplication table. The show is over. At this moment, the leader finally spoke about the part that interested Duncan. Now let's talk about the main thing. Duncan immediately pricked up his ears. Currently, a huge number of our brothers have gathered in this city-state, including both simple believers with strong faith and powerful clergy. Our power in this city-state is gradually growing, and the day of restructuring the order is near. But it is also certain that the minions of the Cathedral of the Deep have also reacted. Recently, the city-state's authorities have become more vigilant in monitoring visitors, and several of our gathering places have been destroyed by the authorities so it is important that those moving around the city be careful. It is also necessary to slow down the collection of sacrifices, the descendants of the Lord ordered. We have already gathered enough strength, and where there are gaps, the descendants of the Lord will take care of them themselves. The believers around him were so moved that they began to praise the love and greatness of the sun god, and Duncan immediately thought of the ritual he encountered in the sewers. The cultists were indeed using it to gather strength, and it seems that this time even the descendants of the sun themselves participated in the ritual? The forces collected by the cultists are not enough at the moment, since the mayor's office and the cathedral in Prand already knew about their activities. But if the descendants themselves are involved in the matter, then the cultists' plan can come true. And then he heard the leader continue. Currently, our main task is still to determine the exact location of the sun shard. Remember, our goal is to bring the true sun god back to the world, and returning the lost shard is the most urgent part of the process. Sun shard? What the hell is this? Duncan thought. He suddenly felt a wave of anxiety from the dove on his shoulder, a low sound escaping from Ai's throat as he vigorously shook his body. Through the connection emanating from the spiritual flame, he vaguely sensed what the dove wanted to do. He wanted to say, or rather shout to Duncan to take out his battle axe and summon another wave of troops, but he could not speak. Here he was just a dove, and this depressed him. Quiet, Duncan said quietly, rubbing the dove's head with the back of his hand as a sign of reassurance. At the same time, one of the believers who was closer to the leader asked, Is there a way to detect him? The sun shard is currently sleeping, and cannot be detected by any means. The leader shook his head. But the Lord sent down instructions that it should hide near the lower region. Also, due to the fact that new brothers have joined us today, I will explain everything again. According to already available information, the shard should have first appeared in the human world eleven years ago, and, most likely, provoked some kind of widespread supernatural phenomenon perhaps a large fire, abnormal temperature in the whole area, 
and perhaps collective spontaneous combustion of people, mass hallucinations, which is precisely our current line of investigation. The authorities of the city-state have detailed information about supernatural phenomena over the past years. Members of God's great family have been trying to find these records, and perhaps among the ordinary people living in the lower region. There are people who remember the strange things that happened here 11 years ago. Our task is to collect evidence and determine the location of the sun shard. But be careful. All searches must be conducted with extreme caution. Although the authorities have never cared about what happens in the lower region, the hyenas of the Cathedral of the Depths have an unusually keen sense of smell and are already on alert. As the leader explained the current situation to the surrounding believers, Duncan became lost in thought, paying special attention to 11 years ago. 11 years ago, according to the leader, something unusual appeared in the world called the Sun Shard. But Duncan paid attention to this point in time on another occasion. Eleven years ago at the age of six, Nina lost her parents. It seems that this happened due to a fire. Is this just a coincidence? Could they even exist? Duncan tried to make sense of the jumbled memories, but most of them had been lost with the death of the original owner, and he could only remember one or two vague fragments. The original owner running out of the fire with his dying niece in his arms, a burning fire behind him. An unrecognizable building collapses, and in the distance is a distorted and dimly lit city. In the distance, the streets of the city were distorted and dim, like ghosts, with countless crowds of people rushing with shouts and screams. In the end, Duncan did not search his mind for any more memories. Although the original owner of this body truly cared for Nina, and things associated with Nina were some of her fondest memories, years of illness and heavy drinking and drug abuse had taken a toll on them. And by the time the cultist named Ron took his last breath, there were few fond memories of his family left in his numb mind. Only one thing is certain. Eleven years ago there really was a fire in the lower region. A fire that claimed the lives of Nina's parents and forever changed the course of this child's life. This could be a coincidence, but it is more likely that there is a real connection between this fire and the sun shard. The accidental appearance of the shard of the sun led to a fire in the city. Innocent residents died, the child was orphaned, and years later the only surviving relative of the child became one of the cultists searching for that very shard. It seemed that an evil fate was moving around the sun, as if trapped by gravity. At that moment, one of the believers suddenly spoke, interrupting Duncan's thoughts. I asked around among the residents, and no one had heard anything about the fire in the lower area eleven years ago. Instead, someone mentioned that there was a gas leak from the tanks at the factory. The gas that came out of the tank spread over several blocks, causing hallucinations and insanity in many people. This incident even made it into the newspapers of that time. Duncan looked up in surprise and saw that an ordinary-looking woman, a believer, was speaking. But before he had time to think about her words, he noticed that the leader turned his gaze to him. My brother, you are also a local resident. Do you know anything about this? Duncan suddenly realized that he was the center of attention, a good source of information for strangers who were trying to gather information, a local man who lived in the lower Pranda area. Noticing the glances directed at himself, he thought for a moment, and then, having thought of what to say, he replied, I didn't live here eleven years ago, so I don't know the details, but I heard about a leak at the factory. Having said this, he glanced at the woman who had spoken earlier. Eleven years ago, there really wasn't a fire in the lower area? At least from what I heard, yes. The woman nodded. According to what I heard, there haven't been major fires in the lower region for at least twenty years. There were small ones, for example, in the kitchen. But that obviously doesn't count. Duncan nodded. He clearly remembered that Nina's parents died in a fire eleven years ago. He even retained in his head a fragment of the memory of how he carried Nina out of the fire. What happened? Did this body inherit the memories incorrectly? Or did the fire not happen in the lower area? Or the woman simply could not find out what really happened? He was slightly perplexed because this concerned Nina and himself, and he was subconsciously worried about it. And just at that moment, he heard another voice from the other end of the room. A girl named Shirley. Did the leak at the factory eleven years ago happen in the sixth quarter? The sixth quarter? Yes. I think it's in him. The believer nodded. They say that at that time, this led to quite serious consequences, since the chemicals affected many people. Many residents of the lower region still remember this to this day. Several believers next to her nodded in agreement. There's a leak at the factory. The leader, who was in the center of the room, suddenly broke the silence. His low, majestic voice interrupted the conversation between the believers. An industrial accident is most likely a supernatural event disguised by the authorities. It happened exactly 11 years ago. This is a very important clue. The next step is to investigate and find out if the supposed leak at the factory points to the sun shard. The believers immediately nodded in response. And then the masked leader added, In addition, we must focus not only on the supernatural event that occurred in the lower region eleven years ago, but also on the supernatural events that occurred in the Pran City State recently. 
Although the sun shard is currently sleeping, the day of its awakening is approaching, and its activity is increasing every day. Four years ago, our brothers tried to awaken the remnant ahead of schedule, and although this attempt failed, and even brought the Cathedral of the Depths upon us, it was not completely unsuccessful. The rite of awakening further deepened the connection of the shard with the real world. This was enough for him to interfere with reality for a short period of time, which could help us find him. Follow newspapers and rumors on the streets of the city-state. Anything that seems unusual could indicate a sun shard. Don't let any evidence slip through the cracks, okay? As the believers bowed their heads in respect and listened to the order, Duncan noted another key point the leader was making. Four years ago, four years ago, the Cathedral of the Depths in the city-state of Prand truly destroyed the largest stronghold of the sun cult in the city. And this event is said to have been so significant that it has come to be called the decisive battle for authority for the city-state's current inquisitor, Vans. And after that, the city. After this, the sun cultists in the city were forced to go into hiding, and this continued until today. All this time, Duncan only knew superficial information, but now that he knew more, it seemed to him that the truth was that the sun cultists had tried to awaken the sun shard before. Unbeknownst to him, a whole series of hidden truths were revealed before Duncan's eyes. He quickly collected the information he knew in his mind, thinking about how to extract more information from the cultists, when suddenly a strange smell entered his nostrils. It smelled as if sulfur was burning and mixed with the smell of some kind of medicine. The next moment, the ordinary believers around him also smelled a sharp and distinct smell. And while some of them were looking at each other, as if searching for the source of the smell, the leader, standing in the center of the room, instantly reacted and suddenly took out from his pocket an amulet made in the form of the sun, the same as the one Duncan wore, and on it an illusory translucent flame burned on the surface. It was from the flame that a pungent odor emanated. The flames were deceived by the impurities. The leader looked at the burning amulet of the sun, and his voice was suddenly filled with shock and anger. There is a heretic hiding among us. Duncan's first thought was that he had been exposed. Although he did not know how, the sun amulet that the leader wore seemed to identify him as a heretic who did not believe in the sun at all. With these thoughts, he sighed slightly and prepared to release the dove on them. But before he could do this, he heard a sigh coming from the other end of the room. A sigh of relief. The sigh came from the girl in the black dress, Shirley, who shook her head regretfully. I knew that the dog was unreliable, and his disguise would not last even three hours. Before these words could leave her lips, a black flame flashed on the girl's side. It suddenly appeared in the air, black as a shadow. Then on the girl's hand and a second later it spread to almost a third of her body. In the next instant, the right half of Shirley's body seemed to turn into charred firewood. The flames flowed down along it, turning into a black chain and the part that fell to the ground instantly turned into a burning monster with jagged bones. It was a demonic dog, huge, half the height of an ordinary person. Her body seemed to be made of countless twisted and folded bones. Where there should have been flesh and blood, there were black flames and twisting shadows. The head was a jagged and disgusting structure. The dog had no eyes. Instead of them, there was an emptiness filled with a blood-red fog of boundless hunger and anger. A black chain stretched from the huge dog's neck, reaching Shirley's hand and merging with her body. Hound of the Depths, are you a summoner of the Cult of Annihilation? The leader in the center of the room was shocked and angry at this scene. What does it mean? Are you worshippers of the Depths going to fight with the followers of the Sun? As soon as he saw what was happening, Duncan, who was about to stand up and say, I am a spy, immediately backed away and began to watch with interest what was happening. The spy turned out to be a girl in a black dress. She made him feel out of place from the very beginning. Duncan thought that he felt this only because of her age and meekness, but he never expected this. He noticed that the cultist leader mentioned two words, the Hound of the Depths and the Cult of Annihilation. The Hound of the Depths was apparently a black dog that was summoned by the girl, and the Cult of Annihilation did not resemble, in its name, an actual civilian group that could be registered in City Hall. This girl was not a follower of the Sun God, but of another cult. How many other strange cults are hiding in this world? Duncan thought. While Duncan was thinking, the girl who called the hound slightly lifted the black chain, warily examined the room, and then with a sarcastic smile on her lips said, Cult of Destruction. Unfortunately, I have nothing to do with them. Unlike you bastards who have to play dog in front of some evil god in order to sleep peacefully, I only work for myself. You will not deceive anyone with these words. Only the Cult of Annihilation knows how to summon creatures of the depths. I advise you to give up resistance, heretic. You are standing in the domain of the Sun God, and even the Hound of the Depths will not be able to protect you. The leader in the center of the room stared menacingly at Shirley, his voice low and threatening. Tell me, 
What do you want? The cult of annihilation and the followers of the sun are not allies, but we have never been enemies. So why did you infiltrate our sacred meeting while hiding your true identity? I just want to get some information out of your mongrel heads. The corners of Shirley's lips rose. The chain attached to her arm suddenly made a series of clanging sounds and then began to squirm as if alive. And, as I already said, I am not from the cult of annihilation. Before the girl could finish, a crash was heard throughout the entire room, and the oil lamps installed in different parts of it suddenly flared up, as if they had been stirred up by an unknown force. The bright flames of oil lamps instantly illuminated the entire room. The next second, a small ball of fire, like a small sun, rose above each of them and began to emit enormous power. The leader standing in the center of the room forcefully squeezed the amulet in his hand. The sharp spikes on the edge of the amulet pierced the leader's palm. Blood seeped into the amulet and flared up like fat. Soon the flames engulfed the leader's entire hand. This event began after a change occurred with oil lamps. Apparently, the experienced cultist was stalling for time with his words and then unleashed some kind of supernatural power while Shirley was distracted. Surrender, heretic. A threatening voice came from under the golden mask. The power of the sun god engulfed the entire room. I know the power of your cult, your ability to borrow spells from the mouths of the creatures you summon and hurt people with them. The dark breath of the deep hound is indeed fearsome, but this place is sealed, and neither you nor your dog can borrow any power from the deep sea. Duncan clenched his fingers in his pocket, wondering if he should help the girl. Although it all looked like a fight between followers of two cults, the girl named Shirley might know something, and now it became clear that she was in the minority. And then the leader in the golden mask extended a burning palm to Shirley. Clutching the amulet of the sun, the voice from under the mask seemed low and convincing, as if an invisible force was mixed with his voice. Give up resistance, convert to faith in the sun god, tell me everything you know, and the merciful sun will forgive your sins. Get on your knees, young sister, you cannot use a magic spell. However, Shirley seemed to be deaf to his threats. She turned her head, looked at the burning oil lamps, looked at the followers of the sun who took out their swords, daggers, and even revolvers, and calmly asked, it must be difficult for you to maintain this force field, right? The cultist snorted coldly. Hmm, a powerful power bestowed by my lord. Before the words left him, the girl in the black dress suddenly took a step forward. The black chain whistled through the air, and the hound at the end of the chain followed it. A huge hound, several times larger than a normal dog, flew into the air, and then crashed into the chest of the cultist leader with a terrifying sound. There was a clear sound of bones cracking. The cultist leader maintained a force field and did not have time to react, so the dog knocked him down. From her blow, he hit the opposite wall, fell, and lay motionless. Duncan, he didn't expect this. It was too late. The suddenness of the situation took all the cultists by surprise. The followers of the sun waited for their leader's order, and the next moment they saw him hit the wall. Immediately after that, the black chain cut through the air again. Shirley raised her hand again. The black chain clanked, and a strange force threw the hound up. Like a meteorite hammer. The huge dog rushed through the air, making a circle, and a few seconds later, several more cultists hit the wall. This time the cultists finally reacted. Despite their shock, they roared and rushed at the girl, who raised the chain again. A dozen daggers and swords rushed towards her and the answer was the girl's cry. Go to your master, you bastards! As the hound took to the air, the cultists flew back with broken bones. This continued for some time. The chain flies up, followed by a dog, after which some cultist falls to the ground. At this moment, Shots suddenly rang out. The followers of the sun finally found their chance. Convinced that they would never be able to defeat the monstrous girl standing in front of them in close combat, they pulled the trigger without hesitation. Brass bullets cut through the air, two of them hit the chain, and the others, one after another, pierced Shirley's body. Uh-uh. Suddenly the girl began to tremble. The shock and pain of the bullets piercing her body made her freeze for a moment, but the next second, just as the cultists thought that the situation had changed, the sound of the clanking of the chain was heard again. Dog! Help me protect myself from pain! The hound flew into the air, let out a chaotic roar, and in the next second sent the head of the cultist with a weapon flying. As it landed, the hound howled even louder than it had a moment ago. Duncan silently took two steps back, diminishing his presence as he waited for it to end. Now he was most afraid that blood would get on him. Today he put on clean clothes and it would be difficult to explain to Nina what he did if there was blood on her. As for the strong girl, she wouldn't need his help. She was doing a good job on her own. The battle didn't last long. The girl's hound in the black dress was so strong and fast that the basement became a kind of exclusive hunting arena for her. Duncan stood in the corner and mentally recited the multiplication tables for the second time before the fight ended. And by the time all the cultists were lying on the floor, silence had finally reigned in the basement. Shirley finally stopped. 
Clutching the chain that bound the Hound of the Depths, she was breathing heavily, standing in the middle of the room, but suddenly her gaze caught a figure standing in the corner. She finally spotted Duncan, the last of the cultists. Despite her confusion and confusion over the calmness of this eccentric cultist, Shirley headed towards the final target without hesitation. Her hostility was obvious. Watching Shirley walk towards him with a murderous look, Duncan couldn't help but sigh, thinking that this whole situation had really turned against him after all. He was not very alarmed, although in fairness he knew that he had almost no combat experience, and the girl in front of him looked like a strong female warrior who could fight troops just like Zhao Yun. But even so, he did not panic at all. Firstly, he had a pigeon with an incredible ability. This ability affected a small sphere of influence and was used instantly, much faster than he could even take a step. Secondly, he controlled a spiritual flame that could have miraculous effects on everything supernatural, and this flame could even control the Lost House. Would the Hound of the Depths in front of him be more difficult to deal with than the crowd of demons and ghosts in the Lost House? And lastly, the most important thing is that this body is still not his original body. The body that he was using at the moment is nothing more than an avatar. And although physiologically it seemed alive, in essence it was still just a corpse driven by supernatural forces. Duncan didn't need the body to remain physically intact to control it. An avatar in the sewers that had lost its heart could still move. It only required the existence of the body. He suspected that even if his current avatar was dismembered, he would still be able to control it. The only thing he had to worry about was how he would explain everything to Nina if the girl's hound broke all his bones. Thinking about this, he continued to stand and watch as the girl in the black dress walked towards him, as the black chain in her hand swayed in the air, and the strange and terrifying hound slowly, with an elusive step, followed its owner. The girl's hands and cheeks were stained with blood left over from the brutal fight that had occurred earlier, which completely destroyed her calm and obedient appearance, and on the contrary, made her look terribly dangerous. You're not afraid, that's strange. Shirley stopped two or three meters in front of Duncan, frowning at the Disciple of the Sun standing in front of her while her right hand slowly rose. Are you giving up resistance? Duncan thought for a moment. Will you believe me if I say that I'm not with them? Having said this, he poked his fingers into his pocket without moving, allowing the illusory spirit flames to slowly penetrate under his clothes so that the girl could not kill him with the help of the hound. Shirley was stunned for a moment, her blood-stained face slowly appearing like, Are you kidding me? You think I am. Before she had time to say this, a hoarse, low voice suddenly burst out of the bone-encircled throat of the hound following her. I believe. Oh? Shirley looked at her assistant in shock. Dog, did your brains get blown out? This one. Wait. The hound shook her head, then stepped aside and under Duncan's gaze stretched her neck. A loud vomiting sound echoed through the blood-stained room as a terrible demon from the depths of the sea spewed out myriads of caustic tongues of black flame, ash, and dark, acid-like dirt, which fell with a hiss onto the concrete floor, instantly making several holes in it. Duncan watched what was happening indifferently wondering at the same time whether he had correctly understood the shortcomings of Shirley's fighting abilities. The girl was strong, accurate, and had a strange and unpredictable fighting style, but was clearly not suitable for a long battle. The fact is that the way she fights can be tolerated by people, but dogs cannot. For two or three minutes there was an awkward atmosphere, and when the hound finally finished, Duncan asked, Are you okay? The hound immediately lowered her head, her curled tail pressed tightly against her crotch. I thank you for your concern. I hope my rudeness did not stain your eyes. What else needs to be done? If nothing else, we'll leave you. Before Duncan could react to what was happening to the dog, Shirley exclaimed, Are you sure you're okay, dog? Did you really get your brains blown out? Usually you don't talk to people so politely. Duncan already had time to react. He suddenly looked at the fierce and terrifyingly deep hound, and his gaze became serious. According to what he just heard from the Sun God follower, the huge dog in front of him is some kind of demon summoned from the deep sea. No matter what the so-called cult of annihilation was, and no matter what strange things lurked in the deep sea, one thing was clear at the very least. The dog was afraid of it. This demon from the deep, deep sea probably had a different vision from ordinary people. Do you know who I am? Duncan said indifferently. Do you know me? No, no. The Hound of the Depths didn't even look up. Not really, but you must be a great man. There is no doubt about it. Duncan frowned and asked again. In your eyes, I don't look human, do I? The hound hesitated for a moment and looked at Duncan with great caution before hesitantly saying, You look like one or not. Duncan looked away and looked at Shirley who was standing to the side. The girl in the black dress looked at him with disbelief. She had finally abandoned her initial hostility and was replaced by a strong feeling of anxiety and wariness. The girl seemed a little reckless, but clearly not stupid. And after her pet dog showed such an unusual reaction, 
Even the most reckless person would calm down and begin to feel that something was wrong. Calmly pulling the chain, she took half a step back and looked carefully at Duncan. You just said that you are not with them. Yes, Duncan spread his hands. You may not believe me, but I'm a spy too. I believe, Shirley said dryly. This time it was Duncan's turn to be surprised. He suddenly discovered that the impression this girl made on him had changed. At first he thought she was a quiet, good-natured child, but then she showed her cruel side. A few minutes ago he thought she was reckless, one-sided, but now she gave in faster than he thought. What kind of family could raise such a child? Strange thoughts were spinning in his head, but at the same time, Duncan was slightly taken aback by the too dry attitude of the other girl. Having calmed down, he asked, Why did you look at me several times during the meeting? The dog was looking at you, Shirley answered a little reluctantly, but honestly, and I just followed her curious gaze. Dog? And it's all? Duncan frowned and looked at the hound. Did I just hear that cultist mention the cult of annihilation, a church that worships the deep, deep sea? What do you have to do with him? I have nothing to do with them, Shirley said immediately, placing special emphasis on this. It is their business to worship the deep sea. The dog and I know each other for other reasons. Duncan's gaze fell on the chain between the girl and the hound of the depths. According to the information just received, the worship of the deep sea, the ability to summon creatures from the deep sea and their use, seemed to be characteristic of the Annihilation cult. And it was because of the Hound of the Depths that Shirley had summoned that the cultist had concluded that she belonged to the Cult of Annihilation. And although he had paid for his poor decision, Duncan believed that under normal circumstances the cultist would have been right. The only problem was the strange girl in front of him. She seemed to resist being associated with the Cult of Annihilation, even though she could summon the Hound of the Depths. Okay. Duncan shook his head and continued asking, So why are you here? Shirley pursed her lips. She seemed reluctant to answer this question, but the constant signals emitted by the hound next to her made it clear that the simple-looking middle-aged man standing in front of her was extremely dangerous, and that she had better answer. I am, Shirley began, but at that moment there was a bang in the basement and a fireball suddenly flew out from the side. 1. This refers to Zhao Yun's single-handed battle with an enemy army in the historical novel Three Kingdoms, during which he killed 50 enemy generals. P.S. Illustrations have been added to chapters 2, 3, 11, 28. The next second, a roar was heard in the room and a fireball suddenly flew out from the side. But Duncan managed to react before it got close. His senses were faster than his body. Sensing an unusual energy appearing in the room, he subconsciously raised his hand to block it. He felt a slight burning sensation at his fingertips, and in the next moment, the spiritual flame rushed towards the fireball. When the fireball reached Duncan's hand, it had already turned a dark emerald color and became obedient. Grabbing the fireball, which had turned into an emerald-colored spiritual flame, and slowly turning his head, Duncan looked in the direction from which it had come. As soon as he looked away, the hound named Dog jumped back, leaving a gaping hole of shadows and black mist where he landed. The hound jumped into it without hesitation, pulling Shirley with her, who spat several bloody bullets onto the ground before disappearing into it. The next moment, the dog and woman disappeared. Duncan looked back in surprise at the sound but could only see the hem of the girl's dress disappearing into the hole. A strange team consisting of a dog and a woman took advantage of this situation and escaped. But he still had a lot of questions, and all because of a sudden vile attack by some unusually tenacious cultist. Duncan's mood soured. He looked again in the direction where the fireball had come from and saw a masked cultist leaning against the wall, holding his arm up with the last of his strength. He seemed shocked that the fireball he had summoned had not only been caught, but even gained control over it, and his eyes could be clearly seen dimming through his golden mask. It's a bad habit to not finish after a fight, muttered a darkened Duncan as he slowly walked towards the wounded cultist. In his hand, the eerie emerald-colored ball was still obediently burning, and the power emanating from it silently spread throughout the room. With every step Duncan took, the oil lamps and torches placed throughout the room seemed to be affected by something. One after another, the dancing flames turned an eerie emerald color, and in the light of the approaching eerie flames, the masked sun cultist felt such intense fear as he had never felt before. He felt his connection with the sun god rapidly weakening, and as lamp after lamp left his control, the sun god's gaze left his soul as quickly as ice melts on a spring day. Finally, from under the mask, a voice trembling with fear was heard. You are not an ordinary heretic, who are you? The last light turned into an emerald flame as Duncan stopped in front of the cultist. His head bowed slightly, and his face looked eerie in the light of the spiritual flame. Impolite, interrupt until I finished asking. Didn't your parents ever teach you this? As he spoke, he noticed the state of the son's follower. He felt that he had been wrong to blame Shirley. The cultist's chest was dented, and the broken ribs may have even punctured the heart and lungs, undoubtedly a fatal injury. 
The cultist was alive only because he was saved by some powerful and bizarre force, perhaps the same sun god, as the cultist called him. But even so, it was clear to Duncan that the life was rapidly draining from his body. With every breath he took, he became weaker and weaker, and that his death was inevitable. Although he didn't know the reason, it was clear that the sun god's blessing was rapidly leaving the cultist. It seems that the blessings bestowed by the sun god are not very reliable, Duncan thought and shook his head. Your lord has abandoned you, he said to the cultist. He said this casually and did not expect that these words would provoke the dying cultist. He flushed with rage, and to Duncan's surprise, suddenly pulled out a bloody strip of cloth from his sleeve. I offer this body to the Lord. May the sacred cloth purify the heretic before me, the cultist shouted, blood staining his golden mask as he raised the sacred cloth high in his hand and made the most radical and insane sacrifice to his Lord. He sacrificed himself to ignite the sacred cloth. He intended to die with the heretic who had taken control of his flame. Duncan just calmly looked at this latest insane victim. Although the cultist really amazed him when he suddenly pulled something out of his sleeve, he remained indifferent when he saw what it was. It was the same strange fabric that was used to verify his identity when he had just entered the room, only he did not expect it to have such a big name as Sacred Cloth. As Duncan expected, nothing happened to the fabric, and the cultist's sacrifice before death did not awaken any miracle. Confusion flashed in the eyes under the mask when the cult minister, barely able to stand, looked in despair at the sacred relic in his hands and coughed up another portion of blood in disbelief. I offer this body to the Lord. I guess that's what you want. Duncan looked away, shaking his head and raised his hand, pointing at the bloody strip of fabric. The next second, an emerald flame flared up on the pallet. The spiritual flame ignited the sacred fabric, ignited the blood that the cult minister coughed up, ignited the flesh and blood of this madman, and the cult minister hissed in shock and anger. No, 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 must be. The Lord will not turn away from me. The Lord will not turn away from me. The Lord God will punish you for this. Who the hell are you? Soon, in the midst of the blazing fire, the priest's voice finally died down, the life force supported by the supernatural force ultimately preventing him from resisting the flames that were burning his soul. Or rather, it was due to the presence of this supernatural force that he was reduced to ashes. As the spiritual flame died down, the cultist was completely burned leaving behind only pieces of clothing and a golden mask imitating the shape of the sun. Even the so-called sacred cloth was burned to ashes in the flames. Duncan frowned. To be honest, this was not the first time he had seen a corpse. The sacrifices he had seen in the sewers had steeled his nerves. So at the moment he was only slightly surprised. Normally, his spirit flames only affected supernatural objects, as he tested on various objects from the Lost House. These objects, shrouded in flames, came under the control of Captain Duncan. But ordinary objects, for example, a piece of paper, cannot be influenced by the spiritual flame. In fact, everything happened on his initiative. He was afraid that the cultist might actually do something with the cloth. So out of caution he ordered him to burn it, and judging by the results, it carried out the order in good faith. But he did not expect that the spreading flame would burn the cultist to the ground. This did not correspond to the conclusions he came to after the tests. It is normal that the fabric burned since it was a supernatural item. It is also normal that the cultist's clothing survived, since it was clearly mortal, and the spiritual flame could not affect ordinary objects, like a phantom in a parallel dimension, unless it itself the clothes were not enchanted or woven from any unusual material. It is quite natural that the golden mask remained untouched, since Duncan showed great interest in this apparently supernatural object, and gave orders, as soon as the flames began to spread to prevent its damage. But why did the cultist burn to the ground? Duncan sat down in confusion, carefully studying the gray-black ash left after burning the tissue. Duncan had never tested his flames on a living person, let alone used them to take a person's life. This cult minister could be considered the first real victim of his flame. At least the first real victim under his conscious control. Slowly, a bold thought came to Duncan's mind. Could it be that a mortal who received a blessing for worshipping a certain god could be considered a supernatural entity? Duncan's speculations bore no fruit, for now he had no idea where to find a second still breathing follower of the sun to test his conclusions. In such matters, fate was everything. Duncan slowly stood up, watching lamp after lamp of ethereal emerald spiritual flame sway in the enclosed space, thought slowly stirring in his head again. One who believes in gods and receives blessings may be considered a supernatural entity by the spiritual flame. But what about ordinary people? Does fire have a greater effect on ordinary people than the surface effects of light and shadow? If not, how strongly must a person believe in God in order to be considered a supernatural entity and for the flame to have an effect? A cultist who believes in an evil God may burn, but what about one who believes in a good God? 
Duncan calmly looked around at the eerie lights in the room and suddenly smiled faintly. They are people. And then all thoughts stopped occupying him. And he did not develop this thought further. The flame was a powerful force. And a powerful force in itself is innocent. But a weak will can most likely lead to its depravity. Duncan had reminded himself of this ever since he discovered that he possessed power far beyond his imagination. Despite Captain Duncan's reputation and the power of the spiritual flame, he had to constantly remember the limits of humanity. He couldn't treat people as beings just to test or master his power, even in another world, even if he didn't always deal with people in the normal sense of the word. It was one thing to strike in battle, quite another to seek out the weak to satisfy curiosity. Duncan exhaled loudly and looked at the ball of dark emerald fire that was still burning in his hand and waved his hand to dispel it. The flame obediently obeyed his order and dissipated into the air without a single sound. Duncan smiled. He was and will always be the master of this flame. When the flames dissipated, the situation in the room quickly returned from an eerie state to normal. One by one, the lamps, engulfed in eerie emerald lights, returned to their bright, original appearance. Duncan looked around the chaotic scene and wondered what to do next. A strange girl named Shirley had disappeared, escaped in some unusual way, and he knew nothing about it, and had no idea where to look for her, which was very annoying. He still had many questions he wanted to ask, but the opportunity was lost. But Duncan always felt that someday he would meet the girl again. This was not an unreasonable assumption, because he understood that the girl's goal was to find out what was happening with the Cult of the Sun, to extract something from the cultists. Recently, the Cult of the Sun has been very active in the city-state of Prand. So there will be countless more such gatherings, and with the way Shirley and the dog behave. Sooner or later they will make a noise in the city. Duncan carried with him an amulet of the sun, which allowed him to sense the activities of the sun cultists in the city. Although he didn't have much range at the moment, if he had nothing better to do than walk around the city, he might stumble upon something new. As for this chaos, Duncan did not intend to do anything with it. He simply picked up the golden mask left by the cultist from the ashes on the ground, and carefully wiped the ashes and dust from its surface, it would become his trophy, which he would take to his future, lost house to explore. The cultist was burned to ashes, and all of his supernatural possessions turned to ash. The mask became the only relic that he left behind in this world. An amulet the size of a palm is, of course, wonderful, but its size, Duncan muttered thoughtfully, holding the mask for a few moments. Besides, it can be detected by special means if I meet a professional from the Cathedral of the Depths. It would be difficult to get the mask safely to the antique store, and even if he did, there was a chance that Nina would find it and make a mess. Therefore, it is best to immediately take her to a safe place. Thinking about this, Duncan looked back at the dove sitting on his shoulder, and he had a completely new idea. Could this dove return him to the lost house without him? The dove raised its head and stared at Duncan. Eighty for a sledgehammer, forty for a small hammer. Duncan cheered up. Consider it overtime. Later I'll find a way to make french fries for you, but for now, try to carry this mask aboard the Lost House. The dove flapped its wings and flew to the mask in Duncan's hand, uttering a characteristic shrill female voice. I would refuse, but you are offering too much. Before the words had left his beak, Duncan saw a flash of light and shadow, and then both the dove and the mask disappeared from his field of vision, while in the depths of his mind he clearly sensed Eyes Aura suddenly appearing in the captain's quarters of the Lost House. The time delay was barely a second. So fast. So he could always teleport things that quickly? As soon as Duncan sighed, I suddenly appeared out of nowhere, flapped his wings, and from his inanimate form turned into a white dove, arching his neck triumphantly. Teleportation successful! Duncan looked at the dove when it reappeared in front of him and mentally nodded, deciding that everything was logical. In his other form, I was much faster. He then straightened his clothes, making sure there was no blood left on them, and no traces at the scene. In fact, he hadn't touched anything since he went inside, for fear of leaving fingerprints or something like that. After which he carefully opened the iron door, wrapping his clothes around his hand, and returned outside along the stairs. The sun, enclosed in runic rings, was already sinking to the horizon, and the magnificent evening luminary was spreading across the disorderly roofs of the lower region, against which a pale crack was already visible in the uppermost part of the sky. Duncan took one look at the sky and abandoned the idea of continuing to explore the city. Nina was returning home from school. To her, Uncle Duncan was just beginning to recover, and so there was no way he could walk outside at night. Duncan walked quickly away from the abandoned factory, following the route he remembered, towards the main road, through winding alleys and through a strange-smelling intersection of pipes and wastewater. After a while, he finally heard the faint sound of traffic in the distance. It wasn't dark yet, so he had to catch the last bus. But suddenly halfway, Duncan stopped. Ahead, at an intersection, he saw four men in uniform, 
Two of them were in dark blue uniforms with shoulder straps, batons in their hands, and revolvers on their belts. The other two were in black raincoats, in shape somewhere between a coat and formal wear, with a large revolver holster visible at the waist and a steel sword that seemed out of place. The two men in long black cloaks had another notable item hanging from their belts, what appeared to be a lantern with runic decorations, apparently used for patrolling at night. The four uniformed men at the intersection seemed to be handing over their work, and Duncan paused for a moment, quickly realizing that they were the sheriffs at City Hall and the Cathedral Guards. The sheriffs maintained order in the city during the day, the guards protected the peace of the city-state at night, and now the sun was going down, and the time was coming when day and night replaced each other, a time when the secular and the divine exchanged places. This is a unique sight in this world. The four men did not seem to notice Duncan. Duncan calmly approached them. He hesitated for a moment, but then it dawned on him that he had a clear conscience. For law-abiding citizens, walking on the street while it was still dark was not a crime. One of the cathedral guards, who was conducting the handover ceremony, finally noticed a figure approaching him. The tall young man, seeing Duncan, raised his head and immediately waved his hand and shouted in warning, Citizen! It's almost dark. Go home as soon as possible. It's not safe here. Gentlemen, I'd like to tell you something, Duncan said with particular sincerity, quickening his pace and approaching them. I heard noises coming from the abandoned factory over there, and saw a lot of strange people coming in and out of there. Having said this, he paused and added, I was reading the newspaper recently, and it said that people should actively report unusual gatherings and unusual sounds around them. Before the last rays of the sun disappeared over the horizon, Duncan saw the familiar facade of an antique store. The gas lamps on both sides of the road were already lit. A slightly yellowish light illuminated the sign ahead and the gray walls. There were lights in the windows on both sides of the door, and Duncan realized that Nina had already returned home. She had turned on the light on the first floor and was waiting for his return. Technically speaking, from Duncan's point of view, he had only recently met Nina, but for some reason, he inexplicably felt like apologizing when he saw the light on the first floor. Is this feeling due to the fact that I have not returned for a long time? Duncan stepped forward and pushed the door of the antique store. The bell hanging in the doorway jingled distinctly, and the next moment he heard hurried footsteps coming from the direction of the stairs. A girl in a long simple dress came down the stairs as if driven by a gust of wind. Uncle Duncan! Nina stopped on the stairs and looked at Duncan, who appeared at the door with surprise and delight in his eyes. I thought you were here again today. I went into town and didn't notice that it was already getting dark. Duncan shook his head. Sorry, I was going to pick you up from school in Crossroads, but then I had an accident. Have you been to Crossroads? Nina looked at Duncan from head to toe in surprise and confusion, as if wanting to make sure that her uncle was not drunk again or was not suffering from the effects of drugs. Pick me up from school. Uncle Duncan again showed himself from a strange, but at the same time familiar side, and Nina did not know how to react to this. I was just a little curious how you were doing at school, Duncan replied casually. Well, enough about that. Don't worry. I won't drink or meet with friends anymore. If I come back late in the future, it will be because I'm busy with business, okay? Nina watched in awe as Uncle Duncan entered the house and closed the door, and subconsciously nodded as she watched his confident, energetic gait. It's late. Duncan turned to Nina. Have you eaten? Not yet, Nina answered a few moments later, perhaps because she was still uneasy about the change in her uncle. I saw that you were not at home when I returned, and I didn't know if you would come back tonight, so I haven't cooked dinner yet. But I bought some bread and got ready. Bread alone isn't enough. Let's go. There's something tasty in the kitchen. Duncan was about to climb the steps when he suddenly turned to Nina and smiled. Today I'm cooking. Is Uncle cooking? Nina thought she heard something completely unimaginable. But before she could ask, she saw that Uncle Duncan was already climbing the steps, and she had to follow him. At the same time, she noticed a dove sitting firmly on Duncan's shoulder, and was a little surprised. Uncle, was this dove with you? Yes, he is very affectionate, Duncan answered casually. Oh yes, I named him I. I? What a strange name for a dove, Nina ruffled her hair. She went up to the second floor and watching as Uncle Duncan literally headed to the kitchen, finally couldn't resist asking, Did you buy anything? Actually, only dried fish, Duncan said, finding dried fish, which he put away in the kitchen cabinet, after which he waved it in front of Nina with a very smug expression on his face. It doesn't look very appetizing, but the soup with it will be very tasty. Fish? Nina's eyes widened in surprise. What day is today? The fish is so expensive, isn't it usually? She finally saw the dried fish in Duncan's hands. Its strange appearance confused the girl, and she asked, What kind of fish is this? Why didn't I see it before? Duncan knew very well that Nina's reaction would be exactly like this. Of course, the inhabitants of the city-state had seen the fish before, although the endless sea was dangerous, and in the depths there were dangerous creatures called descendants who threatened the safety of people. 
not all the waters were so strange. Thanks to the patronage of the gods and the city-state itself, there were a lot of fish in the shallow waters located near the city-state. These shallow waters and the few divinely blessed shipping routes were relatively safe, and they provided valuable resources for the city-states. People collected seafood and minerals from coastal areas and hunted fish of high industrial value, such as whales, along routes protected by the gods, which provided the livelihood of the city-state and supported its industries. Based on this, in this world, of course, there was also the profession of fishermen. But the sea of this world is not like those on earth, and even safe waters are safe compared to the depths of the sea. So even fishing in this world is highly specialized, exciting and complex a task requiring extraordinary knowledge and combat skills. Fish is a well-known but expensive ingredient for those who live in city-states, even if they are surrounded by the sea, and even if there are countless fish in it. Nina had not eaten fish for many years, even before her uncle's illness, and commoners like her did not have many chances to see fish on their table. Fish in general were very rare, not to mention a gift from the depths. Duncan even suspected that the fish he caught at the Lost House first appeared in the city-state of Prand. Even the city-state's consuls and high-ranking clergy of the cathedral did not speaking of Nina. I didn't have a chance to try her. Today, Nina was in for a treat. It doesn't matter what kind of fish it is. The main thing is that it's edible. Duncan knew that some things cannot be explained, so he simply turned back and began preparing tonight's dinner. The strange fish was a decent size, even when dried. It would be too much for soup, so he divided the fish into two parts, intending to use the head part first. The rest could be tied with a rope and hung in the cupboard, where it might acquire a more pronounced flavor after further drying. Uncle really started cooking. As she watched the familiar figure bustling around in the kitchen, Nina felt like she was dreaming. She didn't care about the strange fish that her uncle brought. She didn't even care about today's dinner. It was the change that had happened in her uncle that deserved her attention much more than these little things. There was the sound of a knife hitting a cutting board, then the hiss of a gas stove and the gurgling of water at the bottom of a pan. And Nina was in some kind of trance. She had not seen such a sight for many years. For a moment, a hint of indecision flashed across her face, but then... As if suddenly deciding, she said to the busy man standing in the kitchen, Uncle, Mr. Morris will come tomorrow. To our home. Home. Duncan, busy with cooking, froze at these words. Mr. Morris, is this your history teacher? Nina nodded. Yes. Will a teacher from this school come to the student's home? Duncan poured the processed pieces of fish into the frying pan and looked at Nina in surprise, putting the knives in the sink. I thought this was a feature only for those schools that are located in the city center. The school doesn't really have such a rule. Nina said carefully, paying attention to Duncan's attitude. But old Mr. Morris is a little more special. He pays attention to increased attention to students. Duncan was silent for a moment. This slightly exceeded his expectations. He did not think that he, Captain Duncan, would suddenly have to face such a situation while staying in the city-state. He considered the possibility of a clash with the cathedral, with the sheriffs, even with all the forces of the city. Whether he liked it or not, his plans included the spiritual flame, the sword, and a hundred or two guns of the lost house. But he never considered the possibility of an old man teaching history in a public school coming to his house. And why is reality always so unexpected? Thought Duncan. Uncle? Nina looked a little worried when she saw that Duncan did not answer for a long time. Are you against it? Then I can talk to old Mr. Morris. In fact, I already told him today that you are unwell and will not agree. Duncan looked at Nina's excited reaction and thoughts swarmed in his head. It seemed that this was not the first time this Mr. Morris had asked Nina for a home visit. How many times did Nina refuse for the same reason? He teaches history, doesn't he? Duncan asked unexpectedly. Although she didn't know why her uncle asked this question again, Nina still nodded. Yes, that's good. It so happens that I need a professional in the field of history. Duncan smiled. What time will he arrive tomorrow? The appearance of a scientist who somehow turned out to be a history teacher in a regular school. A teacher who knew a lot about ancient history and seemed to maintain a good relationship with Nina was an unexpected situation for Duncan but it also represented yourself an opportunity. Old Man Morris's achievements in his field of knowledge should have helped Duncan understand many of his questions. And if he can find a common language with such a specialist, this may be useful to him in the future in an unexpected capacity. An authoritative old scientist should have a certain weight in the city-state. Nina didn't know why her Uncle Duncan suddenly agreed, and she didn't even think about it, she just felt unusually happy. In this state, she even had an illusion, as if her life was really changing for the better gradually returning to the past. The night was thickening outside the window. The pale, cold glow of the creation of the world was reflected on the windowsill of an antique store on the second floor. It was the silence of the night. The whole city was silent. In a world filled with strange and bizarre things, the vast majority of people had virtually no nightlife. Go eat. 
Duncan called his niece, who was looking out the window. He brought fish soup to the table, as well as the bread that Nina had bought that afternoon and the onion rings that he had just fried. He didn't think it was a great meal, but given the special nature of the fish, it might have been a feast in the lower region. You have to get up early for school tomorrow. Oh yes, Uncle Duncan. Nina nodded and obediently headed to the table, from which the aroma of fish soup was already emanating. She raised her nose in surprise and looked at Duncan with some disbelief. It smells so delicious, Uncle. When did you learn to cook so well? Can this be called good? Duncan couldn't help but grin, thinking that his culinary skills were only slightly better than Alice's, and he was already rated as a good cook. Was I bad at this before? Well, I wouldn't say so. Previously you cooked according to the standard just so as not to die, and you were always ambitious in exploring new foods, even though you weren't very good at it, and you always forced me to eat them, even though they looked like poison. Remembering the old times, Nina frowned slightly. One day you cooked something so bad that you couldn't eat it yourself, so you threw it in the trash and dragged me to the family restaurant down the street to cook lunch. And when you returned, you saw the neighbor's dog lying on its back in front of the trash can. Since then, this dog has been avoiding you. At the last sentence, Nina's voice dropped. Forget about it. It was many years ago, and you never liked it when I remembered it. Duncan was silent. In the memories that remained from this body, nothing remained of what Nina remembered. These were almost the only good memories that Nina retained of the time spent with her uncle, but they completely disappeared from his mind with the latter sigh from the original owner of the body. Nina silently broke the dry, stale bread and softened it a little in the fresh broth. Duncan suddenly reached out and patted the girl's hair. Nina raised her head in surprise. Uncle, your uncle has succeeded in his research on a new dish, Duncan said in a serious voice. Nina looked at Duncan with confused eyes, her expression changing several times, thoughts swirling in her head before it all culminated in a subdued smile. You look so funny when you're serious, uncle. Don't laugh at adults. Duncan looked at Nina, and then, as if suddenly remembering something, he said casually, By the way, I'm going to clean up the store, so if you see anything strange and unknown on the first floor, don't touch it. This was in preparation for the next journey between the two places. As I's abilities develop, he will have to transfer items between the lost house and the antique store more often, and it will be difficult to hide this from Nina's eyes. So it is better to take precautions. Nina did not doubt this for a second and nodded quickly, and Duncan continued. In addition, I plan to hire a few more employees at the store so that there will be someone to replace me in case I leave. This, of course, is just the initial plan, and it won't necessarily come true. I just want you to know in advance in case you find it strange one day if you suddenly see a stranger in the store. This time he was setting the stage for Alice's arrival, and that was all. There were many other things to consider in order to bring the doll lady to the city-state, and transporting her was only the smallest part of the process. He must think about how to hide her identity. Fortunately, in appearance, she resembled a very ordinary person. The joints of her hands can be covered with long gloves, and her face can be hidden with a veil. All these are minor problems. The real problem was her head. He wanted to bring Alice here to help him, and he didn't want her to spend her days hanging her head in front of people. Nina, on the other hand, gave Duncan an astonished look. Uncle, are you really going to hire employees? This is an important matter. Do you have anyone in mind? What kind of person is this? Duncan thought for a moment, trying to get a long list of not very nice adjectives out of his head, but then he grew gloomy. There is a hard-working young lady. When he thought about Alice again, it seemed to him that the only positive word left to describe her was hard-working. Then he noticed a subtle expression on Nina's face. The girl looked her uncle up and down several times before finally breaking down. Young lady? Uncle. You. Duncan was a man of the past. Taking one look at Nina, he understood what she was thinking about, and immediately tapped his finger on the table. Eat your dinner. What are you thinking about? Nina immediately bowed her head to the plate and, uttering a quiet he-he-he, continued to eat. Taking a bite from the fish, she opened her eyes wide in surprise. This is delicious. Duncan laughed, then broke off some bread and threw it to the pigeon, who paced along the table next to him, saying, Eat, there's more in the kitchen. On the small ground floor of the antique store, Nina and her uncle Duncan finished a simple and long-awaited dinner. After everything was put away, Duncan called out to Nina, who was about to go to her room to rest. He wanted to clarify something. Nina. He looked at the girl who had just left the kitchen, putting away the cups and plates. I want to ask you something. Huh? Nina became a little curious. About what? Do you remember from your childhood? Duncan carefully considered his words, remembering the information he heard at the meeting of the cultists. It happened when you were six years old. Nina frowned, not understanding why her uncle suddenly remembered an old incident eleven years ago. But she still thought about it. Eleven years have passed, and she was only six years old at the time, and therefore when she remembers the past, she becomes sad. 
I was so little then that I don't remember much. I only remember that there was chaos there and adults were lying everywhere. Some people said there was a factory leak near Crossroads. Some said there was a riot on 3rd Street. And some said something was going on in the uptown area. I didn't understand it at the time, but I heard adults talking about it. Duncan thought and looked into Nina's eyes. So, do you remember the big fire? I ran away from the fire with you and your parents were in that fire. He only mentioned it briefly, but to his surprise, Nina's eyes widened. Fire? Do you remember the fire too, uncle? Of course I remember. Duncan looked at Nina's reaction and realized that something was wrong here. What's wrong with that? I also remember the fire. A big, big fire, Nina said hastily and a little excitedly. But then I told the adults around me about it, and they didn't remember it. They all said that I was just scared, and there was no fire anywhere. And then, when I grew up a little, I found a newspaper from that time. At this point, she paused and slowly shook her head with a strange expression on her face. But even the newspaper did not say anything about the fire. All the records said that there was a leak in the factory and the chemicals caused a wide range of hallucinations. Nina went to her room to sleep. In this world, most people went to bed early and woke up early. The hours after sunset were dangerous. The flickering light of the creation distorted the entire world to the limit. And even if the city was protected by lights, people still had to greet the night with caution. They couldn't go out and gather, they couldn't have fun. And while reading books at night wasn't as dangerous as reading at sea, it could easily lead to mental exhaustion, hallucinations, and sometimes attract unwanted prying eyes, so that, all things considered, the safest option was to go to bed early and wait for the sun to rise the next day. Duncan, however, did not feel like sleeping at all. Having turned off the lights in the house, he stood at the window in his shirt and admired the night view of the city-state of Prand, remembering his conversation with Nina after dinner. Nina remembered the fire, as well as this body, a fire during which he escaped from a burning building with a six-year-old girl, and the distant streets were engulfed in human frenzy and fog. However, only the two of them remembered the fire. Nina talked about it with other adults, but they did not believe her words, calling them an erroneous childhood memory after a fright, and newspapers eleven years ago clearly recorded the truth. At that time, on the border between the Lower Pranda District and the Crossroads, a factory leak that causes mass hallucinations. Duncan frowned slightly. The second suspicion in this case concerned him. According to Nina, Uncle Duncan also did not remember the fire. She was the only one who remembered him all this time. Uncle Duncan was one of those adults who believed that she was just scared and was remembering everything wrong. But now Duncan remembered the fire. These were the deepest memories of the original owner of this body. What's the problem? Why in Nina's memory did her uncle not remember the fire, but I found a corresponding image deep in the memory of this body? Was her uncle lying all this time? Or was this memory sealed until I took over the body? Duncan thoughtfully tapped his fingers on the window glass, silently building a chronology of events in his head. He was piecing together information about the sun shard that he had received from cultists. Eleven years ago, the sun shard first appeared in the city-state of Prand and caused a supernatural phenomenon that could affect a large area. Eleven years ago, Nina was orphaned, and her and Duncan's memories included a huge fire that occurred in the lower area. But no one else remembered this fire, and there is no evidence that it even happened. After this, the Sol Shard seemed to go into hibernation, and the only record of an event that year was the factory leak. For several years, Nina lived with her only relative. Four years ago, followers of the Sun God in the city-state of Planned attempted to prematurely awaken the sleeping Sun Shard and performed a dangerous sacrifice but the ritual was interrupted by the newly minted Inquisitor Vanna, the forces of the Cult of the Sun. God suffered greatly, and after a massive purge they were driven out of the city-state. But although the ritual did not reach its final stage, it is possible that the cultists' attempts had some effect, and after that, the Sun Shard began to slowly awaken. Around this time, an uncle dependent on Nina fell ill with a strange disease and fell under her spell, eventually succumbing to the temptation of the remaining Sun Shard in the city and becoming a minion of the cult. Shortly before this, news of the activities of the Sun Shard began to attract cultists back to the city, and the cultists, who had been in hiding for four years, decided to resume their rituals. And then, Duncan appeared. Throughout the timeline, many events seem vaguely connected, although there is no critical evidence for this. The most suspicious is the event eleven years ago. What supernatural vision caused the Sun Shard? Did that fire really happen? Did the authorities of the city-state erase the truth about the accident and destroy traces of the fire? And then, in order to maintain order, they declared it all a mass hallucination caused by a leak at the factory. But this did not explain why everyone had no memory of the fire, unless the authorities made efforts to change the memories of everyone involved in the incident. And one more thing, in a world where anomalies and visions are open to the public, where even children are aware of the existence and dangers of the supernatural, 
and where the authorities govern the city with a policy of announcing dangers in advance so that citizens have the common sense to protect themselves if it is real. It was just a fire caused by a supernatural force. Why did they hide it? Unless there was a larger problem behind this fire, so serious that even just publicizing it would cause some element of danger to get out of control. Duncan suddenly frowned. Or there was another possibility. The bizarre nature of the supernatural phenomenon was such that in many cases the damage it caused was not limited to the physical plane, but could even distort human perception to such an extent that the evidence that was already on paper was distorted. What if people's memories, their perceptions, and even the records of the authorities of the city-state and the cathedral about this event were influenced by the shard of the sun? Duncan felt that being new to the field of anomalies and visions, he had gone too far in his speculations, but on the other hand, he could not stop thinking about it. People's memories, government records, even what was written in black and white in the archives more than ten years ago could be distorted. He might not have believed it before, but now he believed it more than anyone else. Because the place he was in was now called Duncan's Antique Store. Everyone here knew their old neighbor, Mr. Duncan, who owned the antique store. Duncan breathed a sigh of relief and looked down through the second-floor window onto the gas-lit street. Now there was only one question left. Regardless of whether the fire existed eleven years ago or not, whether the sun shard affected the memory of people and the records left behind by the city-state. The main thing was only one thing. Why did Nina remember the fire? Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk in the center of the city, in a house owned by the consul. Vanna woke up from a nightmare, but this time the nightmare no longer had anything to do with the dark sun or the lost house, which had returned from subspace. She suddenly dreamed of her childhood. On that night of fog, smoke, blood, and maddened crowds, when she was twelve years old, she was carried on the back of her uncle running away from the crowd. In the dream, it was as if she was back in that helpless, vulnerable state, her pride in her martial arts skills and great magical abilities being in vain. She could only run, pursued by the crowd in the shadows, through the pipes and valves above the factory with her uncle, looking down in horror at the city, shrouded in smoke, and an endless sea of U-200-B-U-200-B fire. The young inquisitor, dressed in a nightgown, sat up in bed, took a deep breath and looked out the window at the sky. The clear radiance of the creation of the world was still hanging high in the sky, and the wall clock hanging next to the window showed that it was already long after midnight. It seemed to her that she had lived in a nightmare for a century. Bath stood up, turned on the light, and walked to the dressing table to look at herself in the mirror. She whispered the name of the goddess of storms and found inner peace, after which she sighed and said to herself, as if calming down, At least now I don't dream about this ship. As soon as she said this, she suddenly heard footsteps from the corridor, and then a knock on the door. Bath, Bath, did you have a nightmare? It was the voice of her uncle, the city-state's most revered consul. I'm fine, Vanna calmed down, then straightened her clothes and stood up to open the door to her room. Standing in the doorway was Dante Wayne, a gray-haired, gray-eyed, not overly portly middle-aged man who had obviously also just woken up. Having somehow pulled on his clothes, he looked at his niece with concern as soon as the door opened. Having lost an eye in an accident, he now possessed a ruby eye, the inside of which was streaked with gold and around it were terrible scars from eleven years earlier, giving his face a terrifying appearance. But Vanna had long since gotten used to it, and knew that her uncle was in fact a generous and fair man. I had a bad dream, she said, rubbing her eyes. I didn't think I'd wake you up. It's okay. In my old age I still began to sleep poorly. Dante Wayne looked at Vanna with concern. Dreamed of childhood again? Yeah, I dreamed of that time again. Uncle brought a calming herbal tincture and the power of medicine and alcohol finally calmed Vanna's slightly agitated mind. She opened the door to the balcony and stood in the breeze, looking towards the cathedral in the distance. Dante Wayne's voice came from behind. Every time you come back you have nightmares, and every time they contain things from your childhood. For an inquisitor, this is a sign of inappropriate weakness, Vanna said quietly. She was more than a head taller than her uncle, but she never minded showing the true side of her inner world to the man who raised her. I'm confused. Did you talk to Heidi? She recommended four brain surgeries and two nerve punctures, Vanna sighed. I didn't do this, given the years of our friendship. It's in her style. She doesn't interact much with normal people, Dante Wayne shook his head. Actually, I didn't think that after so many years you would remain captive of that nightmare. I also thought that I could get rid of it. Vanna rubbed her forehead. Maybe it really has something to do with that big house. Every time I come back here, I dream about that time. Perhaps I should perform another exorcism in that house. It always seemed to me that the shadow of that disaster was captured in that building. Uncle Dante thought for a moment, but did not object, but only thoughtfully asked, Do you still dream about the fire? Vanna nodded. Yes, he was everywhere. You fled from him with me on your back. I even clearly remember how we fled from the city through the chimneys of a factory. 
and nearby a building was slowly burning. Here she paused, her gaze fell on her uncle. You don't remember that fire, do you? Not only I don't remember, no one remembers. The consul of the city-state, with a serious expression on his face, slowly shook his head. All I remember is a pipeline leaking poisonous gas and cultists going crazy. There were a lot of people that night, but it seemed like you were the only one who saw the fire. Vanna didn't say anything for a while. She was just silent and thinking, and then suddenly she spoke quietly. My memories and yours are the same, except for the fire. Then I didn't understand anything, but now I know very well that this must be the influence of some supernatural force, and that after all these years and my promotion to sainthood, this influence has still not disappeared. This means that either the influence is of such a high level that it is imprinted on your soul for life, or the source of the influence did not disappear when the incident subsided, but remained somewhere in the city-state. I have been investigating this issue all these years, but unfortunately, I have not made much progress. There was a hint of regret in Dante Wayne's voice, not only that he had failed to solve his niece's problems, but also that he had failed to investigate the matter as consul of the city-state. The scars from the great chaos of eleven years ago took too long to heal. Vanna knew that this was not only her own problem but also her uncle's problem, but she was not very good at comforting people, and after thinking for a while, she could only change the subject. I remember that many cultists were arrested at that time, judging by the calculations, even more than during the Dark Sun incident four years ago. Yes, thousands of arrests, so many that I wonder how so many cultists could be hiding in a city-state like Prand, Dante Wayne sighed. And not just one cult, more followers of the Dark Sun, the cult of annihilation, worshipping the Lord of the Deep, and even the last preachers, worshipping subspace itself. All those maggots in the gutter appeared that night, wreaking havoc. Vanna looked at Dante, but according to the results of subsequent interrogations, not one of the thousands of cultists arrested by the authorities can be called the mastermind. None of them even knew why chaos broke out that night. The cultists did not gather at one point to cause destruction. Rather, they all fell into madness at the same time. Dante was silent for a moment thinking, and then suddenly looked into Vanna's eyes. I assume the reason for your irritation is not only that nightmare. The sudden mention of these things has something to do with the recent unrest in the city. Vanna did not shy away from the question. Yes, there is some connection between this. The heretics of the sun converge on the city-state in search of an anomaly known as the Shard of the Sun. And almost at the same time, the Lost House appeared in the real world, whose course vaguely indicates Prand. And although it is difficult to say how these two events are connected, this uneasy atmosphere reminds me of the chaos eleven years ago. I ordered all ports to thoroughly check the ships and spoke with the consuls of other city-states. Several heretics have been discovered on board. Their flow into the city-states all but cut off. As for those who are already in Prand, everything depends on the council. The guards are professionals who seek out and stop supernatural crimes. At this moment, the middle-aged consul suddenly paused, as if carefully considering whether to speak further. But after a moment's hesitation, he decided, as for the matter of the lost house, I cannot be useful in the supernatural realm, but in the mundane I have an idea. Worldly? Vanna frowned. She was about to ask what the ghost ship could have to do with the mundane sphere, when she suddenly remembered something. Wait, you mean? The captain of the research ship Radiant Star, Lucretia Ebnemar, and the leader of the Pirates of the Northern Waters, Tyrion Ebnemar, captain of the Sea Mist, Dante said dispassionately. It is true that the Lost House is a ghost ship beyond the comprehension of reality, but in the real world it has a foothold where it once existed. I wonder how Captain Duncan's son and daughter will react to the reappearance of their father. Vanna's eyes slowly widened. When dealing with enemies, she was used to a simple and brutal approach, but she had never considered anything related to the Lost House. However, she soon frowned. But I heard that these two hardly deal with the authorities of the city-states. They are an independent force on the Endless Sea. Each of them dominates their side, and maintains cold or even strained relations with all the city-states. This is fine. After all, they are the children of that ghost captain, and Radiant Star and Sea Mist accompanied the Lost House, although they went their separate ways a hundred years ago. In the eyes of most city-states, anything associated with that ghost captain meant a curse and danger. So city-states actively avoid them. Havana frowned. And you expect them to help us and go against their father? It's just a thought, but it's worth a try, Dante said seriously. After all, we all know that Radiant Star and Seamus parted ways with the Lost House over a century ago. Lucretia and Tyrion broke with their father even before the events on the Thirteen Islands of Wyseran more than half a century ago. It is even rumored that the captains of some of the ships witnessed Sea Mist fighting the Lost House in the Northern Waters, by which time the Lost House had become a legendary ghost ship, which may explain the attitude of the two captains towards their father. More than half a century ago when the Sea Mist was still the main flagship under the command of the Frost Queen, 
Captain Tyrion was probably ordered to defend the city-state, Vanna said slowly, thinking. But you are right. At the very least, this is proof enough that Seamist has experience fighting the Lost House. But she still had doubts, and after a few seconds of thought, she voiced them. What if Radiant Star and Seamist don't help us? We'll just try, Dante said quietly. I will spread the word and find a way to bring the situation of the appearance of the Lost House and its voyage to Prand to the tables of these two captains. That's all I can do. Then everything depends on them. Even ghosts were once part of the real world. And the Lost House, no matter how terrible it was a hundred years ago when it fell into subspace, was still a ship built by craftsmen in the real world, just like the Captain Duncan was human before he became a subspace shadow. For the average sailor, everything connected with the Lost House is inevitably shrouded in a shroud of curse and strangeness, as if the terrifying ghost captain were a being straight out of subspace. But no one thinks about whether a natural disaster wandering across the endless sea has any personal likes or dislikes, some kind of human relationships. Many perceive Captain Duncan as a symbolic natural phenomenon. It simply exists, and there is no need to think about its origin. Fear builds walls in the minds of mortals, causing them to subconsciously fail to consider the details of what lies beyond them. But as an Inquisitor who specialized in combating this fear, Vanna knew how to distinguish the truth from a series of legends, exaggerations, and delusions. Before the events of the Thirteen Isles of Wyserin, the dread captain of the Lost House had close friends and family, staunchly loyal sailors and adjutants, and needed to make port calls to maintain supplies and deal with the city-state's authorities. He could not swim in the sea all his life. Captain Duncan had a son and daughter, Tyrion Ebnemar, the eldest, and Lucretia Ebnemar, his daughter, and they are still alive. It is believed that some cursed force extended their lives, allowing the two captains to roam the world, immortal like their terrible father. Both captains, each of whom stands at the helm of a powerful ship, have long lived on the outskirts of the civilized world, and their relations with all city-states are so cold and even vaguely hostile that many do not even dare to imagine that Captain Duncan has a son and daughter living on Earth, and only a few who know history well enough and are intelligent enough know about them. On the other hand, despite the cold relations with the city-states, both captains were at least on the side of the people, albeit the terrible curse of the lost house after Captain Duncan did not bypass them either.